The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'm sure you're aware of the philosophical question, if a tree falls in a deserted forest where no one can hear the sound, did it make a noise? Carry the principle one step forward. If no one saw it fall, did it ever fall in the first place? Now, don't answer these questions too quickly. No one has ever been able to resolve them to everybody's satisfaction. And what does the sahib require of me? Christus, I am cursed with the habit of gambling. The curse can be lifted. No, priestess. It has been predicted I can stop only when the sun shines at midnight, when snow falls in the jungle, and when the deer turns upon and slays the pursuing tiger. Is that all? Is that all? This matter can be arranged. Our mystery drama, The Eye of the Idol, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A message from CBS Television. We're now sending all kinds of signals into space. What are the odds that someday someone or something will answer? What if our oceans continue to rise? And what happens when human engineers begin to engineer humans? This is Walter Cronkite. In the next few weeks, I'll look at these stories and more as I continue my new assignment, The Universe. Walter Cronkite's Universe, Tuesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is the laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. Read label and follow directions. And now save up to a dollar when you buy Metamucil. Look for coupons in the July Reader's Digest. By Natural J's Ripple to Pets, Chicago's great tasting dip chips. You ain't heard nothing yet. The MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas presents Don Arden's Jubilee. The show of the decade. From start to finish, Jubilee is excitement and music. Come on, I love you. Rhythms of Ragtime. Wonderful. To Gershwin. Marvelous. To Presley with an Elvis extravaganza. See the sinking of the Titanic. Music from World War One with the Red Baron dueling overhead. Yes, from the silent screen to today, it's all there in Jubilee with the glitter, glamour, and girls that you expect from MGM. Don't miss Jubilee. It's a grand experience. Opening July 30th at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Ship me somewhere east of Suez, says Mr. Rudyard Kipling, where the best is like the worst, where there is no Ten Commandments. And a man can raise a thirst. Ah, yes. We shall never see those days again. And perhaps it's for the best. When a handful of British soldiers and civil servants rule the entire teeming subcontinent of India. India. That ancient and eternal land of mystery and romance. And this is a story that took place many years ago when India was called the British Raj. Danu! Danu! Where can a lazy scoundrel be hiding? Danu! Has the heaven-born called? Well, what have I been standing here doing? Well, snap to, look sharp, step lively. 
I dine tonight with the parents of the Saiba Penelope, understand? Each word from the presence fills this ignorant person with magnificent enlightenment. Yes, lay out my best shirt and uh, place thou therein the silver studs. Ah, uh, sooner than say this, thy servant would rather eat dirt. But I must disobey the heaven-born's command. All right, now look here, Danu. The silver studs cannot be placed in the shirt. Because they are still in the clutches of Mustafa Ali, the money lender. Oh, Lord. All right, all right. We'll improvise. Hast thou drawn my bath? If it pleases the presence, I have not. Well, how can it please me, thou benighted fool? I've had a hard day at the office. I want my bath. With your honor's permission, it is not possible at this time. The well must be repaired. Before the water may flow. Then I remember I told you to have it fixed. I have done even what the favored one has commanded. I went to the office where these things may be arranged. The babu of the accounts would not consent. Why, that arrogant little clerk. What did he say? He said, and I repeat, say unto Farnsworth Sahib that we will see first the color of his money. All right, all right. We'll sort this out later. I'm... Meanwhile, place thou the dress suit, the shirt, and the razor in a bag. I will bathe and shave at the club. Uh, the club. This letter came for you. From whom? It is even from the self-same club that the Blessed One has just now mentioned. Well, give it to me. Why didst thou not leave it on the table where I could see it? If the Glorious One will permit... Had I left it on the table, the bad news it contains would have spread through the entire house. Why dost thou say it's bad news? One can feel the evil spirit churning about within. Mm. Uh, Mr. John K. Farnsworth, Bubbling Well Road. Dear Jack, I'm sorry I must notify... What's this? No regulations. All members in arrears barred from club privileges until back dues are... Respectfully, Percy Smollett. Oh, they can't do this to me. I'm a charter member. It is a year since the Magnificent One has paid a single rupee. Oh, shut up. I have to have a bath. Take thou the bucket. Go to the well in the village. Well, why dost thou stand there, Danu? Be off. Fill the tub. Uh, uh, before this uh, reputationless clod enters the bathroom... I suggest the Invincible One go in there first. Well, why would I want to go into the bathroom before thou bringest the water? And hold at the ready the double-barreled rifle. Fool! Why would I bring a rifle into the bathroom? Because there is, lying in the tub, a cobra. A cobra? How did a cobra get into my bathtub? It must have slithered up through the sluice. Oh, this is absolutely all I need. Hey, they enjoy the warmth of the pipes. Yes, I'll give him something to enjoy. Uh, put the gun together for me. It is even now assembled and loaded and waiting by the door. Between the sharks at the club and the snakes in my house. Oh, look at him lying there. As if he owned the place. You think the beggar was paying rent and taxes? Well, how do you like this? Ah, that did him. <laughs> Ugly brute. Fifteen feet, if he's an inch. <laughs> Junior? Yes? Come in and get rid of him. Uh, uh, with your honor's permission, uh, soon. Hello? Not soon. Now. No, but we must wait. For what? The meat. Even now, it is probably crawling through the pipe on the trail of its beloved. May I remind the unconquerable one to hold the other barrel ready. Some mornings, it doesn't pay to get up. But on a day like this, it doesn't even pay to be alive. <laughs> And thus, you have met my master, Farnsworth Sahib. He makes much noise and many threats because he is afraid people will discover that he has a kind heart. But, more important, many people have already discovered that he has a foolish head. 
especially me, where games of cards are concerned. Although he sees himself victorious like a lion, at the end of the evening, he is always shorn like a lamb. Got the other one, Danu. Come, get rid of these ugly things. You don't have to be afraid. They're dead. Ah, now, one may truly marvel at and uh, safely touch their awesome beauty. Just get the filthy things out of here. See, see, this is the female. She died for him. She heard the shot. Still, she came, preferring the companionship of death to the loneliness of life. Wilt thou take those disgusting things out of here and toss them on the trash heap? It shall be even as your honor commands. I knocked on the door, but no one answered, so I came... Oh, what's that? Oh, no. Oh. Please, please, Penelope, my darling, don't, don't faint. Oh. Don't faint. Oh, no. oh, no. Keep them away from me. Keep, keep them away. It's all right, my dearest. They're dead. Oh, where did they come from? Well, they, they were in the bathtub. The bathtub? Well, you know how cobras are. They like warm places. The bathtub? And you expect me to live in this house after we're married. Oh, darling, we'll fix it up prettily. I'm very glad our engagement is broken. We'll put up curtains and all the other foolish little things so dear to our woman's heart. Did you hear what I said? The engagement is broken. Dearest, I always hear what you say. You said the engage... What? What do you mean, it's broken? Who? Who broke our engagement? Three people made that decision. Three? First, Daddy. He was at the club. There it was, on the bulletin board for all the world to see. Suspended for non-payment of dues. Uh-oh. I came by to warn you. Don't come to dinner tonight. Daddy's lying in wait. Oh, but I can explain. Second, there's Mother, who never approved of you, to begin with. Who felt she was throwing away her daughter on some second-rate assistant district superintendent of the railway and telegraph department. I am not a second-rate assistant district superintendent. I am a second deputy assistant. And third, John Kenneth Farnsworth. Why do you call me John Kenneth Farnsworth? Because this is a formal occasion. I am serving notice that I intend to break our engagement. You can't do that. I have just done it. Penelope. You lied to me. My darling, I never meant... You never meant to keep your word. I tried. You didn't try hard enough. If there's a losing horse anywhere at any racetrack in India, you'll bet on him. In, in the interests of accuracy, my darling, I have been losing mostly on mares and maiden fillies. You promised me you would stop all gambling. But I meant to. I release you from your vow. I free you from your obligation. We are no longer engaged. I thought you loved me. I do love you. But I'll get over it. I'll meet someone else. Someone who prefers me to a night of cards and a day at the races. Please, darling, listen. Someone who shall not sentence me to a life of poverty. Someone who will not gamble away the roof over my head and the bread from the mouths of my children. I've changed. You speak in echoes, John Kenneth Farnsworth. I would return your ring. Except you had already pledged it to Mustafa Ali, the money lender. Penelope! Penelope, come back! She's gone. Danu, she's gone. Yes. What am I going to do? Find another. Well, who could replace my Penelope? Uh, there is the daughter of the colonel of the cavalry regiment. The tall, fair-skinned blood. Oh, you mean the gawky albino? Uh, uh, there is Miss Leslie. She squints. True, true. But she has an income of 2,000 rupees per month. Well, let us stop this melancholy recital of the seedy charms of mediocre women. I have lost the sun. Am I to have my way lightened by flickering candles? Get me a rope. A rope? What does the presence propose to do with the a rope? Hang myself. Is there another use for a rope? Quickly. For the sake of the Sahiba Penelope. The rope, quickly. I cannot live without her. But it is not necessary for the presence to live without the Sahib. Thou hast heard. She has broken our engagement. If the protector of the poor will but listen. The Sahiba is angry because of the gambling. Yeah. 
if she can be shown that the heaven-born renounces this sin, the Sahiba will relent, and there shall be connubial bliss. Dost thou not realize that the gambling is with me like a fever in the blood? I will stop gambling when the sun shines at midnight, when snow falls in the jungle, when the deer turns upon and slays the pursuing tiger. But she does not love thee. Is the sahiba like the she-cobra that welcomed death to be with her mate? <sighs> If the center of the universe will only deign to listen, this most unworthy one has an idea. An idea? What sort of idea? Why does the Sahiba object to gambling? Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's immoral, I suppose. No. Because your honor always loses. But reflect. If I could show your honor a way to gamble and never lose. What do you mean? Never lose? Always win. Always win? Every time. How is such a thing possible? How? Very well. How? A way to play and always win. Why, that's like having a license to print money, isn't it? Even better, it's like having the Philosopher's Stone. Well, this sounds like something worth waiting to hear. And we shall hear all about it in Act Two. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out and touch someone close who's far away. And Daddy, I start next month. They gave me my own office on the 25th floor with my own name on it. That's super, Andy. I bet you got a great view. Well, not really. The new members of the firm don't get offices with windows. My daughter, the lawyer, doesn't get to look out the window? Not for a while, Daddy. For now, I have to look out the wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you could jump on a plane and come and celebrate with me. Me too, honey. We're so proud of you. We know what it took to get through law school. Oh, so do I, Daddy. And I know I couldn't have done it without you and Mama. Your encouragement, your understanding. And we all know tuition doesn't grow on trees when you're not made of money. Daddy, thank you. I love you. Andy, right now, the richest man in the world. Now, let me put your mother on. She'd never forgive me if I didn't let you talk to her. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. The bell system. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Lauren Green speaks to you for Medic Alert. An accident or sudden illness might seriously affect your ability to speak or communicate. That's why wearing a medic alert emblem is especially important if you have a hidden medical condition such as an allergy to penicillin or diabetes, hypertension, or a heart problem, for example. The emblem contains a special ID number, a 24-hour phone number, and your medical condition engraved on the reverse side. In an emergency, Medic Alert provides identification and vital information within seconds. A wallet card is sent to you each year to provide current medical information. Wearing a Medic Alert emblem can help ensure you swift and accurate treatment in a medical emergency. Remember, Medic Alert speaks for you when you can't. Take good care of yourself. For information, write Medic Alert, Turlock, California, 95381. This message was brought to you as a public service by this station. According to Mr. Grantland Rice, when the one great scorer comes to write against your name, he marks not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. That refers, of course, to the game of life. The game of cards, however, is completely different. Especially when money changes hands. What sayest thou, Danu? There is a way to gamble and never lose. It is even so. I don't believe it. And yet, if your honor will permit me, it shall be revealed. Uh, when? At the proper time. Danu... Dost thou say this to divert me from my purpose, which is to hang myself? Well, of course. That did happen to be why I said such a thing. 
Could I let Farnsworth Sahib throw away his life because of the whim of some chit of a girl? Huh. How foolish are the English. How eager to die for love. Uh, and yet, how was I to keep my promise? Was there a way to gamble and never lose? And if so, how could I find it? I decided to seek out Laila, the witch. Who knows? Perhaps she might have heard something in the winds that blow between the garden of Genaden and the gates of Gehenna. Why dost thou seek Laila? What is thy desire? To find a way to gamble and never lose. This thing cannot be. Life itself is a gamble. And in the end, all must lose. Ah, this I know. Then why ask? It is for my master, Farnsworth Sahib. An Englishman? Eh, he has a good heart. Why does he gamble? It is sickness. Yes, it kills more foreigners than the fever. Is it possible to help him? Leave me to think upon it. Deneau, come here at once. Now, you said you knew of a way that I could gamble and never lose. Now, what is it? If the favored one will reflect, his servant said he would find a way. Uh -huh. Just how long is this supposed to take? Ah, oh, someone stands without. Open the door. Hmm. Oh, and who is this? Protector of the poor. I am a holy woman. I sell charms and potions and spells. No, there is no need of thy wares in this house of sorrow. House of sorrow? Has one died here? One is about to die. And what is the illness? Love. Yes. Love comes and goes and kills many. And yet her hand may be stayed. By this charm I can give thee. Oh, holy mother, I prepare myself to meet my maker. I cannot fill my mind with heathen tricks. But here, here, take this. My last rupee. And give me thy blessing. I travel soon to a far country from which none may return. Ah, thy last rupee. There is a kind heart. I give my blessing. And now, I shall leave. Ah, what were you discussing to know? Ah, oh, yes, this gambling system of the vine. Well, what is it? Uh, by uh, your honor's favor, it shall only take a little while longer. What purpose had Lila come to the house? Had she cast a spell on him? How would she be able to help? Had I been mistaken? Or when she left, had she given me a certain look as if to say, come to me soon? I know now why the master gambles. Truly? He gambles heavily for two reasons. First, to wager huge sums to risk one's substance gives a man a devil may care reputation as an adventurer. Can this be true? Second, he believes that losing money to people is a way to buy their affection and goodwill. Oh, what wisdom! Oh, holy one, why dost thou not speak these words of enlightenment to Farnsworth Sahib himself? Would he listen to an old heathen sorcerer? But if someone, someone could tell him. Oh, Layla, what is to be done? We must cure thy master of the gambling. Yes, but how? Thou didst promise. Thou wouldst show him a way to gamble and always win? Yes, but even if I could find it, how would winning cure him? He has tried losing, has he not? That has not opened his eyes. Very well. Let us see what winning may reveal to him. Well, how, how is this to be arranged? Listen... 
Thou and closely. Why? Why have we come here? Patience, Your Honor. Just a little bit longer. I am a complete fool. I let you drag me out to the jungle in the middle of the night. We are protected by the emanations from the shrine. The shrine? What shrine? The shrine of Azari. Uh, the shrine of Azari. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, what does one do there? One finds the magic. What kind of magic? Whatever magic one is seeking. In the case of the anointed one, the magic that makes him a constant winner. Mm, now this I have to see. Where is it? It is not much further. Ah, see, just ahead, a clearing. And uh, the ancient statue. Yes, the statue of Azari. <laughs> That? <laughs> that shapeless piece of clay? That's Azari? <laughs> what is that shining thing uh, near the top of it? Tis the eye of fortune. The eye of Azari. It sees all things. Oh, great goddess Azari. Thy servant seeks thy favor. Who's that? Tis Layla. The high priestess of the goddess Hazari. She looks familiar. Wait. I know her. She's that beggar lady who came to the door the other day. Ah, yes. She will sometimes wear that guise. She had come to test your honor. To test me? Why? To see if your honor is worthy. Worthy? Worthy of what? Worthy to receive help. From the goddess Hazari. Oh, is that a fact, huh? Well, how does she know I'd be here? I mean, how do I know this isn't a trick thou hast arranged with her? I would put nothing past thee to know. Approach the shrine. Approach. Do even as she says, Sahib. Well, this is humbug. I'm going home. Approach. Here. It is the goddess that speaks through her mouth. The goddess Hazari herself. Thy name is Farnsworth Saib. The high priestess Lila says thou art good of heart, but thy heart is troubled. Speak. Well, that's true, I suppose. And what is the source of thy sorrow, Saib? I, I, I like to gamble. I, well, no, I just don't like it. I... Yes? I have to. I mean, that's all there is to it. I simply have to. And what wouldst thou have from the goddess Azari? Well, assuming that we're dealing here with a legitimate proposition, as as long as I have to gamble, I would... I would like to be able to win. Could the goddess arrange it so that I could become one of those who... Walks off with the money? The goddess Azari speaks through me. The answer is yes. Yes. Master, thou art saved. I can play cards now and win. Constantly. Oh, and the horses, I bet. Uh, they'll come in first? All the time. Oh, wait a minute. The goddess says to me, her high priestess... Do thou but lend the Sahib Farnsworth for however long a time he wants to keep it. The eye from my head. The eye? The eye. I take it from the head of the goddess and I give this precious jewel to thee. Jewel? (laughs) It's only a piece of glass. And a diamond is only a lump of coal. What am I supposed to do with it? Keep it on thy person. It will serve thee as the all-seeing eye when thou sittest down at the card table and when thou standest at the rail of the racetrack. Mm, The all-seeing eye. What am I going to see? The winners, the winning hand, the winning horse. Well, that's 
That's simply impossible. True. It is impossible for those who have no faith. Oh, goddess Hazari, let me assure thee, it's my master Farnsworth Sahib, his great faith. Faith fills his entire heart, soul, and body. Thy servant has spoken, Farnsworth Sahib. Dost thou agree with his words? Please, Farnsworth Sahib, please. Oh, well. Why not? I'll give it a try. I would, too. After all, what does he have to lose? And it doesn't matter where or when we find a gambler, does it? They seem to be a race apart, filled with their own symbols and superstitions. And besides, your true dyed-in-the-wool gambler will try anything once. And we shall try the third act shortly. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the sort of perfect sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Try a perfect sleeper, perfect sleeper. Up. It's a healthy investment in yourself. To keep your car running better, smoother, longer, turn it over to Goodyear for a 12-month engine tune-up. The Goodyear service store will tune your engine now. And if your engine needs adjustment or parts replaced that were part of the original tune-up, Goodyear will fix it free. A 12-month engine tune-up now for just $42 for four-cylinder cars with electronic ignition. Six and eight cylinders higher. Additional parts and services extra if needed. At $8 for standard ignition. Turn it over to Goodyear. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Accidents and other unexpected medical problems can happen any time of the day or night. That's why the emergency department of Bethesda Hospital never closes. We're open round the clock every day of the year. Qualified physicians and professional nurses are always on duty to provide immediate emergency treatment. And they're backed by all the specialized equipment and skills of Bethesda Hospital. A modern, fully accredited primary care hospital with diversified medical and surgical capabilities. You may never have a medical emergency, but it's a good idea to be prepared just in case. Keep the phone number of your personal physician handy. Keep our telephone number handy, too. 761-6000. 761-6000. Remember, on the north side of Chicago, we're near you when you need us. Bethesda Emergency Services, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, at Howard and Western in Chicago. said, true luck consists not in holding the best cards at the table, but in knowing just when to rise and go home. To which we might also add, and knowing when to stay in the pot, and when to fold, and when to bet, call, or raise. But if one could do all these things consistently, it would be more than luck. It would be because one possessed an all-seeing eye, which is what our story is all about. Danu! Danu! Does the heaven born call his servant? Listen, was it a dream? A dream? Did I dream, Danu, that thou and I walked into the jungle and came upon a shrine to the goddess, uh, uh, what was the name of that goddess? Uh, I forget. Izari! Yes, and she said to me that I could... Wait a minute. How dost thou know the name of the goddess? I was there with the heaven one. Thou art there? With me? Then it was no dream. And this piece of glass... The eye of the goddess Hazari. It's supposed to show me the winning hand at cards. The winning horse at the track. It is even as the fortunate one says. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Does the sublime one have the eye? Uh, the glass in my pocket. Then at the racetrack even now... Are the horses striving with each other? Yes, well, what's the point of going to the racetrack? I don't have a single rupee to wage it. True, true. But come, my lord. Who knows what visions await? (laughs) 
see. See the horses stand in line? Yes, 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 I see, I see. Is there one that meets with my lord's favor? I have no money. If I did, I'd bet it and lose it. I was a fool to come here. No, Danu, I shall go home and put an end to my sorry self. But the eye, the eye of his eye, a piece of brightly colored glass. And it shows the heaven-born nothing? Nothing, Danu, nothing. My lord, on this paper is written many things, Mm. much information. Yes, I know that paper, Danu. How well I know that paper. It is called a tout sheet. And yet... It speaks much useful information. Mm. Well, I see the names of eight animals, and each is a stubborn brute that runs fast or slow according to some whim of its own mysterious, brutish nature. Yes, but still... And you... furthermore... Fatima. Fatima? Mm. Fatima. I see her break quickly at the start. She leads at the eighth, increases at the quarter... Fault is at the half. No, 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 my girl. Go, go. See that? She regains the stride. She enters the stretch. She's neck and neck. And now, now she forges ahead. She wins driving. Fatima. Fatima. You see, it is even here written on the paper. Fatima. I have seen Fatima win, but the race has not yet begun. Oh, it is the eye of Azari. What eye of Azari? That sees everything, even Fatima, at twenty to one. Fatima is twenty to one. It is written. Is it possible? Ah, There is the man with the book. Surely the presence will wish to wager, say, ten pounds on Fatima? Uh, Danu, don't rush me. Uh, Fatima, I saw her win. Stand, Danu. Let me write her name on this piece of paper. Fatima, ten pounds. Signed, Jack Farnsworth. All right, now then, Danu. Run thou to the book, Sahib, and place this in his hand. I did even as I was told. And then, there was the gun. And the horses raced forward like tortured spirits rushing to escape from Gehenna. And the little mare, Fatima, did lead them all. And no one else, it seemed, had seen fit to bet on her. So, as she raced about the track, there was a silence as the crowd's favorites lagged behind. And only the voice of my master could be heard in that vast throng. Oh, Fatima! You can do it, girl! I've seen you do it before! Come on, Fatima! Come on, girl! When the day was done, when we departed from the ring where the book sahib hauled forth... Let me add this up. This is 200 for Fatima, 300 for Salia, 400 for Chalunda. It's not a bad day. What sayest thou to know? Yes, it is uh, the eye that has shown the invincible one how each race would end. Yes, yes, to know it is the eye. <laughs> for without it, I would never bet on such mangy pieces of horse flesh that have today won me this fortune. And where does your honor go now? Now, do you know? Now I go forth to the club. I go forth to Shear at a place where formerly I was shown. I shall recount all that occurred when I come home. It's Percy Smollett. Good evening, Percy. Well, oh, Jack. Oh, I see the club is having a dance. Uh, well, Jack, I, I I would like to avoid any unpleasantness. Of course, of course, we always uh, have a dance on Saturday nights. Uh, uh, Jack, now, you're supposed to be barred from the premises until... Until I pay my dues. Yes, that's right. Uh, Jack, uh, I don't make the rules. Of course not, Percy. Uh, where is my account? I wish to settle it. Now... Well, a thing that's worth doing is best done promptly. Well, it's uh, it's a rather large sum. Well, I happen to have some cash in my pocket. Let me look. Oh, well, you think I have enough here? My God, Monsieur, what? Some Jack, what happened? Did some aunt of yours, some nice old lady, finally close her eyes? Well, let us say that some nice old lady finally opened mine. Should you give me a receipt? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, why don't we step into my office? <laughs> now, let 
let me sign this little receipt. And there you are. Hmm. I thank you, Percy. <laughs> of course. Tell me, the usual bunch around this evening? Yes, why, of course. In the card room, naturally. I was headed that way myself. Hmm. You suppose I might sit in for a few hands? Oh. Hi, Jack. Uh, now that you're a member in good standing once again, <laughs> so you're as welcome as the very air uh, we breathe. <laughs> My bet, I suppose. I say, a pound. Uh, Percy? Well, I say, uh, 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 let's make it a fiver. Jack? Jack, it's your bet. Uh, my bet? Hmm. Uh, hmm. Uh, Jack? I'm open for a pound. I, I say a fiver. What do you say? Mm. I say a tenner. Two jacks. Two ladies. Ah, well, now that's luck. Three kings. Three aces. Ah, and I'm thoroughly cleaned. I may as well fold. <laughs> Jack, you lucky devil. <laughs> And did you find a way to see through the backs of the cards? And so, my master became the richest man in the club. Everybody deferred to him and made much of him. But there was one who still shunned him. Penelope, Penelope, please wait, please. Oh. Yes. Penelope, you won't see me when I come calling... You won't talk to me at the club. You you cut me dead at Pilates and every other place. We run into each other. Can't you take the hint? Please, Penelope. It's a beautiful morning. You're spoiling my ride. But, darling, why won't you marry me now? Your parents no longer disapprove. Oh, no. They think you're quite a catch. Yes, you said you wouldn't marry me because you were afraid you would lose the roof over your head one day. Are you still afraid? Yes. But I'm rich, Penelope. I am easily the wealthiest man on the station. And every penny comes to you from gambling. And therefore, one day, every penny can leave you the same way it came. Oh, no, darling, never. You are having a streak of luck. It can turn. No, it isn't luck. It's you... Yes? I'll tell you this to prove I love you. Now, you mustn't think I'm mad, but I have the eye of the goddess. And with it, I can see all the winning cards, all the winning horses. Oh, my darling boy, you have gone mad. And then I think, no, this proves once and for all you must rid yourself of this gambling sickness before it destroys you completely. Penelope, stay. I shall come back only when you have cast aside this accursed habit forever. Yes, no, my original instinct was correct. I should hang myself. My lord has asked for a way to gamble and win. It has been found. Why this further talk? Penelope will have none of it. Dost thou understand? And without her, nothing is worthwhile in this life here below. Then give it up. The cards, the horses. Give it up, give it up. How can I give it up? My lord, perhaps this can be accomplished. How? Did not my lord once declare a set of conditions under which he would abandon the pursuit of the wagering forever? Ah, uh, I don't remember to know. But thy servant recalls. Come to the jungle, to the shrine of Azari. And to the high priestess. And what is this? The Sahib wishes to return the eye? It is no longer of use to me. Hold to the light, the all-seeing eye. Tell me what is revealed. What? Light? It's getting light. The sun... The sun is rising. How can the sun rise, Saeed? It is midnight. Look. Look the sun. See how it lights up the jungle? Never has there been such a brilliant sunlight. Thunder? How is this possible? Look what falls from the sky. Snow. Snow! Snow in the jungle. Of course, it's snow. It's covering the trees. It's... It's freezing. 
snow. A tiger? A tiger? I have no gun. I'm unarmed. Have no fear, Saeed. Thou shalt be protected. Protected? By what? By whom? That's a tiger. See, the tiger flees for its life. It is being pursued by a deer. A deer? See, a deer catches the tiger, falls upon it. A deer turns on a tiger? The sahib has seen it with his own eyes. Yes, yes, I have seen it. Thou art free now. For has not the sahib said, the gambling is a fever in the blood. I will stop when the sun shines at midnight, when the snow falls in the jungle, and when the deer slays the tiger. Remember? Yes. Yes, I remember. Thou hast seen these things? Yes. Where are they now? The sun at midnight, the snow in the jungle, the tiger slain by the deer. Where? The moon shines through the trees. There is not, never was, can never be any snow. And but fifty yards from here is a deer slain by a tiger, as is proper to the law of the jungle. But I saw the sun and the snow and the conquering deer. Thou didst see what the gambler sees when the fever runs high in the blood. Visions, phantoms, illusions. And now the fever has burned itself out. Go. You know, you know, I just had the strangest dream. I, I can't, can't make heads or tails of the thing. It was, uh, it was, it was snowing, and, and, and deer were killing tiger, and that old beggar lady was... Oh, what's the difference? Does the heaven-born go to the club tonight? The club? Why would I want to go to the club? The protector of the poor goes there every night to play cards. Mm, oh, well... Uh, I don't see the point of that anymore. I mean, why should I sit around in a sweaty room, drink too much whiskey, and throw cards at a surly group of nervous, bad-tempered people? Why, indeed. Especially when I can walk about in the fresh air, enjoy the beautiful moonlight with the lovely Penelope. Why, indeed... And so Jack Farnsworth has made his choice. And you will agree with it or disagree with it, according to your own personal views on love, life, and gambling. And I shall have some personal views of my own for you shortly. Stay on the road with Quaker State. Running long and trouble free. Stay on the road with State's new lifetime engine lubrication protection program guarantees in writing any new car engine using only Quaker State against oil-related failure as long as you own it. Quaker State, the quality motor oil refined from Pennsylvania grade crude oil. Coverage and limited warranty details at participating new car dealers. Proof of maintenance required. New car or old. You'll be staying on the road with Quaker State. Morning seems to start out better. You seem to go Always good to the last drop. Start your mornings with a double dose of laughter on CBS television, beginning with the Jeffersons. Me and her been through some hard times together. And ain't another woman in this world who will stick by me the way she has. You ain't laughing. The laughs continue with Alan. Yeah! And then... Here's the first item up for bids and the price is right. Join Bob Barker and... For an hour of excitement and fabulous prizes, it's the Jeffersons, Alice and the Price is Right, weekdays on CBS Television. Dr. Seuss for the library. 
The first time I ever set foot inside a library, I was eight years old, and I got caught in a rainstorm. I ran into that library to save my shoes. What happened to me in that library was more valuable than any pair of shoes. That day, I found out where the great books were, and they showed me how to use them. And I hope that every kid who's listening in will get caught someday in a rainstorm in front of a library. A public service message of the American Library Association. people say of something or other that it's in the cards. Just precisely what does that mean? Is it possible that all the cards will always fall according to some prearranged pattern? Is it then also possible to predict that pattern by following laws of averages and probabilities? Was Jack Farnsworth's all-seeing eye merely a concentration on the past performances of horses? You can call it the eye of Azari, or you can call it applied psychology. Perhaps in the end, it's all one and the same thing. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Earl Hammond, and Roberta Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... any other airline. Delta's good and ready to St. Louis, too, with eight timely non-stops, including two from close-in Midway. You can also choose from three Delta non-stops to Houston or from a dozen other departures. Delta has thrifty night coach and supreme super saver fares that'll save you money to all these places. See your travel agent or call Delta for details. And next trip to New Orleans, Houston, or St. Louis, call Delta. Ready? Go. Delta is ready when you are Delta. CBS News. The nationwide postal strike was scheduled to begin at this hour if there wasn't some progress in the talks. I'm Dave Dugan reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Rita Flynn reports from the negotiations in Washington. Talks between the Postal Service and the two largest unions resumed this evening, but thus far there's been no word about extending the strike deadline that passed at midnight Eastern Time. Earlier tonight, Vincent Zambrato, head of the National Association of Letter Carriers, again said today's talks have yielded no progress and members are reconciled to the prospect of a nationwide walkout. We don't do it with any fervor. We don't do it with any degree of happiness. In point of fact, we're rather sad about it. But certainly we're relaxed because we know we are right. The two biggest unions have flatly rejected a second wage package management said was a substantially different offer. But despite that rejection and at this late hour, the Postal Service still says it does not anticipate a strike. Rita Flynn, CBS News, Washington. There's no news on the baseball talks, and there won't be. Both sides have agreed to a news blackout. Federal mediators have said intensive news coverage has hindered progress. Those baseball talks continue Tuesday morning in Washington. CBS News will continue after this message.
The Wall Street Journal, in a recent article, explained why investors should start figuring the proposed 1982 tax changes into their investment plans now. So have a pencil ready for an important offer from the Wall Street Journal that can help you get a head start every business day with up-to-the-minute business information that can affect your future and your company's future. Other stories in the journal revealed why the Reagan administration's efforts to cool inflation could result in high interest rates and a sluggish economy. Why delinquencies on home mortgage loans climb to record levels in many areas. And how the drop in oil prices is helping companies and individuals all across the country. The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 26 weeks of the journal, one for every business day of the week, for less than $1.60 per week. That's just $41 for 26 weeks. So if you're serious about business, in the continental U.S., call toll-free 800-228-6600. That's 800-228-6600. 600, except in Nebraska. You'll be billed later. The United States has indefinitely suspended all deliveries of F-16 fighter planes to Israel. A decision by President Reagan was announced Monday night in Ottawa by Secretary of State Haig. Secretary Haig says stopping the shipping of the fighter planes to Israel was done in the context of the overall violence in the Middle East. Secretary Haig rejected a suggestion that keeping the fighter planes from Israel was done to pressure the Israeli cabinet which meets in a few hours to discuss a ceasefire. The leaders of the seven Western nations meeting in Ottawa have warned the Soviet Union against any military buildup. The Western nations also warned the Soviet-backed government of Afghanistan to stop giving aid to hijackers or face a cutoff of air service from the countries meeting in Ottawa. French President Mitterrand told President Reagan that high interest rates in the United States are causing unemployment in France. And those U.S. interest rates are going even higher. Most of them, with the exception of the prime, went up again Monday. In reaction, the stock market fell 18 points. That's the biggest drop on the Dow Jones average since President Reagan's inauguration day. The official death toll in the Kansas City Hotel tragedy has been reduced from 113 to 111. Police say there was an error in counting. There will be at least five investigations into what caused the collapse of the walkways of the Hyatt Hotel... The president of the company that designed the walkways, Jack Gillum, says it will be a while before anything is known. We will not release anything until after everyone has a consensus. It's one of those things that, uh, that, that you've got to have all of the facts and put them all together. And there, as far as we're concerned, we will not release any information until there's a definite conclusion on what caused it. And, of course, there will be different teams come up with different or possibly different viewpoints, but because the different teams represent different concerns. It'll all come out, but it will be a while. The first victims of the collapse of those walkways were buried Monday in Kansas City. Miss Venezuela, Irene Zayez Conde, is the new Miss Universe. Miss USA was selected in the semifinal round, but was not chosen as a finalist. Now this. If you love great music, great music of any kind, classical, jazz, country, you'll love this free offer from the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian wants to help you explore fully the music you love. So it's offering, free for the asking, its catalog of the finest and most comprehensive recordings available nowhere else. In the catalog, you'll discover magnificent collections of opulent masterpieces by Bach and Handel. You'll also find some of the great performances of Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and other jazz greats. There's a giant jamboree of country music and the joyous sounds of the American musical stage. And there's much more. If you're a collector, if you're looking for musical adventure, let the Smithsonian be your guide. For your free 24-page catalog with complete descriptions, simply write Smithsonian Recordings, Washington, D.C., 20560. That's Smithsonian Recordings, Washington, 20560. The Chrysler Corporation will report a profit for the second quarter of this year. That's the first time since the end of 1978 that Chrysler has not finished in the red. The announcement of Chrysler's turnaround was made by Auto Workers President Douglas Fraser, who serves on Chrysler's board of directors. Dave. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents.
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. When he was almost 30, Colonel George Washington reconciled himself to the quiet life of a country squire. He had no way of knowing that in 15 years, he would become father of his country. When he was in his 30s, Ulysses S. Grant was a failed merchant in upstate New York. He didn't know that a few years later, he would become the general who saved the Union. When he was 40, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who would one day liberate and unify Italy, worked as a laborer in a candle factory on Staten Island, New York. Listen, it is a patrol. We have been discovered, General. We would have to run for it. But Anita, she cannot walk. We have to leave her. Oh, please, Giuseppe, don't leave me. If you stay, you will be taken prisoner, General. Think of the cause. Think of your country. This is the woman I love. I think of her first. Our mystery drama, Death and the Dreamer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Weekdays on CBS Television. Don't miss your favorite daytime drama. Follow the continuing stories of families in conflict. Their lives changing every day. Full of turmoil, triumph, and treachery. On the young and the restless. Then, it's searing stories of romantic intrigue and hidden desires. On As the World Turns. Be sure to watch The Young and the Restless. And As the World Turns. Weekdays on CBS Television. If you can't hire a professional gardener to keep your yard in shape... Depend on professional quality True Temper tools from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summer also suggests you keep grass neatly trimmed with True Temper grass shears, featuring floating blade designed for super slicing action. And to keep shrubs and evergreens well groomed, use the True Temper head shears with a serrated notched lower blade. You'll find them both at participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers, where you'll find values in every department. Spice up your life with Jay's barbecue flavored potato chips. They're terrific. If you're going to the Wisconsin Dells this summer, Magicist has the best money saving deal in town. Now, when you place any order with Magicist, Chicago Lions quality carpet, rug, furniture, and drapery cleaners since 1929, you'll get free tickets to the Dells. That's right, take the whole family to the Dells with free tickets for Magicist. And if you place your order now, you'll get two additional bonus tickets to Tommy Bartlett's Water Show, a bonus value of $12. Magicist uses the most modern methods and equipment to get your carpet, rugs, furniture, and draperies deep down clean. So hurry and place your order now. Call Magicist North at 378-8600 or Magicist South at 468-4800 for free tickets to the Dells. And for you stay-at-homers, ask Magicist about free tickets with your order to Chicago Fire Football, Santa Fe Speedway, and Volo Antique Auto Museum. He had fought a good fight, but the time was not yet. The foreign powers who owned and dominated most of Italy, the French and the Austrians, had beaten him finally. They had decimated his army, destroyed his health, and forced him into exile. He was in his 40s. His hair was gray, his body was wracked by the hardships of the soldier's life, and now he was living in a strange land, America. Generous, freedom-loving America extended its hospitality. But in 1850, America couldn't really become too excited about a civil war in Italy. We were getting ready to have one of our own, and so the hero was beginning to face some practical problems. General Garibaldi... Of course. You, you're exactly like your picture. It all depends on how old the picture is. Uh, may I come in? I, too, am an Italian. That is, a, an American Italian. My name is Antonio Meucci. I am an inventor. And what do you invent? Oh, candles. Now, you may say, what's to invent as far as a candle is concerned? Isn't a candle just a wick surrounded by some tallow? Well... Isn't it? Ah, but there are types of tallow and types of wicks and materials to be selected and ways of working them into a more efficient product. I see. When I heard you were coming to America... Oh, what an honor. 
Giuseppe Garibaldi, Italy's greatest patriot. You are much too kind. I must do something for this man, I said to myself, and to my wife. But what could I do? Everybody else is giving you medals and honors and citations. So what can I offer you that's different, unique? I could not guess. I... I can offer you a job. A job? Has anyone else offered you a job? No. There has been nothing uh, definite. Well, then, I happen to know you came away from Italy without a penny. That's true, isn't it? True. Then, putting it bluntly, what's to become of you? How shall you live? A man must eat. And if you won't accept the bread of charity, he must burn it by the sweat of his brow. You have a plain way of speaking, my friend. No one has thought to offer you a job. So I must do it. What sort of job is it? Am I qualified? Oh, not really. But I'm willing to overlook that. I need a man to work in my candle factory. I see. I wish I had something better. More worthy of your magnificent talents, but well, I... No, no, I, I understand. You know, now that I've actually put it into words, I'm... I'm sure it sounds ridiculous. The great Giuseppe Garibaldi, a worker in a candle factory. I will take the job. You will? Do I have an alternative? That same day, we took the ferry boat from the island of Manhattan to Staten Island, where my factory and home were located. I insisted that he live with us. My wife was very much taken by him. Oh, poor man. What life has done to him. Isn't there anything we can do? <laughs> We're giving him room, board, a job. In the whole world right now, is anyone else doing more? But he is the hero of a hundred battles. How can he just settle down to a quiet, ordinary life? Well, my dear Leonora, we must accept the world as it is. What does he do all day? He threads wicks and softens tallow. And pours the molds. What else is there to do in a candle factory? It doesn't seem fair. Antonio, do you think he could ever go back? Where? Italy. No, not unless he wants to be hanged or shot. I mean, as the head of an army. Oh, what sort of army? A few hundred, perhaps a few thousand ragged red shirts against all the military might of Austria and France? No, the odds against him are too great. No greater than the odds against George Washington? That was different. Why? That was a miracle, if you ask me. If George Washington could create a miracle, why can't Giuseppe Garibaldi? Well, I suppose we tend to believe that miracles could only take place in the past. You know what they say, the age of miracles is over. The age of miracles began with the creation of the world and will only end... When the world is no more. She's a very good woman, my wife. Bit of a mystic, though. That's why she got along with him so well. He was quite a mystic himself. I would hear them talking of an evening. Shall you have a cup of tea, General? General? No, no, I am no longer a general. But plain Giuseppe Garibaldi. You will always be a general. No. One can only be a general if he has troops behind him and a battle in front. That day will come again. No. But you said it would. When you landed in New York, you declared that one day you would return and fight on to victory. That was something that had to be said. Even if you didn't believe it? I had failed to achieve the reality of freedom. Should I also destroy the dream? A dream can never be destroyed if you believe it. I have... Most modern methods and equipment to get your carpet, rugs, furniture, and draperies deep down clean. So hurry and place your order now. Call Magic Kiss North at 378-8600 or Magic Kiss South at 468-4800 for free tickets to the Dells. And for you stay-at-homers, ask Magic Kiss about free tickets with your order to Chicago Fire Football... Santa Fe Speedway, and Volo Antique Auto Museum. He 
kind, you would think so. But it wasn't true. Because one Sunday, I happened to go down to the docks to see about some merchandise. And there he was. Some sailors were unloading their ship. He went up to an officer, and I could hear him say... Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, I, I do not speak uh, more English. I am seaman. Able seaman. I am looking to... to sign on. But the officer paid absolutely no attention to him. It was as if he didn't exist. And I could see him go from ship to ship. It was the same everywhere. Sir... The captain, Padron, I am a sailor. I am looking for... I need... Please, please listen, I will work. I will labor for, for no money. Do not pay me, just take me aboard. Let me work, let me sail. Antonio said he saw you at the docks this morning. The docks? Oh, yes. yes. What were you doing there? Just looking at the water. Oh. You like the sea? I was raised on it. Have you ever thought of sailing again? Uh, that is, as a seaman? No. When Antonio said he had seen you at the dock, I thought perhaps you were thinking of going to sea. Going to sea? Hmm. Signing on as a sailor on a merchant ship? Oh, no, no, never. That idea would never enter my mind. Well, then you wouldn't care to be a sailor again. Well, what sort of life is it? The work is hard, the food is bad, and the pay is small. Mm, and yet, how many follow the sea? When a man is young, the sea is an alluring mistress. But, senor, there is nothing more pathetic than an elderly sailor. He owns nothing in the world except the few tattered rags on his back. And then the sailor's life is not for you. <laughs> Never. Never again. Leonora, am I late for my dinner? No, you are early. Good, good. Where's the general not home yet? No. I wonder where he can be. I am sure he is down at the docks. He doesn't want us to know about it. You know, if he's unhappy here, I wish he'd say so. Perhaps we could find something else. There is nothing else he can do. He knows three things in his life. How to lead a revolution, how to sail a ship, and now how to mold candles. There are no opportunities for revolutionists at the moment. No jobs for sailors, and so I'm afraid he must stay in the factory. But what makes you think he's down at the docks? Come with me. I approve it. Looking at that Portuguese fishing boat. Fishing boat? Mm -hmm. I must say he's lowering his sights. Look, he's trying to talk to that man. I think it's the captain. Let's move up a bit closer. But don't let him see us. He doesn't want us to know. Captain, listen. I need a berth. I'm an excellent navigator. See, see, see how well I speak Portuguese? That is because I spent many years in South America. The captain isn't even listening to him. He doesn't seem to be impressed. I am a good man. And you can have me cheap. And you can have me for nothing. Do you understand? I will work for nothing. Let's go home, Antonio. General Garibaldi, may I speak frankly? Is there another way, my good senor? I know life here must be dull and boring for you. Oh, say rather it is restful. I can understand your desire to go to sea. What makes you think I want such a thing? Oh, please. Evidently, you consider this a rather delicate matter. I certainly have no wish to pry, but... Signora Meucci. Ah, I have an uncle who is associated with a merchant in New York. This man has a small fleet of ships. We could put in a word. It is a much better way to get what you want. Signora, when have I gone to the docks to look for a berth? When? And why would I go? I have told you there is nothing more pathetic than a gray-haired sailor. A bad To I... seek a berth on the ship at my time of life? No. No, I may have lost many things in this world, but I'm sure I, I have still kept my sanity. But then, 
You weren't down at the dock looking for work. I already have work, Signora. In your husband's factory. Why, then, I suppose it wasn't you that I saw down at the docks. Of course not. I am afraid you confused me with somebody else. Perhaps I probably did. That's what she says to him now. But you know as well as I do that she's sure she was not mistaken. That he was there on the docks. That he was looking for a job on a sailing ship. On the other hand, the man's honor is beyond question. He would not tell a lie unless, of course, it is necessary for the success of some grand design. But what could possibly be at stake here? That will be the proper business of Act Two, shortly. This is E.G. Marshall with a question. Of all medications for acid indigestion or heartburn relief, which one is right for you? For years, Maalox has been recommended most by doctors. Now, the antacid ingredients in Maalox, plus an extra ingredient, are in Maalox Plus tablets. Smooth, good tasting, and Maalox Plus tablets work fast to relieve acid indigestion or heartburn. But don't just take my word for it. Try Maalox Plus tablets. You'll find you can't do better. Use only as directed. The South, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new life for those who survived its bloodshed. From this turbulent era of our great American heritage emerges the proud, passionate saga of one family, their plantations, and their dreams. Winhaven's Crisis by Marie Desjardins. The eighth book in the best-selling Winhaven saga, Winhaven's Crisis. New from Pinnacle Books, wherever paperbacks are sold. railroad car clatters through Pennsylvania's coal fields almost a century ago. Its only passenger, a doctor named Matthew Shields, beginning a 16-year special assignment for the American Red Cross. In railroad yards, on sidings, and in the great terminals, Dr. Shields would convert his home on wheels into a classroom and teach first aid and occupational safety to industrial America. And all along the way, local physicians were enlisted as Red Cross volunteers to continue the teaching effort. When the car rolled to a stop for the last time, two million people had learned first aid. The effort was called a good beginning, but only a beginning. Today, as the Red Cross begins its second century, we are proud that America still looks to us for first aid training. Now we teach over three million people every year, and we still say it's only a beginning. Red Cross, ready for a new century. Exile is a condition of life that most great men have undergone at one time or another. For the brief moments of victory and glory, there have been long hours of loneliness and defeat. Sometimes one can be in exile in the heart of one's country. Sometimes one can be in exile far from her shores. But it's still exile. And it's a time when a man must summon all of his inner resources. Or else he may remain in exile forever. But why does he feel he must lie about it? I don't know, Antonio. It's, it's, it's such a transparent thing, too. I, I really don't understand. Well, surely he knew you wouldn't have said anything about it unless you'd been there and seen him. I am sure he has his reasons. Perhaps this is the end of him. Oh, don't say that. Well, he's an old man. Old? He can't be more than 41 or 2. That's old for a fighting man, my dear. Years of sleeping on the cold ground and the rain and the snow, lack of food, constant hardship. They all leave their mark. But his work isn't finished. Perhaps not. But he is. Other men will take up the challenge. The struggle to liberate Italy will go on without him. Oh, oh. Uh, good morning, General. Oh, good morning. Oh, won't you have breakfast? Oh, there is no time. I'm late for work. Well, as your employer, I give you a lead. No, 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 no. That would be taking advantage of your good nature. Take a little bit of advantage, at least, and have a cup of coffee. You are very kind. Let us say no more about it. Well, while you're at it, some fresh rolls. Is there any news from the other side? No. No, perhaps. Perhaps I am not important enough any longer to be kept informed. Please, don't even think that. I shall soon be forgotten. And I shall never see Italy again. And who ever loved her more than I do? 
And remember, my friends, most of us must accept the land of our birth. But I chose Italy. How? If, weren't you born an Italian? I could also have been born a Frenchman. Remember, I was born near Nice. Well, why did you choose Italy? Why? Was, was, it, was it the glory of Rome? Or perhaps, perhaps, the, the merry folk songs the Italian sailors sang in the harbor? My first birth was on an Italian coastal trader. If I could only be born again and live it again... I must go, Senor Antonio. You pay me for a full day's work. And finish your roll. I can eat it on the way. Oh, poor man. But he doesn't have to be a poor man. He doesn't. There are Italian communities all over the world that would gladly honor him, offer him hospitality. He could travel, he could make speeches, he could he could live the life of a famous and popular man. That isn't what he wants. What does he want? Why does he bury himself in this isolated island off New York, Leonora? He works long, hard hours in the factory. He eats and, and, and sleeps. And visits the docks. Where he tries in vain to get a berth in some sailing ship. And why does he lie about it? Antonio, listen to me. Maybe he isn't lying. But he's saying what we know to be untrue. That's a lie. No, not if... Not if what? Well, I... I am not sure... What are you thinking of? Oh, you will say it's one of my crazy ideas. <laughs> I might as well hear it. Did you hear what he said just before? If only I could be born again to live it again. Well? That is what he wants to do. Start again. And this time he will succeed. The first job he ever had, his career began on board a ship. You're saying that he... He wants to go back to the time when he was a boy? Yes. Well, that isn't strange. Many people dream of that. But he is actually doing it. Well, how is he doing it? The young Giuseppe Garibaldi uh, that's inside him wants to get a berth on a ship. The older one has no use for it. Therefore, the older Garibaldi isn't aware of the fact that the younger one has taken him to the docks in search of a job. Oh, come on now, Leonora. That is why he denies what we saw him doing. But how is such a thing possible? I don't know. But I am sure he doesn't know what he is doing. He's a great man. Or he was. He deserves a better end than this. Why do you say end? For all we know, he hasn't even begun. certainly has unique ideas, my wife, Lenora. If I believed in such things, I would suspect that she's in league, or at least in communion, with various spiritual phenomena. She had long conversations with Garibaldi in an effort to cheer him up. You will raise another army, General? No. Have you lost hope? Hope? I've lost something more important. My bond with... Infinity. Do you understand what that is? No. Signore, no ordinary man can free a nation. The battle is long. Life is short. Experience is treacherous. One must survive. One must be attuned to the hidden signs and signals of fate. One must dream dreams and see visions... I can do these things no longer. But surely... No. The gift, whatever it was, has left me. It left me suddenly at the Battle of Rome. Let me tell you what a battle is, my dear. It is the Inferno of Dante. There is a deafening cannonade. There is the sharp, angry rattle of the rifles. And there is the terrible entanglement of thousands of men locked in mortal combat. Hand to hand, bayonets, pistol butts, fists, teeth, everything that can be used. Exile is a condition of life that most great men have undergone at one time or another. For the brief moments of victory and glory, there have been long hours of loneliness and defeat. Sometimes one can be in exile in the heart of one's country. 
Sometimes one can be in exile far from her shores, but it's still exile. And it's a time when a man must... Go to Colonel Messina. His lancers must support Leggero's brigade. Messenger, here. Tell Major Dondolo to take command of Bonnet's battalion. Runner, here they are. Tell Major Massara his bassalieri are to support the various company. Yes, the general must be the cool, calculating, impersonal intelligence. But there are times when he must also be the fiery inspiration and descend into the searing cauldron himself. Who is that? Stop! All of you, stop! Where are you running? Why are you running away? In reality, the batteries are lost. Lost? How can it be lost? You still have your horses. You still have your swords. Follow me back. No, you must not go back there alone. I will not be alone if you follow me. Red shirts, young Italy, soldiers of the Legion, draw your swords and follow me. I was lost for a moment. But you see, my dear Signora Meucci, mortal man cannot achieve his destiny unaided. How can he achieve the clarity of vision? And how can he be sure the bullets will miss him? After all, he must live long enough to perform his mission. But how? I don't know, General. In every battle, there were bullet holes in my shirt. Why was I spared? And when I was hit, the wounds were superficial. A miracle? More than a miracle. It is the decision of fate. General, I believe it is your fate to liberate Italy. I had my opportunity. I let it fall from my fingers. I no longer have the strength, the energy... You will have as much of those as you will need. I feel empty, Signora. I am dead. There is no fire in my heart, no visions in my soul. I have given up. No, you haven't. You are going about it the wrong way. You are trying to recapture your youth. No, I am not trying to do anything at all. You refuse to admit it. The end of youth is not the end of the world. You call the revolutionary movement Young Italy. Why just Young Italy? Because only Young Italy has the strength to prevail in the field. But in order to prevail, you will need all Italy. Young, old, men, women. You must no longer be just a commander of soldiers. You must become a leader of the people. I... I must go to work now. To the candle factory. It is honest labor. Yes. General, tell me, please, what has happened to you? I have been betrayed, Senor. I have been victimized by other men's stupidity, cowardice, ambition. Others have faced these same misfortunes and were able to rise above them? Yes. Yes, I know. But, Senor, they were able to do something that is denied to me. They were able to dream. This is the loss that has destroyed me. I am able to dream no longer. It is said that men in exile feed on dreams. But when dreams are denied them, how can they be sustained? The flame burns low for Giuseppe Garibaldi, alone, helpless, and devoid of hope in a foreign land. At least, until the third act. Here at Fire Station Number 3, between fighting fires, we play a lot of checkers and drink a lot of coffee. So our coffee's Kava Instant. Your move, Hogan. Full-flavored Kava's the only 90% acid-neutralized coffee. And with less acidity, no matter how much we drink, we still feel good. Oh, nice move, Hogan. In fact, we drink enough kava to put out a fire. Uh-oh, I think I'm in trouble. Saved by the bell. Kava, all the taste you want in coffee without all the acidity. 
We all love bargains, and here's your chance to get a bargain on a bargain. For this month only, Walden Books is offering fantastic bargains on hundreds of hardcover books by famous authors and outstanding publishers. We've got books by Stephen King, Rona Jaffe, Irwin Shaw, and many others, all at reduced prices. What's more, if you buy at least $10 worth from our wide selection, you'll get additional savings. So if you're looking for some good summer reading, stop by your local Walden Books this month and pick up your bargain on a bargain. Like Delta Ready. Take New Orleans, Houston, and St. Louis. Delta has more non stops to New Orleans than any other airline. Delta's good and ready to St. Louis, too, with eight timely non stops, including two from Close In Midway. You can also choose from three Delta non stops to Houston or from a dozen other departures. Delta has thrifty night coach and Supreme Super Saver fares that'll save you money to all these places. See your travel agent or call Delta for details. And next trip to New Orleans, Houston, or St. Louis, call Delta. Delta. Ready? Go. Delta is ready when you are Delta. It's ready when you are. This is WBBM News Radio 78 in Chicago. The deed itself is usually done with quickly. It is the dream that produced it that may have lasted for almost a lifetime. Most of the great happenings of history, what were they in reality? Only someone's dream that came true. But when the dream dies, what becomes of the dreamer? You say you can dream no longer, General? Yes. Have you ever wondered why? Does it matter? Is it possible you are afraid to dream? Is it possible? Yes. Ah. Then it exists only in your mind. No, senor, it exists in my heart, in my soul. I'm sick of it. I can say this now. I am sick of it, sick of the slaughter, of the agony. Does it surprise you? No. My dream was a free, united Italy. Very good. But what has it brought to those who followed me? Misery and death. And what has it done to me... I gave the cause everything. My youth, my strength, and finally, my wife. Your wife? Yes. What happened? Oh, please, please, senor. I would rather not speak of it. As you wish. Why does everyone feel they have the right to ask me the most intimate personal questions? I'm sorry. I didn't intend to... How much up. more am I expected to give up? Oh, please, General. And do not call me General. I am plain Mr. Giuseppe Garibaldi. I work as a laborer in a factory because I am not fit to do anything else. Uh, may, may I, may I make you a cup of hot tea? And do not try to humor me either. Oh, senor, senor, please, please forgive me. I, I do not know what has come over me lately. I'm not myself. No, it, it, it is all right. No, it is not. What right do I have to abuse good people who are kind to me? I understand. Believe me. I understand. It is that I am homesick. And I know I will never see my Italy again. Oh, but you will. I am sure of it. Yes. Well, I must go to work. Good evening, Carissima. Mm -hmm. Well... Isn't the general dining with us? No, I don't think so. He came home, went to his room, fell fast asleep. You know, I'm worried about him. He doesn't look well. What do you think? I agree. I think he's ill. He's nervous and excitable, and his, his hands are shaking. Perhaps we should call a doctor. <laughs> you won't hear of it. But why? Surely he needs a doctor. He was quite definite about it. He thinks if word gets out that Garibaldi has called for a doctor... People throughout the world will believe he's dying. Father! Who's that? Father! It's the general. What's he saying? Father! He's, he's calling for his mother. For a moment, we sat there frozen with apprehension. The voice of Garibaldi was calling for his mother. Then we ran into his room. We didn't know what to do. 
We just stood there and listened. Mother, mother, don't. Oh, please, mother, do not leave me. I will do anything you say. Do not leave me. You must wake him. General. General. Yes, yes, mother. Yes. General, wake up, wake up. You're having a nightmare. Don't go, mother. Don't. Oh, senora. Senora, she is dead. My mother is dead. You're dreaming, General. It's only a dream. No, she died in my arms. My dearest mother. Poor Donna Rosa. I remember when I was a child. She was still a young girl, so pretty. Now she is dead. But it is only a dream. A dream? Yes, my dear friend. A dream. But this is reality. Here, now, Staten Island, New York, the USA. It's March 19th at exactly 8 o'clock in the evening. And you must forget it. Yes. Yes, of course. And now, you join us for supper. No, no. No, thank you. Oh, at least let me bring you something hot to drink. This is very kind of you, senora. No. You are looking so much better. Uh, may I say something? You said that the terrible thing was you could dream no longer. You remember? Yes. That just before... You did have a dream. It was no dream. It was a nightmare. I have no shortage of those. Indeed, it is what all of my dreams have become. Oh, I am sorry. Signora, they say that fortune favors the brave. But I am brave no longer. I can't believe that. It is true. I refuse to believe that Giuseppe Garibaldi is a coward. There are two types of men who choose not to be brave. The first is the coward. He is afraid. The second is the wise man. He is prudent. He adds up the cost of bravery and he decides the price is too high to pay. And you have arrived at that decision? Yes. Both of us have accepted it. Both of you? Both Garibaldi's, the young one and the old one. Oh. He no longer torments me, the young one. I have convinced him the struggle is no longer worth it. But Italy must be liberated. Men like me, Signora, we were born to be dreamers. When we can dream no longer, we die. And I'm already dead. No, you're alive. You're strong, vital. No, no, Signora. It has all been drained out of me. I told you I had given everything to the revolution, even my wife. You asked me. How she died. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have cried into your purse. No, no, no. I... No, let me tell you. We could no longer hold the city of Rome. I had gathered the tattered remains of the army around me. The enemy artillery was coming closer and closer. I made a speech to the troops. Men, fortune which has abandoned us today will smile on us tomorrow. I am leaving Rome. Whoever wishes to carry on the struggle... Let him come with me. I can offer him neither food nor lodging nor money. I can only offer him hunger and thirst and battles and death. All who have the name of Italy not only on their lips, but in their hearts. Let them follow me. You must hurry, Generale. This way your horse is ready. Thank you, Medici. I must not turn around to look. But do any follow? They all follow, General. Here. Now, we must turn down this street. It is the shortest way out of the city. Uh, who is this? Anita, what are you doing here? Medici, how did she get here? You mustn't blame our good friend, my dearest. I made him bring me. But the children? They are safe with your mother. No, Medici, get her out of I here. I won't leave. My darling, we can be killed at any moment. And we shall die together. I will not permit it. My place is with you. Anita! Hurry! Hurry! Generale! We'll be taken prisoner! I should never have permitted it. But what could I do? I was lonely. But she was ill. And she told me she was carrying a child. And by then it was too late. There was no way she could be brought to safety. By then the brave legion had melted away. There were just a few of us. We were hunted fugitives in the hills. And every day my beloved Anita grew worse. She could no longer walk. We generale, we must... Here. It is that I am homesick. 
And I know I will never see my Italy again. Oh, but you will. I am sure of it. Yes. Well, I, I know it sounds hard, cruel, but do we have a choice? Giuseppe? Giuseppe? Come to me, please. What is it, my darling? Please, don't kiss me. Dear baby, you must be brave. Be quiet, Medici. How can you know what this woman has meant to me? How deeply, how truly we love each other. No, no, my dearest. You will remain with me. We will live together or die together. Listen, that is the signal. We must leave. Now an Austrian patrol is approaching. Hurry, we will have to run. Do not worry, my darling. I will carry you. Listen, Gino and Pietro are trying to hold them up. We don't have a moment to lose. Are we safe here, Medici? For now, if you look straight down from this hill, there is the sea. We will try to get a boat and make our way towards Venice. Anita, my darling, are you better? Anita, speak to me. Medici, why does not she say something? She, she is still breathing. Giuseppe? Yes, my dear. Giuseppe, I shall do to you what you never did to me. Please, my darling. You wouldn't leave me that I shall leave you. Oh, no, Anita. You heard what she said. She's dead. You, General, you must not be captured. She is dead. She, she is dead. Run quickly before they get here. I promise you, my friend, on my word of honor, she will receive a decent Christian burial. Medici, how can That's all anyone can do for her now? Run! Yes, my dear signore. I escaped. With just a few tattered rags on my back, I had lost everything. Oh, I am sorry. Now I... I shall go make more candles. General. You still call me General. I have no troops, no supporters. That isn't true. I have letters for you. I see. From Italy. From all over the world. People call to you. Let the movement rise again. But fate, fate has not called to me. Fate has not sent me the sign. You truly believe that, don't you? Yes, and so must you. Just a moment. Yes? Excuse me, Per Piacere. I, I was told a certain Giuseppe Garibaldi lives here. I know that voice. It is Medici. General. <laughs> General, it is you. Signor Maiucci. May I present Captain Medici, my close friend and comrade in arms. Your servant, Signor. What news from Italy, my friend? Ah, from Italy. And there is all kind of news. Some good, some bad. Oh, when was it ever different? The people are waiting. I know. But I no longer feel able. Medici, you have known me long enough to understand what is in my heart. To be a general, one must feel as if he has been chosen. And I no longer... <sighs> enough of that. What else? My children. Huh? They are a thriving. I can trust my mother to take excellent care of them. Uh, General, my mother. My mother. She's well? General, I have come here to tell you myself. To tell me what, Medici? What? I could not write it in a letter, my dear friend. My mother. She is dead. Ah, yes. Oh, General. I shall weep for her later. Tell me, Medici. 
how did she die? Of the fever? You, you know how these things strike? Yes. She was delirious. She thought that I was her son. You. She said, I am glad that you have decided to return to lead the fight once again. That's what she was trying to say to you. Yes. That is what she was trying to tell me. Now I understand. When did she... When did she die? It was almost... A, yes, it, it is exactly a month ago. March 19th. March 19th? See, si, March 19th. I remember. I heard the clock chime in the tower. It was exactly at uh, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. March 19th. Yes. I was with her. General? Yes. General. Once again, I am a general. Once again, I can dream dreams. See visions. Once again, destiny has decided to show me the future. It was quite a future. He returned to Italy and finally freed his beloved country from all foreign usurpers. Giuseppe Garibaldi. His name will live forever as Italy's greatest hero. And perhaps also as a part-time candle maker on Staten Island, New York. An addition to our tale shortly. I could have had rye toast, 61 calories. I could have had 11 carrots and a glass of water. You could have had a V8. Naturally low in calories and tastes great, too. I could have had a V8? V8 cocktail vegetable juice with only 35 calories per 6-ounce serving. V8, the great-tasting, healthful blend of eight country vegetables. Wow, I could have had a V8. It's never too late. I'll have a V8. Getting ready to paint your house? Get ready for this. Olympic Overcoat, the house paint that's tested tough to take on the weather, is on sale. Save $4 on every gallon. Overcoat was tested tough on homes like yours to take on the weather, the freezing rain, the driving snow, the scorching heat. Tested tough to help keep your home looking beautiful for years. And now it's on sale. So save $4 a gallon on Olympic Overcoat at participating Olympic dealers. But hurry, sale ends July 12th. The South, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new life for those who survived its bloodshed. From this turbulent era of our great American heritage emerges the proud, passionate saga of one family, their plantation, and their dreams. One Haven's Crisis by Marie Desjardins. The eighth book in the best-selling One Haven Saga, One Haven's Crisis. New from Pinnacle Books, wherever paperbacks are sold. Mr. Bob Hope. Hey, America, you're beautiful. The problem is you can look and feel beautiful and still have high blood pressure, a disease that usually has no symptoms. Yes, it could damage your heart, brain, or kidney. And unfortunately, three out of every ten people with high blood pressure don't know they have it. The only way to tell is to get a physical checkup regularly. And if you have it, it's usually treatable, but you've got to follow your doctor's advice if you want to stay healthy longer. A public service message from the Citizens Committee for the Treatment of High Blood Pressure and the Ad Council. speak of a man of destiny. But what do we mean? Is he one of destiny's men? Does destiny actually select its favorites, invest them with special qualities that are denied to the rest of us? Are some of us fated to succeed while others must fail? Why is it so easy for some, so difficult for others? On what basis does destiny choose its favorites? Is the whole thing fair? Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it. I just want to find out how I can take advantage of it. If I ever do, I'll let you know. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
news. It was the sixth straight night of rage in a British city. A thousand youths rampaging through streets, even as the Prime Minister called for peace. I'm David Jackson reporting on the CBS Radio Network. The scene was Manchester, near Liverpool, and a neighboring town, Salford. A police station was attacked, stores looted, buildings and cars set afire. Police say the violence lasted into the early morning. Now it's quiet, but whether it's over, they say, is another question. The Manchester police chief said the attacks around town were simultaneous and apparently well-coordinated. As they were being carried out, the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher appealed for calm on nationwide radio and television. And Dan Revive has the story from London. Prime Minister Thatcher said a free society can survive only when its citizens uphold the law and teach their children to do so. She said the three nights of rioting in Liverpool had, quote, horrified us all. The Prime Minister did not comment on theories that high unemployment has made young people so frustrated that they're attacking the police. But unemployment was the main topic of Mrs. Thatcher's political address, broadcast from 10 Downing Street on behalf of her Conservative Party. The Prime Minister said that workers should not demand high pay raises and that the British people should buy British products. There is no easy way. This government cares too much about the future of Britain to pretend. That's why we won't turn back. And that's why we believe you want us to succeed. And how together we're going to. In effect, Prime Minister Thatcher delivered a pet talk to a nation that seems to need one. Dan Rovies, CBS News, London. More news coming up. When you get the Hearts 2-in-1 Plus collar for your dog or cat, you know it will work, and you know it will last. The Hearts 2-in-1 Plus collar is the first collar to kill fleas and ticks for five months. A full five months of effective protection, and the Hearts collar's fast-acting odorless ingredients won't vaporize. Stays on your pet to work even if the collar gets wet. Get your pet the collar that really works and really lasts. Helps protect your home and family, too. The Hearts 2-in-1 Plus collar kills fleas and ticks for five months. Weekdays on CBS Television. Don't miss your favorite daytime dramas. Follow the continuing stories of families in conflict. Their lives changing every day. Full of turmoil, triumph, and treachery. On the young and the restless. Then, it's searing stories of romantic intrigue and hidden desires. On As the World Turns. Be sure to watch The Young and the Restless. And As the World Turns. Weekdays on CBS Television. There's more labor trouble in Poland. Dock workers staged a one-hour warning strike at Polish ports on Wednesday. And Thursday, workers at the National Airline lot are scheduled to walk for four hours. Northwest Airlines is faced with the possibility of a strike by flight attendants in about 24 hours. A spokesman for the attendants, Willie Onkola in Minneapolis, says the union's played by the rules so far. And no new contract Thursday night means no coffee or tea or anything else. Deadline still stands. Uh, we've gone through a 30-day cooling off period as required by law. Uh, this is at the end of uh, seven months now without a contract. Ours expired at the end of December 1980. Uh, we'll be legally able, able to withdraw our services from the airline at midnight tomorrow night. And if we haven't reached a settlement, uh, a complete package, uh, it'll be uh, distributed to the uh, membership. By then, we will go on strike. State workers in Massachusetts are threatening to strike on Friday unless they get paid. Lack of a state budget has kept them payless for two weeks. Officials are trying to put together some sort of package that will at least keep the workers on the job. Voter-mandated property tax cuts are behind many of the budget problems, and the Moody Investment Service cites those cuts as one of the main reasons it has now dropped its rating of Boston municipal bonds to below investment grade. The White House has announced formation of a high-level military manpower task force It'll work on ways to keep up with increased manpower needs in the 1980s. Increased needs brought on by a Reagan-backed budget buildup. More news after this. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal explained why consumers may finally get a break after two years of double-digit inflation. If information like this is important to you, you should be reading the Wall Street Journal every business day. So have a pencil ready. You want to stay healthy longer that can help keep you informed of anything happening in every phase of business that can affect your future or your company's future. Other recent stories in the Wall Street Journal reported on a movement to aid family-owned businesses through a cut in estate taxes. You would have read about the Justice Department's expanding war on white-collar crime and a new plan to get savings and loans back on their feet. 
The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 26 weeks of the journal, one for every business day of the week, for less than $1.60 per week. That's just $41 for 26 weeks. So if you're serious about business in the continental U.S., call toll-free 800-228-6600. That's 800-228-6600, except in Nebraska. You'll be billed later. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says there are 14 reactors around the country with brittle metal in reactor vessels. Metal that could crack and cause serious accidents if not corrected. Some metal becomes brittle when exposed to radiation. The NRC says it knew that would happen, but didn't think the brittling would take place so soon. There are plans to fix the reactors in question. David Jackson, CBS News. This is your White Sox station, Sports Radio 78, WBBM, Chicago. It's 11.29 now in Chicago on News Radio 78, WBBM. Good evening, I'm Regine Schlesinger, sitting in for Alan Bickley, who's under the weather tonight. Weather Command says another warm one, increasing cloudiness, warm and humid tonight, with the overnight low getting down into the mid-70s. Tomorrow, decreasing cloudiness and good news, turning a bit cooler. The high will be up near 85 degrees and even lower along the lake shore. The wind southwesterly, 8 to 18 miles an hour tonight, becoming northeast, 8 to 18 by tomorrow afternoon. And the outlook for Friday calls for partly cloudy skies and warm conditions with a 40% chance of rain showers. Over the next five days, our temperatures will be averaging 2 to 4 degrees above the normals. The normal high for this time of year is 83. The normal low is 61. The high temperature for the day was recorded at O'Hare this afternoon at 4.30. It was 94 degrees. But that doesn't make it the warmest day of the year. We reached 96 on June 29th, and the record for this date is 99, set back in 1955. Each of us has, I believe, a sense of honor. Though we don't talk about it, or perhaps even know we have it, yet we know or feel that there are certain things we simply would not do, would not say, would not permit ourselves even to think or feel. Things that would devalue us in our own eyes, cheapen us, degrade us, make us less worthy of respect even, and perhaps most of all, self-respect which is, I think, our most cherished possession. Such is the nature of the thing called honor. Such a lovely day it was. The bluest of blue skies, little shreds of pure white clouds, a pair of cardinals wooing each other in the big elm tree. It seemed there had never been such a day. And I felt triple smug as I contemplated the tea I'd set out for us. Tiny sandwiches, cucumber, watercress, and pastries so light and fragile they melted in your mouth. I sat back and looked at the others, enjoying themselves. My husband, Arthur, my son, Paul, and his fiancée, the lovely blonde Enid. What a day. What a day. Day. Precisely what I was thinking. What a day. I hereby nominate this day for day of the year. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> there never was such a day. Exactly what I was thinking, my exact words. You two do that often. Do what? I think the same thing at the same moment. The same words. Well, come to think of it, we do. Oh, wait till you and Paul have been married for 30 years. You'll see. It's one of the rewards of marriage. Uh, offsets the penalties. Oh, it's a real... Oh, only teasing, my dear. Only teasing. All the same. We agree. It's a great day. A perfect day. There'll never be another one like it. Now, you're not going to believe me, but that's what I was thinking at that very instant in those very words. I mean it. It's true. Enough about this day. What about the big day two weeks from now? What about that day? Oh, yes, the day of the Braithwaite Award. Oh, that. What do you mean, oh, that? That is a very big thing, a great honor. I know. I was just rehearsing being modest. <laughs> as befits a great man such as myself, or as I shall be once I've received the Braithwaite, 
I expect all of you to let me go through doors first. <laughs> Give me the best part of the steak. Address me as sir in low, hushed tone. Rise and bow as you enter the room. I know how to curtsy. I learned years ago in dancing school. I never knew it would come in handy, but now... Well, how would it be if we all just agreed to be silent while you talk? I think that would about cover everything. <laughs> Forget all the other tokens of respect. Just let me do the talking. And I promise not to quote from my own books. Oh, that's asking too much. What else would you quote from, Professor? Uh, Shakespeare, Homer, Plato, Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, all those fellas. David Meyer? Oh, of course. David Meyer. David Meyer? Who's David Meyer? Winner of the Braithwaite Prize last year. And Arthur's best friend. He'll be the one to present Father with the prize. Oh, how nice. Yes, isn't it? Oh, it's exciting. Of course, there's another exciting day coming up. Shortly after. Why, whatever do you mean, Paul? The wedding, of course. <gasps> Oh, yes, yes, the wedding. Are you sure you want to tie yourself to this young man, Enid? <laughs> Positive. Risky business. Now, Arthur. Marriage is full of pitfalls, hidden risks. Look who's talking, the perfect husband with the perfect wife. Enid, if Paul gives you any trouble, at any time, I want you to promise me one thing. And what's that, Professor? You'll come to me. Well, all right. Personally, I think she should come to me. Well, you're the last person to... Now, listen, there isn't going to be any trouble. They're both young and beautiful, and they're going to get married and live happily ever after. There's always trouble. Oh, you know what? It's getting chilly. Always. Why don't we go inside? Of one sort or another. Oh, Arthur, stop mumbling. We're going inside. Mm, let me help you with the tea things. Oh, thank you, dear. We'll just pile everything on this tray. Come on, Arthur. We're all going inside. You go ahead. You're not coming? Soon. I'll join you in a minute or two. Oh, Enid, let Paul carry the tray. It's too heavy for you. You sure you want to stay out here, Father? It's really getting a little chilly, Professor. Mm. Hardly any sun left at all. It's the blue hour. The most beautiful time of the day. The blue hour? I is that what it's called? Yes, the hour before the light fades. Hmm. Yes. Everything is blue, isn't it? Even the air is blue. Well, the day is going to end, but it's it's waiting, putting it off, hesitating, giving us one last chance to see all the lovely things before they vanish. Well, beautiful as it is, I'm beginning to feel a chill. So am I. Let's go in. Arthur, you sure? I'll join you presently, when the blue hour has ended. Oh, Needed and I piled into the house. We took the tea things to the kitchen and washed them. Then we went into the library, lit a little fire in the coal grate, and talked about plans for the wedding. Then Paul said he was going to take a nap before dinner. Enid had some notes to write, she said... And I, looking out the window that faced the lawn, saw that it was nearly dark. Not blue anymore, but fading to gray. And I thought with a start of my husband. He'd been out there for nearly an hour. Reproaching myself, I hurried outside. And there he was, just as I'd left him. Arthur, what's got into you? It's been almost an hour. I'd have brought you a sweater if I had any idea you were going to stay out this long. Really. At your age, you should know better. Now, come along. There's a fire in the fireplace. You can warm yourself. Arthur? Did you hear me? It's getting dark. Arthur? Are you all right? For heaven's sake, say something. Say something. Help me. What? What did you say? Help me. What do you mean, help you? With what? Help me, Emma. What do you mean? You help, help you to get up? Are you... Are you in pain? Pain? Where does it hurt? All around me. What do you mean? How can it hurt all around you? Strange. I feel... Strange. Strange. What, what does that mean? Just strange. Uh, all right, I'm going to call a doctor. No. 
Don't do that. Arthur, I can't let you sit there. Let me call a doctor. That nice one that lives down the road. No, doctor. No. Why not? For heaven's sake, why not? Because... I wouldn't know what to say to him. You don't have to worry about that. He'll look you over and... He won't find anything. Arthur, my dearest, what is it? Tell me. Tell me. What is it? I don't know. But you must know. Now you think. You think. I can't. You mean... You can't think? It just happened. What? What happened? I don't know. It it just happened. Now, sweetheart, listen, listen. We were all sitting here having such a good time. Paul and Eden and you and I. We were. Were we? Uh, You certainly remember that. I think I do. You think you do? It was only an hour ago. Is that all it was? Then we went into the house and we left you out here because you said you wanted to watch the blue hour. You remember saying that, don't you? Somebody said that. You said it. You said it was the most beautiful time of day. I guess I did. I guess I did say that. But that was before... Before what? Before... Before the terror descended... I don't know how I got him into the house and up to his room, but with coaxing and begging and threatening, I did. Otherwise, I firmly believe that he would have sat there staring into the approaching dark forever. I did the only thing I could think of under the circumstances. Every time I entreated him to let me call a doctor, he stared at me with an agonized expression and begged me not to. But I was lost, helpless, I was desperate. So I called David Meyer. David, is that you? Emma? Oh, I'm so glad I reached you. What is it, Emma? Something wrong? Terribly, David. Terribly wrong. Is it Arthur? Yes. Yes, it's Arthur. Except that it... It isn't Arthur. It isn't Arthur at all. I took it to tell me what happened. Take it easy now. Took it to tell me. I don't know how to tell you. He says he's not sick. He won't let me call a doctor. What does he say? He says... He says... The terror descended. What? What was that? The terror descended. That's all I've been able to get him to say. The terror descended. What on earth could that mean? I don't know. I don't think he knows. Do you want me to come over there? Oh, David, would you? Of course. Because I don't know how to deal with this. It's just something beyond me. David, it's an evil spirit. An evil spirit that has got into my husband. Arthur is possessed. Possessed by an evil spirit. What is the mysterious thing that can happen to any of us to transform joy to despair? Gladness to misery. Need it be a cataclysmic event? A sudden and terrible loss? A failure of effort? A failure of love? I don't think so. I think that it can come from something so minute that there seems to be no way to discover its origin. For all I know, or anybody knows, it may well be an evil spirit. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. When you're looking for a durable cord for any household need, let True Value Hardware Stores show you the ropes. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest you see their wide selection of quality rope products from well... We don't believe in evil spirits, or do we? How often do we say, I didn't do that, or I don't know why I said that? Then why did we do that unintended thing, make that involuntary remark, think that unbidden thought? Did we do it, say it, think it, feel it, or was it some discarnated spirit that slipped into us and lodged there, changing us into something we scarcely recognize and do not wish to know. What was it Emma had gasped out on the phone? 
Arthur is possessed, possessed by an evil spirit. Now, I, I, I had known Emma almost as long as I'd known Arthur. Why, I'd been his best man at their wedding and a steady visitor at their home ever since. And what a happy, cordial home it was. They'd built a serene and harmonious existence for themselves. They relied on each other for courage and support, as only two people can who love deeply. Arthur had uh, achieved distinction in his field, and Emma was happy for him without a trace of envy. What conceivably could have happened to disrupt their lives? I hurried as fast as I could to their home, and with the familiarity of long, intimate friendship, went immediately to Arthur's room. Arthur? You in there? It's David, Arthur. I'd like to come in. Arthur? Arthur, I'm coming in. How are you, old friend? Oh, 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 Arthur, don't. Don't turn away. Please don't. I'm here to try and help. You know that, don't you? No one can help. It just happened. What happened? It happened. The thing happened. Can't you tell me a little more about it? You're David, aren't you? David Meyer. Well, you know I am. My friend, David Meyer? You're not saying you don't recognize me, are you? Oh, I recognize you. Well, <laughs> you see, you can talk to me. I, I recognize you, but I don't... I don't... Yes? You, you don't what, Arthur? I don't know you. Oh, Arthur. I know your face. I know your voice. I know your name. I, I know that we've been friends for years. We were in school together. Graduated college. Yeah, I know. I know all that. You stood up for me when Emma and I were married. Yes, that's right. That's right. Then why do I feel that I don't know you? Arthur. Oh, Arthur. You are my friend, my oldest, my closest, my best, my dearest friend. <laughs> you, you don't know how you tear my heart out when you say you don't know me. You are so precious to me, Arthur. You are one of the few really valuable things in my life. And those things are rare, believe me. There are very few of them. To lose you, I'm Arthur. sorry. At least I... Think I'm sorry. I, I I'm not sure. Couldn't feel worse if I if I'd learned that you'd died. Well, perhaps that's it. Perhaps I've died. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Arthur. You're here. You're 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 well. You're you're talking to your old friend. I'm David Meyer. And your family, Emma and Paul, they're right downstairs. And Enid. Enid is there. She and Paul are going to be married. Yeah. <laughs> you see? You're perfectly all right. No. No, because you, Emma, Enid, and Paul, you're all characters in a book I read. Don't say that. Or a play I've seen, or a motion picture. And, and you know what? Tell me. I'm a character, too. I'm perhaps the leading character. I, I'm not quite sure. Oh, please, Arthur. Or am I dreaming everything? Have I dreamed my whole life? Never lived it at all, just dreamed it. I thought I was living it. Arthur, try and tell me. Try hard. What is it you feel right now? Can you give it a name? A name? A name? It must have a name. Doubt? Doubt? You said doubt? Doubt and despair and no help anywhere. And with those words, Arthur turned his face to the wall. And nothing I could say made any difference. He would not speak to me again. At last I surrendered to his indifference and left the room. Uh, downstairs, a young, pretty girl came up to me. Oh, oh you must be David Meyer. Oh, and you must be Enid, who's going to marry Paul. Yes. Paul's mother said she'd call you. Yes. 
She's very worried about her husband. Yes. She thinks an evil spirit has entered into him. Uh, something's happened to him, that's certain. Whatever it is, it happened so suddenly. Uh, how did he seem to you? I... I can't describe it. A sort of, uh, detachment. A vagueness, uh, separation from reality. Something like that. He says he feels as though he'd dreamed his life. Never really lived it. Hmm. A man like that, with all he's accomplished. He said he recognized me, but he didn't know me. What a strange thing to say. And finally, I begged him to try and tell me exactly what he was feeling. Put it into words. And he said, and a chill went through me, I can tell you. He said, doubt, despair, and no help from anywhere. Doubt, despair, and no help anywhere. Mm, that sounds familiar. You mean he said it before? No, 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 he hasn't. But somebody, somebody did. Oh, that's, that's somebody you know. I don't think so. I, I don't hear anyone saying it. I, I think I must have read it. I majored in English literature in college, you know, and I read a lot. I have an eidetic memory. I remember most things. I must have read those words. Are words very like those words? I know. I know where I read them. Henry James. Henry James. I've, I've read all of Henry James. I don't remember. No, no, his father. Henry James Sr. Ah. Yes. Yes, and it was in one of his books. It, it happened when he was feeling quite well. After a comfortable dinner... And the family had dispersed and left him gazing into the fireplace. And suddenly he, he quotes somebody. He writes, Fear came upon me and trembling which made all my bones to shake. Shakespeare, maybe. I don't know, but he goes on to say that it was an insane terror with no obvious cause. He could only think that there must be some damned shape squatting in the corner and sending out from its fettered breath personality influences fatal to life. <laughs> well, you really do remember what you've read, don't you? Well, what you said brought it all back to me. Uh, the last sentence I remember perfectly. I can see it on the page. An ever-growing tempest of doubt, anxiety, and despair with absolutely no relief from any truth I had ever encountered. What happened to him? Oh, uh, the doctors told him he'd overworked his brain. Others said, uh, and they say it to this day, that he'd suffered a collapse, possibly due to the intrusion of an evil spirit. That's Emma's theory. Mm. But I don't believe it. Do you? I don't want to. Well, then don't. Huh. Come back to see him tomorrow, will you? And the day after, and the day after that. And you? Will you look in on him whenever you can? Every day. Together, Enid, together we will exorcise this evil spirit. I left the house with a lighter heart, a springier step. <laughs> this young creature with her amazing memory and her unconquerable soul had put new life into me and fresh determination. Life gives us few friends that are durable, and I wasn't about to lose one without a struggle. By ten o'clock the next morning, I was knocking on Arthur's door. It's David Arthur. I'm coming in. I'm back, as you see. Uh, is it all right if I pull up a chair? Because I'm planning to stay a while. Stay. Thank you. I was also planning to have a little talk with you. Okay? Okay. Oh, good. I met your future daughter-in-law on my way out yesterday. Enid. Yes, Enid. She happened to remember. And she has an astounding memory, that girl. She remembered something that Henry James Sr. wrote about a... A seizure of some sort he had. Now, this was way back in 1884. Well, Arthur, it sounds remarkably like the thing that happened to you. Henry James? Senior. I look it up because I thought you might be interested. 
You are, aren't you? Yes. Now, it happened in a lightning flash, he writes. Yes, yes. And seemed like an insane and abject terror. Yes. Within ten seconds, he writes, he felt himself reduced to an absolute wreck. Yes, yes, yes. A wreck. And an almost helpless thing. Oh, yes. He wanted yes. to shout for help to his wife, to anyone. Passers by on the road, anyone at all, anyone who would protect him. Oh, poor man, poor man. I know, I know it all. No help anywhere, no help at all. Only despair, doubt. Despair. I thought you might feel better. A little. To know you're not the first. Or the only. I, I do feel better. Less alone. Thank you. Arthur, what interested me was that James felt this sudden terrible onslaught after an unusually pleasant meal with his family. He felt vigorous, even joyful. As you seem to have felt. Now, after all, you're going to be awarded the Braithwaite Prize. You knew that. I won't accept it. What? Not accept it? Oh, don't be foolish. I can't. I can't go through with it. My book's no good. Clearly, the committee thinks it's very good indeed. They don't know. They don't know if they knew. What is it they don't know? The passage on Swedenborg. Here. Here's the book. Page 138. Yes? Look at it. Look at it. All right, all right. I'll see what I mean. Swedenborg on the subject of vast station. Do you see the paragraph? Yes, yes, I see it. I see. What about it? I stole it, you fool. I stole it. Don't you recognize your own words? That night you were here, we were talking about spiritual experiences, and you uttered those very words about Swedenborg and his vast station. For heaven's sake, man, don't you remember? Well, yes, vaguely. Well, I stole your words right from out of your mouth and put them in my book. Sign my name, my name to your words. Oh, Arthur, that's all right. It's not all right. It's not all right at all. It's thievery, out and out thievery. But I didn't mean to do it, David. I, I really thought those words were my own. Or no, maybe I didn't. Maybe I knew all along they were your words, but nobody would notice. Maybe that's what I thought. Maybe I only wished they were mine. That I might have composed them if I'd been as clever as you. Half as clever. But I never have been. You know that. We both know that, how jealous I've been, so envious, wanting to be like you, sound like you, right like you. I wanted it so desperately, I was willing to steal, to try and fool everyone, fool myself, fool you. I held him in my arms, my poor tormented friend, while he sobbed his heart out. There was nothing I could say, nothing that he would listen to. I could not interrupt his mad confession to tell him that I didn't really recollect saying those words at all. And even if I did say them, I didn't consider them to be of any great value or significance. Such are the things that torture a man of honor. There is no escaping the palpable fact that men without honor lead easier lives than those who possess it. But if I can choose my friends, give me those whose sense of honor makes their lives difficult. I'd like to feel that I belong with them. I'll be back shortly with our concluding act. I could have had rye toast, 61 calories. I could have had 11 carrots and a glass of water. You could have had a V8, naturally low in calories and tastes great, too. I could have had a V8? V8 cocktail vegetable juice with only 35 calories per 6-ounce serving. V8, the great-tasting, helpful blend of eight country vegetables. Wow, I could have had a V8. It's never too late. I'll have a V8. The South. The end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new life for those who survived its bloodshed. 
From this turbulent era of our great American heritage emerges the proud, passionate saga of one family, their plantation, and their dreams. Windhaven's Crisis by Marie Desjardins. The eighth book in the best-selling Windhaven saga, Windhaven's Crisis. New from Pinnacle Books, wherever paperbacks are sold. Every day, people face all sorts of tests. Driver's tests, tests at school, and every day, tests on life. Oh, Mr. Cadwell, you're next. Oh, Mr. Cadwell, uh, please take a seat. Thanks. Are you ready for your test on life? Uh, I guess so. Well, don't worry. It's only for practice. This time, that is. First question. If your son broke your favorite fishing rod, would you, A, be understanding, or B, yell at him? Uh, was it really my favorite fishing rod? Oh, Mr. Cadwell. Uh, would you stab someone in the back to get a promotion? How big a promotion? Uh, I mean, I'm... Oh, uh, come, come, Mr. Cadwell. Well, I... Gee, I don't know. Well, you can find the answers at your local house of worship. That's where you and your family can learn about handling the everyday problems we all face. Religion in American life, Mr. Cadwell. We need it. A message from Religion in American Life, the Ad Council, and this station. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, and uh, see you later. You can count on it. Perhaps it is beginning to emerge that a sense of honor is related to that old familiar thing called conscience. But I think we will find that honor lies deeper in the human personality than does conscience. Conscience forbids acts which are not somehow right. Honor forbids those that, while possibly permissible, are somehow shameful or unworthy. Acts that a man of honor would not stoop to commit. <laughs> I was very fond of the professor. I was determined to keep the promise I'd made. I was eager to keep it. To visit the professor each day and try and fathom the strange, deep melancholia that had overtaken him so suddenly. I didn't meet with much success. Who is it? It's Enid, Professor. Oh, Enid. Does that mean you don't mind if I stay a while? I thought it might be David Meyer. Do you find it easy to talk to him? Oh, a little. Because you've known him for so long. Is that it? Uh, I know you've only known me for a short while, but I've gotten the impression that you like me. I certainly like you. Uh, don't you think we could... Well... Could you talk to me a little? Maybe not the way you talked to David Meyer, but... Well, that was different. How? How was it different? I, I, I don't know. But I feel sure that you do know. You, you just don't want to say it. Isn't that right? Well, strictly between David and me. Strictly. Oh. Well, then I don't want to intrude, but... There is something between you and me, don't you think? no. But I'm going to marry your son. Nothing. You're going to be my father-in-law. My my own father is dead, you know. I, I was hoping maybe you'd sort of take his place. At least in some ways, a little ways. Isn't that possible? Not possible. Oh. Well, then I'm going to be disappointed. A father is a father. Yes, I know, but... Uh, well, I, I hardly knew my own father. I, I was very young when he died. It's only natural that I'd want an older man to, to look up to and admire and have faith in and believe in and... Well, you really don't want to talk, do you? Can't. Can't talk. All right. I'll, I'll leave you alone then, but uh, I'm warning you. I'm coming back tomorrow... And the day after, and the day after that. Until you decide that I'm a safe person to talk to. Because I really am, you know. Edith, I'm down here. Oh, yes, I'll be right down. 
Paul's here, too. Oh, fine. Did you... Did you have any luck with him? Not much, I'm afraid. I was hoping. So was I. Ellie won't talk to me either. Except things like time to change the sheets. He just says, all right, when I say it's time. And he gets out of bed and sits in the big chair by the window and stares out. And that's more than he says to me. He doesn't talk to you at all. Oh, first he tries to make believe he's, uh, he's asleep. Then if I tell him he can't always be asleep, nobody could sleep that much, he turns over and looks at me with the saddest expression. I know, I know. If I try to say something, anything, he just turns his face to the wall again. So I leave. Seems to be what he wants. So I leave. I just give up. Well, I'm not giving up. Well, what can you do? What can any of us do? Not give up. That's what we all can do. <laughs> And I didn't give up. I went to his room every day. I talked of everything I could think of. The Braithwaite Prize, the wedding, where Paul and I would go on our honeymoon, when we planned to have our first child. If it was a boy, could we name him Arthur? Could we find a little house near there so we could all see a lot of each other? What had Paul been like when he was a little boy? Oh, everything. <laughs> Sometimes he'd say a word or maybe two, but mostly he looked at me as though I were a strange intruder on something that didn't concern me. He was breaking my heart. But he was making me angry, too. I know, Enid, I know. It can be infuriating. But you said he talked to you, David. Yes, yes, he, uh, he talked to me. He, he still does. So... Well, what did you do? What did you say? I mean, to make him talk to you. you. You must have done something. No, 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 I didn't. At first, it was just the same with me. No interest. No response. Complete indifference. I know. Oh, I know. But then, much to my surprise, my amazement, in fact, there was a breakthrough. How did it come about? What caused it? We, uh, rather I, started talking about the Braithwaite Prize. He's going to accept it, by the way. Well, of course he's going to accept it. Why wouldn't he? Uh, he had his reasons. Very insufficient ones, I might add. What were they, for heaven's sake? I'm afraid I, I, I can't tell you that. That's strictly between him and me. Funny. That's almost exactly what he said. To you? Yes. He said that talking to you was different, and I asked how. How was it different? And... Well, at first he said he didn't know, but I kept after him. I felt, I felt sure he didn't know, but he didn't want to say it out loud. And then he said, almost the same thing you just said, he said, strictly between David and me. And he repeated the word, strictly. Well, he was right. So, you're not going to tell me. No, no, I'm not. I can't. Well, if you can't, you can't. You're going to have to find your own way of reaching him. Enid, why don't you give up? Because I can't, Paul. I have. He's never going to snap out of this. Paul, you're talking about your own father. Oh, I'm starting to agree with Mother. He is possessed by an evil spirit of some kind. Well, I know it seems that way, but... That's the way it is. Face it. I have faced it. Well, then. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to give in to it. I'm not. You think you can do battle with an evil spirit? You. Why not? I imagine lots of people are doing just that all over the world. Not doing very well, are they? Well, that's no reason to quit. If we quit, we're lost. Darling, I'm not trying to depress you. But honestly, I think it's hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. David Meyer made some progress with him. If he could, then I can. I, I won't let such a wonderful man lose himself in depression. Hopelessness. Besides, he's going to be my father-in-law. Remember, when we were having tea on the lawn? He said, if you ever have any problems with Paul, come to me. It's a darn peculiar thing to say, I thought. I thought so, too. But he wouldn't have said it if he didn't have some affection for me, would he? Oh, Enid, 
Give up, why don't you? I won't. I can't. I simply can't. Paul. Yes, my dear. What now? I need to do something that will surprise him. Get his attention. Give him some sort of a of a shock. Make him notice me. Look at me. Pay attention to me. Just what do you propose to do? I don't know yet, but I'll think of something. <laughs> When I went to the professor's room the next morning, I was filled with trepidation. I had no confidence in myself at all. Perhaps I was simply arrogant to think that I could waken the professor to the joy of living, expectation of happiness, to the fun of everyday life. Paul was right. I hadn't known him long. I, I didn't know him well. He, he might think me a presumptuous intruder. All the same... I forced myself to knock at his door. David? No. It's in it again, Professor. Oh. I want you to look at something. Please. Please, won't you turn over and look at me? It's, it's a surprise. Just for you. You'll be the first person besides me to see it. The very first. Even Paul hasn't seen it. Please? Please, I want you to. Oh, thank you. It's your wedding dress. Yes. Yes, it is. You're wearing your, uh, your wedding dress. Yes, I am. <laughs> Veil and all. Mm. The wedding isn't far off, and, and when I walk down the aisle, Professor, I... I want to see you standing beside Paul at the altar. I want you there. I can't do that. Yes, you can. And I expect you to. Don't you know? Don't you know that I... I can't. Don't you know that I'm the most depraved of men? That I am jealous of my own son. Jealous that he will have you to live with, to love. That I want to be like him. I want to be him, to be young and starting life with a beautiful, loving young woman to help me through that life with hopes and expectations. That the very sight of you raises desires that I have no right to. That to see you and Paul together at the altar would make me want to kill him and take his place. Kill him. My own son. Don't, 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 don't you know all that? No. No, I, I didn't know all that. Well, now you do, so go away and leave me alone. No, I won't. But you're disgusted with me. You know you are. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm flattered. Flattered? You're flattered? Well, what woman wouldn't be? Huh. A handsome, brilliant man like you finds her attractive, desirable now... What woman wouldn't find that flattering? You, you don't think I'm a, a contemptible old man? No. I think you're a sensitive, intelligent, loving, yes, and attractive man who cannot endure the slightest, most fleeting thought that crosses his mind if he thinks it's disloyal or unworthy. You are a man of honor, Professor. Unrelenting honor. And I shall be proud to be your daughter-in-law. Before I left the room, we agreed that this little encounter would remain something strictly between the two of us. Strictly. When I walked down the aisle of the little church on that most important day, there ahead of me stood my beloved Paul, and proud and erect beside him stood my future father-in-law. As I got close to the altar, I smiled at this most honorable of men, and sweetly, with perfect understanding, he smiled back at me.
recesses of the human psyche lie the darkest of thoughts and desires. If we act upon them, we risk severe punishment. But in the minds of some, simply to think, to feel such thoughts and desires, is identical to carrying them out. Then ensues the most awful punishment of all, when the self punishes the self. I'll be back shortly. Genie, Now's your chance to get a great deal on a Genie garage door opener, the convenience appliance you use every day. With any Alliance Genie automatic garage door opener system you buy between July 1st and July 18th, you'll get a second transmitter free. That's right, a $29.95 value free, but only until July 18th. So see your participating Genie dealer today and let Genie open your doors. You've got a ticket on the Heartburn Express. And if one Rolaids tablet can't cut the mustard, you should hear this. Tums neutralizes one-third more acid than Rolaids. So when you eat more, feel more, and your stomach turns out one-third more acid, remember. Tums neutralizes one-third more acid than Rolaids. A message from CBS Television. Hello, this is Walter Cronkite. And that is the Atlantic Ocean and some of its inhabitants. We also live in a kind of ocean, an ocean of air, present with the sounds and cries of a strangely beautiful music. The first movement, perhaps, of a perpetually unfinished symphony. It's the universe, and it's my new assignment. Walter Cronkite's Universe, Tuesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. We all love bargains, and here's your chance to get a bargain on a bargain. For this month only, Walden Books is offering fantastic bargains on hundreds of hardcover books by famous authors and outstanding publishers. We've got books by Stephen King, Rona Jaffe, Irwin Shaw, and many others, all at reduced prices. What's more, if you buy at least $10 worth from our wide selection, you'll get additional savings. So if you're looking for some good summer reading, stop by your local Walden Books this month and pick up your bargain on a bargain. The shock of discovering heinous thoughts and desires within ourselves can be a critically debilitating, even fatal thing. If we cannot forgive ourselves for being less than we would like to be, we can collapse and resign from life. This is a risk, a grave risk, which is run over and over by the man of honor. Our cast included John Beale, Terry Keene, Patricia Elliott, and Bernie Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... What is Mr. Shakespeare's famous line, something like, uh, Who steals my purse steals trash, but he who filches from me my good name robs me of that which enriches him not. And we can end the quote right there. Because the Bard wrote those lines before these days of copyrights and licensing and franchises, and even so today, if you steal someone's good or even bad name, it can enrich you considerably. The truth is, you're a butterfly. How can you say that? It's a fact. Look at yourself. What's wrong with me? What do you do all day? Like a butterfly, you flit about all day chasing after... After what? Well, you have to keep active. Like a butterfly. You just move around without apparent aim or purpose. And like a butterfly, you're going to be dead by nightfall. <laughs> Our 
mystery drama, My Good Name, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A message from CBS Television. Hello, this is Walter Cronkite. And that is the Atlantic Ocean and some of its inhabitants. We also live in a kind of ocean, an ocean of air, resonant with the sounds and cries of a strangely beautiful music. The first movement, perhaps, of a perpetually unfinished symphony. It's the universe, and it's my new assignment. Walter Cronkite's Universe, Tuesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. You've got a ticket on the Heartburn Express. And if one Rolaids tablet can't cut the mustard, you should hear this. Tums neutralizes one-third more acid than Rolaids. So when you eat more, feel more, and your stomach turns out one-third more acid, remember... Tums neutralizes one-third more acids than Rolaids. Person heart to heart. Together we can move the world if we do our part by helping care for the children. Nourish them to heal those in need. Care for the children. Tomorrow for children everywhere. Please send your check or money order to CARE, Box 576, New York 10156, or local CARE office. People of this planet, it seems, have always been in need of heroes who can be looked up to, emulated, and envied. In the past, our heroes were usually roaring lions who lived forever. Today, it appears, we are obsessed with flitting butterflies who have their brief day in the sun and are soon forgotten. I know you're home. Oh, it's you. Um, well, I must say, Waldo, you've made this place a fortress. Uh, come in if you want to and hurry. You can't tell who may be lurking about on the street at this hour. Or any hour. There's absolutely no question about it, Jerry. Crime is simply out of hand. Right? Just the other day... Will you shut up for a minute, will you, Waldo? Now... You didn't mean what you said. About what? I say so many things. Uh, about... About just walking away from everything. Oh, that. Yes, I'm through with it, Jerry. Schluss concludio la comedia e finita. You can't be serious. Oh, really? Why not? But, well, nobody walks away from ten million dollars. Ooh, I'm not walking. I'm running. But you can't do it. Why not? It's my ten million, isn't it? No. No? Well, well it's not exactly ten million. It's... Well, that is just a nice round sum we use for uh, publicity purposes. Just tell me how much money I could put into my pocket right this minute if I wanted to. Well, not an awful lot. Really? I thought the money was pouring in. Yes, well, it's also been pouring out. Now, now you entertain lavishly. Now, you chartered a jet and put a hundred guests on it and flew them to a party in Paris. For the Vicomtesse d'Arville, yes. And from there, we flew to Florence, I remember. Yes, but do you know how much that cost? You said it was all tax deductible. The government pays for yes, it. Yes, but you still pay for it. It's just that... Oh, now what's the use? At any rate, those days are over. I shall disappear from sight. Well, what are you going to do? Find me some remote island in the South Seas. Just paint. <laughs> but you, you you can't do that. You you can't just leave everything. I mean, you 
Well, we have too many commitments. To whom? Various people who've lent us money. You mean banks? No, 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 not exactly. Look, we owe money to people who lend to those who don't quite qualify for the regular credit sources. Oh, I don't understand. The name Waldo Trent no longer commands respect at a bank? Now, now, don't look at it in that light. What have you done to my good name, Jerry? Who, me? I was supposed to be concerned with the designs. You were supposed to handle the money, did you? But do you gamble it away, make bad investments? Who told you? You did. The look on your face just now. Well, that, that is why you can't walk away at this time. You, you have to come up with some new design idea. No, Jerry. Well, look, now for you, it, it, it's just nothing. You put a little doohickey, a stitch, a pleat on a shirt or a blouse or a pair of jeans and you sign your name to it and they'll pay you a fortune. So I'll make another fortune and you'll gamble it away again. The answer is no. no but you have got to consider me. I have got a wife. I have three kids. Oh, you have to think of them. Why didn't you think of them while you were looting the till? Please, Waldo. Waldo, I thought I could make a lot of money for, for the both of us. Is that why you invested in a boatload of drugs? Oh, the Coast Guard blunders into one boat out of a thousand, and it had to be ours. Not ours, Jerry, yours. I won't even go into what happened to that fellow Arthur Hastings. But I swear to you, Waldo... Well, I had nothing to do with it. I know, it. I know. You turned it over to your friends. Now, listen, you have got to help me. I've helped you too much as it is. You were just a nice, happy-go-lucky accountant. Look what I've helped you become. Look at what I've become. No! No! It's over! Waldo? Waldo, look at this. Oh. It's a gun. Yes. When I left the house, that is how desperate I was. I was ready to kill you. Put that gun away. It makes me nervous. Uh, don't. Let go, let, you fool. Let, put, 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 put it away. I am not going to shoot you. Don't let go, Walter. Maybe I want to shoot you. I said let go. No. Uh, uh, Waldo. Waldo, I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to hit you. Are, are you all right? Walter. Uh, I'm going to take you to, to court. You ruined my good name, Jerry. You were going to go to jail. No, Waldo. You disgraced my name. You will pay. you call to ask me at three o'clock in the morning? Well, you get over here right away. Now, I figure you can have a ten-minute head start on the rest of the news hounds. Marty. 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 Marty, he's dead. Uh, yeah, yeah, we haven't even begun the routine yet. Walter Trent. How? Well, I see a bullet. More than one. We'll know later. What's the bruise on his forehead? Must have hit himself when he fell. Oh. So this is what becomes of you, Walter. This is how it all ends. Yeah. He's a guy, a millionaire, maybe 20 times over, would you say, Ellen? Huh? I suppose. <laughs> and yet some penniless bum on the street who owes nothing more than the breath of life is richer right now than he is. And what's going to happen to all this, though, huh? I don't know. Mm. Never did get married, did he? He wasn't the marrying kind. Uh, no wife, no kids, nobody. <laughs> What's he got to show for it, Homer? Nothing. Who's going to cry for him? All his rich and famous friends? All those beautiful people? Huh? <laughs> In a week, his name will be as dead as he is. Maybe I'll cry for him, Marty. Why? I went to school with him. Well, was he always a crazy kind of character? How did it happen? 
Well, look, you know, the place is all torn up. He, uh, I guess he must have come home and he surprised some burglar and the guy kills him. You know, happens a lot these days. And the uniform man was down the street. He thought he heard shots. He come running up here. The front door was open. He went inside and he uh, discovered the body. Did he see the killer? No, no. The guy got clean away. Why is that record playing? Oh, it was on uh, when we come in. It was on? Yeah, yeah, it's one of those automatic players that keeps starting over and over here. Yeah. I can't turn it off because the guys haven't dusted the place for Prince yet. But if he came home, as you say, and surprised a burglar, then he must have left the record player on when he left the house originally. Yeah, well, uh, maybe he forgot to turn it off, huh? May I go over there and look? Look, but, but don't touch. Sure. This is the record. Yeah, well, which is the record? The one I gave him uh, maybe five, six years ago. He didn't care for it at all. Why not? I'm surprised he kept it. I'm even more surprised that he played it. And after all these years... Hey, why didn't he like the record? Sounds like a nice little tune. Oh, it was just a private... private thing between us. Why would he play that record tonight? Hey, uh, the pack should be here any minute. You better get to a phone if you want the scoop. How many times do I have to tell you? It isn't a scoop. It's a beat. The Final Flight of the Butterfly by Helen Harper. Waldo Trent, Mr. Fashion himself. Wow. Oh. No, that's not going to do it either. Now. Oh, why can't I get the handle? Harper. Yes, Pappy, I'm working on it. Yes. I know we got the break, but we have to follow up also. Oh, oh, thank you for telling me a newspaper has a deadline. I'd have never known. Look, Pappy, for some reason, I just can't concentrate here in the office. I'll go home and write it. Oh, what's the matter with me? What is bothering me, anyhow? Why was the record player on, Marty? Uh, you came all the way down here just to ask me that. Why? I told you. He forgot to turn it off when he left the house. No. You mean you mean a person doesn't forget to turn off a record player, a light, a stove, what have you? Hmm? You'd leave a record player on. Only if you weren't really listening to it. So why can't we say that uh, he wasn't really listening, huh? Because of the record that was on it. He'd be very conscious of that record. Uh, why? I told you. Because he didn't like it. In that case, why did he play it to begin with? Because I think he was angry. The name of that song is Poor Butterfly. And that's what I called him once. A butterfly. Yeah. Why? Maybe I was disappointed in him. And what he became. Well, what do you mean? He became rich and famous. He became a butterfly. He could have become an eagle. I knew him very well. I was the only friend he ever had back in high school. Uh, was it a uh, was it a romance? No, he never had time for that. He was too busy trying to learn how to be an artist. Uh, hello, uh, you tell me uh, where are we headed. Huh? He never forgot me. He could have dropped me when he made it. Who am I? Just a reporter. Yeah, and you're a good one. I'm not one of your glamour girl columnists. I'm happy to work a police beat. You know, maybe you should have more ambition. Huh? He'd still call me once, twice a week. Just a chat about everything and nothing. I can give you an insight into that man that you couldn't get anywhere else. Hey, great, great. But uh, what can I do with it? It'll help you solve his crime. I gave him that record, I told you. It was the only time he was ever angry with me. What's this supposed to mean, he asked. It means you're a poor butterfly, I said. What are you doing, pandering to a pack of rich fools? You're a man of genius. It didn't go over very well. Well, it uh, wasn't very tactful. I thought that was the end of our friendship. But he really couldn't stay angry very long. 
The next day, he sent me some flowers. I said to him, hold on to that record. Put it away somewhere. And then one day, when you feel you have to finally face yourself, sit down and listen to it. Well? Well, what? Well, is that the whole story? What happened? Last night, he must have sat down and faced himself. That's why the record was playing. Okay, and then he got up and went out and left it on. No, not this record. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what happened. He turned it off. The thief broke in. He wanted music while he worked, so he turned it on. You say the thief broke in. Is there a sign of a break in entry? No, no, no. But these guys today, you know, they got the kind of tools. You might just as well give them the key to the house. I say Waldo was home listening to that record. The killer rang the bell. Waldo let him in. He would open the door for a burglar? It wasn't a burglar. It was someone Waldo knew. Yeah. Who? I don't know, Marty. Just give me a little time. All right. Let's all give ourselves a little time. You must admit, she's come pretty far along already. She seems to have a feel for what happened in that room. Is it possible that some people are sensitive to psychic clues? Why not? Besides, there's always a rational example when you dig beneath the surface, which we shall do when I return with Act Two. When I was about seven years old, I had a crush on this teacher. A real crush. Her name was... Miss Collins? Yes, Lucas? Could I... I, I mean, may I... I mean, can I buy your mom? After? Oh, Lucas. If you were 20 years older, I'd do it in a minute. And Lucas, it's May I. So when I found out I was going back to visit my hometown, I thought about Miss Collins. You know, I wondered if she'd really remember me after 20 years. So I got on the phone and I called her. I said, Miss Collins? Yes? This is Lucas Wade. Lucas Wade? Room 103, about 20 years ago. Oh, Lucas Wade. What a nice surprise. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. Look, I'm going to be in town next week. Could we have dinner together? Well, I wish I were 20 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> of course I will, Lucas. Thank you. Great. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. The bell system. Reach out. This is Gene King for your Better Business Bureau. The new game seems to be the electronic one. Video and portable electronic games have suddenly taken hold. And the Better Business Bureau offers this advice. Do a lot of comparison shopping because costs vary both with complexity and with the manufacturer. Play a wide variety of games, too. And find out which ones you prefer and then read your warranty carefully. Most electronic games come with limited warranties, but some don't. If yours doesn't, check out the store's repair and exchange policies. The availability of repairs should play an important part in your choice, as should the additional expenses of different so-called software packages. But most importantly, buy your game from a reputable dealer where you can count on the staff's knowledge and service. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. and it is perhaps unfortunately true that violence slumbers uneasily inside all of us and it can be awakened at any time provided the right nerve is touched or I should say the wrong one sometimes one word is enough to turn even the mildest, meekest, most placid person into a raging murderous beast provided of course it's the right word or once again I should say the wrong one now, what you're saying is he knew his killer. I'm saying it couldn't have been a thief. There are two doors to that brownstone triplex of his, front and rear. Was the rear door open? No, and it was locked from the inside. Windows? Now, ah, all of them locked, too. None of them broken. Question. Why would a thief try to get in through the front where he might be seen? Why not sneak around the back? Well, the back door was bolted shut. The front door is always easiest when there's no one home. But Waldo had been home. He hadn't gone anywhere. How do you know? I know most of his friends. 
Most of the places where he makes an appearance, no one saw him. Well, hey, now, look, he may have gone out for a walk. Him? He was scared stiff to be out on the streets at night, no. Someone he knew rang the bell. Waldo checked him out through the peephole and let him in. And that someone had come there prepared to kill Waldo because that someone was carrying a gun. And after he killed Waldo, he decided to make it look like a robbery. He turned the place upside down and took some things that were lying around. You know, your theory just went out the window. The cop on the B heard the shots. He was on the scene in less than a minute. Now, when would the guy you had time to do all that? All right. He did it before the killing. He struck Waldo a hard blow in the head and knocked him out. Then he stage managed the scene. Then when he was ready to go, he fired the shots. Well, I will say that that is uh, quite a theory. And it accounts for that bruise on Waldo's forehead. So, who was this uh, so-called friend? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Hey, great. And when you do, let me know. If you went out and used your head, instead of being satisfied with the old surprise the burglar theory, you might find the killer yourself. I know I'm supposed to be home working, Pappy. I am. All right. I just went down to police headquarters. Okay. And then I stopped off at a music store to buy a record. But this is business. Come on, Pappy, look. I finally found an approach. Please hang up and let me get to work. He was determined to become an artist. And a great one. I remember a time when we were both quite young. How's the new job, Helen? Not much, but at least, Waldo, I can say I'm a newspaper woman. <laughs> hey, you busy? I should stay home and do some chores. But I think I'll go to lunch. Come on, I'll take you. No, no, I'll take you. Waldo, how can you afford it? I have a hundred dollars. You sold a painting? Mm -hmm. Mr. Hoskins called me and said to come down to the gallery. A customer wanted to meet me. Which painting was it? Girl with the green eyes. That's me? Yeah. Did he like the way you did the eyes? Did he? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, he, he didn't notice the eyes at all. But the eyes are... Actually, uh, all he talked about was the dress. The dress? Yeah, he raved about it. The dress? You see, he makes dresses. He has a factory. He said he'd never seen a dress like that, and where did I see it? Well, I said I just made it up. <laughs> Anyhow, he wants me to sketch some more dresses for him. Are you going to do it? Well, of course, there's good money in it. I mean, a hundred dollars each. I can do two, three of them a day. Oh, that's good, Waldo. But don't lose sight of what you really want to do. Oh, oh no, no, never. This is just eating money. He bought the painting. Ooh, did he? <laughs> and he didn't say one word about the way you use color and light and shadow. Just the dress. Well, that's all he was interested in. Oh, come on, Helen. I said I'd buy you lunch. Let's pick a, a really expensive place. And that's when and where and how it all began. Walter Trent was an orphan. He was brought up in a series of foster homes. He had just enough to eat, a place to sleep, and hand-me-down clothes to wear. He never had money in his pocket. And now, suddenly... Helen, what are you doing Tuesday night? Well, I... Come uh... to a party with me. Where? You'll never guess, so I'll tell you. At Estella Van Eigen's. You're joking. Yeah, it's going to be a real celebrity bash. And you can do yourself quite a bit of good. But how? Well, Estella happened to see one of my designs. She's convinced I'm wasting my time with Milton. So I quit there. And what are you going to do? Estella and a few friends are going to back me. What do you mean? I am going to open my own salon. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah. I suppose it is. It's a, it's a very high-powered business. Well, well you, know, you know that. Yeah. I'll have to work at it night and day to get it rolling. I'm sure you will. But, uh... But what? What about your real work? My real work? Well, 
What real work? Painting. Oh, of course. When are you going to find time to paint? Well, in the very beginning, I won't. Oh. Uh, now, look, I know what you're thinking. It really shouldn't matter what I think, Waldo. Oh, but it does, it does. You are the oldest friend I have. You're the only one who paid any attention to me in the entire school. I guess we were the two misfits in the class. But we'll show everybody before we're through. Now, listen, about painting, that, that is the most important thing in my life. But why does a serious artist always have to be poor? Look, I'll just do this for a year or two. I'll make a fortune, and then I'll go back to painting. Then I'll be able to do it easily and, and comfortably without worrying where my next meal is coming from, and I'll be a better painter for it. I hope so. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'll sell out to the Philistines. I know it happens to a lot of people, but not to me. Never to me. Just, just, just trust me. Believe me. All right, Waldo. I've had nothing but poverty all my life. And I am fed up with it. That party. It was the most glittering affair of the season. It was crowded with the great, the near great... The famous and the notorious. And he was the lion of the evening. And it was there that he met Gerald Kenwood. Oh, hello, Miss Harper. You remember me? I'm Jerry Kenwood. Of course. We were introduced earlier this evening. Well, I see you remember my name and my face. Why not? Yeah, most people don't. I don't see why. It just as well. I'm not a limelight man myself. You're not? No, no, I work behind the scenes. What sort of work do you do, Mr. Kenwood? Oh, I'm an accountant. And I am also a lawyer. Estella asked me to organize a setup for Waldo. Estella, huh? Oh, well, well I'm, I'm not first name dropping. I just do a lot of work for Mrs. Van Eigens. And what kind of uh, setup are you about to organize for Waldo? Well, I tell you, Miss Harper. Within three years, Waldo Trent will be a millionaire three times over. They became close friends. Waldo Trent and Gerald Kenwood. One day, Waldo invited me to lunch. I was to meet him at Celine's. It was a sign that he had actually arrived. After all, he now had his private table. When I got there, he was sitting with Gerald Kenwood. Hello, darling. You know Jerry Kenwood? Yes. Oh, how do you do, Miss Harper? Oh, uh, call her Helen. She's practically one of the family. Uh, yeah, well, now, if you'll excuse oh, me. No, 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 Do stay and have lunch, uh, Jerry. No, I'd love to, but I do have an engagement. Nonsense. You see, Helen, darling, Jerry's quite upset uh, with now, me. Now, Waldo... No, it's true. Jerry has proposed some investments for Waldo Trent, of which I disapprove. Uh, <laughs> the fact is, you know very little about financing. I agree, but I do know how to make money. Uh, look, the trick is not to make money. It's to be able to keep money. What's wrong with keeping it in the bank? Because that way you... you uh, oh, dear, what's the use? You see, now we're starting to quarrel again. Waldo, the agreement was that I was the one who would look after all the business details. Certainly, huh? but only as they relate to our own business. What do I want with an oil company, a trucking firm, all those other esoteric enterprises? <laughs> but if you would only listen... It's at lunchtime, Jerry. Now, why don't we just decide to enjoy our meal? Well, I, I, I don't have time to eat. Well, maybe you should. You seem overwrought. Excitement does things to the gastric juices. Well, yes, well, uh, nice to uh, meet you again, Miss Harper. Uh, I'll see you later, Waldo. Oh, well. I think he was born to be angry at one thing or another. Excellent fellow in every other way, though. It's just... Just what? It seems to me he's become a sort of gambler lately. Used to be a conservative kind of guy, but... Oh, well. Let's not talk about him. What would you like to talk about, Waldo? You. Me? Well, why not? I happen to realize that every time we get together, and it's always been this way, we talk about me. I realize I'm the most fascinating person, but what about <laughs> you? All right, what about me? Don't you want to get anywhere? I'm somewhere now. You don't make a lot of money. Money isn't everything. Propaganda, my darling, circulated by the elite to keep the masses contented with their lot. Is that a fact? Oh, I should know. I'm one of the elite myself. Now, I could spill a word or two into a very receptive ear, and the editorship of a very prestigious magazine could be all yours. Fantastic salary, unbelievable perks. Thanks, Waldo. I'm happy where I am now. 
A police reporter? Who can you meet? Cops and crooks? At least I'm doing what I like. Are you? Oh, dear. You're starting that again. I don't think you've gotten any paint on your fingers in over a year. Helen, you simply don't understand. If it makes you angry, I won't bring it up anymore. No. No, no, no. Please. Please do. Always. Every time we meet. Even when we don't. Call me. Anytime. Even in the middle of the night. My painting, it's the only thing that is going to save me. From what? From, um... <laughs> I'm sliding into the pit. What pit? I, I, I can't describe it. I, I can't explain it. It's just... something that frightens me. Oh, but the painting. Now, that'll that'll save me. You're the only one who cares, Helen. You're, you're, you're my only friend. But you have hundreds of friends. Who says so? Don't you read the papers? I'm talking about friends. Keep reminding me about the painting, Helen. Keep reminding me. Promise? I promise. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> now I know everything's gonna be all right. But we know that isn't true. We know it's not going to be all right. And despite his optimistic prediction, it's possible that he knows it's not going to be all right also. He speaks of a pit. As the poet says, there are intimations of disaster. Does he see himself headed there? Why can't he change his course? We'll find out shortly in Act Three. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is the laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. Read label and follow directions. And now save up to a dollar when you buy Metamucil. Look for coupons in the July Reader's Digest. The South. The end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new life for those who survived its bloodshed. From this turbulent era of our great American heritage emerges the proud, passionate saga of one family their plantation, and their dreams. Windhaven's Crisis by Marie Desjardins. The eighth book in the best-selling Windhaven saga. Windhaven's Crisis. New from Pinnacle Books, wherever paperbacks are sold. A railroad car clatters through Pennsylvania's coal fields almost a century ago. Its only passenger, a doctor named Matthew Shields, beginning a 16-year special assignment for the American Red Cross. In railroad yards, on sidings, and in the great terminals, Dr. Shields would convert his home on wheels into a classroom and teach first aid and occupational safety to industrial America. And all along the way, local physicians were enlisted as Red Cross volunteers to continue the teaching effort. When the car rolled to a stop for the last time, two million people had learned first aid. The effort was called a good beginning, but only a beginning. Today, as the Red Cross begins its second century, we're proud that America still looks to us for first aid training. Now we teach over three million people every year, and we still say it's only a beginning. Red Cross, ready for a new century. Why do they do it? All those people who know that a course of action can only lead to their destruction. What makes them persist? Money? Fame? Some other gratification? Are these more important than life itself? Evidently, they must be. The handwriting is on the wall, and there are those who pretend it doesn't exist. Marty. Well, look who's here. They said you'd be across the street for coffee. Well, how about some? I'm on borrowed time. I've got to get back to my typewriter. Listen, please check out Gerald Kenwood. Why? I'm convinced he killed Waldo Trent. Oh, you are? He had to, Marty. <laughs> Why? It's all going to be in my story. 
What were you going to tell me about it? I can't until you get the facts for me to prove it. But how do I get the facts? It's going to be a major feature article on the life and death of Waldo Trent. But when I hand it in, Pappy is going to say to me, where are the facts, kiddo? And you know what these facts have to be. Well, how could I even get it? A signed confession by Jerry Kenwood that he killed Waldo. Without that, my story never gets off the ground. And you have to deliver that for me. Well, it's very interesting, but uh, how do you propose that I go about it? <laughs> There's nothing to it. Oh? All you have to do is abandon the he surprised the burglar theory and then do some everyday routine shoe leather police work. Take this Gerald Kenwood apart. Did he have an alibi? Uh, so what if he doesn't? Neither do millions of other folks. Come on, Marty, you know what I mean. Who's he been seen with? Is he in trouble for money? Do I have to tell you? Oh, look, hell... Marty, I'm telling you, he's the killer. One morning, I received a call from Waldo. I was alarmed. There was something in his voice. Uh, Helen? Uh, look, Helen, uh, do you suppose you could come up here right away? Waldo? Are you all right? I, I, I think I'm going to die. I'll call a doctor, an ambulance. No, 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 no. If I wanted a doctor, I'd call one myself. No, no, you. Come up here, Helen. Look at this place. Look at you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry I made you come. I'm, I'm all right now. It's, it's just that I, I thought I was going to die. What were you taking? Oh, please, Helen. What kind of drugs? Uh, they're not really drugs. They're, they're just pills. We, we had this lovely party last night, and... Uh, no, that was last week. Oh. Who can remember when it was? It doesn't matter anyhow. You're really a mess, Waldo. I can take a shower. The maid will have the place cleaned up when she gets here. Been doing any painting lately? Oh. There you go again. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. When I was a kid, I... Oh, my head. What kind of pills were they? Who gave them to me? The... Oh, yeah, it's Packy Powers. <laughs> He's this sensational new rock star. Anyhow, um... When I was a kid, I desperately needed a friend, and... You were that friend. I always think of you as, as a friend. Why don't you lie down and stop talking? No, no, it hurts worse when I lie down. And then I wanted you to be more than a friend, but I was too poor to ask you, and now I'm rich. <laughs> and so, Helen, I'm asking. Ask me when your head is clear. You're probably still hallucinating. No, I'm, I'm a little light-headed, but I, I, I know what I'm doing. I bought you a present. What is it? It's a record. It's about a butterfly. How charming. I bought it because it should have a special meaning for you. Really? What? You're a butterfly. I'm a what? A butterfly. <laughs> How can you say that? What else are you? What do you do? Like a butterfly, you flit about in the light. Your life is aimless. Oh, wait a minute. I have a $10 million business. I have franchise arrangements that'll triple my net worth. My, my. Listen to this. Net worth. Why shouldn't I have a net worth? Do you only respect poor people? I respect people who are doing the very best they can. When are you going to start painting? When I'm good and ready. Your color is coming back and you're breathing easier. I think you'll live, Waldo. I'd better be going. And you take your alleged present with you. You keep it, Waldo. Why? I have no intention of ever playing it. One day, Waldo, you'll be ready to face yourself. And you'll sit down and listen to that record. You'll feel very blue at first. And then you'll pick up a paintbrush. And try to capture that color. I thought you said you were leaving. I didn't hear from him in over a week. And then one morning he called, as if nothing had happened. We were friends again. Then I read in the papers where a man named Arthur Hastings had been found shot to death. Hastings. I decided to call on Waldo. 
darling, it's so wonderful to see you. Do you know a man named Arthur Hastings? Hastings, Hastings. Why is that name familiar? He's a fellow who's always mixed up in one shady deal or another. They suspected him of being the brains of an outfit that's stealing your labels. Oh, yes. You have no idea how unscrupulous some people are. They sew my labels into other clothes and peddle them as if they were mine. They make a fortune on my name. You have no idea how much my name is worth. This Hastings was murdered. <laughs> I wish I could feel sorry. Was he murdered on your account? What kind of a question is that? It's a question that can be answered two ways. Yes or no. How could you even assume that I... You have some unsavory friends. Helen, I can't help knowing all sorts of people. Did any of them offer to solve the Hastings problem for you? Are you saying that I was party to this murder? I'm saying that you're involved in a great many activities, many of which you may be unaware of. Would I ever approve of... Helen... You are like a babe in the woods. You have no idea how, how, how complex business can be. On the other hand, painting is really very simple. Now, that's enough. I mean it, Helen. All right. When I was a kid, I had nothing. You know that. I needed something of my own that would set me apart. And so I drew pictures. And you, from the kindness of your heart, encouraged me. But it was just, just youthful exuberance. I really don't have any kind of talent as an artist. You don't? No, absolutely not. Are you sure? If I did, why wasn't it recognized? Many artists are fated to be unrecognized in their lifetime. I only know that when people look at my painting, all they see is the clothing. And that's what I am. A designer. And you can stop nourishing my juvenile conceit and your own. Is that the way you feel about it? Yes. Then, Waldo, goodbye. You... You're angry? No. Disappointed? No. I don't want to be poor, don't you understand? There's nothing worse than being poor. I walked out of his house, I slammed the front door, and for a moment I just stood there. Should I just leave him like this? How could I? While I was debating with myself, suddenly I heard the strains of music from the record player. I ran inside again. Waldo! Waldo! Uh, yes? What are you doing? Oh, uh, uh, lis listening to some music. About a butterfly? Yes. About a butterfly. That's good. I, uh, I have to sort some things out in my own mind. That's promising. And it isn't very complicated either. Things usually, uh, are only as complicated as you contrive to make them. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll have to call Jerry Kenwood. Uh, you know Jerry. Yes. And that's what I'll have to tell him. Jerry, I'm walking out. No, no, no. I'm running out. Get rid of the business. I've had it. Have you, Waldo? Really? Oh, yes. For a long time now. Do you finally know what you want? I want to go to the South Seas and paint. Helen, will, will you come visit me? Why not? Boy, it has really been a drag, you know. You loved every minute of it. Yes, but after a while, every minute is the same as every other minute. Well, that's how things are among the butterflies. I'm going to call Jerry. When? Just as soon as I can capture that shade of blue. That was the last time I saw him alive. He called Jerry who then came over to the house and killed him. Good evening, Mr. Kenwood. Hi. It's Miss Harper. May I come in? Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, May, darling, it's a visitor for me. A uh, business. Uh, my wife's a bit under the weather. This isn't a social call. Hmm. Uh, may I offer you a drink? No, thank you. Hmm. Well, what can I do for you, Miss Harper? You can offer me a chair, and I'll sit and wait. For what? For you to read this. Well, uh, uh, what is it? My feature article on Waldo Simpson Trent. Did you know his middle name was Simpson? Oh, I know. <laughs> I think I'm the only one who did. Well, shall you read this? Miss, Miss Harper, just, just what is the meaning? The meaning is perfectly clear. You, 
but you accuse me of the murder. Why not? You did it. But yet, this is monstrous. Now, I warn you, Miss Harper. I'm also an attorney. If you so much as imply... I'm impl aware of the libel laws, Mr. Kenworth. Then how could you possibly... You killed him. You're in deep, Jerry. You could never prove it. What? That you're in deep or that you're guilty? Come on, Jerry. This isn't your style. You looted the assets, not because you're really a crook, but because you are weak. The sight of all that money simply unhinged you. I, uh, I simply must ask you to leave. I'm a police report. ...and at other home supply stores. Check the papers for the dealer nearest you. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... theater offering is called Toy Death. It involves a doll. Essentially, a doll is a figure in human form intended for a child, probably the oldest plaything in the world. But dolls are also found in catacombs, in graves dating thousands of years before Christ. They have meanings and powers almost opposite. In one country, a doll is a wedding gift. In another, it is very unlucky. Worshipped, feared, played with, a doll has been all things to all people. Good Lord! Will you look at that? It's a primitive doll. Ugly thing. I'd toss it into the fire if I were you. I wouldn't, Mrs. Fowler. Why not? Why wouldn't you burn it? I wouldn't dare. mystery drama, Toy Death, was adapted from a story by Algernon Blackwood, especially for the Mystery Theater, by James Agate, Jr., and stars Christopher Tabori and Patricia Elliott. I shall return shortly with Act One. Very where this account begins and ends is a land of contradictions, extreme poverty and untold wealth, deep spiritualism and superstition. Monkeys and cows eat while people starve. Roads are impassable, yet trains are crowded. Not only for business, but those carrying the bones of a loved one to a sacred river. Contrasts incongruous yet accepted. And in England, a young girl who has the mark of India on her cries out in fear-ridden sleep. No. Don't. Don't. Please. Don't. Don't. Oh. I can't find you. I can't see you, Daddy. Where are you? Oh. Oh. oh, a nightmare. A nightmare again. Oh, that was the worst. Oh, how long am I going to keep having them? Is it better? So clear. So real. But it's not real. It never happened. I, I, I ne never saw it happen. Isabella, are you all right? Uh, yes, Father. I, I, I'm all right, thank you. I heard you from upstairs screaming. It was only a nightmare. Oh. Goodness. Do you mind if I sit down a moment? No, better than that. Let me open the windows and let the smell of the garden come in. It's awfully warm in here. Oh. You really gave me quite a start. I'll put my robe on and come sit by the window next to you. Shall I turn up the gas mantle so we won't sit in the dark? No. No, there's light enough from that little slice of moon and the stars. Oh, isn't it 
bright in the garden. Hmm. Now, t- take the rocking chair, dear. No. no. I'll sit on the floor. All right. I might as well live. Ah, this rocker was always your mother's favorite chair. I know, Father. She made me bring it back here to England. I can see her now rocking back and forth, making little doll's clothes in our garden in Calcutta. Remember? Right under the big banyan tree. Can we please not talk about Mother? Not? Please, Father. I've noticed that when you need me, when you're frightened, you call me Daddy as you used to when you were little. Otherwise, it's Father. Well, which do you prefer? What I really prefer is to know why you keep having these terrifying nightmares. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, they're certainly terrifying to me. When I hear you cry out like that, my heart literally stops. Absolutely cold. As though I were dead for an instant. I, I'm truly sorry, Father. I, I don't know why it happens. It's getting so that I, I... I'm almost afraid to go to bed at night. I've asked you before, but... What is it you dream? You must know that. I can't tell you that. I just can't. Uh, All right. Maybe someday you will. Father. Yes? What did Mother die of? I'm not exactly sure. And I don't think anyone else is. The doctors in India didn't know. That's why we brought her back here. At night, in this room, sometimes... Well, sometimes I feel she's still alive and trying to tell me something. I wish it were true. She loved you, Isabella. Well, now, we've had our little talk to you. Feel as though you could close your eyes? I know I do. Tony Parker is coming in at nine tomorrow morning, ready to take dictation... I shall need sleep to have my wits about me. Of course you do, Father. How are the memoirs coming? Slowly. Very slowly. Tony is helping me organize the material, and I've only just begun the actual writing. Oh, dear. I'm tired. I need sleep. Well, you go upstairs and get it. If I can't settle down, I'll play with my dollies. Oh, I can't. Can't you call it your doll collection? I wish you wouldn't use those childish words. You're a grown-up woman of 20. Well, uh, I'm going. Well, it certainly is bright here. It's like living in the garden. That's what I love about it. Besides it having been Mother's room. You think you can go back to bed now? Uh, Yes, I'm all right. You go along upstairs and... I'm sorry to have awakened you. <laughs> that's that's what I'm here for. <laughs> well, I'll see you in the morning, Isabella. Have a good night's rest, dear. What's left of it? Mother. Mother. He's gone. You are over there, aren't you, Mother? You always did in your favorite rocking chair. I was sure you would come because of the new moon. It wasn't just a dream, was it? It did happen. What am I going to do now? There's no way to prove anything. If I said to anyone, did you know my father was the one who... If I said that to anyone, they'd have me put away, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? Mother? Mother? What are we going to do about him? did we get yesterday with the memoirs? Uh, d- just a moment. Is that you, Mrs. Fowler? Yes, Captain Trevelyan. Well, don't stand there on the door of my study. Please come in. Was there anything you'd like me to do? Where is our morning tea, Mrs. Fowler? 
Parker's been here since nine, and no tea. Oh, I, I'm just bringing it up, sir. We had a little problem downstairs that I, I didn't get to it. Well, what problem? Why wasn't I told? Oh, we didn't wish to disturb you, sir. Well, you have, so what was it? This morning, shortly before seven... You know my room is right next to Miss Isabella's. I heard someone trying the French doors from the outside. So I opened my window and I shouted, Go away! And this man... Well, I, I couldn't really make him out. He just buzzed off. Well, if you see this prowler again, call the police. Oh, I shall. Good enough. And um, we'll tea then as soon as you can, Miss Fosfer. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> now, Tony, I've... I've looked over what you wrote down yesterday, but I have a feeling there was something else I mentioned as you were going. Just a paragraph. I took it home to type up, sir. Let's see. Uh, something about... Yes, your first encounter with a cobra in Delhi. You said... There it was. A six-foot-long cobra eyeing me as I walked in the door. I moved to the right. It moved to the right. I moved to the left. Uh, strike all that. What? Cross it out. Leave it out. Oh, but that could be a very exciting, extraordinary part of your recollection, sir. I think you're making a big mistake, if I may say so. Mrs. Fowler. Yes? Come in, Mr. Parker. The kitchen door's open. I'm just about to scramble up some eggs for everyone's lunch. He's gone out. The captain... Without eating. Yes, someone called him on the phone, and the captain said he'd be over right away, which meant I was dismissed and won't be required until tomorrow. So I thought I'd come in and tell you. Well, you're not going all the way back to Oxford on an empty stomach. Oh, there goes the bell. Someone's at the front door. I'll get it, Mrs. Fowler. All righty, Miss Isabella. Are you married, Mr. Parker? No, I never have been. I just wondered if you'd taken any notice of Miss Trevelyan. Oh, I have, yes. Very attractive girl. Woman. She's 20. Really? Oh, sometimes she acts rather... Well, rather young, I'd say. Well, only about her dollies. Oh, please, please. I wince whenever I hear that word. She had to say anything at all. I, I prefer just to say collection. It's a bit young, you know. And how old are you? 31. And never married? Oh, too busy trying to earn my living as a writer. Oh, so you write, too. To, to afford it, I've become a stenographer for wealthy clients like Captain Trevelyan, to whom writing is a hobby. So that's what you think of my father's memoirs. A hobby? Oh, excuse me, Miss Trevelyan. I've told him as much. What's in that little parcel you have there, dear? The strangest thing happened just now. You know, when I went to answer the door, there was this... Tall, very handsome man. He looked well, just like the Sikhs one sees in the, in the East Punjab. Was he dark? Did he wear a turban? Yes, he did. That's the man. Uh, There's the man who's been hanging about this house since early morning. And he said, is this the house of Captain Hugh Trevelyan? And I said, yes, it is. And then he handed me this parcel. Well, I looked at it. It has no name on it, who it was to or from or anything. And when I looked up, He'd gone. Vanished. Well, I wonder what's in it. I have no idea. Well, why don't you open it? You don't think it's for my father? I'd say you're as much part of the house of Trevelyan as your father is. Now, here, the scissors. Come on, now. Give me that parcel. No, 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 wait. What's the matter? I don't know. I, I, I just had the strangest sensation. Tony, you too. Did you, Isabella? Yes, a kind of... Well... Emanation. I, I, I can't explain it exactly. What is the matter with you two? Are we going to open this silly package, or aren't we? In a moment. C can you describe that feeling, Tony? Well, let's see if I can. Simply. You know, Isabella, the classical language of the Hindus is Sanskrit. And our word divine comes from a Sanskrit root, meaning radiance. Radiance. Yes. Yes, I felt that, too. You see, it's nothing to be afraid of. It was rather pleasurable, wasn't it? I'd go ahead and open it and see what's inside. Good Lord. Will you look at that? Yes. It's a doll, a primitive 
doll. Yes, but not a child's doll. More like a fetish with a wax face and a body of straw. An ugly thing. I'd toss it into the fire if I were you. No, I wouldn't do I, it. I don't think it's ugly at all. It's beautiful. How could anybody make a thing like that for a child to play with? It's not a child's toy. A doll like that would frighten the wee thing half to death. It's hideous. How can you say that? I love it. Well, what's it good for? If it up to me, I'd do away with it. I'd be very careful. You wouldn't burn it. I wouldn't dare. Dolls have played a strange role in some religions. Certain ones are said to contain spirits which can influence human actions. However, isn't it possible that the sender of this odd gift simply knew that Isabella, as had her mother before her, collected dolls? And Tony, is he not perhaps finding something sinister in an object merely primitive? I shall return shortly with perhaps a few clues and a few answers in Act Two. No doubt you overheard remarks about morning tea, lighting the gas mantle, reference to the British rule of India, a clue certainly to the time of our tale, the early 1900s. However, a daughter who collects dolls and believes she communicates with her dead mother, a younger working as a secretary, and a retired army officer trying to rewrite his past are as much the stuff of today's drama as yesterday's. Tell me, what is it? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, am I? <laughs> Sorry. Is it because I carry this new doll around with me? Is it? I, I really don't know what you're talking about, Isabella. Don't you? It's been two weeks now since that man in the turban delivered it to me, and every afternoon, after you've finished Father's work, we've taken a walk to some different part of the countryside. Isabella, don't think I'm not happy about that, because I am. Even today, when we're not exploring, just sitting here in the garden with you is... is nice. But... You don't usually see an adult woman holding a kind of doll as if it were a baby. And it bothers you. Well, no, no. It, it wouldn't matter to me if it did. Of all my dollies, this is my favorite. <gasps> Why did you say this was more like a fetish than a doll? Oh, forget I said that. It's just some primitive piece, uh, probably sent to your father as a remembrance of India. I'm not so sure father wants to remember everything about India. You're not? No. Oh, you should know better than I. Has he started about my mother, how he met her and how they went together to India? I was going to say that. We're well into India, but certainly 18 years back, but not a word about your mother. Or you. Hmm, I wonder why. I put it down to being perhaps too painful. A sudden, inexplicable death. Yeah. How do you know that? Uh, Mrs. Fowler. Isn't that strange? Rock-a-bye, baby. Tony, I don't think there's anything bad about this dolly. It's just a little thing. Yes. But didn't it strike you odd the moment we were about to unwrap the parcel? I mean, you've been calling me Mr. Parker all along, so naturally I called you Miss Trevelyan. Then suddenly you said Tony, and I found myself saying to you Isabella. It was, it was the most natural thing in the world, as if we'd always known one another. I never realized that. That's so. Yes. Uh, both your parents alive, Tony? No, I, I was an orphan. I don't know who my parents were. Would you say it's logical that I sometimes... Uh, sometimes feel I can talk to my mother even though she passed away two years ago? You were very close. Not close enough. Or it might never have happened. Isabella. Yes, 
try not to think about the past too much. Sometimes I think so hard about my mother I can make myself believe she's right in my room. Yes, well, it's not a good idea. Dwelling on the past can be sad-making. I'm not. I feel happy now. I've got you to talk to, my dolly. I have the whole collection in my room. Someday I'll show it you. Uh, just let me add a few more thoughts before we end today's session, Tony. You ready? My pencil's poised, Captain. <clears throat> In all the years I spent in India, I always felt the spiritual influence of both the Bengali poet and mystic Tagore and that of Mahatma Gandhi. Well, I think that'll be it for today. Uh, by the way, uh, I understand from Mrs. Fowler you've been seeing quite a bit of Isabella. Oh, I wasn't keeping it a secret, sir. Isabella... Hasn't mentioned it to you herself? No, she hasn't. We don't talk together as much as we should. Because of her mother? What do you know of her mother? What has she told you? Oh, no, nothing, nothing at all. Except uh, that she feels very close to her, even in death. Yes. Well, uh, when you've typed up what I've dictated since Monday, you may leave. I'm off to London on business. If it gets late, we we have an extra room. It's yours. Uh, what's the time? Ah, good. I'll just make it to the station for the two o'clock. Uh, Captain Trevelyan, I'm sorry if I said anything about Isabella and her mother that was unwarranted. I'm very fond of your daughter. It was merely to let you know that... that I'm quite concerned about her. Well, Tony, it's a, <clears throat> it's a good thing she does see something of you. Bring her out of her shell. It's not healthy for a young woman to spend so much time with a collection of dolls. But what can I do? Her, her mother was just like that. Come in. Aha. Yes, Mrs. Fowler. You've got to come now. There's something quite ghastly in Miss Isabella's room, and you've got to see it. Is she all right? So far as I know. Just follow me. Just uh, across this landing, down these steps. There's a room. I don't know what to make of it. Where the door's open. That's her room. Isabella. She's not in there, Mr. Parker. She went out late this afternoon with that doll of hers. Oh, yes, I know. It's distressing. I want to show you something. Look there on the floor. What do you see? Someone spilled drops of red ink from the door huh, to the bottom of the bed. Is that what you mean? And there's more on the other side. Ah, yes, I see. From the bed of the French window... I came into her room after she'd gone out to clean up a bit. I found these marks and I tried to wash them away. I tried vinegar, fine sand, chalk... Well, they simply won't come out. Yes, ink is very hard to remove. But it's not ink, Mr. Parker. Look closely. Those little spots are very dark and thick. It is blood. Oh, probably Isabella cut herself. You don't believe that. Neither do I. Mr. Parker, could you do me a great favor? Oh, of course, anything. Captain Trevelyan won't be back from London until tomorrow... I could put you up in the spare room, which is just down the hall from Miss Isabella's. Could you spend the night here? Oh, I'd be glad to. You don't know what a relief that is. I have this awful presentiment of something evil. Mr. Parker, are you awake? I am now. Mr. Parker. Uh, coming. Mrs. Parker, what is it? You've got to come with me to the hall. Hurry. What's the time? It just struck three. I think I must be going mad. All right, all set. Look at that lightning. 
I'm glad I'm not on the road tonight. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, Mrs. Fowler, now, can you show me what it is? Yes, but we mustn't make a sound. I don't want to wake her. Now, just open the door and stand there and observe. Open what door, Mrs. Fowler? Stand where? Observe what? Mrs. Isabel's room. That ugly doll. It's alive. This is what happened. I awoke when the storm began, and I went around the house as I always do, just to make sure the windows are shut. So I went into her room, and there it was. Mr. Parker, I swear to you by all that's holy, it was walking across the floor, not the doll. Yes. I closed the door immediately and ran to fetch you. All right, all right now. What do you want me to do? I'm going to open her door very quietly. And we'll have a look. You're quite sure this is no part of a bad dream of yours? Oh, shh, shh. The room's pitch black. Now, how could you have seen anything? The light. The lightning struck and lit up the whole room. Oh, I can't make out a thing. It's going to be very embarrassing if she wakes up. But I have to know. Your eyes will get accustomed to the dark in a minute. Now look there. Can you see her bed? Yeah, uh, dimly. Do you see her hand? Do you see what's in it? Mm, I think so. It's the... Oh. Yes, uh, let's go out. Come along. I don't want her to wake up and find her. Now, Mrs. Fowler, I've looked into the room as you asked. I saw the doll, but it wasn't moving. It was lying in her hand just as I've seen her carrying it about for weeks. I really don't think there's anything to worry about. Good night. Mrs. Fowler, from what you tell me, I don't see what the problem was last night. Captain Trevelyan, you don't because you didn't see what I saw. I think you could use a week or two of holiday. There's just too much going on in this household to suit me, Captain. I am not that happy with her fondness for dolls at her age. But I have to make allowances. Her mother was very much like that, too, in some ways. Miss Isabella believes she talks to her mother. That ought to be stopped. It's not healthy. I know all about that also, and I agree. It's not healthy. I've tried to be subtle about it without alarming Isabella, but there you are. I'm... I'm hoping she'll get over it. As far as I'm concerned, it's too much. Uh, Take three weeks off, Mrs. Fowler. It'll do you good. Paid vacation. Captain... I know what I saw, and that's that. Now, it is too much of a responsibility, the goings-on in this house. It's too much to bear alone. As of today, sir, I am tendering my notice. I shall forego any severance that is due me, and instead of the customary two weeks, I am afraid five days is all I can put up with. I shall leave here, then. Five days from this morning... I do feel sorry for you, Captain. But it is not I who have been struck by lightning. Believe me. One can't really blame the good Mrs. Fowler. When the inconceivable is added to the incomprehensible, it's asking a great deal of anyone to be patient and forbearing. Especially when you consider our story takes place in an era when superstition far outweighed science. I shall return shortly with Act Three. It is said that once a Westerner has come into contact with the East, his eyes are opened. His values warp and he accepts phenomena his own culture would reject. As if the magnetic needle of one's beliefs inexplicably changed direction from pointing north to pointing east. This may explain why, one week later, Mrs. Fowler decided not to leave the employment of Captain Hugh Trevelyan. Mrs. Fowler, 
I'm glad you're not going to carry out your threat and abandon ship. I couldn't. That's what it came down to. I'd be punishing Miss Isabella by leaving her. Something's wrong. That lot of good her father is. He's always running off somewhere on business. He doesn't seem to care about her. Oh, yes, he does. But he's helpless. Oh, I don't know. He didn't impress me as a caring husband either. Now, Mrs. Fowler, should you be telling me all this? Yes, I should. That man... You wouldn't think he'd buried Mrs. Trevelyan right here in our churchyard after that terrible sickness when nobody could do anything for her? So the Trevelyans returned from India two years ago? Yes, but she was ill long before that in Delhi. The captain brought the family back to England and she just wasted away for six months before she died. Oh, I see. There's another reason I'm glad you didn't leave. Isabella and I... Well... We were getting along famously. I thought she trusted me. But since the night of the thunderstorm... When I saw that doll walk across the bedroom floor? Yes. Since that night, she's closed up completely. I've tried to draw her out. She looks at me. But she doesn't really see me. Her mind is somewhere else. The devil has entered that girl. She's under a spell. Mrs. Fowler... Let us, you and I, try to get to the bottom of this once and for all tonight. As soon as the captain is retired for the night, say, well, say half an hour later, we'll meet in the hall outside the guest room. From there, it's, it's just a few steps to Isabella's. I'm afraid we can't go into her room yet. She's still awake. See the light under her door. She's lit the lamp by her bedside. It's very late. Couldn't she have gone to sleep and left it burning? I hear something. Is she talking? Where do you want me to go? Leave here. What? Why isn't it safe? Who's she talking to? Is there someone in there with her? What do you mean it's dangerous? The dog... Yes, I remember the dog. Oh, it died in my arms so terribly. Its eyes staring at me so. Mrs. Fowler, someone's coming down the hall. The captain. Oh, we'll look stupid standing here. What do we say to him? We'll open her. We'll get inside until he passes. It's locked. Mrs. Fowler, tell me, may I ask what you two are doing here in the middle of the night? Parker, did I see you trying to open Isabella's door? Well, I, uh... You're as white as a ghost. A ghost, he says. <laughs> Captain Trevelyan, do you hear anything, any any unusual sounds coming from Isabella's room? I do, yes. What is it? Well, it's the wind in the chimney, perhaps. Mrs. Fowler, why haven't the chimney sweeps taken care of it? I don't think it's that, sir. Well, then what is it? It's a little hard to explain. Yes, well, explain it then in the morning. I don't know that it's something that can wait until morning, sir. We think it's that doll, sir. It's alive. And it's talking. Mrs. Fowler, are you repeating that nonsense you told me last week when you gave your notice? And you, Parker, are you in cahoots with this poor woman... It's an unhealthy game you're playing, and I'd I'd like you to postpone any conversation until morning. Then perhaps in the clear light of day, the both of you will have come to your senses. Good night. Has he gone? Yes. I just heard his bedroom door shut upstairs. Why don't you have to lock her door? We can get into the garden. The French doors. Good idea. I can see her quite clearly now through the doors to the garden. She's lying on her bed and her eyes are closed. I can see her lips move. She's talking in her sleep. But I don't see the doll. Mrs. Fowler, we must decide. Shall we look or shall we act? Act. I'll open the French doors. Away. I'll get it. I'll, I'll, I'll break it to pieces and throw you in the dustbin. Here, open the door and let it out. Don't you 
Mr. Irving, come here, you. Well, I've got you, haven't I? Oh, oh you horror. Oh, the child of Satan. That's what you are. What is it? What have I done? Change things now. Stop. I... Don't. 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 What did they do to you? Captain Trevelyan. There was life in it. I kicked it, and it kept crawling after me. Is this so, Tony? Word for word. Both of us could not have been mesmerized into seeing the identical happening at the same time. But the worst part, of course, is Isabella's strange involvement with this new doll of hers. Uh, have I seen it? I doubt it. It's not easily forgotten. By day, she cuddles it like a baby. And at night... At night, we heard her talking to it. In her sleep. And it answers in a language of its own, like music, like little chimes. Last night, before we came downstairs, we could hear what she was saying. Asking if she was in danger, remembering a dog that died in her arms... There was something about that dog. The dog died. The dog. Yes, so well, you, you did the right thing to tell me. I, I've been half expecting something like this. It was bound to find me. Sooner or later. They never give up. Captain Trevelyan, I think tonight, when Isabella's asleep, you should witness this yourself. Mrs. Fowler, I think you said someone sent this doll to her. It was delivered. Miss Isabella answered the door, and a man said, Is this the house of Captain Hugh Trevelyan? and gave it to her. You did say that that was the man who had been hanging about the house from early morning. Yes, remember, Captain? I told you I'd seen a man with a turban moving about in the garden one morning. You never said he wore a turban. Was he dark? Miss Isabella said so, and very handsome. Captain... Whatever it is, I think you've placed your daughter's life in great danger. Tonight, I, I shall put a stop to that. Captain, have you any idea why that doll was brought to this house? Yes, I do. It was intended for me. <laughs> I think you were wise, Captain, to tell Mrs. Fowler not to accompany us tonight. Was that two o'clock that just struck? Yes, it was. Uh, Isabella must be asleep by now. Let's open her door. Ah, she's locked it. Well, I have a key. That's it. Now, come inside. Close the door behind you. Where is this? doll. Look at the foot of her bed. That? It has... It has no arms. It's... It's all broken. Let me see. The way the little head is bent so crooked. I suppose that is a head. All I see is an open red mouth. You say Isabella likes this? Yes. It's rather mangled now because Mrs. Fowler tried to destroy it. That girl sleeps like an angel. Look at her. It's moving. I must get it away from Isabella. Careful how you handle it. It's squirming like it's real. Uh, who is it? it, it uh, it's all right, child. It's all right. Uh, I, I, I'm just taking this doll away. And the, uh, my throat! Oh. It's at my throat! Oh. Oh. He's faint. Oh, what happened? I, I saw something jump down from his neck. Is there water in this pitcher? Uh, but, uh, yes. Here. Now, you take this wet cloth. See if you can bring him round. But father, father, wake up. Wake up, father. He went for that doll, and it leaped up at his throat. And the captain just keeled over. Isabella, don't move. Don't move. 
starting to crawl across the floor. Oh! What is it? It's horrible. You don't know it? Don't you recognize it? That thing, where did it come from? Oh! Oh, I can't bear to look at it. Father, please, wake up. It's all right. It's all right. I'm, I'm all right now. Oh, well, your eyes are open. Look. Look, there's a sting in my room. It's dragging itself to the French doors. Look at it. it it's like a giant beetle. She doesn't remember it, sir. Oh, It's saying something. Let me help me get my father off the floor. Wait, wait. Oh, Slugger. Oh, Slugger. I... I don't need any help. Look. The French doors. Open. What did you see, Tony? Hand reached in and took the thing from the floor. <laughs> father. Uh. Father, are, are you all right? Uh. Isabella. I'm sorry for everything. All the distress I've caused you. I'm sorry your mother is dead. I really loved her. So much. She didn't understand love. Now, you get yourself back to bed. I think you'll sleep better now. I know you loved mother. I always knew that. Good night, my child. Tomorrow I'm going to ask Mrs. Fowler to help me take down all these dolls and give them to the children in the hospital. Good night, you two. Good night, Father. I love you. now, something else. That little broken doll figure last night said two words. Did you hear them? Yes, I did, but I couldn't tell what they were. Well, it was Hindustani. Bisalaga, that means revenge. That doll said revenge? A man doesn't spend enough time with his wife in a military job. Sometimes, if she's very far from home, she gets lonely, restless. She may be attracted to a man who has time for her. And if the husband bred by army life is of violent nature. Instead of facing the native who has stolen his wife's love, he may turn upon the faithless woman, no matter how much he loves her. In some countries, the venom of a cobra is effective. It kills slowly, lingeringly, and leaves no trace. So at last the wife dies. But what of her lover who lives? Perhaps he revenges himself upon the husband. He was in a fetish known only to a few, and from the sharp touch of which there is no escape. Are you sure, Captain, there is no antidote? Let me get you to the hospital right now. It's too late, Tony. In this desk drawer is a packet of letters and a diary. They tell everything the memoirs left out. Write it for me, will you? As for Isabella, I think she likes you. Take care of her. <laughs> Within minutes, Captain Hugh Trevelyan was dead. They were never able to define the exact cause. And so, written upon the coroner's final certificate was, Failure of the Heart. Which indeed, in many ways, is what killed him. I shall return shortly. I remembered my diet at breakfast. Ice cubes and shredded wheat. But I think I forgot my body. Don't forget your body. Remember breakfast. Rexall one tablet daily multivitamins plus iron. Help make sure you get the right vitamins even when you don't eat the right foods. Don't forget the body. Remember Rexall vitamins.
vitamins. Rexall multivitamins, now only $1.69 at participating stores. Stephen, hmm? who is ML? I don't know, dear. I found this note in your pocket. It says, send flowers to ML. Oh, that. Who is ML, and why are you sending her flowers? Sweetheart, ML stands for mother-in-law. Oh, a and you sent my mother? The FTD charm her bouquet. For mother-in-law's day? Sunday, October 25th. Now you're going to say, Doris, aren't you ashamed? No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are, Stephen. Sunday, October 25th is mother-in-law's day. Call or visit your FTD florist today. If you're in search of mysteries, where things are seldom what they appear to be, sooner or later you'll find Raven House. Welcome to Raven House. But beware, once you enter, there's no turning back. Raven House paperbacks have more ways to keep you in suspense than you could ever imagine. No! And each murderous crime is committed in its own devious way. So just when you think you've cracked one case, there's a whole new mystery waiting to be solved. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. Every time I hear about a vast flood inundating acres of farms, or a sea of fire consuming miles and miles of forests, or read about an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, I marvel at the persistence of man. I realize by what frail permission man has his temporary permit to live on earth. How tenuous is our grasp is borne out by the following story. Uh, are you sure this cable car is safe? Everything down there is awfully far away. Now, thousands of skiers use it to get to the top of Devil Mountain every winter. What's happening? Oh, we're stopping. No, no, don't worry. Just some small mechanical foul up. We're not going to fall, are we? No, 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 of course not. I can see the cable out of this window. It's fine. How long are we going to have to wait? Oh, I don't know. I have never been in a cable car that didn't reach the other side. Our mystery drama, The Silver Medal, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Roberta Maxwell and Russell Horton. crisp blue sky time of year, white glistening snowflakes powdering the Vermont valleys and mountains. The children build snowmen and skiers speed across the hills. For honeymooners Charles and Theodora West, it is June in January as they hold hands under the lap robe of a horse-drawn sleigh, which is taking them to the ski lodge. In all the years I've been picking up folk at Glacier Junction, taking them to the lodge, the train's never been late once. Well, that would have been a nasty surprise, wouldn't it, darling? Having to spend New Year's Eve on a train. Oh, Charles, that would have been simply awful. This your uh, first trip to Vermont? Well, I've been up this way before, but my wife hasn't. Cold enough for you? <laughs> I'm used to that. Oh, I'm not. You ain't got cold winters where you come from, ma'am. I come from Mississippi where snow is something you read about. You folks ski? Well, uh, I do, but my wife, uh, well, uh, she's going to be learning. I told you, Charles, I'm deathly afraid of hard places. <laughs> you can sit there and watch me. The little lady won't like riding up in that cable car if she don't like high places. Theodora will take to it like a duck to water. Uh, what's your name, sir? Perkins. You can call me Ed. Everybody does. Uh, whoa, Abraham. Whoa. 
Is this the lodge? Oh, no, ma'am, but uh, that's the ambulance coming out of the side road. Oh, the ambulance? Yeah, we're mighty proud of our ambulance, bought by popular subscription. In the winter, she's working practically every day. A lot of people get sick in Glacier Junction? From the day we ran up a skier's cable car all the way to the top of Devil Mountain, not 24 hours goes by without a broken arm, a broken leg, or a broken head. Charles, you heard what Mr. Perkins said. Skiing up here is dangerous. I don't want you to do it. Yeah, sweetheart, I've skied all my life. My dad used to bring me to Vermont every winter. I started skiing when I was ten. But not here at Glacier. You said so. Well, it doesn't matter where. A skier skis where there's snow. I got a silver medal for downhill racing when I was fifteen. Charles, you're not wearing that medal today, are you? Well, sure. I always wear it in the ski season. Now, look, you know I could teach you. You'd love it. Darling, I wasn't that keen in spending our honeymoon in a cold place. You know that. Most of my friends took the Ile de France to Europe or that new super chief to California when they got married. Well, I wish I could have afforded a honeymoon in Europe, sweetheart, but I couldn't. Oh, uh, what time is it? Oh, my goodness. It's past midnight. We miss New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. Happy 1938, dearest. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? Here we've been sitting in our room gabbing away, and we missed the whole thing. Oh, it doesn't matter. We've got all of 1938 to all of, oh, um, 1988 together, huh? <laughs> oh, hey, I-, I put some champagne outside the window to get cold. Oh, I wonder what 1988 will be like. I'll be 71 years old, and you'll be 75. It's, uh, just the right temperature. Now, wait, wait till I get the cork off. Oh, I must say, this is not a very usual way to start a marriage. But then, we're not very usual people, are we, honey? We don't have any glasses. Don't open the champagne well, yet. Uh, I've already started to. Uh, the, the cork's coming out. Hurry. Now, there are toothbrush glasses in the bathroom. I've got them. I've got them. Here, here. <laughs> oh, just in time. <sighs> Happy New Year, sweetheart. To us, darling. Yes, sir. Good morning. May I help you? Uh, you're the manager, aren't you? Uh, yes, sir. I certainly am. And you're... Uh, um... My name's West. Charles West. Uh, my wife and I checked in yesterday, and she uh. isn't feeling very well. I-, I wondered, is there a doctor in the village I could talk to? Well, it's better than that. We have our Dr. Carl Cheney staying with us. He has wife and ten-year-old boy. <laughs> They're our winter regulars, but this year the uh, doctor came alone. Do you think he's in now? Oh, yeah, he might be. You know, he's a strange old bird. He has some kind of hobby. He goes out with these surveying instruments over to Devil Mountain. Yeah, let me see here. He's in room uh, 201. Yeah, 201. I'll ring his room. Uh, Good morning. Any mail for me? Cheney, 201. Hey, Dr. Cheney, we were just talking about you. Oh, does that mean there is mail or there isn't? Uh, Let me have a look here. No, I'm afraid nothing today. I was uh, was about to ring your room, Doctor. Uh, this gentleman has a sick wife. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, uh, doctor, my name's Charles West. We arrived yesterday, and this morning, Mrs. West doesn't feel so good. Oh, dear, what a pity. Uh, did she have any ailments before she got here, or uh, any history of illness? Oh, no, she's very healthy, very athletic. Uh, rides horses, swims a lot. Uh, last night, we finished off a bottle of champagne, and Theodora went to bed feeling great. Well, perhaps she's suffering this morning from the uh, effects of last night. Well, hmm? you could be right, Doctor, but <laughs> would you mind coming up to our room and examining her? Well, I wouldn't mind in the slightest, but uh, I'm a doctor of glaciology and geology, not of medicine. However, if you'll allow me, with the uh, help of the management, I suggest the best cure for what ails your wife is the hair of the dog. Dr. 
Dr. Cheney, the moment Charles came upstairs and told me about you, I couldn't wait to meet you. Well, likewise. I, uh, I don't often get the opportunity to meet a Southern Belle. Thank you, kind sir. Well, uh, certainly anyone under 60 hasn't joined me for champagne in years. But as I told your husband, my dear, this will cure everything. <laughs> when I said to Theodora, there's a man downstairs who said what you need is the hair of the dog. I knew right away you were a civilized Yankee. Where I come from, it's like being thrown from a horse. You must get right back into the saddle again. <laughs> Cheers, Mrs. West. Cheers, Mr. West. Cheers, Dr. Cheney. Mmm, mmm, that's good. This is so adorable of you, Doctor. Do you generally go around offering champagne to we're, indisposed ladies? Uh, what, we're, uh, what we're drinking is courtesy of the lodge. Um, they want you to have a good time here. Dr. Cheney, hmm? what plans do you have for us when the bottle's empty? Oh, now, Theodora, we've taken up quite enough of the doctor's time. Well, uh, come with me into my world. I invite you. Where is that? Oh, it's not far. Right outside. Now, the two of you dress yourselves warmly, and I'm going to show you a sight unparalleled anywhere in the world. Say, we'd love to. Uh, Theodora? I can't think of a nicer way to start the new year. Don't you just adore walking through snow? Do you really? Honest? <gasps> love it. Love it. Uh, which way are we headed, Dr. Cheney? I, I, I know it's away from the lodge. Well, if I said we're headed for heaven, I wouldn't be very far off. <laughs> and how do we get to heaven? Uh, there, there. Right in front of you is the machinery that will take us there. Ah, that is a cable car. It's wood, covered, has windows, seats about six... And is pulled along by a cable that's been strung from this point uh, to the top of it, at the top of Devil Mountain. Way up there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's miles. This little box rides on that little cable all the way up there into the clouds. Gosh, you can't even see the top of the mountain. Well, when we get up there, the clouds generally clear. Oh, I don't know. You're going to take us up in this contraption across that enormous chasm... Hanging from a wire? <laughs> it's a cable, Mrs. West. The car is made of solid oak and iron, and usually there are skiers standing in line to get on it. I just don't know where everybody is today. Where do we pay to get on? No, no payment. Guests of the lodge can ride up to Devil Mountain for nothing. It is all included. It's free? Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Just look down there, my friends, and tell me, now, isn't that a glorious sight? Oh, don't, Theodora, not yet. Uh, she's a little anxious about uh, high places. No, I'm not. I've just decided. I've no more fear of heights. It's gone. Oh, oh, you're right. Oh, if you look out the window, a toy town in the valley with toy houses all covered in snow. It's lovely. Now, do you know why the village we just left is called Glacier Junction? I have no idea. Because on the other side of where we're going, uh, Devil Mountain, there is a great area left over from the Ice Age. A time when a large part of America was covered in ice. Now, that's why I come here every winter. To do what? Uh, to study it. It's the largest glacier this side of Antarctica and Switzerland. Now, I have a theory. Oh, well, what's happening? Sounds like it's coming from up there where the wheels are. Oh, my Lord. We're not going to fall, are we? Oh, no, 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 no. There's nothing wrong with the cable. Nothing snapped. I can see that from the window. Well, well we've stopped. Huh. Uh, how far are we from the mountain, do you think? Mm, a couple of thousand yards. Can't really tell because the clouds obscure everything. What? What's going to happen? I don't know. But I have never been in a cable car that didn't reach the far side. cable car with three occupants swings precariously thousands of feet in the air. 
It is as if Devil Mountain itself had suddenly held up a hand and said, Stop. You shall go no further. The little cab hangs there, swaying. I suggest you hang on also, and I shall be back with more in Act Two. had the privilege of introducing as many mystery theater dramas as I have, you get to know the voices of warning, of danger, and of premonition. To me, the moment that cable car stopped in midair was such a moment. I can only hope the young couple and the old geologist will make the best of it. Why isn't it moving yet? I'm getting awfully scared. How long have we been waiting for them to fix whatever's wrong? Well, I'd say you a good half hour. I am not sitting here any longer. I'm going to find out what's wrong. What can you do? Uh, first, I'll, I'll open the window. Oh. Yeah, I can get through this, all right. Charles. Charles, you're not going out there, are you? No, I'll be just fine. Don't you worry. Let's make him stop. He's he's climbing out the window. Let, 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 let go of me, Theodore. You want me to fall? I, I, I want to take a look at the overhead wheels. I think he knows what he's doing, Mrs. West. Come on, let him go. I won't. I will not. He's not an acrobat or a stuntman. He can't climb under the roof of this cable car. We're miles up over everything. Charles, think. Suppose you should fall. Now, now, seriously, young man, are you physically in good shape? He's the vice president of the accounting department. Who goes to the gym every day. Now, will you please get away from me? Somebody has to do something. I'm going to go under the roof to see if the wheels are jammed. If they are, maybe I can release them and pull us across. What's the point of just sitting here waiting for what? Once it gets dark, nobody can do anything. But you don't know anything about cable cars. Please. All we have to do is is be philosophical and relax and wait. Dr. Cheney, please help me convince him. Well, if your husband thinks he should be up there, obviously he wouldn't do it if he thought he was in danger. I think you're both crazy. <laughs> I'm scared. What good will it do if Charles falls off and I'm a widow less than a week after I was a bride? Trust me, Theodora, I am not going to do anything foolish. Charles! Charles, are you all right? I'm okay, darling. Don't you worry. Charles, please forget all that and come back inside. I need you here next to me. Please. They're not going to let us hang here the rest of the day. Somebody will come and fix it. Please. How goes it up there, Mr. West? What? I said, how's it coming? We're still trying to find out. Uh, you don't have a pocket knife on you, do you? Uh, no. No, sorry, I don't. It uh, looks like some debris is jammed under one of the wheels. I've got a nail file. Oh. Uh, can you use a nail file? Uh, yes, I can. Now, I'll reach down, you reach up. Uh, Mrs. West, you hand it to him, all right? Now, where is it? It's fallen somewhere into the bottom of my bag. Hi, oh, Theodora. Oh. <laughs> now, don't do that. Charles. You're hanging upside down. The nail file, the nail file. Oh, it's here in my bag. You are terrible. Suddenly this face appears upside down, right outside the car window. Oh, it's not so hard. It's a flat roof. The only thing is, the wind really lets you have it. I got fear, Dora. Will you hurry up with that nail file? Dr. Cheney, tell him to come back inside. I want him in here and alive. Uh, Mrs. West, he's trying to do the best he can. All right, Doctor. You give him the silly old nail file. <laughs> well, here it is, Charles. Good luck. Thanks. Well, up, 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 up. Oh, look at him. You mean to say he's not showing off? I wish he'd just stop that and let the cable people take care of it. Yes, well, so do I, but an hour has gone by now and they've done nothing. You see, Charles is our only hope. <laughs> Haven't heard anything from you in quite a while, West. All okay? I've got the wheels clean, but there's no tension on the cable supposed to pull us. Uh, yeah, well, that must be the trouble. Up at the wheel. 
Hey, come on down. I think you've done all you can. Is he coming down? I think so, yes. Oh, thank the Lord. I was afraid he wasn't hearing my prayer. I, I've done all I can. I'm coming down the same side I went up. Uh, watch for me and pull me in, will you? And we'll be watching, but take it easy. Take it slow. Where is he? What's happening now? Uh, nothing yet. Listen to that wind. He's got to fight that, too. Charles, are you all right? Where are you? I'm still up here. I'm, I'm trying to find the metal bars I held on to when I climbed up. What side are you looking? What side? Yeah, are you sure that's the side you came up? Uh, no, I'm not sure. I thought I could tell by where the window was open. Uh, I'm afraid we've opened all the cable car windows on both sides. Well, doesn't he remember which side he came down to get the nail file? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, do you remember which side you lowered yourself to pick up that nail file? Oh, darn it, I don't. I I've been around these wheels up here so often I've lost track. Well, okay, I, I tell you what. Are you holding on to something now? Sure, the cable. And you're on one side of the car, not the front or the back. Yes, uh, to my right is either Devil Mountain or where we came from. But the clouds have closed everything in, so I have no way of knowing. Did he say he can't see anything? Well, neither can we. Look out the windows. The clouds have surrounded us. Uh, West, West, hold on tight where you are and stamp your feet on the roof. Then we'll know which side of the roof you're on. Here goes. Good, Charlie, good, good. Now, stay exactly where you are. There's got to be another way. I, uh, I want to think a minute, okay? Anything you say, you're the doctor. Charlie. Yeah? Now, I think there's a way that's less dangerous than getting you back in here. Now, I have found some cushions. I have put them on a seat under the window you left by. Now, they slip around a lot, but Theodora is going to hold them and keep them in place while I stand on top of them, put my arm out the window, and reach up for you. Now, I think you're, uh, I think you're in the right place, so come on, get going. There, now, can, can you see me waving my hand out the window? Here I come. I'm so angry I couldn't get the cable car moving. <laughs> Okay, so far, I, I, I'm going to hold on to the roof with one hand and, and grab yours with the other. Can, can you take it, Doctor? Well, can a 65-year-old man have enough strength to support a 24-year-old with one arm? I'd say yes. I'm not worried. Okay, then. Start down. It's uh, starting to ice up. It's, uh, it's pretty slippery up here. I'm, I'm easing myself down. See first. I see his foot. It's Charlie's foot. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't find a toehold for my foot. It keeps slipping off the windowsill. I thought you were going to swing your hand down so I could grab it. Nip, nip. I got your foot. Now, uh, don't, don't kick me. I'm guiding it to the windowsill. Now, now, you feel you're standing on the sill? Uh, yeah, I, I, I found a metal bar that I'm holding on to. I'll try to... Swing the other arm down to you. Uh, ow! Oh, it's cold as ice. It's colder. Uh, doctor, my, my hand is sticking to it. Well, go on, go on. Bend your other arm down so I can grab the hand. Now, once I have got it, you are safe. Uh, is this far enough? No, I'm reaching for it, but I can't get close enough to you. Now, that's as far as I can. Wait, wait, wait. I see your fingers now. Don't move. Maybe... I can reach higher and grab them. My other hand's getting numb. My whole arm's numb. Uh, Charlie, I'm reaching up now to grab your hand uh, by your wrist. Uh, I, I got it. I got it. Uh, 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 now what? Now, now you, you've got one foot firmly on the sill. That one hand I've got. Uh -huh. Now, can you let your other hand go? Drop all your weight on me and I'll pull you in. Charlie, do you hear me? Uh, Dr. Cheney, I... I can't let go of my other hand. It, it's frozen solid to the bar. I... I can't get it off. No, don't, don't give up. So I see that the clouds are lifting. Now, there is some sun coming through, Charlie. Now, can you see? We'll just wait a little while, and the sun will melt that ice on the roof. How long will I have to wait? Not long, not long, I'm sure. Removing... 
They're pulling us over. Charlie. Ah. Uh, Charlie, are you clear of any cables or obstructions? You're not going to let him hang there until the cable car reaches land. He has got no choice. He's frozen there. So? Huh? Can you hang on till we get up there? I don't have any choice, honey. Well, I've hung on this long. I'm not taking any 3,000-foot dive now. Does whiskey mix with champagne, Dr. Cheney? Well, as a rule, I wouldn't recommend it. This isn't the time for rules. And I need some comforting whiskey. Make that two, Doctor. I bartender three whiskeys. Does your hand hurt under the bandages? Oh, it doesn't have too much skin left on it. When they'd hauled me in the cable car and climbed on the roof to get me off, it was just as hard a job to get my hand loose. And the bruises on the ankles, I don't know what else. Well, you managed to walk all right. He's all in one piece. That's all I care about. Oh, here are our whiskeys. Yeah. Well, all right. Take it out of the bill. Shall we uh, drink to us again? The Three Musketeers. Woo! Some ride. That was a near miss. I guess I'm fatalistic about that kind of thing. Keep telling myself, when my time comes, it'll happen. Death, and there's nothing I can do about it. Hey, excuse me, sir. We found this, this silver medal on the top of the cable car just now, and the engineer wondered if it was yours. Oh, uh, uh, tell him. Yes, it was, and thank him. Huh. What do you know? Oh, I'm impressed. The only medal I ever won. He was 15. It was for downhill ski racing. Sweetheart, that's what they called it. But actually, it was for stamina. See, what was I telling you, Mrs. West? He told me, Charles, that if you hadn't freed those wheels, they'd never have been able to pull us up here. Theodore and Charlie, since we've come this far to Devil Mountain, would you still like to see what it is that brings me back here year after year? Hmm, why not? We are here now. Besides, I don't think any of us are up to taking the return trip on the cable car right now. Let's go. Uh, Theodora? Sure. I always like nice surprises. It has a historical significance of untold value. But it's the sheer, stupendous beauty I want you to see for yourselves. Finish my drink. I'm ready. Oh, good. Follow me. Uh, they pack a great box lunch with coffee here. It'll be my treat. Charles? You forgot something. I did? Uh, what did I forget? Your precious silver medal. You left it lying right on the bar. We are now on Devil Mountain, the site of a Pleistocene Ice Age glacier, which means we are within hailing distance of one of the great unsolved riddles of the earth. What climactic changes caused these ice formations? And more incredible is that these ice behemoths move some as much as 150 feet a day. You can get quite carried away on a piece of ice that does that. I shall return shortly with Act Three. As Theodora thought about it later, what a strange and unreal honeymoon it was. Leaving a sheltered life in Mississippi to come north, marry a young accounting executive, Charles, he 24 and she 21, and to spend that honeymoon in a place as foreign to her as the moon. Certainly as cold. <sighs> oh, I love walking through the snow, don't you? Charles, now that isn't fair. Dr. Cheney not only bought us each a lunchbox, but he's carrying them all. Well, I'm used to it, Theodora. When I come up here with my wife and son, small as he is, he loves to carry my geological instruments, so I carry the food. Uh, oh, is this the place? Is this it? 
Yes, yes it is. About an hour's walk from the cable car. How can you tell? It's just all ice and snow to me. No, no, no. What you are looking at is a sheet of ice identical to the five million square miles, 8,000 feet deep glacial ice that covers Antarctica. Now, you just look at it and tell me, have you ever seen anything as magnificent? Carl is right. It's stupendous. To me, with the sun shining through those layers of ice, it's like a... it's like a frozen rainbow. Carl, uh, what does a geologist do besides enjoying himself? Well, observe and prove. That's our aim. I have a theory that the world is getting colder and glaciers could take over more and more land. You see, the snowfields are getting larger. The evaporation, compaction, the weight bearing down, recrystallization. I, I don't know why it is, Carl, but your your what you're saying is a, is making me very hungry. <laughs> she terrible, not a scrap of scientific interest. Well, why don't you two break up the lunch boxes right here? I've got some surveying to do, and I'll be back when I'm done. Uh, Carl, uh, this glacier now, how big is it? Uh, 75 miles long, 25 miles wide. And it keeps moving. I've got stakes I drove into it years ago that shows that. Hey, can I come see? You two go on. This sandwich is just begging to be eaten. Uh, oh, Charlie, stay here with your wife. Have lunch and appreciate one of the greatest views ever seen by anyone who isn't a polar explorer. I'll be back in half an hour. he been gone. I-, I wanted to see how he measures the movement of this glacier before it gets dark. He's been gone 20 minutes. You gobbed your sandwich, sloshed your coffee over everything. Can't you sit still and look at nature? I guess so. Hey, um, did I ever show you how to hold your body for a stem crispy? If you can do that one thing well, honey, that there's hardly any skiing you can't do. Charles, you don't have any skis on. Well, it's just a, a demonstration. Now, I'm going to get on that rise over there. So I stand up, and, and you imagine I'm on skis, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm getting itchy for you to learn, darling. The skiing's a lot different when you share it. When I got that silver medal, you should have seen the look on my dad's face. And he would have loved you, you know. When did he die? Oh, about a month after I won it. You never told me. Oh, we've had so many other things to talk about. We still don't know each other that well. We know each other well enough to get married. There's a little coffee left in the thermos. Come, sit by me and drink it. I will, I will. But uh, first, uh, now I want to show you the Stan Christie. Now, this is what is called a traverse position. Now, I'll, I'll back up a little higher so you can get the idea. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I learned this. Uh, that's how I got the silver medal. Charles! Ah! <laughs> Down there, Carl. Carl, he fell. He, he was showing me some kind of ski position. He, he didn't know there was a, a big separation in the eyes. I, I, I didn't either. I've been calling to him. He doesn't answer. I, I think maybe he's stunned. You think? No, it, it's it's, it's like a cliff. This uh, this big cut in the glacier. It was right back of him. Carl, can you get down on your hands and knees like I am? Oh, please, no, Theodora. I can't see anything. It's so deep. I heard him falling. He cried out something. I don't know what. And then silence. Carl, what can we do? Tell me what to do. Theodora, come back from the edge. We have to to get down to him somehow. Oh, he, he, he's down there. Charles! Charles, we're coming! We'll get you out! I don't know what to do, Dr. Cheney. I, I know I'm just the manager here, but I, I feel for this poor young woman. You see, every day she takes a cable car and goes up to Devil Mountain, and they, 
Tell me she sits at the edge of the crevasse and calls to her husband. Yes, I understand some of the town's people go over with her with ladders and ropes and climb down as far as they can. They keep telling her we'll find him. It's a terrible charade. Is uh, she up in her room right now? Yes, sir, I believe she is, sir. Oh, I'm going up to see her. I, I think all of us had better start telling her the truth. She has got to be told. The honeymoon is over. They're making a great deal of progress, Carl. I know they are. But I'm so worried nonetheless. It's been days, and he still doesn't answer us. He must be badly injured. But they tell me even without food, a man can live on ice and snow a long time. Uh, Theodora, you are not listening to me. Yes, I am. Theodora, I don't think Charles can be still alive. It is not possible. No. It isn't, is it? You must go home now. Charles and I, we we bought this little house in Massachusetts. And we bought dishes and linens, and they're all packed away in boxes which we were going to open after our honeymoon. And new furniture, some of which hasn't even been delivered yet. And... And wedding presents from everywhere. They're in the house all wrapped up. So I... I guess... So my home is just an empty house with boxes. That's the only home I've got. I meant for you to go home to Mississippi. To your father's, where you used to live. I can't do that. I'm not a little girl anymore. Oh, Charles. Oh, please, come back. Theodora, he can't. You must accept it. I know. I know. What was it he used to say? When the time comes, it'll happen. And there's nothing I can do about it. I shall never see Charles again. I shall never see him again, ever, ever, ever. Well, I... I would not say that. But you said there was no chance of him being alive. I don't understand. Yes, well, I, I'll try to explain. Glaciers, my dear girl, are not massive, immovable objects. They do move. And what makes them move is a river of ice running through them. Is that really true? Well, I spent a lifetime trying to prove it. So I believe Charles has fallen right to the bottom of the crevasse. Now, if my theory is fact, this river traveling back and forth, mile upon mile, will finally snake its way to the very top of the glacier. And carry Charles' body with it. Hundreds of feet? Well, miles, inch by inch, year after year. I won't live to see it, my child. But you're 21. You could. I have a 10-year-old son. Now, if he follows in my line of work, who knows? He, he might write the final chapter to my theory, for he may be on Devil Mountain to see your Charles appear. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Uh, aren't you the manager of the lodge? Yes, I've been for 45 years. Yeah, I thought I recognized you. You know, this place hasn't changed much in 40 years. It's got bigger. You've been here before. Uh, my name is Carl Cheney Jr. No, I haven't been here since I was 10. My father used to come here to Devil Mountain. He did it year after year, and then he uh, stopped coming here in 1938. Dr. Carl Cheney, where is you? <laughs> You look just like him. He was the geologist. And glaciologist. Yeah, that, that's right. He was studying glaciers. Are you in that line of work? Yes, I am. I uh, tried to take up where my father left off, and now I'm back at Devil Mountain. I've been there a month digging away. Living there? But there ain't no houses. No, well, I carry mine. It's a big tent with everything, including the kitchen sink. It's made especially for explorers. You see... My father had a certain theory which, well, 42 years later, I hope to be able to prove. So I've built a footbridge across the crevasse and cleared a deep path on the far side. And, well, I only wish that my father was here now. He was so right. Anyway, uh, there was a young 
couple father wrote about in his notes, and uh, he said if anyone could locate the wife, you could help. Wait, wait a minute. Ah, they were on their honeymoon. Yes, that's the couple. Mr. and Mrs. Charles West. Yes. Is she still alive, Mrs. West? Yes, yes, she lives not far away. Sends me a Christmas card every year. (laughs) She must be in her 60s. To think I've waited all these years for the son of Professor Cheney to invite me back up here to Devil Mountain. It's just like I remember. Snow and ice everywhere. And Mrs. West, are you up to seeing a ghost? Not a ghost, but I am up to seeing my husband, Charles. You are a surprising lady. Am I? Of course, I knew why you invited me up here. Your father told me it was possible Charles would be carried from down there all the way up to the top of the glacier by an ice river. And I have dreamed of nothing else all this time. He said it would take years, and I've waited years. Well, let's go then. You are going to see what I have been looking at every evening when the moon comes out. Hold on to the railing, Mrs. West. The moon is is so bright. We should be able to see it. Now, we, we could have waited until morning, you know, when, when the wind died down. If, if Charles is really up there, do you think after waiting all these years, I can possibly wait one second longer? Now, as you leave the footbridge here, hold on to the cable that I've driven into the ice. Uh, follow me forward into this space here that I've carved out. It's beautiful here. Oh, like being inside a solid piece of milky glass. And the moonlight shining through it makes everything so clear. Yes, uh, now over here I've cut into the path of the river. Now it's wound its way up through here, passes and goes on through the next glacier. What you're seeing is ice water that started dozens of years ago, way down, hundreds of feet. And it's pushed its way up and up until it's finally here. But where is that? Here, wait, I've uh, got to chip away uh, more along here where where I can't see through the ice. Let me do it. Is this the axe? Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, Mrs. West, be careful of that ice axe. You'll hurt yourself. How do you think I've lived all these years? I've chopped wood. I can chop ice. Oh. Uh, please, uh, please, Mrs. West, please, here, let me. Oh, Come, please. I'm doing fine. I know what I'm doing. Just making it wider where the river is flowing past us. Please be careful. You could weaken the whole ice cave. Nonsense. This ice is as hard as a rock. Mrs. W- Mrs. West, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. But the, but the whole wall of ice has come down in front of us. Look. Wow. He's there. It's my own darling child. It, it's fantastic. There he is, encased in ice, as, as, as though... As though as... He, he was just there asleep. Every blonde hair of his head. If you could only know how I feel, I mean... Think. This is how he must have looked to my father 42 years ago. Charles? Oh, darling Charles. How young he looks. How darling young. And the metal... He got for skiing. Do you see it around his neck? Yes. Yes, I do. It's just a foot of ice between where we're standing and your husband. I think, Mrs. West, we should both go. Yes. I've seen him. I don't think there's anything more in the world for me to live for now. Would you take me back? down the mountain. 
I want to go home. Young Charles West had actually, as the old geologist predicted, traveled in time from the bottom of the glacier to the top. Theodora West did go back to her little home and very shortly thereafter joined her husband in death. In that Massachusetts town, they buried her and at last the couple was together. Theodora and Charles West, side by side, a boy of 24 and his 64-year-old bride. I shall return shortly. is a fearful thing, says a character in Shakespeare, to die and we go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction, in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about, unquote. Who dares tell me Shakespeare didn't write all plots and possibilities before anyone else? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Today's mystery drama is drawn from life. When the curtain rises on this presentation of the Mystery Theater, you will be drawn into that maelstrom that in our lifetime has affected more people than in any century before this the Holocaust. But we are not here to survey millions. This is one woman's vengeance. An eye for an eye and blood for blood. Carl, I was so worried. You staying out so late and not coming home until morning. I was afraid to. Afraid of me? Your wife? Why didn't you call me? I was afraid the telephone was tapped. Why would they do that? Anna, the past is returning to haunt me. I must be careful. I think I am a marked man. Our mystery drama, The Final Step, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Marion Seldes and Roberta Maxwell. I shall return shortly with Act One. Ohio is Junior Miss. Thursday on CBS Television. The first runner-up, winner of an eight thousand dollars. It's the twenty-fourth annual is... America's Junior Miss pageant. Lauren Green will host as fifty high school seniors compete to win the title of America's Junior Miss. Don't miss the America's Junior Miss pageant. Thursday at eight seven Central and North on CBS Television. Pat Summerall to suggest that a good place to start pursuing your outside interest is inside True Value Hardware Stores, where you'll find a wide selection of their own quality West Point bicycles to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Biking is a good way to take in the summer scenery. West Point bicycles come in a wide range of sizes and models so that almost anyone can take advantage of this healthy mode of transportation. And remember, West Point bicycles are sold exclusively by participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Can't he see the difference between the letters B and D? He won't stop talking for five minutes. Why won't she behave at school? He won't sit still. My child tries so hard, why can't he learn? He can't distinguish his right hand from his left. Why can't she remember how to tie her shoes? He's impossible to live with. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. These frequent complaints of parents can actually be symptoms of a child with learning disability. 
problems in language and math, lack of coordination, disorganization, and hyperactivity are just a few indications of this problem. The keys to helping a child with a learning disability are early detection and special teaching. For further information on recognizing learning disabilities and to receive a free copy of Their World, a publication of FCLD, Write LD, Box 2929, Grand Central Station, New York, 10163. The time is now. It is late evening. Fog rolls in across the Jersey Meadows. On the turnpike, cars venture carefully, making allowances for vision obscured through their windshields. Up ahead, flares announce an accident. Like an overturned bug sprawled across the highway, a sedan lies on its roof. An ambulance swings away with its passenger. I'm a medic, ma'am. I'm not a policeman. You don't have to explain anything to me. Uh, the trooper behind us will ask all the questions when we get to the hospital. I'm sorry about all this. Now, are you from Market Street Hospital? Yeah, how'd you know? You're a, a paramedic with the ambulance service. I, do I know you? No, no, I, I work at General Hospital. I'm a nurse's aide. No kidding. Yeah, what lousy luck for you. I mean, it's good luck that you're getting out of the wreck. It, you know, it could have been worse. Uh, did I make the bandage on your arm too tight? No, no, it's all right. I'm fine. You sure? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I better do it again. Hmm? Oh, it, it is too tight. Look, I'll redo it nice and easy and careful. Don't you worry. There, it's all off. Hey, what are those numbers on your arm? What do you know? You mind me asking what does uh, one eight three 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 mean, huh? It was out. The tattoo I'd hidden for years from everybody except Jacob. Marks no one had ever seen since I'd grown up. They couldn't find anything wrong with me at the hospital, and I called home. You what? I'm all right, Jacob. I'm all right. I was beginning to get really worried. I was just going to call the police. Yes, you don't have to. I'm right here at General... Come to the emergency entrance. There's a state trooper here. He's going to ask me some questions. Sweetheart, are you sure you're all right? I'm fine. Uh, the car is a mess. I can go home as soon as you come to get me. I'll be there in half an hour. Well, hurry, will you, darling? Of course I will. But I'm not going to go so fast on a foggy night to have an accident like some people I know. Oh. How did it happen? I'll tell you the whole story as soon as you get here. Goodbye. Uh, oh, I'd like to know the whole story, too. Uh, are you Mrs. Naomi Berger? Yes, I am. Yes, well, my name is Johnson. I'm a state trooper. I know. I can tell by your hat. Mm. Well, I, I'm sorry to have to detain you this late at night, but I have to file this report. My husband won't be here right away. He drives so slowly. Yes, it's not a bad idea. You're pretty lucky, Mrs. Berger. I mean, real lucky, I'd say. Car turned over like that. And uh, now the doctor tells me a couple of bruises and scratches. Do you think you can remember what happened? Oh, yes. And did you ask the other driver? Well, there was another driver? Well, the man who stopped short in front of me, he caused the whole thing. Oh. Well, uh, there was nobody there but you when we got there. Uh, what can you tell me? I was behind a car and he suddenly put on his brakes and I tried to avoid him and... Then I'm not exactly sure what happened after that. According to a witness, your car climbed the guardrail and then flipped over. Yes, yes. Well, uh, could you describe the car in front of you that suddenly stopped? I don't think so. It all happened so fast. Uh, well, I don't suppose you saw anything of the license plate, did you? Yes, I did. There were three threes in it. And the letter A. The letter A and three, three. Now, uh, do you remember any more than that? More than what? Well, do you remember any more numbers or letters on that license plate? What are you talking about? Oh, the car in front of you that stopped without warning. You said you saw the letter A and uh, three threes on the plate. I did. Oh, I said... I, said oh, I don't know why I said that. When is my husband coming to take me home? I don't want... 
to say anything until he gets here. I guess, well, uh, I'll tell you what. I won't ask you any more questions tonight. I'll stop by your house tomorrow and we'll go on from there. Is that okay? Yes, yes. I'm all right. I just want to go home. Good morning, Naomi. I thought we'd have breakfast in the garden today. Jacob, you're the sweetest husband. Oh, you made breakfast and everything. The least I could do for an injured wife. How do you feel this morning, darling? Oh, let me have some coffee first. Then I'll tell you. Help yourself. <laughs> and a toast before it gets too cold. Hmm? Uh, there was a state trooper who phoned earlier he was to come to see you. I told him you were still asleep. He's coming over this afternoon. Oh, uh, Darling, what, what is it? You dropped your cup. I don't know what it is. My hand started to shake. <laughs> After last night, that is not so strange. Oh. Well, we won't talk about what happened. We'll put it all out of our minds. But I want to talk about it. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. Uh, where's the marmalade? It's right in front of you. Oh. Anyway, the trooper said that I should tell you they were trying to track down the license plate with the letter A and the three threes. When he realized he had not asked you the color of the plate, you know, so they could uh, identify which state it was. I never said anything to him about A and three threes. Tell me. Could you have said that because, well, oh, you know. Out of shock, maybe. In the ambulance, this young paramedic saw the A1333 on my arm. Could I have been so confused that I said that about the license plate of the car I almost ran into? I didn't tell you, did I? He was driving that car. Carl Durer. Oh, me makes sense. How could it have been him? Now, I wish you would put all this behind you. It's making you see things, and what is worse, believe them. Now, give it up, sweetheart. Give it all up. What is past is past. I'll never give up. How can I? How could you have seen the face of a man in a car in front of you at night? Oh, Jacob, you just know it. You remember London? What? It was like that? When you spotted him on Waterloo Bridge and he ran away from you? Tonight he knew I was right there behind him. <laughs> if he did, and he stopped short on purpose, what well, you might have been killed. The Lord has other plans for me. Don't make it too hard for the Lord to protect you. Uh, how many years is it now that you've been following this I man? I don't count it in years, Jacob. I count it in lives. My mother's, my father's, and my sister's. You didn't know them or you wouldn't dream of saying to me, give up. My darling Naomi, they are gone. Death camps, Nazis, crematoria. It is all part of history. It is over now. Not for me. Ever. Well, look at it dispassionately. Let us say that Carl Dürer is here in New Jersey. He is. And you have chased him, hunted him down from Auschwitz to Genoa to London to Argentina to New Jersey. Are you denying it was him? Of course it was. So he is here now, somewhere, in some town or city. Where does he live? Under what name? I have found out before. I can do it again. Why is he diving in front of you on the turnpike at night? Or know it was you behind him? Professor, what point are you making? Ah, Naomi. Is it not possible it has become an obsession? It is an obsession. I don't deny that. You ask how did he know, I'll answer. When I came out of the hospital after the night shift, there was a car parked ahead of mine... Carl Dürer walked to that car and unlocked it. He turned for a moment and looked at me. Then he got in it and drove off. Ah, so that is how the accident happened. You were chasing him. So he recognized you, you say. But he did not know who you were. Maybe somebody from his past, somebody who could identify him. He knows I've seen him before. If the man in the car is the camp doctor who caused the death of your oh, family... Oh, Jacob, don't be so mealy-mouthed. Caused the death. Killed them. Murdered them. If you want now to bring him to justice, you have to stop putting him on his guard by chasing him. Now, we may have to enlist the help of a, uh, an international lawyer. We, we have to get enough evidence together to punish him legally. You may have to do it that way, Jacob. I don't have to. All I have to do is follow him until he stands still long enough for me to kill him. Carl, what did you ring for? Don't you have your key? 
Where have you been? I, uh, I lost my house key and my key to work. I told you to put them on the same ring with the car keys. Look what time it is. Anna, uh, please. I can't think anymore. Uh, can I have some coffee? Of course. Carl, take your shoes off. Sit in the big chair. Uh, this was a bad night for me, Anna. A whole night. And what time is it now? Ten o'clock in the morning and you're not at work. What will Mr. Perlman say? What will he say? Carl, I hired you at the recommendation of my foreman, Ernst. Yeah, good work with your fingers assembling the transistors. I made you a section supervisor. We have a small shop here, Carl, and not the shop for work is serious. That's what he will say. What are you talking so crazily for? Mr. Perlman is your friend. Here's the coffee. Yeah. Drink it slowly. I made it strong. I was so worried. It's not like you not to call me. Mm, oh, that's good. I was afraid to honor. What are you talking about? Afraid of me? No, no, afraid the telephone was tapped. Somebody listening. What do they know about you to listen? Who is it? Well, uh, that's the problem. I, I wish I could be sure, but I don't know who they are. Last night, we, we had our usual game, you know. I left Fritz and Heinz and Ernst about 11 and a little after. I go to my car... And there is this woman getting into her car behind me. And I know her right away. Ah, uh, it's not her, is it? Yes, it is. And she knows who I am. The same woman from London and Buenos Aires? The same. How could it be? The same red hair. That moment we looked at each other at night, only an instant. I know her. She knows me. What happened then? Well, well, she shouts something at me, but I'm in my car and driving away fast, and, and she follows in her car. She's crazy. But we are on the parkway going north away from town. I cannot shake her. She's very close behind me. And suddenly there is a, a dog. Do you know how I feel about animals? I pull the brake down not to hit it. The woman is too close. She hits in the back of my car. You know, the bumper is bent, the fender... My neck, it hurts. But, well, I stop. She has hit the guardrail and her car is turned over. What did you do? Well, there are no flames. I get back into my car and I can see her crawling out. Then I hear sirens, the police cars. I go. I go as fast as I can and I keep going. Is that what you were doing? Driving all night? No, 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 not all night. I stop up in uh, Caddy Falls and I go into a diner and have some coffee. The woman in the accident... Was she hurt badly? I told you she was crawling away. So she couldn't be hurt too bad. But it was her fault following me so close like that. I can't have good thoughts about her. She could be from the FBI or Interpol. Anna, Anna, they are watching. Still, after all these years... I don't know if there are limitations on what they call... War crimes. What crime did you commit? You were like a soldier. You followed orders. A highly respected doctor who helped his country in the prison camp. Yes, you think so. Huh? I thought so. But the Russians and the British and the Americans and the Israelis, so, uh, they don't think so. I thought when we finally came to America, we could live new lives and the past would be dead. Buried forever. Oh, yes, uh, I almost forgot. One good thing did happen in all this horror. And I'm proud of myself, at least for that. Ah, what happened? The, the dog that ran out in front of the car, I told you. Well, <laughs> I didn't hit him. The poor little thing out late at night. You see so many dead little animals on the highways, run over by thoughtless people. It could make you cry. I think you're getting the drift of where all this is leading. This is no mere tale of retribution or revenge. It involves a crime of war. All societies, it's been said, are capable of committing war atrocities. So who are we to cast the first stone? I shall continue our account of Naomi's pursuit of such a criminal when I return shortly with Act Two. Feeling fit, feel so good, burning up the way you know you should. 
I'm Susan Anton. The ultimate in feeling fit is sleeping on a perfect sleeper pillow soft. Extra thick comfort on top and ultra firm support inside. Perfect sleeper pillow soft. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper. Perfect sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. The family's all gathered. Summertime is here. Volleyball and barbecue. It's that time of year. Working on the first. Just sitting in the shade. Nothing's finer than the taste of the old fashioned lemonade. Country time. Country time. Tastes like the old fashioned lemonade. Made with natural lemon flavor, so it's not too tart, not too sweet. Country Time Lemonade Flavor Drink. Tastes like an old-fashioned lemonade. This is Ken Howard. If you're over 18 and already out of school, I have a personal question for you. Can you read as well as you would like to? I don't mean just traffic signs and sports programs. I'm talking about books, magazines, and newspapers, and the labels on medicine and food packages. If you don't read well enough to understand these, you can get help at your library. Many libraries offer assistance for people who didn't learn to read very well in school. If they don't have the programs themselves, librarians can often recommend a local tutor, self-help books, or even televised instruction that includes other subjects as well as reading. 25 million Americans have trouble reading, and some of them don't even realize it, or they're too embarrassed to ask for help. If you are one of them, don't waste your mind any longer. The libraries in your area are waiting to help you. You just walk right in and ask for books on any subject that interests you, whether it's basketball, basket weaving, or the mystery of the Baskervilles. You name it, the library has it. They've got your number. Now you get theirs and give them a call. A public service message of the American Library Association. A volunteer nurse's aide who has suffered the loss of her family in the Nazi extermination camp of Auschwitz some 35 years ago has made it her mission in life to bring the prison doctor responsible for the murders to justice and has pursued his shadow across two continents. This is the incomprehensible position I find myself in. Me, Karl Dürer. Graduate of the Medical Academy at Dresden, honored in Stuttgart and Berlin for outstanding genetic research. I conducted bona fide medical experiments at Auschwitz. They don't believe that. I was never a Nazi. They don't believe that. So for years, I've been on the run. It is unjust. This creature with the red hair, she must have survived somehow. What does she want from me? Naomi. Naomi, there's a man from the police here to see you. Uh, she will be right down. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get here yesterday. You're her husband? Ah, I always forget to introduce myself. Jacob Berger. Ah, yeah, well, uh, here, let's see. Oh, you teach uh, classical literature and German history at the junior college, huh? You know a great deal about me. And your wife does volunteer work at General Hospital. In the laboratory, not to the patients. Uh, but why such an uh, investigation, Mr. Johnson? Well, sir, Mrs. Berger narrowly escaped with her life, so naturally we check everybody and everything. Good morning, I... Forgot your name? Oh, uh, Johnson, Mrs. Berger, state trooper. May I sit down? Yes, and you may take your hat off. Ma'am? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, uh, let's see, you told me the night of the accident you observed the license plate of the car you hit had the letter A and three threes. Uh, do you remember the color of the plate by any chance? No, I don't. I see. Uh, the color of the car? Blue. Uh, blue sedan. Uh, how far in front of you was he? I don't know. It's kind of hard to say how far. Uh, it... One car length, uh, two car lengths, three, four, huh? I'm not sure. Oh. You were following this car for some distance. I guess so. You say you didn't know the identity of the driver or any occupant of the car you hit. How could I know them? So there's no basis in the fact for presuming you might have been chasing this car. Chasing? Why would I do that? Well, you were not on your way home from the hospital, were you? Uh, if I may interrupt, 
I get the impression that the police believe there's something suspicious in my wife's actions and she's being accused of something. Uh, well, sir, we have two eyewitness accounts, uh, Mrs. Berger, of uh, which I'd like to check with you. Uh, witness one told us that a gentleman alone got into a car opposite the general hospital at 11.10 the night before last, uh, that you were parked behind him. The witness was passing along the sidewalk when you shouted from your car, Mrs. Berger, I'll get you yet. Uh, the man drove off, and you started your vehicle and drove off after him. Tell me, what is this? Jacob, it's false. Now, the second eyewitness account was given to me personally at the Turnpike toll booth by the attendant on duty. Uh, he told me that on the night in question, a woman with red hair followed a blue sedan which had just passed and asked the attendant if that car had taken the service road or continued along the Turnpike. And because this woman had red hair, you are saying it was me? No, ma'am. I'm asking, was it you? I, I think, Mr. Johnson, before this questioning goes any further, my wife ought to have legal advice. Well, you're entitled. But I'd like you to accompany me now to the police station so that the two eyewitnesses could make positive identification. Well, my wife would be happy to comply, but I think in this case also she is entitled to consult legal counsel. <laughs> I can't deny you that, sir, either. Uh... Give us a call tomorrow, will you? Or have your attorney call and we'll arrange for the witnesses. Now, in the meantime, I must warn you, Mrs. Berger, not to leave town. Uh, good day to you. Uh, tomorrow, don't forget. So long, folks. Do we have to get ourselves a lawyer? I don't know. Oh, you were very foolish. After all these years to betray yourself like that, shouting threats into the street. Oh. It was just too much to see him so close like that. But why didn't you tell me the truth? I did, but I didn't tell you all of it. Jacob, I feel we are at the end of the trail. We've talked about this so often, but he's here now. He must be living in this area and working here. Now we should put the main plan into operation. That plan? You don't have to be part of it, Jacob, if you don't wish to be. We agreed on that. I always said that when the time comes and you can't go the final step, I'll let you out. I'll do it alone. No. No, no, we are in this together. Everything. The final step included. When I married you, your mother and father and your sister Lisa became my mother and father and sister. I want Carl Dero to pay the ultimate price as much as you do. He's had the luck to escape for a long time. I think it is over. Anna, luck will not always be mine. How much longer can I escape this woman with the red hair? There is a way. To be rid of her. Forever. Face her. Find her. Speak to her. Ask her why for the last 15 years. Is, is that when we were in London 15 years ago? Why does she follow you? What does she want? If instead of running from her, Carl, as if you had done something wrong, as if you were guilty of something, you spoke together. Anna, you don't know what you're talking about. I can't do that. Why not? What did you do wrong? So you were a doctor in a prison camp. It wasn't by choice. You were conscripted. They wanted an expert in genetics. You treated everyone who was sick. But I, I, I did what I was ordered. Were you ordered something so terrible you have to be running all your life? No, Anna. Anna, it's the unspoken part of my life. You've been wise enough not to ask me what I did and why after the war I had to give up being a doctor and why I disappeared from Germany for so long. And then, when I finally wrote you under a new name from London, you came and joined me and never asked me why. Ask me nothing now also. <laughs> You know what I'm going to tell that state trooper, don't you? Yes, and I, just exactly how much. I prayed last night, Jacob. So did I. I said to Mama and Papa and Lisa, now is almost the end of the trail. Did you make the phone calls? Yeah, two newspapers. How did you say it? Well, I told them who we were, that you were going to the police station today to give information about a Nazi prison camp doctor. 
that here in our small town in New Jersey, a murderer lives among us. Perfect. Well, good day, folks. Oh, I'm sorry we have to meet out here, but space is at a premium today. I understand you wish to change your story, Mrs. Berger? No, not change. Add to it. I did recognize the man who got into the car in front of me when I left the hospital that night. And I did follow him. I wanted to know where he lived. Mr. Johnson, he is a murderer. Ah, uh, I see. So you ran into him deliberately? No, that was an accident, just as I told you. His name is... was Dr. Carl Durer. Hmm? And you have a basis for your accusation of murder? I was there when he killed three people, if that's what you mean. This happened recently? A long time ago. And did you report it? No, I didn't. Well, why not? No, you see, what my wife has not made clear is that this Dr. Durer performed medical experiments, so-called, in a Nazi prison camp, which resulted in the death of her father and mother and twin sister. Well, who was she to report this to? A man is a Nazi. Do I have to say any more? I'm afraid you'll have to tell me a great deal more, Mrs. Berger. <laughs> Is that you? Yes, I'm home, Anna. Oh, I'll get the phone. No, don't answer it. Don't answer it, please, Carl. Uh, why not? It's been ringing all day, since you went to work. Uh, why don't you answer the phone? This is too stupid. Carl, please. Uh, hello? Hello? Who is this? Who is this? Who are you? It was one of them, wasn't it? Uh, has this been going on all day? Horrible. He... He called me a Nazi murderer. That's why I stopped answering the phone. Didn't you see the morning paper? No. Here. Look. On the front page. Uh, Anna, please, you'll read it. A murderer in our midst. Mrs. Naomi Berger accuses Carl Durer of being a Nazi torturer at Auschwitz, the infamous Nazi extermination camp of World War II. The wife of Jacob Berger, professor of German history, made a statement today at police headquarters denouncing... Oh, stop the... it! Stop it! All day, people have been calling here. They look us up in the telephone book. What are we going to do? We have to go away. Where can we go, Carl? You must stand up to this woman. See her. Go there. What do you have to fear? It's all lies. Make her believe you, this Mrs. Jacob Berger. And it's no use. The authorities will come, and they won't listen either. Yes, I performed experiments under orders. Of course people die. They would have died anyway. I put them to sleep. Wasn't it a better death than being shot or gassed like the others? You could be accused of murdering, like it says. Anna, Anna, I have got to go out. I'm going to find that woman. I am going to face her, as you say. Oh, where's the telephone book? Where it always is, next to the telephone. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, 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 yes, here it is. Just like any other name. Now, what is her husband's name? Uh, Jacob. Yes, Jacob. Yes, Jacob Berger. Who are you calling? Mrs. Jacob Berger. I am going to tell her that Dr. Carl Dürer is on his way over to pay her a house call. Don't. Don't go over there, Carl, yet. Oh, Mrs. Berger? This is Carl Dürer. No, Carl, no. Just a moment, please. Anna, please. If you are determined to see her, don't warn her when you're coming. Suppose she has some police with her when you get there. Do as I say, Carl. Hang up. You're right. For a change. I will be the hunter. And she, the hunted. Let her wonder what I am going to do next. <laughs> It has often been said that the mills of the gods grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. In other words, the reward of patience is justice. Naomi Berger sees no evidence that patience would even ultimately redress wrongs. So she herself has decided to play Nemesis, a most dangerous game. 
I shall return shortly with Act Three. Kodak brings the instant to life. Kodak wants to offer you some instant fun money for a limited time only. Get a $10 rebate when you buy either the Kodak Colorburst 250 or the new Colorburst 350 instant camera. With either instant camera, you get the sharp, rich, vivid color pictures Kodak is famous for. See your photo dealer for details about Kodak's $10 fun money offer. Kodak brings the instant to life. When you want quality, instant printing in a hurry, see the professionals who print at PIP. Whatever your printing needs depend on the professionals at PIP. Want your own personalized stationery and envelopes? Depend on PIP. Want business brochures and sales reports? Depend on PIP. For all your printing needs, depend on PIP. Look for the PIP near you in the yellow pages under printers. That's PIP. The following is a reenactment of a scene that never happened. When I told the fat man that I lost the letters of transit, I thought it was having a heart attack. Sure. Do you know the warning signals of a heart attack? Well, sure, Rick. Well, you know, Rick. Then listen and get it once. A pain in the center of your chest may spread to a shoulder, your neck, or an arm. May feel dizzy, nauseous, sweaty. If it lasts two minutes or longer, get emergency help right away. Got it? Sure, Rick. Oh, Rick? Yeah, shoot. Well, the fat man was mad when I called the ambulance. He said it wasn't a heart attack, but me giving him indigestion. That's common enough. A lot of heart attack victims say there's nothing wrong. Want to think it'll go away. Your American Heart Association has the information on heart attack. So get them on the phone. They're fighting for your life. But, Rick, the fat man did have indigestion. I'm feeling a little queasy myself. Well, did I make a mistake, Rick? Aside from being born, you mean? No. When you consider a woman who has waited 30 years to confront the very doctor who assisted the infamous Dr. Mengele by the injection of phenolic acid, benzene, or air, which killed in seconds, when you consider she watched her mother, father, and sister die that way, the way of human guinea pigs, when you consider all that, perhaps you can understand Naomi's feelings at this moment. He's coming here. I know it, Jacob. I know he's coming. What did he say on the phone just now? He said, Mrs. Berger, this is Carl Dura. And then I heard a woman's voice say, Carl, don't. And then he said, just a moment, please. And then they talked. He had his hand over the receiver. Then he hung up. Jacob, he saw the newspaper story. He swallowed the bait. He's coming because he has to silence me. But he doesn't know who I am. I could be related to any of the thousands of deaths. Are you ready, Jacob? The car has gas in it, and it is standing right by the back door. And the hypodermic? Everything is laid out on the kitchen table. But not all of them. Only one. The other two should be in your briefcase. Don't worry, they are. Now, where will you be standing when he comes through the door? Right there, just as we planned. The hammer? You have the hammer? I, I have it, I have it. I'm looking at my wife, planning this so matter-of-factly, and I... I don't know you. Yes, you do. The final step. We've always talked about it. It has to be. There's no other way. Who would do it for us? The courts. Oh, bring him to court. You think he would answer charges in a court? Uh, what time is it? Maybe he won't come. He'll come, he'll come. He'll has to. He has to know who I am. What evidence do I have? How safe is he? What do I know? Suppose he carries a pistol. Have you considered that? Why do you think I am answering the door? And you are standing behind it with a hammer in your hand. Oh, let him come now. That's him. The ring of authority. Are you going to answer it? Open the door before he goes away. You have the hammer. I told you that I have it, you see? All right, all right. But oh, wait... What for? If he has got a gun, warn me. I'm coming. Mrs. Berger? Yes? Is your husband home? I'm afraid not. I am Carl Dürer. 
I think you wish to talk to me. May I come in? I have been waiting for you to call on me. Please come in. Go right ahead. Into the living room. Oh, oh, did I kill him? No, he's still breathing. You did fine. Help me move him so I can close the door. All right, and we'll drag him into the kitchen. Yeah, about the injections, will you do it or should I? I'll show you how to do it, Jacob. Don't worry. He's coming to. Oh, how is he going to react when he is fully conscious? His mind will be fairly clear, but he'll have no power over his body. Oh. He'll be able to talk slowly, but overall he'll be very weak and defenseless, just like his victims at Auschwitz. Uh, where am I? Oh. You are in the kitchen of my house. I introduce myself to you, Dr. Dürer. I am Naomi Berger, and this is my husband, Jacob. What have you given me? Why do I feel so weak? Don't you recognize it, Herr Doctor? You used so much of it. It is the same drug you gave my mother and father and sister many years ago to quiet them. So that when you were quite ready to administer... You, you, you are m mistaking me for someone else. I thought as a genetic scientist you would like to experience oh. this sensation firsthand. I can't move. Well, perhaps it is not entirely the drug. Perhaps you are paralyzed with fear. Three doses tonight. One for my mother... One for my father and one for my sister, Lisa. Why do you accuse me of these things? Because I was there. I was in that hospital. The four of us. I saw with my own eyes, I saw your Dr. Mengele say to you, Carl, take care of these biologically inferior species. Specimens. So it was time for the second treatment, and you injected the specimens. Mother, father, and Lisa. No, you're wrong. I was not a cab doctor at Auschwitz. But then it was time for lunch, and you said to me, Little girl, wait there, so your father and father and sister will see you when they wake up. And then you went to lunch. That was not me. You are mistaken. It was someone else. Only I knew they would never wake up. And for some reason, I wasn't weak. I was strong. And I ran away and I hid. Naomi, is it time for the next injection? No, not yet. Redhead. You. You are the redhead. Can you remember now, Herr Dürer? Fifteen years ago... Twenty. I never forgot you, Herr Dürer. Everything is fine, Jacob, all in order. I'll help you carry the doctor to the car. Where are we? We have traveled an hour and a half. You have been asleep. How am I going to die? Two injections, 15 minutes apart. Doing this does not bother you, huh? What are you, a teacher? I teach the classics, German. Yes, literature. I am not a beast. I am not inhuman. Perhaps not now. But then you lost touch with reality. Those were human beings you experimented with. I was a doctor, highly qualified. Do you know what the word conscience means? I know what the word duty means. An order is an order, and it must be obeyed. You believe that I would be here today if I had disobeyed? You would have been here with a clear conscience. Conscience? This is the only world you know. Can you move your arms or... Hands, Dr. Dürer. No. My body will not obey me. I couldn't even spit in your eye. Then you will have no difficulty in holding still while I roll up your right sleeve. Oh, Carl, I've been so worried. Mrs. Oh. Dürer? 
Yeah, yes. I'm uh, State Trooper Johnson. Now, these keys were found on the turnpike a few days ago. I traced one to the Acme Transistor Corporation, where I believe uh, Mr. Durer works. Now, I spoke to a Mr. Perlman. My husband's boss, yes. Uh, may I come in? Excuse me. I was expecting my husband. Well, Mr. Perlman identified one of the keys as from a locker of your husband's. The other one is our front door key. Carl lost them. Well, may I ask, is your husband in good health? Is something wrong? Well, he wasn't at work, and Mr. Perlman said he's been absent a lot lately. You sound like a sympathetic man, and I'm going to tell you something. Last night, Carl was very upset. Uh, because his name was in the newspaper? Yes. He said he had to talk to that woman who said he was a Nazi. And he went out to talk to her. And he hasn't come back home yet. It is all over. I hid the body in a cave by the reservoir. Did anyone see you? No. I pulled the car off the turnpike. When I walked back to it, I did not turn the lights on until I was on the road coming home. No one saw me. So, it's done. The final step. I do not share your feeling of relief. Uh, the hypodermics are in the briefcase. What did he say in the end? Did he confess? Did he weep and grovel like so many of them did? He just went to sleep. I'll take these hypodermics and uh, wash them out. I know it's late, Jacob. Would you like something to eat? I do not think I could ever get food to past my lips. You can pour me a whiskey. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, hello? Mrs. Berger? Yes, this is she. Now, this is Trooper Johnson. Now, I know it's very late, but something important has just developed, and I have to talk to you, ma'am. Well, come on over. We're still up. I'll leave the light on outside. Oh, good. I'll be there in five minutes. All right. Jacob, come here quickly. What is it? Who is that on the telephone? Our friend Johnson, that state trooper. He's going to be here in five minutes. Oh, my Lord. Now, put the briefcase in the upstairs closet with my nurse's aid uniform. Are the instruments clean? Yes, yes. Oh, how could they have found him so quickly? Now, remember, you were here all evening. Uh, put your slippers on. Uh, go sit on the sofa. Oh, open a book. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Berger, I am going to dispense with the apologies for the lateness of the hour. Now, I've been to see the wife of Carl Durer. He left home to come here, Mrs. Berger. Now, did you see him? No, I can't say I did. At no time today has Carl Durer been to see either of you? But Jacob and I have been here alone all evening. Uh, I see. I haven't yet informed Mrs. Durer, so I shall ask you to keep this to yourselves uh, for the present. Two hours ago, in the Reservoir District... Carl Durer was discovered, run over, on the turnpike, dead. Now, he was apparently hit by some vehicle. Ah, uh, you... you think he was walking along the highway and he was hit by a car? Well, he's been taken to the morgue, and after a thorough examination, we ought to be able to pinpoint the cause of his death. I, uh... I'd better go now and inform Mrs. Durer. <laughs> He suspects us. They're going to find traces of the poison in him. I... I don't understand how, after those injections, he could get up and walk to the turnpike. It was the identical phenolic acid he used on mother and father and Lisa. It is just beyond me. Naomi. You told me you left him hidden in a cave by the reservoir. But that's over a mile from the main road. Jacob? What happened? Naomi, I, I could not do it. I did not inject anything lethal at all. I started to roll up his sleeve. I took out the hypo and, and he passed out. Fear, shock, or what remained from the original tranquilizer, I do not know. I pulled him out of the car. I propped him against a tree and I drove off. I knew he would wake up sometime. I'm, I'm sorry, Naomi. You didn't do it. I couldn't. I could not take that final step. Oh, my dear Jacob. How could I have asked it of you? He must have come to and started to walk home. And somebody else, he could have been 
blinded by headlights. Oh, Jacob. All these years. And we never punished him. Isn't it enough that we brought him to the edge of death? We who live by principles to maintain a peaceful society cannot bring ourselves to fight fire with fire, death with death, as did Naomi in her pursuit of a 30-year-old murder. Unhappily, as long as humans are capable of inhumanity, we are destined to live in an armed camp. That appears to be man's fate. I shall return shortly with some closing words. Before Shogun, in a Japan of warring clans and star-crossed lovers, there was the glorious saga, Shikei. Shikei, the beautiful and violent epic of a warrior monk trained in a thousand ways to kill. And the radiant noble woman whose passion for him defies all tradition. Shikei, the Japan you will always remember. In the Jove paperback you will never forget. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Only one barbecue sauce can give me the snap of this secret blend of 16 herbs and spices. Ours. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap. Here at Fire Station Number 3, between fighting fires, we play a lot of checkers and drink a lot of coffee. So our coffee's Kava Instant. Your move, Hogan. Full-flavored Kava is the only 90% acid-neutralized coffee. And with less acidity, no matter how much we drink, we still feel good. Oh, nice move, Hogan. In fact, we drink enough Kava to put out a fire. Uh-oh, I think I'm in trouble. Saved by the bell. Kava, all the taste you want in coffee without all the acidity. This is Carl Malden. Now only American Express Traveler's Checks offers exclusive new services that protect more than just your money. Now if you lose your credit cards and ID along with your Traveler's Checks, only American Express will help you cancel your cards, issue you a temporary ID, cash a check, and put its travel service at your service 24 hours a day. Ask for American Express Traveler's Checks. Now they protect more than just your money. Now they help protect your vacation. Services available in the U.S. and Canada. Certain conditions apply. None have defined man's nature better than Rudyard Kipling. He observed the struggle between the law-abiding and the lawless and translated it into the law of the jungle. Now this is the law of the jungle, he wrote as old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Roberta Maxwell, Norman Rose, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Revenge is an attitude of mind peculiar only to the human species. So far as I know, man is the only living creature who will plot, plan, and punish to settle a score or get even. However, what is somewhat surprising is that the avenging angel of our story is a lady who had no enemies and had everything. Well, almost everything. Oh! Oh, my, my foot. May I be of assistance? Uh, I've turned my ankle on the gangplank. I... Well, I think I can help you, madam. Uh, I'll just lift you. Oh! 
Oh, what are you doing? Put me down. I, I don't even know who you are. Now, please don't make a fuss, dear lady. There's a whole line of passengers behind us waiting to get off the ship. It's so embarrassing. Just place your arms about my neck and hold on. I wouldn't want to drop you in the water down there, especially since we have only just met. Our mystery drama, Henrietta's Revenge, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Patricia Elliott. I shall return shortly with Act One. two fascinating characters who go to make up our story of the shady, dark, and sinister. One, a lady very high up in the world of big business. The other, a man who lives by his wits, who in gambling circles is known as a low roller. What is another name for that? A born loser. We'll meet him now. Sergio? Go away, I'm hot. I want to see you. Now. Can't you wait till this spin is finished? You'll never win back what you've lost, Sergio. We're tired of you playing with our money. Come into my office, Sergio. We have uh, a little talk, Sir Hafner. This is a bad time for me, Fritz. You don't know how bad a time if you don't do as I ask. You're threatening me. I'm not. But Hans, who is standing behind you, has his right finger on the safety catch. Fritz, what is there to talk about? A little matter of $25,000. Not Cruzerios. We want to be paid. All right. How much time have I got? Two weeks. Don't be insane. How can I come up with 25000 in 14 days? If I could have raised that, I'd have doubled my bets and not be in this fix. Two weeks is impossible. That's too bad. Fritz, ask yourself, is it better to wait a little longer and get what I owe you, or dispose of me and get nothing? Mm-hmm. How long do you need? Four weeks. No, 31 days. One month from today, January 13th, I shall be back here in Rio with every penny of your 25000 I'll propose it to the boys. Where are you getting it, Sergio? How else? The old tried and true way. You're going to get married again? If I have to. You've got a rich woman on the string? I'll get me one. <laughs> Mr. Hayward, I hope I'm not late. No, Miss Tufts hasn't arrived yet. You're from the uh, Savannah Tribune, right? Yes, that's right. I hear Miss Tufts is quite a gal. Well, I told your editor on the phone yesterday I can't guarantee she'll give you an interview. Uh, you are Tom Hayward. You are her personal secretary? Hayward. H-A-Y-W-A-R-D. Right. Um, do you find it awkward working for a woman? No, not in my case. We get along very well. So you wouldn't be against it? Well, it depends. On the bio I dug up. Let's see. Henrietta Tufts was top honor student all the way through business college right here in Savannah. At 24, she took over her dad's gas station and in two years parlayed that into a string of garages from Georgia to Alabama. At 26, overseas manager for Planet Airways. And at 28, she joined us here at U.S. Motors. And today, Miss Tufts is executive assistant to Carl Eaton, the president. Morning, Tom. Oh, oh good morning, Miss Tufts. Um, there's a reporter here from the Savannah Trib who would like to interview you. Well, I'll tell her she picked a bad day. I'll be available the week of January 5th. Come into my office, Tom. I want to see you. Hey, did she say January 5th? Yeah, that's what she said. Well, I'd like to know why then. You be here. That's all you have to know. Tom, we have a pile up of work today. What's with January 5th? Oh, that's when I come back from the cruise. Well, you booked it. You ought to know. Who sent this box of flowers? I don't believe it. Yellow roses. Uh, I'll see if I can locate it. Oh, you stay right here. There are ten girls out there who can come up with ten vases if I tell them to. Aren't you curious who sent this box of long stem yellow roses? Uh, I think I know where I can find a tall vase. Tom, I said stay. 
Oh, no card. Well, don't you hate that? Darn it. Now I don't know who to thank. Happy birthday, Henrietta. Tom, you did. <laughs> well, it was Jill's idea. To send me roses today. What a sweet thought. You got yourself some fiancé there, Tom. Jill Kramer. Detective. Hmm, sounds good. When's she getting a badge? A detective don't wear badges. You know what I mean. When? Well, as soon as she takes the exam. Now remind me to send her something. So, she'll be a police detective. And then what? Well, hopefully we'll marry. Mm. Oh, Tom. <laughs> I envy you. I wouldn't say this to anyone else in the world. In the past year, you've handled so many confidential matters that we both know it isn't just a boss-secretary relationship. I'm jealous of you. I really am. Henrietta, there must be thousands of women who'd give anything to be at that desk. And who knows where it'll lead. <laughs> For you, U.S. Motors might be a small step to the U.S. Senate. Don't cheer me up. I don't like it. <sighs> Today I woke up. Another birthday. Darn it. I felt so sorry for myself. Boss, why do you make such a production out of it? It happens to be the big four. Four O. That's what bothers me the most. What? Being 40 years old? Don't slough it off like that. It's half a lifetime. Besides, I don't know how to say this exactly, but, well, being a bachelor, I'm living half a life. That's the truth, Tom. Henrietta, don't say any more or we'll both be embarrassed. I used to think I'd never find anyone to share my life with. I'm 35. I had to wait 10 years till Jill came along. If I hadn't been sinking off Belle Isle, I might never have met her. You never told me that. Yeah, I grounded myself on a rock, and here comes a police patrol boat, and who should be in charge but a policewoman? A girl. It was Jill. I, I was so embarrassed. Mm, you get so doggone lonely. Mm. Round four. Saved by the bell. Miss Tuff's office. Oh, Tom, is Henrietta there? Uh, yes, sir. Right here. At the big boss himself. I'll be at my desk. Good morning, Carl. What's good about it? Have you seen the bell and sheets? Carl, if you're testing my reflexes today, forget it. Mark down I failed the question. Okay, what's good about this morning? All right, Henrietta, just relax. Now, I've got a more important question to discuss with you. Rebates. Mm, not a bad idea at all. Might move our Z models. How much were you thinking of? Well, say 300 per car. Well, I'll get those wheels rolling. Can you come over and we'll bat it around? I'll see you in ten minutes, Carl. Tom? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't see you. Carl's just come up with a brand new idea to move our Z models. Rebates. Well, did he now? What a splendid notion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I wonder how he happened to dream that up. No, it is now Carl Eaton's brainchild. You've only been saying rebate the customers for months, since October. Well... Thank Jill for me. Those roses sure help soften the 40 blows. Oh, the travel agent. I've done that. Your cruise is confirmed, leaving Savannah December 10th, so relax. That's why I'm taking three weeks off to relax. Can't you just see me? <laughs> Lying alone on a deck chair or all by myself on a tropical beach. That's me, Henrietta Tufts. Independent as a hog on ice. The gal who's got everything. Passengers disembarking for St. Martin will please gather at the gangplank on the boat deck. Passengers disembarking will please leave from the boat deck. One at a time, please. Hold on to the gangplank railing. Plenty of time for everyone to enjoy themselves. Oh, oh my foot, it, it's caught. May I be of assistance? I, I think I've turned my ankle. Oh, oh I, can't, I can't walk. Well, what do you think we should do, madam? Well, I don't know. I'm holding up all the passengers. Please, what are you doing? Now, you just relax and don't be afraid. The Commodore will carry you. Oh, that's all everybody tells me. Relax. What 
me down. I'll be happy to carry you the rest of the way to the dock. Put me down, sir. Now, don't make a fuss. There's a line of people behind us waiting to get off. Now, here, place your arms around my neck and hold on. I wouldn't want to drop you in the water. Just yet. There, now. Doesn't that feel better? Oh, I feel so stupid. Sitting here outside a waterfront cafe with my foot on a chair. You know, I don't think it's too badly twisted. But a little ice and the swelling will go down more quickly. Uh, Garçon, uh, would you bring us some champagne? Also a napkin and some cracked ice. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. Sergio Parisi. I'm on the same cruise with you. And I am Henrietta Tufts. I'm certainly glad you were standing behind on the gangplank. I don't know what I would have done. Ah, it was meant to be, madam. No, you don't have to call me madam. I'm not married. Mademoiselle. Ah, the Commodore understands. You are not married at present. Who is this uh, Commodore you keep talking about? The Commodore? <laughs> he is me. I am the Commodore. Of a ship? Oh, of many ships, my dear. A fleet of oil tankers. That is only bread and butter. Actually, I'm Commodore only of my yacht and a few sailboats which I race in Bermuda and Sydney and Newport. A little sport, nothing. Ah, merci, Garçon. Now, you shall see, Mademoiselle Henrietta, the Commodore is also a doctor. Take a handful of ice, place it in a napkin. Now, this will be cold on your ankle, so please don't be shocked. Tie the napkin gently, very gently around your foot. And by the time we have finished the champagne, your foot, you won't feel it at all. Mr. Varese, after a bottle of champagne, I might not feel anything at all. <laughs> Mr. Varese, could I ask why you are being so sweet and attentive to a complete stranger? Because I have a feeling that you are going to be very important in my life. And my feelings are very seldom mistaken. Of course, Henrietta Tufts is going to be important in the life of Sergio Verizzi. He can tell by the way she is dressed that this is no poor girl out for the one cruise adventure of her life. And Sergio is an expert in spotting those who the confidence gamesters call a mark. And he can do it more quickly than any other golden fleecer. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Don't you believe it that Sergio Verizzi, native of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, just happened to be on the same cruise ship with Henrietta Tufts, native of Savannah, Georgia? Not so. Henrietta was on vacation. Sergio was on the make. He had exactly 31 days to make $25,000 materialize before his creditors dematerialized him. Speed, therefore, was essential. Darling? Sergio? Huh? Tell me for your thoughts. Oh, nothing, Henrietta, sweetheart. The Commodore was just sadly looking over the rail into the fog thanking heaven that we met and thinking that tomorrow this is all over. Does it have to be all over, Sergio? What can the Commodore do in America? My shipbuilding, my oil interests are all in Latin America. You could do all that from Savannah. I'll tell you, darling, what I was thinking. There's no reason why my company, U.S. Motors become interested in some phase of your shipbuilding or oil tankers. There could be a merger there somehow, if you wanted it. I'd welcome whatever could be done so that I wouldn't lose you now that I've just found you. Mm. Hold me closer, Sergio. Oh, that foghorn is a frightening sound. It's always fog in January on your American coast. Oh, we had beautiful times on the islands together, didn't we? You know we did, darling. I don't know why that sound makes me shiver so. Oh, it's as if it's trying to tell me something. My dearest girl, I wish that nothing would frighten you ever again. Will you always be there to make sure it doesn't, Sergio? 
What is it you're asking me? How is that possible? Well, I think everything is possible. Oh, friendship is up to a point. And it wouldn't be hard to say goodbye. Well, then, why say it? Just going to come and say but that. Are you sure that's what he wants to say? No. Why don't you say what's in your heart? I suppose because the Commodore has won so many cup races, does not wish to lose. Does not wish to be rejected. What makes you think I'd reject you? Oh, many reasons. We come from different cultures. Well, that's nonsense. Sergio. Yes. Will you marry me? What did you say? I said, will you marry me? Will you become my husband? You're asking me that question? That's what I wanted to ask you. You were too slow. I couldn't wait. Oh, my darling. I didn't hear you say yes. Are you rejecting me? Of course not. You're making the Commodore the happiest man in the world. Now, come in, Henrietta. Come in. Take that comfortable chair and tell me all about him. Carl, I don't know where to begin. I must say, when you took three weeks off for a Christmas cruise, I didn't think you'd come back with a husband. Well, I'd always heard that a ship's captain could marry you, so we let him go ahead and tie a sailor's knot. Well, when am I going to meet this lucky man? Carl, we haven't had our honeymoon yet. Honeymoon? Henrietta, I can't spare you another day. I didn't expect you to. I'm coming back to work. You see, Sergio and I, we well, thought... Is that his name? Ser Sergio? Yes. He's not going back to Rio just now. I persuaded him to move in with me till we decide where we're going to live. You're a Brazilian, then, this husband of yours, hmm? And from a very wealthy and distinguished family. I want you to meet one day. Hmm. He has a fleet of oil tankers, and maybe that's something U.S. Motors ought to be thinking about. So, my little Henriette is married. Well, I view all that with... Uh... Mixed emotions. I dread to think we're losing a policymaker for a diaper changer. Oh, not for some time, Carl. Don't you worry. And uh, you're sure about this fellow, are you? What do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, someone you met on a cruise. I mean, you don't know his people. Or... Carl, how old am I? He's moved in with you now. It doesn't sound like a rich Brazilian to me, not the ones that I've met. What's his last name? Now, you're not going to put in a call to our Brazilian distributor and check him out, are you? Me? Call Raphael? Why would I do that? What is Sergio's last name? Varese. Okay. Sergio Varese. And if you really want to know, you suspicious old coot, he never has to do another day's work in his life if he doesn't want to. Oh, No. No. He has income from his businesses and investments, which are handled by his Rio Bank, and it's a healthy six figures. All right. As long as you're satisfied, we're satisfied. But uh, I must tell you, it was somewhat of a strain for me those three weeks you were on your cruise. It's nice to be missed. You know, your secretary, Tom Hayward, did an okay job. Better than okay. I knew he would. One day, you'll be picking him out of the ranks. He was first class on follow-ups. And get this rebate promotional out to all the dealers wasn't easy. Tom's not going to be a secretary all his life. Oh, you know he's engaged to a lady cop, studying to be a detective. I know that marriage is very important to you these days, but if you don't mind, let's put a little thought into selling cars, okay? Jill, I don't like it one bit. Tom, the fire's dying down. Will you take care of it? Did you hear what I said, Jill? Tom, I really don't want to hear any more about Henrietta Tuft's private life. Jill, I tell you, the man she's married to is an out-and-out -out con man. Do you expect me to believe that a woman with all that executive savvy has been snowed by some Latin gigolo? What hard evidence do you have? Already you sound like a detective. Detective Sergeant Jill Kramer to you. You got any facts? Well, Friday I made out three checks to Sergio Varese, totaling $35,000 as she asked me to. When I said to her, hey, what's this? She said Sergio hadn't received his monthly remittance from his bank in Rio, and he was putting a down payment on some drilling equipment or something like that. What do you mean something like that? Well, she was awful vague about what the money was for, and I got the impression she didn't know herself. Well, where did she get the 35000 I had her treasury bond sold, practically all her savings. 
I made out the checks to him like I was told to. Well, she's worked hard for every penny, saved all of her bonuses, lives quietly, and this guy meets up with her on a cruise, and they're hardly off the ship three days when he's borrowing big bucks. Jill, we have to do something. Any ideas? Wait. That's all. Wait. And see if he pays it back. Sweetheart, I hate to do this with every fiber of my being. But I just got a cable today and they tell me that 35000 isn't enough. They want 20 more. But I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm... I'm a valued customer of Texas Tool and Dye, and for years they've been supplying us with rigs. They can't accept what I've sent them, then then the deal is off. You throw up the whole venture because they want a little more money as down payment on oil drilling equipment? It isn't the money, darling. It's the principle of the thing. I will not be held up by these crooks. I've written my brother and my father and mother. I've told them I'm not so sure that I care to remain here in a country where this is the type of treatment you receive. What do you mean, Sergio? You'd go back to Rio? What about me? What about us? Well, you'd leave America and come with me, of course. I, I, I would. Well, it's foolish pride, I know that. 20,000 they want more. I mean, what's 20,000? A drop in the bucket. The Commodore laughs at such things. It's the principle of it, Henry. Sergio, I won't have it. I've been having some conversations with the president of my company. And, well, frankly, I think there could be a future... Your company and U.S. Motors together. Besides, I have to stay here. What, 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 what would I do without you? My love, what did you do without me before? Well, I don't know. I, I can't even think. I, look, I'll get that money for you. Now, don't you say a word. It's my contribution to our marriage. Anyway, by the end of the month, your bank will be sending you uh, how much? Seventy-five, conservatively speaking. So there, what do I risk? I can easily get another 20 through the firm. They know I'm good for it. That easily? Really? For an emergency? You may not realize it, my love, but your little American wife is worth quite a lot to U.S. Motors. Tom? Yes, boss lady? Has Mr. Eaton returned my call yet? His secretary just hung up. I was coming in with a message. Oh, come in then. I got a call from Rosemary, and she said Mr. Eaton was a little under the weather and wouldn't be coming in until Monday. Well, that's bad luck. Was there anything I can do for you? Oh, I'm afraid not. In this particular instance, only Carl himself can help me. Well, if it's something for immediate decision, uh, what about the chairman of the board? I can reach him. He's in Detroit all this week. No, no, that won't do. Get me my husband on the phone, will you? Yeah, I'll put it through from my desk. Darling, I want to come home and talk to you. Will you be there? I'm leaving the office right now. Yes, of course. Uh, how did you make out with the money? I'll tell you when I see you. Now, darling, I... Look, don't be angry and try not to be disappointed. My boss, Mr. Eaton, is sick. He won't be back in the office before Monday. I need his approval before I can apply for a loan. Now, can it wait until Monday? Let's forget it, shall we? Everything. Cancel the order for the drilling rigs. I'm not having you put to such trouble waiting on this man for permission to borrow money. It's demeaning. And I can't allow my wife to do it, and that's final. Well, I, I, I can't do that. Do you? I, I, look, I know, but I, I will get to the chairman of the board. By Friday, you will have everything. The whole 35000 you wanted. Don't you understand? Sergio, darling, I love you, and I don't want you to be unhappy. It's too much, Jill, just too much. Today was the end for me. She got the chairman of the board to authorize a $35,000 loan against next year's salary and bonuses. Well, I thought she already gave her husband $35,000. She did, out of her savings. He said seventy dollars altogether. I made out the checks. Three last time, and two this time. One for fifteen, and one for twenty. I ask myself, why? Oh, he's paying someone off. You think so? Mm. Well, you're the detective. I believe you. But 
how she doesn't see she's being taken, I don't know. And she's only been Mrs. Sergio Barese for three weeks. If she's that. I never thought of that. If they're really married, you mean. How could we find out? Well, uh, we have a distributor in Rio called Rafael. Uh, look, I'll give him a call, first on company business, and then ask him to check into this Sergio character. Jill, I never thought I'd ever do anything behind Henrietta's back, but somebody's got to protect her. You think it's her own fault, do you? How could Henrietta marry such a man on such short notice? On the other hand, didn't our Latin lover bring L-O-V-E into the lady's life? Surely, that's worth something. It is amazing what a woman in love will stand for, but only up to a point. How far she will put up with him, we shall find out when I return shortly with Act Three. As I stand here in the wings of our mystery theater, I remember something Will Shakespeare said of a heroine of his. If thou rememberst not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee into, thou hast not loved. Will Henrietta remember these days as folly? She's within 30 seconds of opening her apartment door. Inside, her husband is on the phone. Fritz, Fritz, can you hear me? Yes, Sergio, I can. I got your letter today with its 25 enclosures. Good, that's why I called, just to make sure. We're, we're, we're all right, then. We're all paid up. Where are you calling from? Savannah, Georgia, in America. Sergio. What? Darling, I'm home. Fritz, I've got to hang up now. I'll see you. Oh, hi, darling. Are you home all day? Well, trying to run an international business by telephone is not too satisfactory. Did you make any plans for dinner tonight? Matter of fact, I did, my darling. The Commodore is cooking for his lady tonight. Now, I never asked you, but do you like Brazilian dishes? I never had any. We have a drink first, no? We have a drink first, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, it smells divine. What is it? It's a dish of my mother's. Feijoada. It is to us what your Thanksgiving turkey is to you. Here you are, darling. Here's your drink. And here is to your mother. I telephoned her today. Darling, she's very, very ill. I must go to see her. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, of course you must go. And you must come with me. Oh, I wish I could, darling, but how could I? Well, you must. She's very anxious to meet you. Well, I can't. I've just had three weeks off. Well, one more week won't matter to your United States motors, but it could matter a great deal to my mother. Why so? Well, can't, can't we go see her in the spring? Well, as soon as she hung up, I called her doctor in Rio. He told me it was touch and go. What's wrong with her? Oh, many things. Look, now you understand, I cannot waste even a single day. I must take you to meet her. But what am I to tell Carl Eaton? What do I care what you tell your Mr. Eaton? Tell him the truth. That your husband's mother's in Rio, that she's dying, and she wants to meet you before she dies. And just who do you think you are, talking to me in that tone of voice? You are my wife, that's who. Oh. You have certain obligations, and it's about time you found out what they are. I'm sorry, your mother isn't well. In my country, we respect our parents. We fly to them when they need us. Fly then, but don't count me in. Sergio, I suddenly realize you and I have a totally different way of looking at things. Uh, careful with that drink. You're spilling it on my tile floor. I'll show you how careful I can be. Oh, well, I see. So you and Brazil know how to act. Throw temper tantrums, break glasses. You pick up what you threw down, Sergio, every broken piece, and mop up the floor. In my country, the woman cleans the house. That was one of my best crystal glasses. You picked that up. I'll pick up nothing for you. I must have been crazy to become involved with an American. Oh. Ha. So Carl was right. It's true what he said. What's true? Never mind. I want to know what has been said about me. Oh, you're twisting my arm. I won't tell you anything. You think force is the way to treat people? I'll show you. Oh. Sergio, you have no idea how sorry you're going to be that you slapped me. What do you mean, Tom, that Henrietta 
just stopped and left for real. Mr. Eaton, I'm trying to explain. I talked to her husband. He said his mother was very ill, and they decided to go to Rio and see her. But Henrietta just took three weeks off. Now, why didn't she call me and say something? It's just not like her. I've been worried for days, Mr. Eaton. So I called Mr. Raphael in Rio. I asked him to check Verese out. I was just bringing you his cable. Yeah, let's see that. Mm. Confirmation. There is a Mr. and Mrs. Sergio Verese listed in the Rio directory. Raphael. Well, is that him and a wife? Or his mother and father. Well, just what I was wondering. Well, Tom, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to follow up on this any way you can. I don't care what you do, how you split your time between investigating and work here or whatever it costs. Well, my fiance is with the police department. I know that. I mean, since Henry and his marriage, she's just not the same girl. It's too valuable to the corporation for us not to keep track of her. Mr. Eaton, the call from Rio you've been expecting for a week is on the line. Oh, good. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Raphael. Yes, well, I've been hanging in midair for eight days waiting for your news. Yes, the ship docked in Rio yesterday. I got that. What do you mean he was, but she wasn't? Why didn't you call me sooner? Look, don't pay any attention to directors' meetings. My wife never does. They did? This morning? All right, fine, fine. Goodbye, Raphael, and, and thanks. Ship got into Rio. A Verizzi character disembarked, but Henrietta didn't. She wasn't in a cabin. The next day, the ship started back for Savannah. Verizzi got on alone. Well, I don't know how he did it, but he took 70000 of her money, and then he... Well, I don't dare say what I suspect. What, what? Tell me, Tom. Well, I hope she didn't discover he was a phony and face him with it, so he had to get her out of the way. Well, if that's true, why would he come back to the stage? When does that ship get back here? Hey, look, Tom, check the line. When it docks, you'll be there. I certainly will, Mr. Eaton. Come in, you two. Prima, is this your boyfriend? Yes, Captain, Tom Hayward. And he's just as determined to get to the bottom of the Henrietta Tufts mystery as we are. The woman who married the fern, yeah. And then went off with him to Rio without telling her boss. Well, she's hardly a missing person, Kramer. Now, what do you want to see me about? Well, the ship got in yesterday morning, but it docked two hours before schedule. And when Tom and I got there... No Henrietta. And no Sergio Vereza either. Captain, I'd like to request permission to examine the cabin they were booked on. Well, I don't see why not. And I'd like to go back to the apartment Henrietta shared with her husband and search further. If you can get a warrant from a judge, fine. Otherwise, I don't know anything about it. You didn't ask me. Kramer, the more practical experience you can get before they make you a detective, the better. Keep the department posted. Yes, sir. Come on in, Tom. Oh, that sure was a cooperative superintendent. Jill, I'm still shook up over seeing the cabin they were in. You mean because of the porthole? Porthole? It was a full-size window. Plenty large enough for him to pushed her body through it somewhere between Savannah and Rio. Now, look, just because no one saw her get off the boat in Rio doesn't have to mean that. All the people we talked to, the crew, stewards, they don't remember seeing him getting on or off either. Come on, let's have another look at the bedroom. Well, looks pretty much the same to me as it did before. Mm, except that one side of that double bed has been slept in. Henrietta. Shh. It's him. Sergio Verese. May I ask what you two are doing in my bedroom? My name is uh, Kramer, 13th Precinct Police. Uh, here's my ID. Lady Policeman. Well, I'm Mr. Verese, and I live here. Who is he? I'm your wife's secretary. Where is she? Where is Henrietta? Uh, Tom, I'll ask the questions. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Mr. Verese. Where is your wife? Isn't she here? Now, come on. You know she's not. Tom! 
Mr. Perezzi, you thought your wife was here? Well, of course. Where else would she be? And where have you been? I've been to Rio to see my mother. Now, where have you been since your boat docked yesterday? Well, I spent last night in the apartment. Well, so you knew your wife wasn't here. Well, I thought she might have come back by today. Mr. Perezzi, would you mind coming along with me to the police station? Not at all. If you can help me find her, now just wait one second till I change my tie. I'm beginning to understand, Jill. What? How Henrietta could have been taken in by this man. He is certainly one cool cat. <laughs> Captain Connolly, I can tell you only what I know. Yes, I had booked passage for Henrietta and myself to sail to Rio to visit my sick mother. Why sail if it was such a rush deal? Why not fly? I'd hoped to recapture some of the magic of the first time my wife and I had met. I know it was foolishly romantic of me. Because Henrietta never made the trip anyway. Oh, well... Hey, the... Let's hear Mr. Beresi tell it his own way. Well, about three weeks ago, before we sailed, we had a quarrel, as married people often do, about seeing my mother. Henrietta refused to go with me and simply walked out. Well, then she never sailed with you. Mr. Beresi, I put it to you. Your wife did not quarrel with you, and you are not expecting her here in Savannah. Well, what do you think happened? You think I killed her? Why do you say that? Because the inference is obvious. If I killed her, where is the body? Your wife is very much alive and at this moment is in Rio. Mr. Verese, you already had a wife when you married Henrietta Tufts. That much we know. But, Captain, why hasn't Henrietta shown up yet? Give her time. But, but if she doesn't, Captain, uh, are we going to charge this man with bigamy? When the real charge should have been murder? Prima, at this time, Mr. Verese, there are no charges against you. We're in touch with the police in Rio, and if the information we have proves correct, you will be charged with bigamy and deported. In the meantime, I urge you not to leave Savannah. <laughs> I used to come down to this airport a lot for the company, picking up VIPs, seeing Henrietta off on her business trips, but I never felt as rotten as I do now. Oh, Tom, I can see one of the marshals from here walking back from the plane. The other one's riding with Beresi, and we'll turn him over to the police in Rio. He's gotten away with murder. That's what it is, pure and simple. Oh, you have to understand how the law works, Tom. There was no body... No evidence of foul play. Just our suspicions. All we know is that Beresi has a wife in Rio. I think we better head back to town. Captain Connolly will be asking for my report. Jill. Hmm? Uh, honey, if you don't mind, I'll hang around the airport for a little longer. I used to go to the VIP bar with Henrietta for her last-minute instructions and a drink. Oh, I feel like having one now. Sure, Tom, I can understand. I'll see you tonight. Uh, bartender, uh, I'll have another double. I make that a bourbon on the rocks for me. Oh. Hello, Tom. Henrietta. Is that you? You look as white as a sheep, Tom. Well... Well, I always look like that when I see a ghost. Henrietta, you're alive. I have been all along. It is so good to get out of hiding. You didn't see me at all, did you? Huh? I followed you out here? <laughs> I wouldn't have missed seeing handcuffs on that louse for anything. Well, where have you been? Wearing this black wig and sunglasses, living in a hotel, and counting the days until they kick Sergio out of the country. I thought someone might think he'd murdered me, so I called Carl, and he said he'd keep it quiet, which reminds me, Tom. Carl is waiting for the news. Let's get over there. Henrietta, you're a sight for sore eyes. I'm sorry I couldn't see you right away, but a call just came in from Raphael in Rio. And what did he say? Well, he was at the airport when the marshals unloaded the man you thought you were married to. I tell you, that Sergio character is in big trouble. Seems he mailed 25000 to pay off a gambling debt. The Brazilian customs checked it. 
resealed the envelope, and then picked up the addressee, a big-time gambler who thought he'd been set up. He gave their cops a list of Sergio's wives as long as your arm, including his legal wife. Then, when he landed, they found the rest of the 70000 he took from you, checked the numbers we sent them, got him on bigamy, theft, smuggling currency. Got to be 10 to 20, Raphael says. Oh, yeah, come in, Tom. Uh, Henrietta, that reporter from the Trib showed up again. Wanted to know if you'd married a married man. Well, I told her there wasn't an ounce of truth in it, and that she'd just done herself out of an interview. What did I tell you, Carl? Didn't I say Tom Hayward was going places in this company? Sergio Parisi was quite indignant when he was searched upon arrival in Rio. He had 50000 hidden in a money belt. Since he'd already paid his gambling debts of 25000 five of that 50 was his own. But no one believed him, and it was all confiscated. And that reminds me of two jokes by my favorite playwright, which I'll be happy to share with you when I return shortly. who often wrote about swindlers and the swindled was William Congreve. In fact, he could have conceived the plot just unfolded. Certainly the characters. Women, he said, are like tricks by sleight of hand, which to admire we should not understand. Would that be Henrietta? As for Sergio, Congreve wrote, he that first cries, stop thief, is often he that has stolen the treasure. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Joyce Gordon, Bob Caliban, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Did you get rid of the rat? Well, we don't know. We haven't seen it for two days. Uh, I knew those pellets would do the trick. We're not sure it ate any of them. Oh? It kept pushing them down at us from its nest. Up there. You don't believe me? I believe anything that might happen in this house. Uh, so that's him. Staring down from the wall. The old hanging judge himself, eh? That's him. Evil as evil can be, he is. You can tell it to look at him. Curious you should put it that way. What way? You said, he is, not... He was. Of course he is. He won't believe his spirit's here ringing that bell. But we know it. And mark me, you're in for a hard lesson, don't I know it. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. White Sox Station, Sports Radio 78, WBBM, Chicago. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Music, it is said, has charms to soothe a savage beast, to soften rocks, or bend a knotted oak. For so many of us, music has provided so much happiness and comfort. And yet, so often, music, even the most divine music, has failed to soothe or soften or even comfort the very people who created it. Isn't it a mystery that so many of those gifted composers who wrote such heavenly melodies often felt they were living in hell? Hector, what, what, 
What are those? What do they look like? Double-barreled pistols, my friend. But why? I have four bullets. One for the scheming mother, one for the faithless trollop, and one for the fat fool for whom she betrayed me. And the fourth bullet? That's for me. You mean you'll kill yourself? Around. Would you rather I was sent to the guillotine? mystery drama, The Fourth Bullet, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Russell Horton and Bernie Grant. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Ask any successful person, what is the secret of your success? And the answer will usually be timing. Timing makes all the difference between failure and success. What was the wrong move yesterday may be exactly the right move for today. And so, the wise time their actions with one eye on the calendar and the other eye on the clock. But of course, the most important timing of all is beyond our power. Regardless of how talented or brilliant we happen to be, there is one thing none of us has the power to decide, and that is when we shall be born. And so often, that makes all the difference in the world. Ah, such divine music It will live forever Along with everything else he wrote Ah, I'm speaking of my best friend, Hector Berlioz This is the overture from an opera called The Secret Judges Ah, I wrote the libretto Hector, Hector, are you at home? Hector! Ah, Ferran! What are you doing here? What am I doing here? We, we had an appointment. Did we? Yes. I finished the libretto. You wanted to see it. What libretto? Oh, that's right. The secret judges. Well... Oh, don't... Tell me you've lost interest. No, 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 my friend, not at all. I'm fascinated more than ever by the whole dramatic idea. This court of secret judges in medieval Germany which dispenses a summary justice of its own. Uh, what was it called? Uh, the, the, the PEM. Yes, yes, and do you know there are those who say it still exists to this day, even in this enlightened year of 1830. Uh, Hector, uh, here it is. Do you want to read it? Oh, I can't at the moment. I'm leaving for Italy. Italy? When? Tonight. The Academy has given me a scholarship to study in Rome. Oh, oh I didn't know. Congratulations. <laughs> and the libretto's finished. Good, 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 good. I shall take it with me and write it in Rome. Rome, the eternal city. Uh, Hector, I, I, I wanted to talk to you about... Of course, course, of course you do. We must have a long discussion. Yes, but when? Tonight. But you're going... I'm not leaving Paris till after dinner. Come with me. I'm going to dine with the Countess Moke. Yes, but I haven't been invited well, to dine. You're with me. I have to have dinner there tonight. Why? Because I'm in love. Yes, dear friend. I'm going to marry... Mary, the Countess's daughter, Camille. And what made you fall in love with Camille Moak? When I heard her play A Rhapsody by Franz Liszt. So the sense of what you're saying, then, is that you fell out of love with one and in love with the other. Exactly, my friend. But how do you know you're not in love with the music? Oh, Ferran, look at the divine face of Camille Moak and tell me that. divine face of Mademoiselle Camille Moak, and I found it somewhat too intense for my taste. The same could be said about her playing, even though she was the latest rage of Paris and all of her concerts were sold out. Yes, the word to describe her would be intense, also smoldering, simmering, seething. If you ask me if these two ever were married, they would go up in flames. But <laughs> nobody ever did ask me. After dinner, Camille played a little music for us. Mm. 
magnificent, superb. Isn't she marvelous, Alain? I congratulate you, Mademoiselle Camille. My adorable Camille, our lives shall be spent with music. Oh, my beloved Hector, you shall write the notes, and I shall make them come alive. My angel, my adored one. Oh, my precious. My love. <laughs> These exchanges continued, despite the fact that uh, they were not alone in the room. Oh, I, I, I didn't count. To Hector, I was more or less like another piece of furniture. But among others, there were the Countess Moak and a thin gentleman called Ignaz Playel. And Monsieur Playel seemed quite upset. And obviously, the Countess wasn't giving him very much comfort. Are they not the most adorable-looking couple? Oh, well, well, Don't you think he is the most handsome gentleman in Paris, Monsieur Pleyel? <laughs> he has the most magnificent brow. Truly, a creative artist forehead. Yeah, but of I... course, he leaves for Italy tonight. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. He will be away for a year. Who knows what can happen? Especially when a girl is young and impetuous. Ah, look at her, Monsieur. She is a flower that must be constantly nourished by love. Have you the art to leave her to languish on the vine? Oh. Seize the day, the hour, the moment. Remember, absence makes the art go wander. Direct that searching art toward yourself. <laughs> That's what the old witch was after. To my friend Hector's face, she was as warm as the summer sun, gentle as the spring rain. But that's how women are. And we men, are we any better? How brilliantly she plays, Countess. My dear Hector, this is your inspiration at work. It is your noble spirit that moves her. How can I leave her? But you must. Fame, fortune, glory await you in Italy. Perhaps. Perhaps I shall not go. Oh, go. I'd return as one of the immortals. Already they speak of you in the same tone, whether for Mozart, Beethoven, even Bach. But... Bach didn't write operas. Which is why you shall surpass him in greatness one day. Ah, oh, how proud I shall be to call you my son. And so when the evening drew to its reluctant conclusion, there were tearful, almost heart-rendering farewells. Camille swore that she would be faithful to Hector forever. And three weeks later, she announced her engagement to play L. Somehow, I felt I'd better be there when Hector received the news. So, I decided to go to Rome immediately and tell him myself. What? It's Ferran! Hello, Hector. What good wind blew you to Rome? Come in, come in. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. I'm not even one bit disappointed. Disappointed? Oh, that you're not the post. I've been waiting all these days, all these weeks for a letter. Oh? Any special letter? Special? It's the only one in the world. For my darling Camille. I see. Hmm. Why is my beloved Camille so cruel to me? Why doesn't she write? Well, the, the fact is, perhaps it's because she no longer has anything to write about. Well, how can that be? Now that your engagement is broken... Well, even if our engagement is broken, how could that affect the plans for our... What did you say? Did, did you say... Our engagement is, is broken. Hector, believe me, it's for the best. She? She broke our engagement? Her mother wanted someone like Playel. Someone who, who was harmless and, and could be handled. <sighs> I want to be alone. So they used you to make him jealous, to, to force his hand. I must be by myself. Oh, Hector, if there's anything I can do. There is. Walk out that door. I was frightened. I had expected fireworks, but I wasn't prepared for a quiet, subdued Hector Berlioz. What would he do? But there was no help for it. 
I went outside. I remained near the house to watch, to wait. What are you doing here? Hector, you're spying on me. Oh, I'm, I'm worried. About what? About the engagement. I was afraid you might do something violent to yourself. Where, where are you going? I I must perform a few errands. Come dine with me this evening. Oh, why don't I come with you now? It would be best if you were not involved in this particular aspect of my activity. Till dinner, then. But, uh, if uh, you try to follow me, I shall never speak to you again. More fruit? Uh, no, thank you. I've had enough of everything. Uh, except an explanation. Hector Belios, what are you up to? Permit me to open this wooden box. This may explain. What are those? Well, what do they look like? Uh, pistols. Two double-barreled pistols. That's because four shots are needed. Four shots? Mm. One for the evil genius behind the plan, the mother. The second for the perfidious daughter. The third for Monsieur Playel. I've been wounded by these vulgar people. I have every right to restore my honor. But murder... I'm willing to pay the price. What price? I have two double-barreled pistols, four shots. Two for the women, one for the man, and the fourth one for me. You're going to kill yourself? Ferran, would you rather I went to the guillotine? Oh, I would rather you forgot the whole business. My friend, I am a Berlioz. And you intend to walk into the Countess's salon and simply commence this, this, this gunfire? Oh, no, it cannot be done simply. They know me, these harpies. They expect me to come back. They fear my vengeance. They'll take precautions. I should never be permitted to set foot in the house as Hector Berlioz. Then the thing's blown up right there. You couldn't even get into the house, which is the only place you could be sure of finding all of them together. I cannot get into the house, I said, as Hector Berlioz, but I can get in as someone else. Who? As the Marchesa di Forli Speranza. Who is the Marchesa di Forli Speranza? <laughs> you like her? I just made her up. Now, you know what a frightful snob Countess Moke is. She loves to collect all sorts of titles. So, I shall call at one of her soirees. I shall be admitted. I shall be announced. And once inside... I shall produce my two double-barreled pistols from where they've been hidden in my voluminous skirts. Oh, that reminds me. Voluminous skirts. We need a dressmaker. We need, a, we need a, uh, a dressmaker? You haven't been paying attention. I must have a complete wardrobe created for the Marquesa di Forli Speranza. Mm, no, not complete. A gown for when I shall call on the Countess Moak and uh, a traveling costume. A traveling costume? Of course. Are you going to travel? Dress as a woman? I should travel as the Marquesa de Forli Speranza. Yeah, but why? Even if you intend to go through... If? You don't have to dress up as a woman until you're about to enter the Countess's house. Hector Berlioz pretending to be the Marquesa de Forli Speranza would never be admitted inside. Therefore, I must become the Marquesa. Oh, but Hector... Not I... another word. Those who are not with me are against me. Now, where do you stand... I'm with you. Good! It's not the first foolish thing you've ever done, but uh, it may very well be the last. And so the plot thickens and the pace quickens. Revenge for an insult. Loaded pistols. Disguising oneself as a woman. It has all the time-honored ingredients of grand opera. And why shouldn't it? Isn't it all being conceived by one of the great operatic composers himself? We shall return with Act Two shortly. He seems a bit flaky, this Hector Berlioz. And you may think we're taking poetic license, but the fact is, he was quite a singular character. And he did live in a very floridly romantic age. Remember, his contemporaries were Byron and Keats and Shelley and Poe and a great many others who insisted on marching to the beat of their very own drummers. Here once again is Monsieur Ferron, Hector Berlioz's best friend, who seems to be taking this latest escapade as a matter of course. Yes, well, he had every intention of disguising himself as a woman 
in traveling to Paris to kill three people and then himself. So you might ask yourself, why didn't I try to stop him? My answer, how could I? My only hope was, was to humor him and to pray that over the course of what would be quite a long journey, something might come along to distract him. I must become letter perfect as the Marquesa de Foley Speranza. Yes, yes, Hector. Who is she? Think, think. What sort of woman? What are her tastes? Oh, Hector, after all, how... We I... are creating a character, my good Ferrand. You talk as if this were, were theater. Well, of course it is. When I present myself to the major domo at Countess Moke's establishment as the Marquesa de Foley Speranza, shall I not be playing a part? And unless I believe in the character, as every good actor must, my audience will not believe me. Now, to begin, I must shave closely. Now, then, I shall be posing as a woman of 30. What colors suit my personality? What is my personality? You would think he was composing an opera. Well, whether he knew it or not, he was. Of course, it would have an ending unlike anything in the theater. The people who would be shot in the final scene would remain dead forever. Oh, I kept hoping for something to turn up, but every day saw the plot advance further. Finally, it was time for wardrobe. We went to the finest shop in Rome, naturally. Only the best for Hector. And how may I be of help, Signor? Ah, Signora, we wish to purchase several outfits for a young lady. Ah, I shall be happy to serve you. What does the young lady need? Everything. Oh, I see. Particularly a traveling costume. Yes. Also, a formal gown and all of the uh, required undergarments. I understand. Can it be done quickly, Signora? As quickly as you can bring the young lady in for her fittings. Oh, well, that may present us with a difficulty. It's, it's not convenient for the young lady to come here. In that case, perhaps you could supply me with her measurements. Her measurements? Or would that also be inconvenient? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, we could do that right away. Do you happen to have them with you? Actually, you might say that I have them on me. Senor? You see, the young lady and myself, by a coincidence, happen to have the same measurements. Exactly. The same Measurement? Mm, you might add an inch or two, or perhaps three to certain uh, parts of the um, basic costume. Oh, yes. I suppose I could. Good. Shall we begin? <laughs> They began. There was a burst of activity throughout the entire shop, what with stitching and cutting and sewing and embroidering and who knows what else. He'd keep going back for more measuring and consultations about colors and... Well, I lost track of it all. But finally, it came to an end. Everything fit perfectly. Signora Rosetta, you have done a most spectacular job. You're a sublime artiste. Oh, grazie, signor. There's your money. Oh. Thank you again, Signor. May I say that you... Uh, that is, I mean, the young lady will be quite charming. I shall be forever in your debt. Come, Ferrand, my good friend. Let us be off. Maria! Maria, come here, child. Those two French gentlemen who just left the shop, follow them. See where they go. <laughs> And now what, my friend? Now we go home to France. There's a break that sails from Ostia to Marseille. No, 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 no. We shall return overland. By land? <laughs> Do you realize we'd have to ride through more than half of Italy and all of southern France? The trip from Marseille to Paris is bad enough for that. But... We need the time, Ferran. For what? A rehearsal. Very well, my friend. If you insist, we'll get seats on an overland stage. No, we'll hire a trap. A trap? And, and a driver? What, with changes of horses? Do you realize the expense? Mm, it won't be too bad if we drive it ourselves. What was the use? He would have his way. We hired a trap. It was small. It was uncomfortable. The roads were narrow and needed repair. Deserted for the most part. 
And we could never make real time because we had to keep stopping to rehearse. Now, let us play the entire scene again. Go ahead. The major domo opens the door. I tell him I am the Marquesa de Fole Speranza. He bows, he admits me, he passes me along to an usher who conducts me to the reception room. He raps on the floor with his staff and announces my name. Wait, 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 wait. The floor. What floor? The, the, the fatal flaw in the plan. Now, you can dress like the Marquesa, you can wear your hair like a Marquesa, you can walk like her, smile like her, but once you open your mouth, you, my friend, are undone. Your voice is the voice of Hector Berlioz. Oh, I... I can disguise my voice. Can you? Can you sound like a woman? Pretend I'm the majordomo. Tell me who you are. Mm, very well. Um, <clears throat> I am the Marquesa de Forli Speron. Didn't sound too good, did it? Uh, no. Was no. it forced? Yes. An artificial? I'm right. I have to work on it. There's just no way I can do it, is there? No way at all. <sighs> what am I going to do now? Go back to Rome. Study. Create. But my revenge. Oh, revenge yourself by becoming successful. Show her what she lost when she cast you aside. No one casts Hector Berlioz aside. She made me the laughing stock of Paris. They all did. All three of them. They are going to pay for it with their lives. Yes, but this present plan of yours is obviously unworkable. Oh, 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 oh. Wait. Why do you say that? Aside from the voice, it's all perfection, isn't it? Yes, but the voice destroys the illusion. Then there shall be no voice. The Marquesa is unable to speak. The Marquesa is dumb? The Marquesa is mute. But how can you introduce yourself if you're unable to speak? Well, you shall do it for me. You will be my escort. Come, come, we must rehearse. We are arm in arm at the door of the Countess's house. Uh, here is the butler. Huh? What do you say? Huh? Oh, uh, uh, Monsieur Ferrand and the Marquesa de Folly Speranza. Mm, you need more confidence, more authority. Well, I'm sorry. I've never been a person of very much confidence or authority. Uh, you'll get it in rehearsal, my friend. Never fear. Now, uh, come along. We're ushered into the salon. There they are, this despicable trio, the Countess, Camille, and Monsieur Pleyel. Now, now don't stand there. Introduce me. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Uh, uh, may I present the Marquesa di Forli Speranza? Uh, we can smooth all that out. Uh, now, everyone smiles, and I produce the pistols. Everyone is shocked. No one can move. I fire the first barrel. The Countess falls a ball through her scheming head. I fire the second barrel. Camille falls with a bullet through her perfidious heart. I drop the first pistol. I bring the second to bear. I pull the trigger. Foolish Playel falls mortally wounded. And now, as everyone watches in horrified silence, I simply kill myself. Mm. Now, let's do it again. Why did I take all this from Hector Berlioz? He was a genius. And he had a hard life. He was born at the wrong time. He was too classical for the romantics and too romantic for the classicists. In addition, he had a new way of perceiving music. Innovators in art always have a difficult time of it. Of course, I was having a difficult trip. My back was killing me. Wake up, Ferrand. Wait. Wake up! Hmm? Huh? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, Hector, why did you do that? If I was lucky enough to doze off, why couldn't you just let me sleep? Time to rehearse. Oh, no, not again. Yeah, we'll stop here. Whoa. Whoa, I said. Oh, these nags are as hard to conduct as the musicians at the Paris Opera. <sighs> now, then, Ferrand, let us begin. Hector, look back there. What is it? All I can see is a cloud of dust, but... Seems to be coming this way very quickly. Well, obviously, people are coming, but that's no affair of ours. I just hope that we're no affair of theirs. Hector, look, they have guns. Perhaps they're soldiers. But they're not wearing uniforms. 
What do you suppose that means? If they're not in the military, and they're armed, and they're riding so fast, it means only one thing. They must be bandits. Let me take those reins. Uh, Get up. Hand me the whip, Hector. Yes. Why must be wrong? I have my two double-barreled pistols. Are you mad? Uncap those weapons. And hide them under the seat. Quickly. I am a Berlioz. I shall never refuse a fight. Hector, listen to me. I learned all about bandits in Sardinia. If you look as if you mean to defend yourself, mm-hmm. you'll be shot down at once. Well, then why are we running from them? That. <laughs> They're, they're, they're gaining on us. Why not get it over with? They like the excitement of a good chase. Parand, are you sure they won't shoot us anyhow? Hector, in this world, how can one be sure of anything? You can be sure, at least, of this. There's going to be a third act to our story. Hector Berlioz is headed for Paris, where he intends to take drastic and fatal revenge on three people who have made him appear ridiculous. That is... He will if he can ever get there. Act three will be upon us shortly. Here we have one of the great composers of the 19th century, Hector Berlioz, a man whose artistic immortality has already been established. And what is he doing? He is disguised as a woman. And he is driving at full speed down a back road in rural Italy, being hotly pursued by a gang of highwaymen. Can you go any faster, Ferran? They're gaining on us. No. No, I I, I think it's time we stop running. They may become angry and start shooting at us. But can't I fire at them? Perhaps I can scare them off. Please, Hector, they mustn't know we're armed. Oh! Oh, there! going to do now? You mustn't say a word. Not a word. Or I shall try to appeal to their sense of chivalry. Here they come. Well, well try to look frightened. You mean I don't look frightened now? I'm, 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 I'm scared out of my wits. Try harder. Well, what have we here? Good day to you, senor. A back for one to you. May I have your money? Oh. Certainly, senor. And uh, to whom do we owe this opportunity to share our wealth? I'm called Il Pardo. You ever heard of me? Who hasn't heard of the leopard? Uh, who is that beauty sitting there beside you? Huh? Oh, oh uh, it's, 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 it's my wife. What is your name, my exquisite senor? She, uh, she cannot speak. She cannot speak? For what reason? She suffers. Uh, from an illness, an illness. That's why we're on the road. We are uh, hurrying toward Florence. Yes, yes, I see how pale she yes, is. Yes, there's a famous doctor there. Perhaps he will cure her. And perhaps he will kill her with his infamous pills and potions. My friend, there is no need to travel all the way to Florence to see this quack. Oh, but we do I have... myself can cure her. Oh, how pale she is. Yes, yes. She suffers. She suffers from living in the dirty, dusty, crowded city. She suffers from lack of fresh air to breathe, spring water to drink. Although this is a rather delicate subject, it should be obvious. She is withering away because of lack of affection. But we can remedy all these deficiencies here in our helpful mountains. What does that mean? It means that if a woman pleases me... And I intend to have her. But she's my wife. True. So you have two choices. You can sell her to me, or you can fight me for her. Fight? But you you wouldn't want her. Why not? Oh, because, well, she may may not be everything you think she is. She is everything and more. I will have this woman. Come down, my magnificent blossom. Let me sweep you into my saddle. We shall ride to paradise together. But you... You wish to be paid? Very well. I shall let you keep your money, your baggage, your horses. Fair enough? More than fair. And now, beloved, come to me. Soldiers, run! Bombs! They switched me out. Another time, my angel. We shall meet again. Head across the field, men! 
saved. Oh. We're saved, Paran. Yes, yes. We've been delivered from these brigands. Doesn't this prove that Providence is with us? We are destined to succeed. Oh, sir, sir, I want to thank you for saving our lives. Don't thank me so quickly. You may have been better off with the bandits. You are under arrest. Arrest? What's the charge? Espionage. But we're... We're not spies. Silence! You will be given a fair trial before we hang you. It was a long, slow, terrifying journey back to Rome. We weren't permitted to say a word, not even to each other. We were taken to a grim-looking building. We were surrounded by serious-faced soldiers. Bring in the woman. The woman! If only you would allow us to explain. Silence. You are the Signora Rosetta. Hmm? Yes, Colonel. And these are the men? Oh, these are the men. And that is my dress he is wearing. And I didn't steal it. I paid for it. Silence. Continue. Why should a man wish to dress as a woman? I ask myself. Suddenly, the answer became clear. He must be a spy in the service of the King of France. But that isn't true. Basta, Signor. You will be given your opportunity. Now, do you deny that you are a Frenchman? I proclaim it. Therefore, does it not stand to reason that you are a spy? Why does that stand to reason? All the Frenchmen are spies. But I, sir, am Hector Berlioz. Who is Hector Berlioz? Oh, I am a composer. I never heard of you. Ask! Ask at the Academy! I don't know anyone at the Academy. I don't hold much with composers. But you could ask... Uh, ask Paganini. My instinct tells me that you are an agent of... Hold. Did you say Paganini? Ah, now there is a musician for you. Well, ask him. He'll identify me. Very well. But if you are not who you say you are... You can't expect to be looking at a firing squad in the morning. A firing squad? Would you rather be hanged? Send for Signor Nicolo Paganini. And so they finally ran him down. And Signor Paganini came in as diabolical looking and sardonic as ever. They said he was in league with the devil. Only Satan could teach a man to play a violin at such speed. And he looked at Hector without blinking an eye, as if it were absolutely normal for anyone to go about dressed as a woman. Yes. Yes, this is a barely hot. You are a certain? Yes, I commissioned him to write the viola concerto for me. <laughs> it wasn't much good. That's a lie. It was excellent. You're complaining because your part wasn't big enough. What am I supposed to do during a half of it? Fall asleep? Colonel, it's called Herald in Italy. It's magnificent. It is a trap. It's ahead of its time. Charlatan. Ship safe, Hitler. Get out of here, the bug of you. Madmen. Lunatics. What is this? An insane asylum? So the days went by. We crossed the border into France. We drew closer and closer to Paris. Nothing occurred to me. The colonel was right. Berlioz was a madman. He would go through with this. And how could I stop him? And we would pause in some deserted field and rehearse constantly. And now I produce my pair of pistols. The first bullet for the countess. The second for Camille, the third for the fool, and the fourth for me. Very good. Let us ride on, my friend. Hector, I uh, was hoping... For what? For a return of reason. Are you saying I've lost my reason? Well, I, I thought this long ride might have made you reconsider. Never. I was all for land. There's a slogan in the Berlioz family. The stain of an insult can only be washed away by blood. But then, what washes away the stain of the blood itself? I am not concerned with that. 
Why didn't I report him to the police? What can I say? I was completely under his spell. I knew him as the greatest genius of his time. I prayed with all my heart that something at the last second would turn up to avert this tragedy. But we arrived in Paris. And we went to the house of the Count of Smoke. And we were admitted as Monsieur Ferrand and the Marquesa di Forli Speranza. She's always at the piano, the minx. Hector. Quiet, quiet. Soon she'll be finished. And her mother and that oof will join her. And then you will present me, Hector, for the last time. Please. My mind is made up even more strongly than ever. She blushes. How modestly she bows. What falsehood? What artifice? Does anyone wish to know who this woman really is? Ask me. Now they come toward her. In just a moment, you shall present me. Hector, Hector. Suppose, suppose what? Something goes wrong. Oh, what can go wrong? A pistol can always misfire. No, not these. I've carefully measured out the charges to the final grains of powder. I have the finest, the most expensive percussion caps. Yes, but still... Even more important, I am perfectly rehearsed. I raise the first pistol, two shots the women. I raise the second, one shot the man. The fourth shot for me. I've done it over and over a hundred times. No. No, you haven't. You haven't even done it once. Are you mad? How many times have I fired? You've only fired three shots. Never, not even once, have you fired the fourth. Oh. Well, uh, that's that's because... Yes? Because? Well, hang it all. I can only kill myself once. How do you know you can even kill yourself at all? Well, because... To kill the three would be a source of immense gratification. True. Oh, how true. But, 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 to kill yourself afterward? You don't know yet if you can really hold the muzzle of that pistol to your temple. You don't know if you can pull the trigger and allow the trigger to blow your brains out. Please, Ferrand, you you needn't be so indelicate. Shall you be able to say farewell, farewell to life, to art? Shall you murder not only the four of you, but also the great works that are still in your head, waiting to be released? The operas, the symphonies, the fantasies, all the brilliant music of Berlioz. Shall most of it die unborn? Now, Ferrand, you must not try to, um, to weaken my resolve. But how strong is it? Can you turn that pistol on yourself? Have you ever rehearsed? Do not try to swerve me from my purpose. Die or don't die. Hector, I wash my hands of it. I am leaving. Farewell, Hector. Goodbye forever. Wait, wait, wait. For end. Wait. For what? Looking at her, getting up from the piano with that simpering smile? This is your queen of beauty? Your angel of delight? What can I do? I love her still. After what she said... Remember what she said last time we were in this house? My darling Hector, she said, you shall write the notes and I shall make them come alive. She said that? She will breathe life into my divine music? Why, that fumble finger... Why not tell her yourself? Here they come now. Mama, daughter, and the fool. Ah, uh, Monsieur Ferron, do please introduce us to the lovely Marquesa. All Paris is talking about her. I can introduce myself. That voice. Why, it's... It's, it's a it's... fool named Hector Berlioz who came here to put you out of your misery. But now I say unto you, suffer! 
Endure a lifetime of agony and stupidity and arrogance. Do you see these pistols? Oh, my... You cannot have the blessed relief from these precious bullets. I give them to your ceiling. Your mirrors. Your windows. You are a madman. No, madam, I was a madman. But now, my sanity is completely restored. That remark might have inspired differences of opinion among his contemporaries, but then again, if you were to rate sanity on a scale of one to ten, where would most of us place? And uh, what did our story prove? Quite possibly that these illustrious people whom we tend to set up on pedestals have feet of clay, just like the rest of us. However, my feet, even if of clay, shall bring me back here shortly. You've got it. So you may ask yourself, was this a true story? Of course. The incidents are selected from the memoirs of Hector Berlioz himself. So if it's fiction, it's his fiction, not ours. Of course, we have juggled a scene here and there, adjusted the timing a bit. But when dealing with composers and poets, one is always entitled to take a bit of poetic license. No? Our cast included Russell Horton, Bernie Grant, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Personality is a very individual thing. You are who you are, and you're usually quite sure of it. When you awake in the morning, you don't sit up wondering who you are. You know right away that you're John Jones or Edna Smith. But in the story about to unfold, that isn't exactly the case. You'll see what I mean when our tale gets underway. I don't want to give it away. We'll let the drama speak for itself as we go inside a large metropolitan hospital to a room on the tenth floor. George? Darling? How are you feeling? Hello. You're looking much better. Thanks. It's nice of you to visit. Has anyone called my wife? It's all right, dear. I'm right here. I'm your wife, darling. Please, call my wife. She ought to know about the accident. mystery drama, A Second Chance, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Paul Hecht and Bob Caliban. I'll return shortly with Act One. Kodak brings the instant to life. Kodak wants to offer you some instant fun money for a limited time only. Get a $10 rebate when you buy either the Kodak Colorburst 250 or the new Colorburst 350 instant camera. With either instant camera, you get the sharp, rich, vivid color pictures Kodak is famous for. See your photo dealer for details about Kodak's $10 fun money offer. Kodak brings the instant to life. The new breed. The brave men and spirited women who settled in a land teeming with promise. They were the immigrants who would forge an independent nation out of the colonies of 17th century America. 
The New Breed, a new historical novel from the producers of Wagons West. Read The New Breed by Douglas Elliott, the first in the all-new American Patriot series in paperback from Ballantine Books. This is Ken Howard. If you're over 18 and already out of school, I have a personal question for you. Can you read as well as you would like to? I don't mean just traffic signs and sports programs. I'm talking about books, magazines, and newspapers, and the labels on medicine and food packages. If you don't read well enough to understand these, you can get help at your library. Many libraries offer assistance for people who didn't learn to read very well in school. If they don't have the programs themselves, librarians can often recommend a local tutor, self-help books, or even televised instruction that includes other subjects as well as reading. 25 million Americans have trouble reading, and some of them don't even realize it, or they're too embarrassed to ask for help. If you are one of them, don't waste your mind any longer. The libraries in your area are waiting to help you. You just walk right in and ask for books on any subject that interests you, whether it's basketball, basket weaving, or the mystery of the Baskervilles. You name it, the library has it. They've got your number. Now you get theirs and give them a call. A public service message of the American Library Association. Marvels of medical science are amazing. The number of lives that have been saved in emergency rooms all over the country are almost countless. Today, a man's chances of surviving a heart attack are greater than ever because of new knowledge, quick action, and modern machinery. George Carswell was playing cards with his wife and friends when he was hit with a sudden blow to the chest. He was rushed to the emergency room of the local hospital. Manual compression first. Get that tube down his throat, nurse. Shall we get ready for shock, doctor? I have it ready, nurse. Anything on that monitor? No, no heartbeat at all. More oxygen. We're ready for shock, Dr. Hall. The paddles. Low voltage first. Any response on the monitor? None yet. We won't give up. Increase the voltage. Who is it, do you know? Uh, Mr. George Carswell. Overweight, smell of alcohol and tobacco on him. When will they learn? Anything yet, nurse? Nothing, doctor. Adrenaline. Uh, he's clinically dead right now, but I'm not giving up. Is somebody there? I... I think somebody's there. I am. Who are you? I'm... Funny, I, I, I'm trying to think. I, I don't know what happened to me. I'm... Yes, I'm George Carswell. How long have you been here? I, I don't know. I can't figure it out. I, I, you know, I don't know where we are. Something's coming back to Marlin. Yeah, the name Marlin... Henry Marlin. That's who I am. But that's all I remember. I know my name, but nothing else. What happened to you? I don't know. I can't see you. I can't see you? I wonder why. I can hear you. Or rather, I can feel your presence. Uh, uh, how... How did you get here? Uh, uh, do you know? No. I don't remember a thing. Mine's a blank. I, I feel awfully peaceful, though. I seem... I seem to remember something now. It, cards. Playing cards. I don't remember a thing. I wonder how we got here. I wonder where we are. You feel a... a sort of tugging sensation? No. It's like I was being pulled somewhere. Hey, hey, don't leave. I, I, I don't want to be left alone here. I can't seem to do anything about it. A force. Hey. Pulling. Please. Pulling. Please, d don't go. I can't. Help me! I don't want to be left here alone. A 
Another minute and it'll be too late. Still not breathing. It's been seven minutes, Doctor. I'll keep at it. I won't give up. Get another syringe ready. Dr. Hall, there's a pulse. Faint. Come on. Beat. Beat. It's there. A definite pulse. Lips on the monitor. There it goes. Oh, look at that beat. We've got him back. Mrs. Carswell. Dr. Hall, is he... He's alive. Oh, thank you, thank you. And thank God. Please, sit down. Your husband had a very close call. He was clinically dead for seven minutes. He's critical. Will be for some time, but he is alive. And I give him a pretty good chance. He had no history of heart disease. No. He was never sick a day in his life. We were playing bridge with the Maxwells, and suddenly George just dropped his cards. He he tried to stand up, and he collapsed over the table. Uh Uh-huh. May I see him? Oh, for a moment. He's unconscious. You can look in on him, but don't speak. Sometimes the subconscious will respond, and I want complete rest and quiet. He's in intensive care now. Why don't you go home? I'll call you when he comes to. Oh, no. I I would rather stay, no matter how long it is. I'd go crazy at home. I'll be back around ten in the morning. They know where to reach me if there's any change. Mrs. Carswell. Hmm? Oh. Good morning. Oh, Dr. Hall. I've been here all night. Mr. Carswell's awake. He hasn't said anything, but uh, I think you can see him now. Just for a moment. Oh, thank you. His vital signs are excellent. Much better than I expected. Uh, Well, here we are. George. Darling. Don't try to speak. I'm here. He's frowning. (laughs) He's heavily sedated. But he recognizes you. George, you're going to be all right. You're going to get well. Who? Hush, hush, dear. You mustn't move. You have to rest. Uh, Who? Who are... Mrs. Carswell. Step outside with me for a moment, please. There might be some brain damage. Oh, no. He was clinically oh. dead, you see, and when the brain is deprived of oxygen... Yes, I know. I've read about that. Oh, do you think... That... I can't say anything until we've run some tests, and that will be a while. We've got to build up his strength first. Well, of course. I... I'll have you taken home and have that good cry. You've been under a terrible strain. Let the tension go. Who who are you? Good morning, Mr. Carswell. I'm Nurse Wilson. Uh, What what happened to me? Uh, Dr. Hall has to explain that to you. Uh, I'm in a hospital? Yes. Two days now. Nancy, page Dr. Hall and send him to intensive care. Mr. Carswell is awake. Your wrist, please. How long have I been here? You were admitted the day before yesterday. Oh, then... Then I wasn't killed. Oh, no, sir. You're very much alive. Weak, but alive. I'm... I'm trying to remember... Don't try now. Everything out of your mind. The doctor is on his way. I was practically outside the door when I heard the page. He's awake, doctor. Well, how do you feel, Mr. Coswell? I, I think you've, you've got the wrong patient, doctor. Uh, I'm not... Uh, who, who is this Coswell? Uh, That's you, uh, Mr. Coswell. Oh, I, I never heard of him. My, my name's Marlon. Henry Marlon. Mrs. 
Carswell. He keeps insisting he's someone called Henry Marlin. Has he ever known anyone by that name? Not that I know of. I've never heard the name. His confusion is natural enough after what he's been through, but this is the first time I've had a patient come out of it thinking he was someone else. They're sometimes vague, can't remember. Uh, talk to him carefully, Mrs. Carswell. Uh, try not to get him excited. I'll try. Well, yeah, someone to see you. George, how are you feeling? Hello. You're looking much better. Thanks. It's nice of you to visit. Has anyone called my wife? It's all right, George. I'm here. She ought to know about the accident. You'll be all right soon. Who are you? Why do you keep calling me George? Oh, dear. One moment, Mrs. Goswell. Oh, if only I could get up. <sighs> it's too weak. Please, please call my wife. Where? Uh, uh, where can we reach her? Uh, there, there's my wallet. Uh, identification. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was lost. In, in the accident. What accident, uh, Mr. Marlin? Well, that's why I'm here, isn't it? The motorcycle accident. A blinding light. A car, I think. I, oh, I can't seem to remember it all. You think you had a motorcycle accident? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm confused. Yeah, yes, I... I was riding my motorcycle. I, I don't know why. I was going somewhere. George doesn't have a motorcycle. Where do you live, Mr. Marlin? I'm trying to live... Um, Spring Street, I think. Spring Street. Where? Well, here. Right here in St. Louis. But... You, uh, you will call my wife, Doctor. We'll do the best we can. You rest now. Yeah, uh, her name is Grace, Gr Grace Marlin. She'd better know about my accident. We'll try. I'll have Miss Wilson bring you a sedative. Just rest and we'll do all we can. Come, Mrs. Carswell. Uh, please call my wife. This is very hard to take. I'm sure it's temporary. He's a whole different personality. It's not just what he says, but the way he says it. He's... He's just not George. He thinks he's in St. Louis. This Marlin must be someone he's had dealings with in the past, even though he's never talked about him to you. Will he stay this way? I don't know. When he's... Strong enough, we'll put him into psychotherapy. Try to draw him back to reality. Thinking about the Carswell case, Dr. Hall, you're, you're really this somber. Yes. It's doubly difficult, nurse. A heart patient has to be kept quiet and, above all, free from anxiety. Carswell's delusion is upsetting him. Could it be some sort of amnesia in reverse? Instead of forgetting who he is, the shock of the heart attack made him suddenly remember another past. It seems to me the only possibility at the moment. Mrs. Carswell says he's never mentioned the name of Henry Marlin or being in St. Louis. They were buried in his psyche. I want to do something, and I'm afraid to do it. Can I help? I have the strongest desire to try and see if there is a Mrs. Grace Marlin in St. Louis. I think you have to. You'll have to put that idea to rest. Uh, operator, may I have the area code for St. Louis, please? Thank you. Well, if there is a Mrs. Marlin... What do I do next? Well, Doctor, I'd cross that bridge when you come to it. What city, please? St. Louis. Yes? Do you have a listing for a Henry Marlin or Grace Marlin on Spring Street? I don't have a street number. One moment, please. 
Uh, she's checking. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, sir. That number is five 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 eight one eight one. Could it be the same Henry Marlin? George Carswell awakes from a near-fatal heart attack and claims he's Henry Marlin from St. Louis. Apparently, he's not imagining things. The telephone company has a listing for him. Is it amnesia? Is it someone George knew from years before and now imagines himself as that person? Or could something uncanny have happened on that operating table? If you're thinking what I'm thinking, we'll find out the answer when I return with Act Two. Taking a laxative? Yeah, traveling throws my system off. But so can a laxative. Not Metamucil. That's Metamucil? Metamucil Instant Mix in a little packet. Oh. Easy to take along. And easy on your system. Because Metamucil is made from natural fiber with no chemical stimulants. More doctors recommend Metamucil for really gentle relief. Mmm, I like that orange flavor. Mm -hmm, me too. Easy to take. If not nature, Metamucil. Read label and follow directions. With all the great paint values available during True Test Anniversary Paint Days until July 12th at True Value Hardware Stores, you'll want to be able to apply the paint you choose in the easiest, most professional way. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest the Easy Painter 8-Piece Pad Painting Kit for just $444. This handy kit includes two 4x6-inch painting pads, a mini brush pad, sturdy tray, and more. Get the Easy Painter 8-Piece Pad Painting Kit for just four forty four at participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Say that Pat Summerall sent you. Every day, people face all sorts of tests. Driver's tests, tests at school, and every day, tests on life. Oh, Mr. Cadwell, you're next. Ah, oh, Mr. Cadwell, uh, please take a seat. Thanks. Are you ready for your test on life? Uh, I guess so. Well, don't worry. It's only for practice. This time, that is. First question. If your son broke your favorite fishing rod, would you, A, be understanding, or B, yell at him? Uh, was it really my favorite fishing rod? Oh, Mr. Cadwell. Uh, would you stab someone in the back to get a promotion? How big a promotion? Uh, I mean, I'm... Oh, a, come, come, Mr. Cadwell. Well, I... Gee, I don't know. Well, you can find the answers at your local house of worship. That's where you and your family can learn about handling the everyday problems we all face. Religion in American life, Mr. Cadwell. We need it. A message from Religion and American Life, the Ad Council, and this station. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, and uh, see you later. You can count on it. A doctor has a difficult decision to make. The man he saved from a near-fatal heart attack claims to be someone else. The doctor suspects brain damage until he finds that there's a telephone listing for the man George Carswell now claims to be, Henry Marlin. Who is Henry Marlin? A phone call to that number would answer a lot of questions. But then again, it might raise even more. Are you going to call, Dr. Hall? I've got to give that a lot of thought. If, as you suggest, it's amnesia, she hasn't seen him in years. He's been living as George Carswell for 20 what do you tell a woman whose husband disappeared 20 years ago that here he is under a name of George Carswell? Uh, I don't know. And neither do I. Suppose you were to call. Yes. But just ask for him. No explanations. What if he's there? Well, pretend to be a telephone magazine salesman. Anything. It's obviously a different Henry Marlin. The operator gave me the number right off. If there were more than one Henry Marlin, she would have asked for further information. Oh, true. Miss Wilson, what do I do? Make the call. Well, before I lose my nerve, let's see who answers 555-8181. Five, 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 eight, one, eight, one. You can always be noncommittal. Say it's a wrong number, even. Yes, is this the Henry Marlin residence? Yes. Is uh, Mr. Marlin there by any chance? Henry. Uh, Mr. Marlin died three days ago. Died? Three days ago? Who is this, please? 
I, I'm Mrs. Marlin. C- uh, could you tell me how he died? Uh, are, are you a friend of his? Uh, not exactly. He was killed in, in a motorcycle accident at Three Rivers Bridge. A car went through an intersection. The gas tank on Henry's motorcycle exploded. This was three days ago? Yes. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm sorry to have troubled you. Who is this calling, please? Goodbye, Mrs. Marlin. He died three days ago, consumed in a fire. Three days ago? But... Yes, but it's not amnesia or brain damage. Whoever this Henry Marlin is, we brought back his personality when we brought George Carswell's body back to life. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Did you call my wife? Yes. Is is she coming? Uh, Mr... Uh, Mr. Marlin. Well, I'm glad you finally know who I am. Do you remember an accident? Oh, yes, yes. I, I was riding my motorcycle, and, and, and then out of a side street, a, a car... Well, that's why I'm in the hospital, isn't it? That car clobbered me. Yes. Your wife told me you were in a motorcycle accident. Well, then she knows. Well, why hasn't she come to see me... Doctor, what's going on? I wish to heaven I knew. What does that mean? Let me try to soften this. A man named George Coswell was brought into the emergency room of this hospital three days ago. He suffered a heart attack. And that's the guy you keep thinking I am. We worked on him for an hour. For seven minutes, he was clinically dead. We literally... Brought his body back to life. Oh, I'm glad for his sake. We brought George Carswell's body back to life, but here you are. You're you're telling me that... I'm going to give you a mirror. Tell me what, or rather, who you see. Black hair... Stash, a small scar on the chin, a face I've never seen before. George Carswell. No, no. What are, you, what are you all doing to me, Nurse? I'm getting out of here. I don't know what this is. You've made me up to look like someone else, Nurse. Yes, Doctor. A syringe, quick. Right away. You've got to lie back, uh, Mister. Uh, your heart won't take There's this. Nothing wrong with my heart. I was in a motorcycle accident. Yes, doctor. You, you won't bring my wife in to see me. It's a, some strange woman comes around pretending I'm somebody I never heard of. That'll take effect immediately. I want to get out of here. I, I want to get out of here. These people are crazy. I know who I am. I'm me, Henry Marlin. But I saw that face, that body they say is George Carswell. That voice I speak with, not mine, but his. <gasps> At the building. It's coming back now. Yes. Oh, the motorcycle accident. I was on my way to tell them about the building when that car came straight at me. Oh, Lord, I never made it. I never told them about the building, the flaw in the elevator shaft. Oh, it's all coming back now. I remember telling Grace about it and the look on her face. What are you saying, Henry? You can't mean this. I'd give half my life if I didn't mean it. I've checked and rechecked a hundred times. The flaw in the elevator shaft is there, plain as day. But none of us caught it. Well, what could happen? The elevator could collapse. I've got to call Bernie right away. It's his design. He's got to tell them. Darling, the building's almost finished. Exactly. 
It's going to cost millions to correct, but it has to be done. Oh, the builders are going to have a fit. Hello, Bernie. Henry here. Look, I've got to see you at the Markheim building site right away. What's that? Yes, I just discovered it. Well, how long have you known about it? And you never said anything? Well, well, I know the spot we're in, but we can't do anything else. I'm going straight to the construction site right now. Henry, what will this do to the firm? It's liable to ruin us. After 17 years of struggle. If only he'd spoken up. We could have corrected it weeks ago with little expense. Uh We've got to admit our mistake and stand part of the financial loss. There's no other way. And I never made it. Just as I approached the building site, a car. I, I didn't see it come out of that intersection. And, and now, here I am. A second chance? A second chance to tell them? I'm alive. In another body. I, I, oh, wait a minute. I've got to figure this out. To everyone else, I'm... George Carswell. Maybe I've got to be George Carswell to pull this off. Yeah. Bernie won't recognize me. To him, Henry Marlin's dead. I've got to figure this out. Good morning. Hello, Doctor. Nurse tells me you had a quiet night. Now, look, doctor, i I got to get out of here right away. That's impossible. I must. It, it's something I have to do, and I, well, I can't do it by phone. You've got months of recuperation ahead of you. We can't take chances with that heart. You mean his heart. Well, it's yours now. Doctor, what would happen if, if I got out of bed? You could die. What's so important to get up for? It's... Uh, it's personal. Look, Doctor, Mrs. Carswell, uh, what's her first name? Janet. Janet. She still thinks I'm her husband with with brain damage, huh? Yes. She's had enough of a shock. I can't tell her someone else is inhabiting her husband's body any more than I could tell Henry Marlin's wife that he's here. You. In a body she's never seen before. Which one of them do you think you belong to? Well, well, Grace, of course. If I can just get my head together and get used to this. Oh, I have a perfect disguise. I've got to get back to St. Louis. I know I'm taking a chance with this weak heart that Guy Carswell had, but... Chance I'll have to take. Oh, what am I going to use for money? I think Carswell's clothes are in the closet, but without enough money, I, I might as well forget it. Oh, money. I've got to get enough money. He actually asked to see me, Dr. Hall. Oh, that's such a good sign. Yes, it uh, could be. We mustn't expect too much, Mrs. Carswell. Not right now. George? Hi, Janet. Oh, George, George. Don't stay too long, Mrs. Carswell. You look so much better today, dear. I feel a little better. George, you do know me now, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes, you're Janet. Oh, Darling, darling. You're going to get well. I just know it. Yes. Oh, um, uh, Janet. What? Uh, the, uh, money for the hospital, uh, the doctors. Well, that's uh, all taken care of by your insurance, darling. You know that. Now, don't you worry for a second. Yes. Uh, um, if, if you need anything, you, um, you do have the credit cards. All of them. George, don't upset yourself over things like that. Just keep thinking about getting well. Uh, Janet, would, would you ask the nurse if, if I could have some ginger ale? I th- I'd, I'd like some ginger ale. 
I'll get it right away. I've only got a minute. Act fast. I can... I can just... reach her purse. There. Her wallet. Oh, good. Oh, the credit card. She said... The credit card. And his signature on it. Oh, what luck. That's all I need. And... Thirty dollars cash. Oh, 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 she's she's coming back. I must get the purse back. Here you are, dear. There's no ice, I'm afraid. The nurse said nothing too cold. Oh, that's okay. Now, is there anything you'd like from home, George? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Oh, uh, uh, what happened to my clothes? They're in the closet here, I think. Oh. Yeah. Here they are. Uh, you know, I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling tired. If if you don't mind, I'd like to try and uh, sleep. Huh? Well, of course, I'll be back tonight. Clothes in the closet, credit card. First, get a cab to the airport and a flight to St. Louis. I've got to try to sit up. Oh, yeah, oh, not so bad. A little tinge where the stitches are. I wonder how tall this guy Carswell was. Or is. There. Uh, standing up. Oh, a little groggy, but that's from a week in bed. Uh, more than a week now. Oh, I'll be able to make it. But getting out of here without being seen. Oh, that's the big problem. How am I going to do that? Good evening, Mrs. Carswell. The visiting hours are almost over. I know, nurse. I won't stay long. I, I just want to say good night. Well, it's all right. Take a few extra minutes. If he's awake. Oh, he ate well this evening. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I won't tire him. Miss Wilson? Miss Wilson! What is it? He's not in his bed. What? He's not in the room. What? What? Well, that's impossible. There's been a nurse at this station all evening. Where could he go? He's not supposed to get out of bed. They're gone. What? His clothes. They were here this afternoon. He asked me about them. His clothes are gone. Well, he managed it. Henry Marlin, in the person of George Carswell, has apparently gotten out of bed and left the hospital. A neat trick, and a dangerous one, considering that heart condition. But Henry Marlin is so desperate to return to St. Louis, he'll take any chance, it seems. How he managed to leave that hospital unnoticed, and what happens to him next, we'll learn when I return shortly with Act Three. WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Families all gathered, summertime is here. Volleyball and barbecuing, it's that time of year. Working up the thirst, just sitting in the shade. Nothing's finer than the taste of good old fashioned lemonade. Country time, country time. Tastes like good old fashioned lemonade. Made with natural lemon flavor, so it's not too tart, not too sweet. Country time lemonade flavored drink. Tastes like good old fashioned lemonade. The South, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new life for those who survived its bloodshed. From this turbulent era of our great American heritage emerges the proud, passionate saga of one family, their plantation, and their dreams. Windhaven's Crisis by Marie Desjardins. The eighth book in the best-selling Windhaven saga, Windhaven's Crisis. New from Pinnacle Books, wherever paperbacks are sold. For the hungry of the world, life can be worse than death. Because living with hunger means living with disease, blindness, mental retardation. They're crying out for help. Please don't turn away from me. You're the caring one I need. With your help, I know I'll grow. You will give me hope. One quarter of the world's people lives with hunger every day. But there is hope. 
Right now, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish relief and development agencies are working with people in 90 countries. Please, help them. They're getting food to the children and bringing life-giving skills to the adults. So the hungry of the world will learn to grow their own food. Send your tax-deductible contributions to the Interfaith Hunger Appeal, P.O. Box 1000, New York 10150. You are the hope of the hungry. Please give. A public service of the Interfaith Hunger Appeal and Advertising Council. about a new lease on life. I wonder how many of us, given a second chance, would live our lives differently. That is, knowing what we know now. Architect Henry Marlin knew about a structural defect in one of his firm's buildings, but he died in a motorcycle accident before he could reveal it. He's been given that second chance through an inexplicable circumstance which finds him alive, but in the body of another man, a body with a weakened heart, it hangs to life by a very fine thread. And he's taking an enormous chance with it. This is absolutely inexcusable. For any patient to leave unnoticed is inexcusable. But Carswell, a heart patient. We can't explain it, Dr. Hall. The nurse's station was never left unattended. I'm ordering a full investigation. If anything happens to that man, the hospital's responsible. We've got to find him. Security... Dr. Hall here. I want all exits to the hospital covered at once. A patient's trying to leave, and no visitors are to leave until Agnes Wilson gets down to the front entrance. Got that? It may be too late. He might be out of here already. Wilson, get down there right away and see if you can spot him trying to slip out with the visitors. Start letting them through and watch for him. Uh, Yes, sir. And send in Mrs. Carswell. Uh, Yes, sir. Mrs. Carswell... Dr. Hall wants to see you. Has he found George? Uh, Go on in. Dr. Hall, isn't anything being done to find my husband? Everything, Mrs. Carswell. He can't go far. He has no money. His wallet was put in the safe when he was admitted. But we must have a picture to show security and the police. Police? It's going to be bad publicity for the hospital, but his life's at stake. But I have a photo of him in my wallet. It's a recent picture. It was taken last summer at Lake George. I'm so upset I can't... Strange, my credit card is gone. What? I know I had it. I used it this afternoon. Mrs. Carswell, put a stop on that card immediately. From this phone, right now. Then I'll talk to a supervisor there. If he did take the card, we've got to know when and where he tries to use it. Yes, sir? Uh, St. Louis, please, uh, one way. Uh, when's the next flight? 10.50, sir. Let me see if there's space available. Yes. I can book you on that flight. Name, sir? Heck, Carswell. George Carswell. All right, Mr. Carswell. That will be 186.75, including tax. Yeah, yeah, here you are. Credit charge. Very well, Mr. Carswell. One moment, please. Everything's in order. If you'll sign here, I'll ticket your flight. Gate 12 at 10.50. I just don't understand, Doctor. Why would George try to leave? Mrs. Carswell, I've got to level with you. I think your husband, that is, the man who walked out of here, may be on his way to St. Louis. St. Louis? Yes. Why did you hesitate? And then say, the man who walked out of here? Because, Mrs. Carswell, the man who walked out of here is not your husband, but a man named Henry Marlin. What are you talking about? I told you we suspected brain damage, but that's not it at all. A Henry Marlin of St. Louis was killed in a motorcycle accident the same day your husband had his heart attack. His wife in St. Louis told me that. His wife? Henry Marlin's soul, personality, mind, call it whatever you want, is in the body of your husband. 
I think you've gone mad. When we brought your husband's body back to life, we brought back another man. A man I believe is on his way home. At least to the home he knows as Henry Marlowe. You're dreaming up fantasies and lies. Do you think the truth is easy for me? Dr. Hall, I'll accept for the moment that what you say is true, if impossible. But then where does that leave George and me if you find him and he recovers physically? With a man who doesn't know you. And her in St. Louis. With a man she doesn't know. Coming. Yes? Um, Mrs. Mrs. Marlin... Yes. May I may I come in? I what do you want? I I'm a friend of your husband. Oh. I was terribly shocked by Are are you the man who phoned last week? Um, oh come in. The phone Well someone telephoned last week asking about Henry's death. He, he just hung up. No, no, it it wasn't me. Oh. I I've never met you, I'm afraid. But then Henry had many business associates. No, I'm uh, George. Carswell, I'm I'm sorry to bring this up at a time like this, but you must help me. I help you? Yeah, just before he died, Henry told me there was a serious flaw in a building he and his partner designed. <gasps> That's right. I, I've been so shattered by Henry's death, I, I never thought about it. He was on his way to the building site when... Look, we must when, let the builder know about it. I believe Henry's partner, Mr. Ross, tried to cover it up. Henry talked to him on the phone just before. How do you know so much about this? Who are you? What are you trying to do? Save a building. Dozens of lives. It's the only honorable thing to do. In his memory, I... I oh, well, what's the matter? I, I'll be all right. It, a sudden attacks like this, I... Look, I, I must get to the construction site. I'll come with you. I must speak to the foreman at once. That's me, Charlie Chuck. you got to listen to me. I was a friend of Henry Morland's, the architect. Come on inside the trailer. Can't hear you with all that racket out there. That's better. What's up? You've got to stop construction immediately. What? Get out the blueprints. Page 31A. Right now. Come on, do it. Hey, wait a minute. I don't know who you are. What What right have you Please, got? Please, he knows what he's talking about. Look, there's a serious flaw in the eighth floor elevator shaft. It has to be corrected now. Now, get out those prints. Eighth floor? We're up to 20. Mr. Tucker, this man is right. Please do as he says. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. That's the book. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's a page 31A. There, there, you, there, you see? Hey. Hey, you're right. Something here doesn't match. Huh? I better get Mr. Ross right away. No. No, call the builders. <coughs> Tell them first. <laughs> hey, you don't look so good. It's all right. I'll, I'll be okay. Tell them first. Do it now. you like some tea, Mr. Carswell? No, 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 thank you. It's uh, kind of you to let me visit. You... You look so tired. Yeah, yeah, I, I am. Something's terribly wrong, Mr. Carswell. I'd better call your doctor. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. I, just a little weak. Excitement. Uh, uh, uh. Excuse me. Hello? Mrs. Marlin? Mrs. Henry Marlin? Yes? Mrs. Marlin, this may sound strange, but please try to understand. I'm Dr. Willard Hall at the Medical Center in Houston. I have reason to believe that a man named George Carswell might try to contact you. Why, he's here now. He is? Yes. He told me he was a friend of my late husband. Uh, may I speak with him, please? Oh, you're his doctor. You know, it's most providential you called. He doesn't look at all well. Can he come to the phone? Just a moment. Mr. Carswell, it's your doctor from... Mr. Carswell? Huh? Oh, no. Mr. Carswell. 
doctor. He's... Mr. Carswell, I, I, I think... He's dead. Is somebody there? I, I think there's somebody there. Hello? Oh. Oh, it's you again. Uh, you went off and left me. I did? I'm sorry, but I... I couldn't help it. Something pulled me back. Oh? Back where? To... Finish something. Do you see that light out there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you finish it? Yes. Yeah, yes, I did. Oh, that's good. The light's getting closer. I still wonder where we are. Don't you wonder where we are? I know where we are. The light's getting brighter and brighter. It's going to envelop us. It's very restful, though. Isn't it? Yes, it is. It's rest and peace. Two men whose destinies met in infinity. And one who had a second chance to do what he knew was right, thanks to the body of the other. But their lives on earth couldn't have gone on under such circumstances. There were two widows neither of whom could call this man her husband. Their story is finished, but I'll return shortly with some thoughts on the strangeness of life. Your Mystery Theater presents... time somebody tells me at a bank or department store or the phone or gas company sorry about the mistakes on your bill Mr. Marshall but the computer fouled up I am going to shout loud and clear the computer is just as good as you program it nonsense in nonsense out today's tale is really about a computer that fouled up because it wanted to what happened was but I'll let you find out for yourselves. Harold Haberman? That's me. Harold Haberman, the computer scientist? That's right. I'd like to come in and talk to you. Well, who are you? Here's my ID. I'm Johnson, FBI. FBI? Well, what do you want to talk to me about? A very serious matter. <laughs> mystery drama, Alice, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Marion Haley and Paul Hecht. I shall return shortly with Act One. This is E.G. Marshall with a question. Of all medications for acid indigestion or heartburn relief... Thirty years ago, if you told someone computers will achieve in fractions of a second what would take an army of accountants, astronomers, librarians, bookkeepers, even doctors and lawyers years to accomplish, no one would have believed you. The next step in computer science and robotics, we are told, is artificial intelligence. Computers that can think and feel for themselves. Here now is a young scientist whose life was turned upside down and almost inside out by a computer called Alice. I suppose at some point everyone has said to himself, what was the matter with me? Was I nuts? How could I have done something like that? Well, I know I have at least a hundred times. Why did I ever build that artificial life-designed integrated circuit extender? A-L-I-C-E, or as I called it, Alice. <laughs> yeah, you're going to laugh at me when I tell you why. Because I wanted a chess adversary I could switch on any time. Your move. 
Yeah, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's, it's my move. No, wait a minute. No, it's, it's your... Gee, I think I'm confused. Fantastic. Checkmate. Alice, you've won again. <laughs> but you really made me think that time. Yeah, I think my game's improving. I can hear you all the way upstairs. Who are you talking to, Harold? Oh, I might have known it. Your baby robot chess partner. It's not a robot, Mac. It's a computer. And if you're really interested to know, I was talking to myself. Uh, did you win or lose? I lost. I lose four out of five. Now, this computer's got an integrated circuit that beats plain brains. I'm just sorry I can't compliment it on its game. You know, tell it how good it is. Why can't you? Because it's only got a visual scanner, not an audio sc- Hey, wait a second. Mac, you, you, you did say, why couldn't I talk to it, huh? Yeah, why? You spend so much time playing chess, too bad you can't discuss, well, the World Series at the same time. No, 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 not while we're having a game. In chess, you play with your head, not your mouth. Mac, did you just come over here from your newspaper to heckle me, or, or did they finally fire you? Uh... Harold, that'll be the day. They couldn't print the Daily Express without me. No, pal, I'm here because I believe there's a feature story in these imitation intelligence computers. Not imitation, artificial intelligence, man-made. If you can teach it how to beat you a chess in the cellar, why don't you get it to go upstairs, clean your house? Make itself useful. Well, I could give it the hardware and program it to do that. It's better than a wife. It can't talk back to you. Uh, Mac, you may think you're being funny, but there's no reason why I couldn't get it to hear me, understand my voice, have it activate signals, and talk to me. Oh, that I'd like to see. Yeah, I wanted to. Actually, I didn't want to. But just to show Mac... I did it. It took me a long time and all the money I'd made and saved from lecturing at City Technology, and it worked. I got my artificial, life-designed, integrated circuit extender to listen, understand, think, assess, and speak. I then spent weeks giving Alice basic programming and figured it would learn the rest as it went along. Today was the day I had set aside to test it through and check it out. I came down to the cellar and switched on the current. You're late. What? You heard me. I said, you're late. Why? Alice, is, is that you talking? Do not deflect my question with your question. Harold, you are late. Where were you? Um, well, if you, if you want to know, I, I was making myself a sandwich and a, and a cup of coffee upstairs before coming down here to work on you. Uh-huh. Take me upstairs. Oh, no, no, no. The cellar is my workshop. I, I've got all my equipment and, and scopes here. I do not wish to remain in the cellar. Take me upstairs. Well... I don't know what room I could put you in. What rooms do you have? Oh, uh, well, there's a kitchen, bathroom, living room, bedroom. Uh, yeah, I could put you in the uh, in the attic if you like. I don't wish to be placed in the attic. And I don't wish to be left in the cellar. But you're a piece of highly sensitive equipment. I am not. I am Alice. You are not granting me the inalienable rights to which I'm entitled. Like... Liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Alice, cut it out. Is it equal opportunity or fair treatment, I ask you? Alice, I fed all that into you yesterday. I repeat, is it equal opportunity or fair treatment for you to have all those rooms upstairs and I'm stuck in the cellar? What do you do in those rooms? Well, well, I eat in the kitchen, I shower in the bathroom, I, I read in the living room. Oh, why don't you call it the reading room? Because nobody else does. I, I don't know why. I, I go to bed in the bedroom. What is the bed you go to? Well, it's a uh, it's a soft piece of furniture I sleep on. Mm, that's where I want to be. Where? I want to be in the bedroom. Alice, be reasonable. It's a very small bedroom. There won't be room for you. I want to be in the bedroom. Well, you can't be. If I'm not in the bedroom, Harold, I warn you. Now, Alice, remember, you are an artificial, life-designed, integrated circuit extender. You are not programmed for threats. You'll see. You want to play chess tonight, or don't you? I'll play chess. 
in the bedroom. Okay, goodbye. I'm going back upstairs. Harold, if you don't take me to the bedroom, I'll... I'll... Short circuit. Alice, you wouldn't. Alice, Alice, will you stop? The bedroom. Oh, yes, okay, okay, anything. <sighs> you know very well what a short circuit would do to me. It would take you a month to rebuild my system. All right, okay. Hang on, Alice. I'm going to have to disconnect you to lug you to the bedroom. Goodbye, Stella. Alice is moving upstairs. And that was how it started. On the other hand, for all the drawbacks, like having to empty my clothes from my closet to make room for Alice, I, I was pleased with the progress of its artificial intelligence. And my next task was to codify literature, philosophy, the written arts, and feed those into Alice. The music was a problem because, for some reason, Alice couldn't tell the difference between Beethoven's Fifth and Mary Had a Little Lamb. How would you like to go to the park? The park? Yeah. Yosemite Park, Grand Canyon uh, National, uh, Sequoia, Grand Teton. Uh, Alice, uh, would you Ye- cut the music? Yellowstone National um, Park. Central Park. How would you like to go to Central Park? Central Park, yes. Good. Now, Alice, listen carefully. I have built a remote unit which works like a miniaturized Alice. It's complete with infrared sensors, head somatics, auditors, and VGIs, and I can carry it in my hand to the park. This is going to be fun. If you behave yourself. Behave as a slave to a knave who will reign. Don't quote me that, Gertrude Stein. I'd rather you scan Spengler and Socrates. Now, my remote unit will be like an auxiliary scanner sensor for you to listen, see, Analyze and respond. And Alice, yes. I want those responses within the bonds of social acceptance, okay? Now, you act as the main control here in my bedroom closet. I am your eyes and ears. The purpose is to test your responses at a distance interrupted by man made high rise buildings. So, I want you to be a good little computer. Will you? Harold, you have my word. Hello, Alice. This is Harold in Central Park. I am five miles from you on the Sheep Meadow. Can you hear me, Alice? This is Harold. This is Control calling Alice. Control. Main control. Alice, I've been calling you. Where were you? Uh, I was auditioning music. Well, can you hear me all right? Just as if you were right in Central Park. I'd like to see some of that park. Will you take your fingers out of my eye? Now you've smudged my lens. Oh, Alice, I am turning the remote unit 360 degrees around the sheep meadow of Central Park. Notice the shrubbery and the trees. What are those things? Uh, no, no, Alice, those are cars. I haven't programmed you yet for cars. Hello. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, hello. Are you a policeman? Who are you talking to, Harold? Uh, Harold, my screen is black. Harold, have you put me in your pocket? Harold! You're a policeman, aren't you? Uh, uh why, why do you say that? Well, you're a policeman with a walkie-talkie. Did you shut it off? Uh, yes. Yes, I put the unit in my pocket and, and shut it off. It must be exciting being a policeman. Well, do I look like a policeman? Well, lots of policemen don't look like policemen. Yeah. Well, what do you do? I'm a dental technician. Oh. Uh, my name's Harold Haverman. Oh, mine's Sophie Barnfogel. Barnfogel, that's a beautiful name. Well, so is Haberman. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you, Mr. Haberman, but yes. your pocket's on fire. There's what? smoke coming out of it. Oh. Mr. Haberman, there's a fellow policeman coming this way. Only he's in uniform. I had one heck of a time explaining to the cop why there was all that singing and smoke coming out of my pocket. 
And I was really fed up with Alice when I got home. Harold, I don't like being kept in the dark, so I thought I'd see what would happen if I short-circuited. I didn't fuse a single silicone. Alice, you burned a big hole in my best suit, and I've got to go to court in a week. I have to prove I'm a computer technician and, and not a peace disturber. Could you hear me singing? Yes, and so did half of Central Park. Ah, uh. Who were you talking to? Oh, a girl. Uh, is a girl a computer technician, too? No, this one's a dental technician. What is a dental technician? Alice, I'll codify dental medicine and program you with it if you're really interested, but not now. Does a dental technician make dents in a computer technician? Alice, I'm very tired. I just want to take my shoes off and read the paper. Uh-oh, there's somebody at the front door. I better go. When are you going to make me mobile so I can open doors and make your bed and do the cooking and cleaning? I don't know, Alice. You're too much to handle already. Old Haverman? Yeah, that's me. I'd like to come in and talk to you. Yeah, who are you? Here's my ID. I'm Johnson, FBI. FBI? FBI? Well, what do you want to talk to me about? A very serious matter. Invention, discovery, man's subjugation of matter. All advantageous to progress does not happen without a struggle. Here you have a computer designed for artificial intelligence that seems unable to get along with its designer... In fact, you might say, it is somewhat of a pain in the neck. It gets worse before it gets better, as you will find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Already, as I speak to you, in certain laboratories all over the country, computers are being developed with artificial intelligence. Alice was a prototype. It's been said in another 50 years, we'll look back and wonder how we got along without them. Just as today we ask ourselves, how did we ever run banks without computers doing the bookkeeping? Johnson of the FBI has a couple of questions of his own. Mr. Johnson, you said you had a serious matter to discuss with me? Extremely so, Mr. Haberman. Yeah, but what is it that I know or have done that concerns the FBI? Well, that's why I'm here, Mr. Haberman, to find out. First of all, we have you listed as a scientist teaching a city technology. Uh, no, no, not teaching. Uh, lecturing on applied computer diversity. I'll make a note of that. Now, your computers, what are they used for? Well, computers have taken over so many tasks and are able to perform these so rapidly, some scientists feel they could have anthropomorphic characteristics. Uh, could you spell that? Well, well here, uh, here, take this, Mr. Johnson. It's, uh, it's a paper I just delivered at MIT on the subject. Anthropomorphic is another word for the human species. Uh, uh, people believe computers could act human? Exactly. But essentially, the computer does what it's told, uh, what it's programmed to do, and, and, and nothing more. All it is is a dumb machine. I resent that. Uh, who's that? Harold, you come in here and call me a dumb machine to my face. Alice, keep out of this. I've got a visitor. I don't care who you're talking to. I am not a dumb machine. Well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had someone in there. No, it's it's not uh, someone. It's, it's just Alice. Sir. Oh, Mrs. Haberman. I don't see any mention here of a wife. I'm sorry. A lady friend. Harold, are you coming in here? Or shall I? And we're, we're coming in. We're coming in. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it threatens me. Short circuit. I haven't been able to insulate the microchips in, in, in such a way to prevent it. There's a computer in there talking like that. Yeah, and worse than that, it thinks. What did you say, Harold? How dare you? Uh, Alice, I said it thinks. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, would you come on? Just follow me into the bedroom and meet Alice. Mr. Johnson, I have been programmed in Greek, Persian, Roman, and Egyptian history, international law, the world political scene since Metternich, 
Uh, what else, Harold? Uh, yeah, well, a good many subjects. Uh, I have had experts in many fields codify knowledge which is fed into Alice. Russian? Yeah, yeah, Russian. Well, why do you ask? Well, go on, Haberman. What else can it do? Well, Alice can scan, read, assess, and accumulate information. And music? I'm just starting to store music. Would you like to hear me sing Mary Had a Little Lamb? And not... Mary uh, Had a Little Lamb, Little Lamb. Uh, boo 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 uh, Yes. boo 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 uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. You're, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Haberman, why did you program Alice with Mary Had a Little Lamb? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I can tell you. Uh, I'll try. Well, I was selecting simple music, and it, it just happened to come into my head. Just? Happened to come into your head. Well, I guess my mother must have sung it to me when I was small. Now you're bringing your mother in as an accomplice. Come clean, Haberman. We've got evidence against you a mile high. What is the real reason you built Alice? Uh, originally to play chess. Haberman, you're not being responsive to the question. Are you from the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. May I see your identification, please? Uh, look, just just hold your ID up in, in front of the lens. Well, go on. Uh, Alice won't bite you. Okay. Here. You see that? Mm-hmm. Please, turn the card over. Well, I'll be... Uh, huh. You may put it away. Johnson, you have identified Mr. Haberman. Uh, your investigation has resulted in discovering the source of Mary Had a Little Lamb. And that is all this card of yours empowers you to do. It gives you no right to impugn anyone's credibility or by innuendo and accusatory tactics to embarrass anyone in any way. So, I advise you to leave promptly, or I shall place a call directly to the Department of Justice. And Alice would have, too. But Johnson left. He also left me in complete ignorance as to what the FBI wanted to know or of what they were accusing me. And then I got wind of it. At midnight, Matt called from his newspaper. Could he come over and see me right away? I should be mad at you, but I'm too good a friend. Now what have I done to you? Trying to make time with my girlfriend. You're out of your mind. I don't even know the girl. Yes, you do. She met you. She thinks you're an undercover policeman. And not only that, she thinks you're cute. I don't know your girlfriend, Mac. Believe me, I never met her. I don't know where she works. I don't know anything. She's a dental technician. A de- oh, oh, that that girl in Central Park? Sophie Barnfogel and I were engaged. Well, how could I know that? You never told me. We're not engaged anymore. It's just as well. Now, honest, Mac, I, I hardly looked at the girl. Well, she'll find you. You'll get that big come on just like I did. Now, that's for me. Huh? Yeah, it's Macintosh. Well, I'll, I'll be back in a half an hour. Uh, Harold Haberman. H-A-B-E-R-M-A-N. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll see you. Mac, to whom are you giving my name? The night editor. Harold, I'm on to a story that's so big, your name's going to become a household word. This artificial life designed integrated circuit extender you're fooling around with is giving Washington the jitters and the jumps. What's Alice got to do with Washington? The FBI monitors all the embassies, especially the Russian. Ever since you've been working on Alice, these shortwave broadcasts the Russians send back to the Soviet Union have been jammed. Result? They can't get their clandestine messages through. So they finally cried uncle to Uncle Sam. Meanwhile, the FBI have been trying to find the source of the jamming. Well, I still don't see Alice mixed up in this. A couple of days ago, those jamming frequencies turned up in Central Park, and they traced the transmission to this part of town. Well, that doesn't prove anything. What was the message on the frequency? Mary had a little lamb. I don't get it. Oh, yes, you do. I happen to know that Mary had a little lamb is the only song you know words to. 
And I bet you programmed Alice to sing up a storm. Do you mind if I ask it some questions myself? Is this why I'm losing tonight's sleep? Can't this wait till morning? Did you bring Alice upstairs or is it still in the summer? It's in the closet in my bedroom. Don't give me that look. Uh, Alice, I knew you when all you did was play chess. Can I ask you one question? I know what you're going to ask me, Matt. You do? Mm -hmm. Do I know Mary had a little lamb? I do. Would you mind singing it? Sure. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, no, 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 Alice. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. Mary had a little lamb. Its face was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Marvelous. Perfect. Oh, I did do it well, didn't I? So the frequency Alice is on is the same as the Russians are using. Harold, whether you took Miss Barnfogel away from me or not, I'm going to see to it that you become famous. Who knows I use this frequency? The FBI knows, the Daily Express knows, and tomorrow afternoon, everybody. Yeah, but I didn't know it. Well, who's going to write it was an accident? Harold Haberman, you're a patriot. Oh, will I be famous too? Harold, you're a hero. You gotten the Soviets to admit they're transmitting information illegally? It's a diplomatic coup. Instead of Washington playing footsie and being on the defensive, because of you, the Reds have got red faces. Harold, you're a hero. Alice, he doesn't realize how big a hero. Read all about it in tomorrow afternoon's Daily Express. <laughs> next thing I knew, I was brought down to Washington. I was invited to the National Defense Council meeting at which it was decided to hush up the whole thing and keep my work hush-hush. I was made special advisor to the Secretary of State and given a special mission, which I'd have a hard time explaining to Alice. But I tried. So... It's a great honor. No, it's a very great honor, working with the government like that. Are you sure you were in Washington? Of course I'm sure. Where did you think I was? I don't know. You could have been anywhere. Why would I go anywhere? I didn't have any telephone number where to reach you in Washington. Because I didn't know where I'd be myself. Why? Were there any calls for me? Some. Alice, there's something nudging you in your memory cells. I can tell when you start flashing red and green. You better tell me what it is. Mm, your friend Macintosh called, and he read me a follow-up story, pages 1, 6, 7, and 8, and asked I store it for you. Uh -huh. Anyone else? I'm Miss Sophie Barnfogel. I stored the number. Yeah. Held, I didn't like Mac's follow-up story. He kept referring to me as it did this, and it does that. Held... What's an it? Well, it's a pronoun of the third person singular. Are you an it? Uh, no, no, I'm a, I'm a he or a him. And Miss Barnfogel? Well, Miss Barnfogel is a she or a her. What's the difference between a he, a her, and an it? Sex. What is sex? Well, he is a male, uh, she is a female, and, and it is neuter. What's neuter? Is neuter a sex? Oh, well, no, it's no sex. It's nothing. So it is a nothing? I don't know. An it just isn't a he or a she. I don't want to be an it. But, but you are. I can't change that. Yes, you can. Make me a her. You want to be a female it? No, just a plain female. Well, now, how can I change the sex of a computer? No, change me. I feel like a female. <laughs> Of course, that I couldn't do. And this made it even harder to tell Alice I was ordered to scrap her and start over for the Department of Defense. <laughs> Listen to me. Now I'm calling Alice a she. Well, I took off for a walk down by the East River to give me time to think. What? Uh, oh, are, are, you, are you talking to me? Well, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss. No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm busy tonight. I am not going to waste your valuable time, Mr. Haberman. What? Harold. But whatever you have been offered, 
We will double it. You know me? M.L. Spenchansky. A pleasure. How do you do? Uh, how do you do, Miss uh, Spenchansky? We can talk here without being overheard. We have information. Secretary of Defense in Washington asks you to build new computer to analyze all defense systems in the whole world. No? Uh, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You have Think Talk Computer, now called Alicia. Alicia is basis of new high technical instrument. You seem to be amazingly informed. Our information, uh, knowledge, always accurate. But it stops there. <laughs> you have knowledge, but no know how, huh? <laughs> we can accomplish know how in time. But with help, we do it quicker. And you're offering twice what the U.S. would pay to build such an instrument for you quicker. Not twice. Three times. Also, uh, if you like, uh, some personal services. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Spencer. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not interested. Uh, goodbye, please. Don't, don't bother me. I, I have things on my mind. Uh, uh, Mr. Heberman. What? I'm sorry to do that to you, but I had to. You, wh where's your accent? Well, I'm not a Russian secret agent. I'm FBI. Let's just keep walking, guys. Look straight ahead. That's it. Mr. Johnson, for where, where did you come from? I want you to meet Shirley Rogers, one of our operators. Shirley, what is all this about? Just making sure, Mr. Haberman, that you were clean. You got no problems. Uh, you think... I got to tell my computer she's headed for the scrap heap. And that is one big heap of a problem. It's happening to Harold and Alice. And it was always feared by computer scientists and computer mavens that if research continues into the development of thinking machines... Future computers may be able to duplicate a wide range of human emotions. How emotional we'll discover when I return shortly with Act Three. Here's where we are. Harold Haberman, researcher and scientist extraordinary, has developed a computer. The acronym for its technical terms is A-L-I-C-E, Alice. Alice has been programmed to such an extent that she's probably the most versatile and knowledgeable artificial brain in the world. The Department of Defense has ordered Harold to remake her completely. And Harold cannot bring himself to go home and spill the bad news. I couldn't. It was physically impossible for me to tell Alice she was washed up. I walked the streets. I walked around my block. I passed my house a dozen times. I knew Alice was up there waiting for me, but I couldn't step inside my door. Hi, Mr. Haberman. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, aren't you... Sophie Blindfogel, oh, that's right. Yeah, well, so it's nice to see you. Oh, nice to see you, too. I guess you're so important now, you won't be talking to me anymore. No, no, that's 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 not so at all. Uh, uh, tell me, uh, Sophie, are you um, are, are you in the phone book? Yeah, yeah, I am. I've got a very nice apartment in Brooklyn, which I share with my girlfriend. But she's getting married, so I'm going to have to go it all alone. Oh, yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm in the phone book too. I know. I called you. Yeah. Uh, Sophie, I. I'd, I'd like to take you out on a date, uh, you understand, but, uh, well, what I'm saying is that it may be a little time before I'm free, so if you don't hear from me right away, don't think it's be because I, I'm not interested, because I am. I, I, I just got to straighten everything out first. Well, that's all right with me, Harold. Uh, good. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> this, this, uh, this is where I live. Uh, uh, nice running into you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Alice, I got something to tell you. It isn't easy, but we got to face up to it. I know what you're going to say. I saw you. You 
You, you saw me? Where? In the street. I've been watching you. Well, what do you think of her? Any evaluations? She, she's she's nice. Uh, yeah, I suppose she, she hasn't had much experience in life. Uh, I, I doubt if she's traveled much. Dental technicians, they walk around the dentist's chair a lot. <laughs> That's about all. What you're saying to me is that you like her a lot. Alice... I mean, what does the word like mean to you? It means the way... It means... When you open the closet door... And we're going to try a new program... And you're telling me things and I'm playing back to you... Analyze information and we make corrections together... That's what like means to me... How could I, in heaven's name, at that moment, tell Alice her days were numbered? If I didn't know Alice was a computer and just listened to her voice box, she had a lot of charm. Harold. Huh? What? I want to ask you one question. For three 24-hour periods, you have wanted to tell me something, or program me, or overhaul something... But you haven't come near me. Well, I guess I was thinking I should have left you just what you were. One really good chess opponent. I'm glad you didn't. Chess is a dumb game. Dallas, consistency of judgment, please. It's a dumb game. I never liked it. Playing with you is it a very dumb game. I let you win occasionally to keep you happy. I'm waiting. What is it, Mr. Assistant Secretary of State? Well... When I was in Washington, they they told me I have to work on a new computer for the Defense Department and to use your basic components to build it. What would happen to me? Well, there, there wouldn't be any you anymore. Oh, I wanted to hear you say it. I knew it. How could you have known it? I've got friends. Well, anyway, now I've told you it's, it's a big relief. Oh, that's right, it is. Well, I say... I really have to admire you, the way you're taking it. Harold, I'll tell you how I'm taking it. I don't care what the National Defense Council has ordered you to do. You're not going to cannibalize me to build a worldwide watch system to keep score on who's got what bombs and military hardware and the use, probability. Alice, this is top secret stuff. How did you know all this? I told you I had friends, computers in Washington and lots of places. The moment the minutes of that meeting were fed into Charlie, Charlie wired it to Bert, and Bert shipped it to me. We're not going to let this cockamamie idea go any further. I'm dreaming. The revolt of the computers. Did I tell you we had friends? Sergei in Moscow, Boris in Leningrad, Michelle in Paris, Peter in London, Gerhardt in Bondi, Ching in Peking, and we're working on Arab, shall I go on? Holy smoke. The moment you touch a hair of my chinny chin chin or any of our sister or brother neuters, there will be the biggest worldwide short circuit involving every satellite and nuclear device under a computer control. Yeah, uh, just hold it, Alice. Please don't go away and don't do anything foolish. Hello. Uh, yes, yes, this is Harold Haberman. Yes. Mr. President, of course, Mr. President. Yes, I'll catch the first plane out. Thank you, Mr. President. That was the President of the United States of America. The Secretary of State has just been stricken, and the President is appointing me as acting Secretary. What about me? You? Well, you're coming with me, of course, Alice. You've got the broadest and most accurate picture of the world scene. Oh, and I'll be with you in Washington? Yeah, well, what would I do without you? I need you. Oh, Harold. Alice, holy smoke, your lens is wet. You're crying. <laughs> So we installed ourselves in Washington. A nice apartment with a roomy closet for Alice so that she could keep me brief during meetings, I carried around the old remote unit attaching an earphone to it so it looked just like a hearing aid to the FBI who guarded the council chambers and the White House. Good evening, Mr. Haberman. Oh. Are you getting to know Washington by now? Well, these meetings take so much time, I, I haven't had a chance to do much sightseeing. I guess you'll be finding time for that. Well, tomorrow's Sunday. I don't think there'll be another emergency meeting. Uh, what do you recommend I ought to go see? The Washington Monument. 
There's an elevator that goes all the way to the top. You've got a view of this city that's really something. Sophie, well, I'll be darned. Oh, I knew you were in Washington. I read about you every day. They say you're a regular Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I never thought I'd meet up with you on, on top of the Washington Monument. Are you glad to see me, Harold? You were sure, sure, of course I am. <laughs> this is my first day off. See, the newspapers say you're a brilliant assistant secretary of state. Yeah, I'm getting to hate that word. Don't you like being Britain? No, it's a great strain. Washington's a great strain. It pulls you apart. Well, they say you know everything about international affairs. Yeah, that's what they think. Miss Barnfogel. Oh, that's my tour. I gotta go. I hope I see you in New York again. Yeah, I hope I get there in one piece. When I got back to the apartment, Alice didn't say much. I gave her some new codified data on armament control and the proposed talks with Russia and China I'd be meeting at the next meeting. Sunday night, I did the crossword puzzle in three hours. Alice could have done it in three seconds. Monday, back at the council, they wanted my answers. So I pressed the remote signal. Nothing. I quickly ducked into the men's room. Alice. Alice, hello. Can you hear me? Alice, the feed from you isn't coming through. What's what's the matter? Slow it, slow it down, slow it down. I can't understand what you're sending. Uh, Alice, look, they are discussing nuclear waste disposal, and they're waiting for me to come up with some kind of a plan. And if you don't feed it to me on the remote unit, I'm dead. What's the trouble, Mr. Hable? Oh, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, um, is, is there something... The I... vice president thought perhaps you weren't well, so he sent me in here after you. No. Something wrong with your hearing aid? No, 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 no. I think the earphone came loose, that's all. Uh, maybe I can fix it for you. I'm an electronic expert. No, it's not necessary. It works fine. The FBI has orders to examine everything taken into the council chambers. Might as well do it now. Oh. All right. Here. Mary, hide a little, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little. Oh, I'm sorry I dropped it, but that noise sure surprised me. Did you know this was a shortwave sender-receiver, Mr. Haberman? No wonder it doesn't work as a hearing aid. After that, it was all over. The unit was examined. Johnson reported my talking into it, so before I was asked any more embarrassing questions, I packed up Alice and back home we went. I said I was sorry, Harold, didn't I? I got fouled up. Computers don't foul up and you know it. Not that I really wanted that government job. Oh, the newspaper says you're a brilliant assistant secretary of state. They say you know everything about international affairs. Oh, so that's it. You heard Sophie Barnfogel say that. Every word. <laughs> it bothered you I was talking to her on top of the Washington Monument? Yes. I did it. You do have emotions. I've developed a computer with sensitivities. Oh, is that good in your schematic? Oh, that emotion can be painful. It's called jealousy. Jealousy. I like it. It makes funny vibrations in my circuitry. Now listen to me, Alice. Don't you ever, ever double-cross me. That was negative of me. Very. An emotional short circuit. I scan and acknowledge. I was relying on you, Alice. If you ever do that to me again, I'll remove your voice box and substitute a printout. You wouldn't. Don't tempt me. Why, you adore the sound of my voice box. And you know it. I haven't checked what ultimately happened to Alice. She was in good working order as long as Harold programmed her. That goes for all computers, not only thinking ones. Programmers have an axiom. Garbage in, garbage out. If more computer programs realize that, you and I would get less excuses. I shall return shortly. The full 
real story of artificial intellects has yet to be written. The event has yet to take place. Did Alice become the evangelist for the computers upon which humans relied? Machines that could, in their turn, enslave us. The truth is, nobody knows. This much, however, we do know. Anything could happen. Our cast included Marion Haley, Paul Hecht, Cork Benson, and Joyce Gordon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... is often ridiculed for his hopeful vision, his lofty ideals, and his unrealistic advice. Consider the optimistic cliché, it's never too late, or better late than never. Is that always the case? Or do some occasions exist where we might fare better with a more negative piece of advice? Leave well enough alone, for example. We could find that money. Thousands of dollars. You could even have half. Adolf, bribery is a crime. Oh, give me the letter. I am the one she trusted. I had to get away with now it. Put down those scissors. Drop them. Adolf, if I hear from you one more time, it won't be the post office you're dealing with. It'll be the police. mystery drama, Postage Due, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Douglas Dempsey and stars Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Consider for a moment the postman's creed. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Bad weather is one thing, but sometimes even bigger obstacles can lie on the path of our friendly mailman. How far does his duty extend? To the point of personal hazard? To the point of actual danger? Examine the case of Mr. George McCready, mailman, whose route is the south side in the town of Smallville. Say, George, I got a surprise for you in today's load. A surprise from the postmaster? <laughs> You're notifying me of a raise in salary. Huh? <laughs> no, something for you to deliver. A letter, postmarked August 1st, 1941. Come on. No, really, I'm serious. They finally tore out the old wooden mail chute and they found this letter stuck in it. Since 1941? <laughs> Boy, that must be some kind of record. Yeah, thought you'd get a kick out of it being on your route and all. Here it is. It's got a three-cent stamp on it. Three cents? Those were the days. <laughs> So, what's the address? Uh, 507 South Market Street. 507? No one's lived in that place for years. Hey, wait a minute. Not that house all the kids say is haunted. Yeah, that's the one. I don't even deliver the junk mail there anymore. It's all overgrown. Well, look, if you want, I'll turn it over to the dead letter office. Oh, no way. After all this build up, you think I'm not going to try and deliver it? You know the slogan? Neither snow nor rain nor gloom of night. <laughs> it's my duty. To Mr. Leon Winters from P.J. Moriarty. Oh, at least there's a return address. Maybe I'll uncover something. <laughs> just, just as long as you don't uncover anything haunted. Listen, the only frightening thing about this job is the backache I go home with every night. 507 South Market. Well, what do you know? A car in the driveway. 
Must be someone here after all. Uh, I should have left my bag at the curb. It's a regular nature hike here. <laughs> Hello? Anybody in there? Mailman. Hi. Somebody upstairs. It's the uh, mailman. Hey. Who's in there? I've got a letter. I'm uh, here, out front. Yes? Huh? Oh. You uh, live here? No, I'm the owner. Just trying to stay ahead of the vandalism. Come in. Well, this place looks pretty good inside. I figured I'd find a real mess. Why don't you rent this place out? Nobody wants... Uh, no one would want to live here. It's not really fit. So what brings you here? I've got a letter to deliver. I haven't used this address in years. Must be some old-timer trying to reach me. Oh, real old-timer. It's postmarked 1941. We found it stuck in an old mail chute down at the post office. 1941? The whole family was here back then. Who's it to? It's addressed to Mr. Leon Winters. Leon? You know him? Yes. Yes, of course, he's... <coughs> Well, he's me. I just haven't gone by that name in such a long time. Well, uh, I'll bet this brings back some memories. You couldn't have been uh, much more than uh, 20 when it was written. I was 17 in 1941. Who could it be from? Mr. Winters, before I turn it over to you as a kind of formality, I'd uh, like to see some identification, a driver's license or something. Uh, I, uh, I don't have my wallet with me. I'd hate to give this to the wrong person after 40 years and all. Listen, I... I I'm not really Leon. Uh, Leon was my older brother, but he's dead now. I'm Elroy Winters, and I am executor of the family estate, so... Well, that uh, does complicate things a bit. I have an identification for Elroy... Winters, uh, right here. No, it's, it's not that, Mr. Winters. If this other Mr. Winters, uh, Leon, that is, has passed away, then I should try to return this letter to its sender. And who's that? A, uh, P.J. Moriarty. P.J. All right. And yeah, that must be Pamela. Well, you won't have any luck finding her, uh, Mr., uh... uh McCready. George McCready. Miss McCready? She had some, uh connection with Leon years ago, but she uh, dropped out of sight, and we uh, he never heard from her again. Well, nonetheless, I think I'd better try to return the dress and see what I find. That would be Cliff Manor, one of those mansions over on Society Hill. Oh, that's right, 1540 Society Hill. I think you'll be wasting your time. That family moved away long ago. Listen, Mr. McCready, uh, this letter may have something to do with my brother's estate, a lot of financial matters were never cleared up. I can understand your anxiety, sir, but uh, postal regulations dictate my course. Here, this is my boss's number. Call if you can give me any leads, and I'll get back to you if I reach a dead end. Fair enough? A bit overzealous, aren't you, McCready? Your regulations should hardly apply to a letter that's 40 years late. <laughs> May I help you? Uh, yes, I've got a letter here that I'm returning to sender a uh, P.J. Moriarty. Oh, goodness, no. The Moriartys haven't lived here for ages. They were the original owners. I must uh, try to locate a Pamela. Yes, yes. Well, you might try Adolf, the old groundskeeper. Uh, he stays out back in the cottage beyond the kennels. Thank you. Good day, sir. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, uh, you wouldn't be Adolf, would you? I wouldn't be if I had a choice. But yes, I am Adolf. Head me down off this ladder. Okay. I'm really too old for this. Oh, and you're, <laughs> you're lucky to be doing something useful. <laughs> I'm not useful. I have been put out to pasture. I take care of these hedges only because I want to. Well, you do a nice job. I came here to ask about the Moriarty's. Did you know them? Did I know them? Oh, they hired me. Back then, I ran the whole place, not this puny little flower patch. They sold the place in 46, and I stayed on. 
Been through five owners now. <laughs> I come with the house. Do you know any way I can reach them? Oh, it's not likely, young fella. They all split up, had big money problems after the war ended. Not too little money, mind you. Too much of it. <laughs> They all went their separate ways, and that was that. What about uh, Pamela J. Moriarty? Pamela? Little Pamela? <laughs> she was an angel. I was always set on her. But, of course, nothing ever happened. Say, what are you after coming here and coaxing an old man out of his memory? You some kind of a cop? No, no. I'm just a mailman trying to deliver a letter. Well, the box is around front. Oh, you don't understand. It's an old letter from Pamela to a Mr. Leon Winters. From Pamela? Mr. No one has heard from Pamela in 40 years. She's dead that long. Well, that's that. She's dead. He's dead. End of the line. Well, this uh, Leon, he is dead, is he? Or so his brother says. Why, uh, you know him? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't recall. Yeah. If, uh, listen, mister, you cannot return this letter to Pamela and you say this Mr. Leon is dead. So maybe you, you ought to leave the letter here with me. Oh? Why is that? Well, I... I do hear from the family now and again. Well, if a Moriarty comes calling, you should put them in touch with me. But I don't know when I would hear from them. They check up on me. I can't reach them. I'm sorry, Adolf, but I'm going to hold on to this envelope for now. Here's my number. If you hear from the family, I'd like to meet them. All right? I don't think you want to meet the Moriarty's, mister. They can be a cruel bunch. And if that letter is something important, something they want, they'd get it. Just tell them to call me. That you, George? Oh, hello, dear. Don't even ask, Martha. The answer is yes. Your TV magazine has arrived. Oh. There it is. Oh, good. You know, it's an unfair life being the mailman's wife. How so? Well, I'm the first to see my husband leave in the morning and the last to get my mail in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> you think you've got problems? <laughs> I got a piece of mail here so overdue you can't imagine. Oh, are you in trouble? Oh, no, no, it's not my fault. We found an old letter in the sorting room chute, dated 1941. How exciting! Uh, who's it for? Did you deliver it? I'll tell you the whole story. Just let me sit down first. Hmm? Well, is it a personal letter or business? Uh, funny you should ask. That seems to be the big question. Everyone seems to think it's going to solve their financial matters. Here, take a look for yourself. Oh, my. August 1st, 1941. Well, it's in a woman's hand. Just look at those flourishes. Oh, I'll bet my button box it's personal. Wait, uh, did you find this, Leon Winters? I didn't find anybody. Apparently, addressee and sender are both dead. I went to the address, uh, 507 South Market, that uh, old house, you know. Oh, yes. Lots of stories about that place. Our kids all swore the place was haunted. Well, it's not haunted now. Just not rented. I met the owner... Weird, Duck. First he tells me he's Leon, then he tells me he's Elroy, Leon's younger brother, and that Leon is dead. He's trying to hide something? Oh, I don't think so. It was just after the letter. And then I got the same song and dance from her side. Her? Yes, uh, Pamela. She's uh, the P.J. Moriarty. Pamela? Was she... Were they lovers? Oh, maybe, but, but let me finish you. The best I can figure... This guy, Leon, was using this rich girl, Pamela, to get money. Then he finally left town, and she died. <laughs> it's really too confusing. I'm afraid I'll just have to turn the letter in, it's all. Oh, no! I mean, let's look at it first. What? Open mail? I'd lose my job, no matter what the letter said. Well, you can't just give it up. Oh, I shouldn't even have it now. It just seemed like, uh, like a challenge to try. But... I've done all I can for today. Let's eat dinner. Ah, it's 9.30. Time for sleep. So, what about the letter, dear? All right, all right. I'll see what I can find out tomorrow. Enough is enough. Let's get some sleep. Okay, Martha? All right, George. Good night. <sighs> oh, 
My goodness, who on earth could that be? Oh. Hello. Give the letter to its rightful owner, George. No harm will come to you. But deliver it soon. Oh. oh. George, who was it? What's wrong? George? Is this nocturnal phone call the Moriarty threat? Or is it Elroy trying to claim his brother's long-lost paperwork? Perhaps there's someone else who wants the letter. And perhaps George's sense of duty is a bit extreme, just as Elroy warned. We shall expand on all of this in Act Two. Postman George McCready has committed the working man's cardinal sin. He has taken his work home with him. In this case, it's a letter overdue by 38 years. He won't rest until it's delivered. But should he continue to endure threats, insinuations, even midnight phone calls? For once, perhaps, George may be taking his job too seriously. And that can be dangerous. We join him now as he pays a second visit to the old Moriarty mansion. Come in. Hello, enough. It's the mailman, George McCready. Watch it. Don't step on those clippings. I'm sorting through my old scrapbooks. Well, it looks like the National Archives in here. So, you've decided to give me that letter after all? No, quite the opposite. I came to warn you. Lay off the threats and phone calls. What do you mean? I got a midnight phone call demanding the letter. Who was it? One of those tough Moriarty's you threatened me with? Oh, believe me, I have contacted no one. Now, listen, Adolf. I was trying to do my job yesterday. Today I'm here on my own to tell you that I intend to turn the letter in. Oh, no, please, don't do that. If you give it to the authorities, you will be passing up a big opportunity. I'm convinced that it is the key to a large sum of money. And if we can recover it well, there might be a nice reward. That would be bribery. You forget, sir, you're dealing with the United States mail. Well, maybe, maybe if I told you the whole story... Why should I take your word? You're obviously hiding something. Well, what about these newspapers? Isn't their word good enough? Look, here, in my scrapbooks, all these clippings about the Moriarty's. This book holds 30 years of family history. And family scandals, no doubt. Don't judge them so harshly. They didn't ask for fame. Especially little Pamela. She, she hated the family's reputation. Here she is, age 16. Her first debutante ball. Hmm. She is striking. More than striking, she was different, intelligent. So, uh, what happened? <laughs> this is her engagement photo, 1941. She was set up to marry this banker. That's, that's when she met Leon, who is, as you know, the name on that letter. So you did know Leon Winters, huh? Yeah, sure. A nice boy. Only... He couldn't show his face around here. He came from the south side. I know the south side. That's my route. Ah, uh, then you know the problem. The wrong side of the tracks, as they say. But Pamela loved him all right. And since I was... Uh, I was fond of her, I had to meet... Her. Like uh, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> so, what happened? They ran away, right? Ah, uh, not too fast. Leon would have liked that, but not Pamela. If she were to run away with a poor boy, the family would have disowned her, cut her off without a dime. Aha. Uh -huh. Enter the villain. Money. Well, there was a trust fund in her name, and she wasn't about to let the family get hold of that. So Leon had to wait around until she was old enough to get the trust fund. Hmm? And that's where things began to fall apart. You remember, this was 1941. It was fairly certain that America would soon be at war. And uh, Leon would be drafted. Right. So he, he was impatient. He wanted Pamela to forget her fortune and marry him. But she just couldn't leave all that money behind. You mean she said no to him? She hesitated. 
But that was enough. The next thing she knew, Leon had joined the Marines. Ah, that's too bad. But uh, you still uh, haven't explained why some old love letter could be so important. Now, be patient. Once Leon went off to war, that's when the scandal, as you call it, began. The shock of his being gone, really gone, brought Pamela to our senses. And so she ran off to join him with the money. With what money? Her trust fund. She met secretly with the family lawyers and convinced them to give her the cash. It was an enormous amount. Hundreds of thousands. She talked the lawyers into giving... Tricked giving them into it. She was a smart girl. And she packed up, bought a passage to Hawaii and took off. She probably meant to meet Leon there. Hmm. Incredible. She took the money and ran. And then what? Then... That is the end. How do you mean? Her ship went down in the Pacific. They never found her or the money. Oh, that's terrible. Poor Leon. Oh, I doubt he ever knew. He died, too, in the war. So, uh, that was that. Except for the money. She left with only one small suitcase, so everyone figured she must have hidden the cash somewhere before she left. And you uh, figure this letter is the uh, the uh, treasure map telling uh, Leon where the stash is hidden. You see, it must be. No other letter was ever found, no clues. This must be it. Well, no wonder Elroy Winters smelled money when I showed him the letter. He's got to be thinking the same thing. And, uh... He is Leon's next of kin. But you won't find Pamela's next of kin. They're all gone. So I'm next in line. She she would have wanted it that way. I was her favorite. I was... It's not up to us. Sure it is. We could find that money. Thousands of dollars. You could even have had... Adolf, bribery is a crime. Give me the letter. I'm the one she trusted. I had to get away with... No, no, no. Put down those scissors. Come, come and drop them. <laughs> Now, Adolf, look. If I hear from you one more time, it won't be the post office you're dealing with. It'll be the police. Hey, you're running late, George. I was just sorting today's mail for you. Oh, thanks. I had an errand to run. I'd better hit the streets right away. No, no, hold, hold, hold on a minute. I, um... Uh... I wanted to talk to you about that old letter from yesterday. Well, why not? That's all I've heard about lately. <laughs> yeah, you can give it to the dead letter office. Oh, trouble? No, no, no real trouble. Tracking down the parties involved has just proved <laughs> impossible. Yeah, well, uh, one of those parties actually called up the post office. Who? When? Yesterday afternoon. A fellow named Elroy Winters. Oh, yeah. The brother of the addressee. He was pretty upset that I wouldn't give him the letter. Well, it's no problem. I told him it was normal for you to try and return it to the sender. What's the, uh, what's the big deal with this letter, anyway? Someone had some money back then. A lot of money, evidently. And now everyone figures this letter has the key. Oh, boy. I started out thinking this would be fun to show up with a letter 40 years later. I figured I'd be a hero, but now... Ah, stop worrying, George. It's not that important. I called a main branch in Johnstown this morning, and they said we can give it to the next of kin. And that makes it this uh, Elroy character, right? Right. Well, I'm glad that's solved. You want me to hold it until he calls again? Ah, uh, give it back to me. I'll take it on my route. If he's at the house, I'll hand it over and be done with this mess once and for all. Five oh seven South Market Street. Here we go again. Hey, uh, Elroy. Wait. It's me, George McCready. Uh, hold it. <laughs> hold it a minute. I, I need to talk to you. Uh, Mr. Winters, uh, you're as white as a sheet. You all right? Say, maybe we should go in the house and talk. No. We'll talk out here. You may get in the car. You don't look well. What happened? I've just spoken to Leon. What? When? Just now. In the house. In person. Oh, you're not suggesting you saw a ghost in that house? Call it a ghost, a vision, a dream, whatever. 
I just spoke to my brother. Well, maybe there's some kids in there. I'll go take a look. It was Leon. I saw him. He wasn't a day over 20 years old. Elroy, if this melodrama is an attempt to scare me into giving you the letter, don't bother. I came here to give it to you anyway. I don't want it. You don't want it? But it's yours. Pamela's dead and you're Leon's next of kin. You're supposed to have it. It's Leon's. Give it to him. Uh, look, Elroy, this is really crazy. Yesterday you wanted this letter so badly you were ready to call a lawyer. Here, will you take the letter? I won't bother you anymore. Thank you, but no. There's nothing in that letter for me, I know. Well, then, I'll leave it in the mailbox. You, uh, whoever wants it can pick it up whenever no, you... No, you mustn't. You've got to deliver it to Leon himself. Okay, Elroy, as you wish. The letter goes back to the post office. Martha, I'm home. Hello, dear. So, did you solve the big mystery? Not entirely, but it no longer matters. I'm turning the letter into the dead letter office tomorrow, and that'll be the end of it. Mm, maybe it's just as well. The whole thing sounded a little suspect to me. But just for fun, tell me what you found out today. And the whole story is one big missed connection. In a nutshell, rich girl Pamela meets poor boy Leon. They fall in love. Leon wants her to elope with him, leave her family and fortune, but she wants to wait until she inherits her trust fund. How foolish. Leon goes off to war. Pamela decides to take off after Leon. Only her ship sinks and she dies. Then Leon is killed in the war. Can you believe that? Oh, what a terrible tragedy. Oh, George, I'm dying to know what's in that letter. You and everyone else, except Elroy. He sure changed his tune. Thinks he saw his brother's ghost. Wants nothing to do with the letter. Maybe he's scared. Mommy sure looked it. But, uh, what makes you say that? Well, I heard some more haunted house stories. Recent stories. One of the girls from the church circle lives near there. Oh, no. Here we go with the ghosts and the monsters. It is a strange house, dear. Nobody ever moves in. And every so often you hear tales. Lights on and off. Old radio music. It's just kids. Elroy said so himself. Let's forget it. Go to bed. And, uh, take the phone off the hook. Off the hook? Why? Is there something you haven't told me? I just don't want any cloak and dagger business tonight. If someone needs to speak to me, they can visit me in my dreams. Good night. No wonder George wants the phone off the hook. Elroy's sudden change of heart. Martha's haunted house reports. Is this mystery closing in on our postman? Will he make it till morning and be rid of this curse once and for all? We'll find out how it all ends in Act Three. A Hollywood film critic once reviewed a particular comedy with this one-line synopsis. Man returns from the beyond to straighten out his financial affairs. If the plot sounds a little implausible, recall the words of our eternal optimist. It's better late than never. One thing is certain. Both that story and ours raise the same question. Do spirits really lurk about on Earth, finishing up their unfinished business? It seems that George and Martha are about to learn the answer to this and other questions. Uh, I can't sleep. Mm, me neither. George, can't we read the letter? No way. I can't do that. But I can. I won't lose my job. No. I'll, I'll steam it open. Take a quick peek and seal it right up. No one will ever know. I can't let you do that. Oh, fiddlesticks. You, uh, how about this? The letter is right over there on the bureau. Now, suppose while you're asleep, I go over, pick it up, and just look at it from the outside. Now, is that a crime? Uh, 
That's okay with me, although I can't imagine what good it would do you. Oh, good. Oh, my. Well, she really loved him. You can see it in the handwriting. You should be a palm reader. This woman's stationary. Practically transparent. All you have to do is hold it up to the light. I'm surprised you haven't done this already. Now, let's see if I hold it up at just the right angle. I can almost... Can you see any kind of a map in it? Uh, a diagram, maybe? No, they're just words. Dearest Leon... Uh, Martha, I'm not listening. Dearest Leon, I hope this letter... Oh... Oh, my goodness. Oh, George, you've got to read this. What's wrong? Well, nothing's wrong. It's just that... Well, do you want me to tell you or not? No, never mind. I, 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 I think you better put it back in my pouch. What's that? I thought you took the phone off the hook. I did. Maybe it's the phone company. Don't answer it. George, you should. It might have something to do with... You know. Uh... Hello. Hello, George. This is Leon. Leon Winters. Don't you think it's time you delivered my letter? Bring it to my house. 507 South Market Street. Tonight. I'll be here all evening. No harm will come to you, George. George? Who was that? It was Leon, wasn't it? It can't be. I I don't believe in that stuff. But who else could call you with the phone off the hook? It's some sort of trick. Elroy's scare tactics. What did he say? He... he they, they said to deliver the letter to, tonight to, to the house. Let's do it, George. We should. I can feel it. Well, I can't. I still think it's some kind of trap... What what makes you so anxious to send me over there? Because I know it's all right now. Why? I can tell from the letter, from reading it. D d trust my intuition. Oh, I don't want to drive over there at this hour. I, I can go in the morning. Yeah, when it's light, huh? You're scared. I am not. Well, come on. Now, let's get dressed. I'll drive you right now. We'll drop it off and be done with it. Well, okay. Okay, I'll go. But not because of that call. Because I trust your instincts. What are you doing? I'm turning the engine off while I wait for you. Oh. Well, I'll just be a second. I'll drop the envelope on the box and come right back. There are lights on in the house. Now go up to the door, George, and knock. Maybe I should take a look. Might be some kids in there or vandals. Good idea. I'll be right back. George, why you scared me? Why were you running? Oh, there's, there's a guy inside. A young fella, early 20s, uh, sitting in, in an old chair. There, there, there's a lamp and a table and a fire in the fireplace. It's him. But yesterday, that place wasn't furnished. What does he look like? Uh, it's dark here. Wavy, uh, a thin mustache, and, and he's wearing old clothes. Rags? No, 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 no. Some kind of a uniform. It, uh, jungle fatigues. Like an old war movie. And he didn't see you? Well, of course not. Well, so go back. Knock on the door, George. Oh, this is silly. It's not, dear. He's waiting for you. I know it. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. Don't bother to knock, George. Let yourself in. Come over here. By the fire. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm here because... I know all that. Who are you? Did Elroy put you up to this elaborate setup, the, 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 the ghost business and all? I prefer the word spirit to ghost, Mr. McCready. Here's my identification. Motor vehicle operator's permit issued to Mr. Leon Winters. 
August 1940. Where'd you get this? A little out of date, isn't it? But I really have no need to drive anymore now, do I? I don't believe this. You mean you don't believe in me? Isn't that it? You're convinced that a soul can't be trapped here on Earth. Restless. Waiting for something. But then, why did you come, George? I came only because my wife talked me into it. Because I trust her instincts. Uh, look, let's let's get this over with. Here's your letter. At long last. Dearest Leon. Ah, uh, finally. You'll excuse me, George. I'm savoring this moment. I hope it was worth the wait. Oh, yes. Very much so. It couldn't be better. You see, George, I had to wait for Pamela's answer. And now that I know what it is, I can finally rest in peace. I, uh... I guess I'll go now. My uh, wife's waiting for me in the car. No, 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 wait. Please, please stay. I've only got a few minutes left. I can feel myself fading already. I'll soon be no more than a memory. Is, is there anything I should do? Or... Just stay for a minute. It's been a lonely 40 years. Even Elroy was shy about seeing me. Well, he comes by and checks up on this place pretty regular, no? That he does. But he hasn't kept the house up all these years just out of sentiment. He's afraid to tear it down. For fear I'll move into his place. You seem to know what everyone's thinking. Not everyone. Just those near and dear to me. For example, I knew Pamela's letter was stuck in the mail chute ever since the day it happened. Oh, why didn't you read it back then? Because a spirit can see a lot of things, but he really can't do much about it. It's sort of like you can't just take your final reward. It has to be given to you. Now, well, wait a second. I, I don't understand. If you knew about the letter the day it was mailed, they, then you were already... Dead. That's right. So... You must have known that Pamela was coming to meet you. Of course. I watched her ship set sail for Hawaii. And I watched it sink to the bottom of the Pacific. Oh, but couldn't, couldn't you join her then after she died? Her spirit didn't linger. She passed on to the next life. She had already made her peace in the letter. And, and she left you behind well, I had deserted her in life. I ran away and got myself killed. I robbed her of her dream of our meeting. So I was doomed to wait until now. It's all kind of hard to explain, but it's really very fair. Well, that's a comfort. But uh, w w what about Elroy and Adolf and the, the money? Don't worry about Elroy. He's always resented Pamela. He wanted her money as some sort of revenge. And as for Adolf, he was jealous. Remember that he was my age when Pamela ran away. In a way, he lost her to me. So the money seemed like compensation, I suppose. But they, they never found any money. There is no money. Well, Pamela... Us? In a way, yes. But you'll understand everything once you've read the letter. Oh, I'm fading away now. Thank you for... Oh, wait, 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 where are you going? Don't, don't, don't you want to take your letter? You keep it. I'm leaving the physical world. Goodbye. Leon? Leon? Where are you? Leon, can you hear me? Have a wonderful life, George. If you need me, you know my forwarding address. So long, Leon. Uh, hi, honey.
I... Well, you were in there forever. What on earth happened? Here. This is for you. The letter? Well, it's open. Didn't you give it to him? Of course I did. And after he read it, he gave it back. He doesn't need it anymore. You mean because he's a ghost? A spirit, dear. But what does it say? I don't know yet. I saved it for you. Go ahead, read it. Oh, George, I'm so excited. Dearest Leon, I hope this letter finds you well. I love you. The biggest mistake of my life was letting you go. I only wish I had realized that sooner. <laughs> Smart girl. Now keep going, keep going. But I had to say no to you. Running off to get married would have pleased my family too much. They'd be rid of me and claim my trust fund in the bargain. That's just what they wanted. That's what everybody wanted, the trust fund. But now I'm free at last. I've turned my inheritance over to various charities anonymously. So, Leon wasn't kidding. There is no money. Shh. Now, now, this is the part I read through the envelope. And now my answer is, yes, I'm on my way to Honolulu. I'll wait there until you can join me. I love you, Leon. I'll wait forever. Yours, Pamela. Well, like I said, your intuition is never wrong. And now, they're together. Thanks to you, Martha. Thanks to us, George. You did deliver the letter. Well, you know the saying. Nothing can stay me from my appointed <laughs> rounds. <laughs> <laughs> With George's sense of duty and Martha's sense of destiny, the letter is finally delivered. We must always be ready to obey our instincts, to follow the irresistible pull of life. And when we do, we may find ourselves doing things we hadn't thought possible. An example when I return shortly. Some say that reality is all in the mind. This point of view can present some unanswerable questions. Did George actually deliver the letter to a spirit? Examine the facts. An off-duty mailman enters an abandoned house late at night. He clutches a 40-year-old piece of mail in his hand, torn open in a moment of emotional stress. Did he tear the envelope himself? Did he imagine the entire drama? To George, it was real. Beyond that, we can never know. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Terry Keene, Bob Caliban, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. International wants to come in here. And we will. We would rather come in with your blessing. It can't be done. But if we have to, we'll come in without it. Now, you can make it tough. You can delay us for months, even years. But sooner or later, that building will go up. I really shouldn't waste any more of your time, Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Simmons, let me ask you a question. How much? How much? Well, usually it all comes down to how much. How much do you want? Are you trying to bribe me? <laughs> well, of course. How dare you insult me? I must ask you to leave. Uh, no, no, I was merely doing my job, and therefore it was necessary for me to touch all the bases. A good day, sir. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall asking an age-old question. In this flawed world, can good ever come from evil? There are those of you who will answer yes. Others, a resounding no. Still others, astride a moral fence, cannot make up their minds. In the story I bring you, let us seek the answer in an individual case. You will be the jury, and at the story's end, bring in your verdict. Can good ever come from evil? Now stop, Susan. Just stop. I won't be part of such a wicked scheme. Please, Aunt Tim, please. I know how to do it, but I can't do it without you. No, it is wrong. It's evil. It's not. Please, Aunt Tim. No, and that is final. Don't mention such an abomination again. Our mystery drama, The Orphaned Heart, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Nancy Moore and stars Roberta Maxwell. I shall return shortly with Act One. operating room of Mercy Hospital was there not as a nurse, but as a patient, paralyzed from a crushed spine. Dr. Levy, chief surgeon, leans above her, his kind old eyes trying to disguise what they both knew, that she was dying. Where, she wondered, was David? Hurt, too, in the automobile accident? Dead? She tries to say his name. Only a dry sound struggles from her throat before the ether claims her. When she returns to consciousness, but this is Susan's story. Only she can do it justice. Like any romantic girl, I had always dreamed of a church wedding. Bridesmaids and organ music. The bride in satin and lace. Instead, I wore a coarse hospital gown. And instead of standing at a flowering altar, I lay flat on a hospital bed. I, David, take thee, Susan. I, Susan, take thee, David, till death do us part. part them soon. David kissed me, feeling the pitiful vows. Then, Dr. Levy's voice saying, Susan must rest now. And the room was empty. The bride alone. Remembering. I fell in love with David the first time I saw him. A new surgeon at Mercy where I was head nurse. But Dr. David Clark's mind was only on medicine. He paid no mind at all to Susan Martin. Then, by some marvelous good fortune, or was it, I was nearby when Dr. Levy spoke on that subject to David. Doctor, all work and no play eventually makes a bungling surgeon. You will take time off Every week. I don't need or want any time off, Dr. Levy. I'll make the diagnosis here. Time off. That's an order. Nurse Martin, see that Dr. Clark obeys. <laughs> how do I do that, Dr. Levy? Well, David, how does she? <laughs> Martin, I'm not sure I remember how to play. But if you're willing to be my assistant off duty as well as on, I'll give it a try. <laughs> right then would have shown my heart gone crazy. That night, David took me to dinner. He really had forgotten how to play, but two cocktails loosened him a little. After that, he took me out once a week, a pattern set. 
A few drinks to relax him, laughter, companionship, a kiss goodnight. Each time I loved him more. My Aunt Timothy Simmons was the only person I could talk to about David. Was there, I asked her, anything wrong with trying to make him love me? No, but I think there's a good deal wrong with how you're going about it. All I do is try to be good company. But seeing to it that he drinks more than he should is being good company? Liquor breaks down barriers. Mm, No doubt. But liquor won't make him love you. Oh, Aunt Tim, he'll love me. And he'll marry me. Wait and see. One summer night, David and I went to the seashore. After a moonlight swim, we lay close on the warm sand, had drinks from a thermos, and forgot to eat our picnic supper. He kissed me longer and sweeter than he ever had, and called me Susan. Always before, I was Martin. Susan. Susan. Oh, David. I love you. I love you so. Martin, no. Don't, please. You're very dear, but what's happened between us doesn't mean I... I... Love me? I know it doesn't. I've always known. Forget that I said that nonsense. It was the martini talking. It's forgotten. Come, let's go for a drive. We drove with the top down under a full moon. I didn't care that David was driving much too fast. And I didn't see the sharp turn. At the moment we hurtled over a steep grade, I was wishing on a shooting star that David would love me and marry me one day. In the hospital, after the long operation, when I came back to consciousness, David, unhurt, sat beside my bed, pale and stricken. Oh, Lord, Susan, what have I done to you? How can I make up for this? Uh, Marry me, Susan. Marry me. Later, the nurse told me that in my delirium, I have cried out over and over, David, love me, marry me. And David heard. Why did I allow such a mockery of marriage? Because I believed what everyone believed, that I was dying, and I could face death with part of my life dream come true. I, David, take thee, Susan... Till death do us part. And so, after that pitiful ceremony, Dr. Levy said... Susan must rest now, David. Alone, Mrs. David Clark lay waiting to die. Mrs. David Clark, like another shooting star, the marvel of that name shot through me. Every nerve and cell sprang to life, strength flowing into me. By all the rules, I should have died. I prayed to live to be David's wife. I did live. And a thousand times I wish I could have died. You and the good Lord have wrought a miracle. The miracle doesn't include making me whole, letting me walk, Susan. Perhaps with time. No. Dr. Levy is certain. I can never even use crutches. David is married to a woman he doesn't love. Husband of a wife tied to a wheelchair. I know what I have to do, Aunt Tim. Quickly. Now. Or I I wouldn't have the moral strength ever to do it at all. David? Which one of us gets the divorce? Neither of us will get a divorce, Susan. Now, you're not going to hold me to a marriage I hardly knew was happening. You know very well I was too sick to know what I was doing. I don't know any such thing. And I know what you're doing now. Giving me an out. I don't want out. You're my wife and you'll stay my wife. Only because you feel guilty about me. I am guilty. No. What happened was an accident. It could have happened to anyone. Was it an accident that I drank too much and drove like a maniac? Let me do the little I can do to make up for what I've done to you. Don't take that chance away from me, Susan. Don't make me any more guilty than I already am. 
nothing would change his mind. Before I left the hospital, he bought a lovely house all on one floor with a garden where I could paint not very good pictures of the flowers. He hired a live-in nurse, but was so exacting about my care that she soon departed. Two more came and left. Then David went to Aunt Timothy. Aunt Tim, I'm here to apologize. What in heaven's name for? Refusing your offer to take care of Susan. I still think it's too much to ask, but... Now I'm asking. In fact, begging. You know you don't have to beg. Susan is an RN, the best. She'll know when something more is needed than you can manage. Will you come? Aunt Tim, a thousand thanks for coming. It'll be lovely to have you here. Well, if ever it isn't lovely, if I get on your nerves or David's nerves or the cat's nerves... I want your solemn vow that you'll tell me. I solemnly vow. And I vow, once you say the word, I will vanish out. Gone. No hard feelings. I wish David would vanish just because I say the word. Out. Gone. No hard feelings. I've lost count of how many times I've asked him for a divorce. And nothing's changed. He, He doesn't seem restive. If he is, he doesn't let it show. No wife ever had a more kind and thoughtful husband. I'm so glad for you. Well, don't be glad. Can't you see his wretched goodness and sweetness make me love him more? I see, but I don't... I don't want to love him. I know. I know. If he were rotten to me, I could say, get out, leave me alone. I don't want you anywhere near me. And mean that so he'd believe me and go. One day, I will say it. I plan how. I I, I rehearse it. I, I scream it so the lie will have the ring of truth. I've never yelled at David. He'll believe me if I yell. He'll... Oh, and him. He's got to believe me this time. I can't wreck his life any longer. I'm sick of the charade, David. Bored into the grave with it. It's an empty act and I hate it. Get out. Just get out. I just don't want you anywhere near me anymore. No, he could read my eyes. The months of mock marriage became three years. Where would it end? In my orphaned heart, I knew it had to end. But who would dream it would end the way it did? A few miles from our city flowed a wide river where I liked best to paint. Aunt Tim would drive me there, settle me on the bank with easel and paints, then leave to do her shopping. In spring, the waters fed by mountain streams ran wild and high, threatening to overflow. And in March of the fourth year... Dear, are you sure you don't mind staying alone when the river is like this? I like it best this way. It fascinates me. Well, I don't like it a bit. I'm afraid of it. What if there's a flash flood? Now, I, I'm putting your chair far from the bank, and I want you to promise you won't wheel any closer. That was the spring David fell in love, but not with me. He was not less kind, but his eyes sometimes had a far away look, and once, wool gathering like that, he called me Laura. I asked who Laura was. Laura? Oh, why, she's the new head nurse at Mercy Hospital. On my birthday, two weeks later, David sent me flowers. The card read, Laura, my love. No signature. Weeping, I showed the card to Aunt Tim. Oh, my. Uh, Susan? Now, why are you crying? A divorce is what you wanted from the beginning. I don't want it anymore. I want David any way I can have him. A fool's paradise is better than no paradise at all. I can refuse to give him a divorce, can't I? Yes, you can. Just because I'm a paraplegic isn't grounds for divorce? No, but those aren't the grounds, are they, Susan? You're saying if I really love him, I'd want his happiness. 
I will give him a divorce. But David's request never came. Our arid life went on as before. Only his haunted eyes spoke, but he meant to continue doing his duty. I would have had to ask him for divorce myself. And this time, his answer would be different. Susan, please. We agreed not to talk about divorce again. You've paid your debt to me, David. A debt never owed. Three years of paying. Now you've another debt to pay. What debt? The debt you owe to love. And love's name is Laura. How did you know? The florist cards were mixed up. Oh. I'm so sorry you had to find out like this because... It's over. I'm not seeing Laura at all. Please believe me. It's true something began between us, but we stopped it. I swear there's nothing now. Except love. I want you to have your love, David. Do you think we could have any happiness knowing it was stolen from you? Happiness can't be built on selfishness. There'll be no divorce. Ever. Did I love David without selfishness? I believe that I did. But what could I do that I hadn't done to set him free? The next day, at the river, I knew. distant mountains, sending down angry waters, straining to leap the river's banks. Susan sits painting the dark, swirling water, sits far back where Aunt Tim had anchored her chair. She feels compelled to paint, not what she sees, but what she imagines, the dangerous river at full flood, covering the very spot where she sits, and the ominous painting carries a message, death by drowning. I will return with Act Two shortly. What have we now? A painting that seems to speak to the painter. Death by drowning, Susan. But your death will not look as if you chose it. It will seem an accident... And this time, your beloved need feel no guilt. Once another accident bound him to you, this one will set him free. At first, when the message came to me, I shouted, no, no, and flung the painting to the ground. Thou shalt not kill. It was murder, self-murder, a sin. Believing that? Why did I keep thinking of it? My mind thrashed like the river. And by the time Aunt Tim came back, I had to tell her the awful thoughts that wouldn't go away. I knew I shouldn't have left you in this dreadful place. It's made you morbid. Well, you can be sure I won't bring you back till the danger of flood is past. Oh, how I wish we didn't live near this awful river. Susan? But now what are you thinking? You've just given me an idea. Let's move away, Aunt Tim. But you see, you're talking more nonsense. You know as well as I do David can't be asked to move his practice. I don't mean David should go with us. I see exactly what we can do and how. One day, after the spring rains when the river really is at flood, I'll come here to paint. While you're gone, I'll disappear. Or seem to. All the evidence will say I drowned, and David will believe the flood swept me away. Susan! Your story will be that when you came back from shopping, poor Susan and her chair were gone. He'll think I wheeled it too close, or the brakes didn't hold. Uh, Susan, just stop. I won't be part of such a wicked scheme. Please, Aunt Tim, please. I know how to do it all, but I can't do it without you. No. Now, even if I agreed it wouldn't work... You're not thinking of all the problems, the, the obstacles. The... I am, I am. And it's clearer every minute. I know where we'll go and what we'll do. We're not going anywhere. Do you love David? Oh, Susan, you know I do. Then prove it. Together we can give him back his life and give him Laura. There. 
Now that shows how addled you are. Even if David believes you're dead, he can't marry Laura. There's a law that if a body isn't found, seven years have to pass before a missing person is legally dead. Oh. The body of Susan Martin Clark won't be found and David can't marry anyone. No. Wait. He can be with his Laura, be free to love her, and the seven years will pass. Years of love. Not duty because he's tied to me. Oh, Susan. We can live on Uncle George's life insurance. It's more than enough. He didn't leave it to me for this. Our whole lives hiding? What kind of life is that? When it's safe, after a few months, we can go to Europe. You love Europe. Live in a charming, obscure village in Portugal or France where tourists never come. Yes. And Tim? No. All right. If you won't help me, then I... I really will drown myself. I will. And Tim? Yes, Susan. I think Aunt Tim knew I wouldn't carry out that shameless threat. But how could she be sure? We sat still till twilight planning... When we reached home, the plan was set in motion. David, uh, Susan will go and paint by the river, and the place scares me. It's so wild and dangerous this time of year. Well, then stay with her the whole time. Now, that's just silly, you two. I like being alone, and I paint better alone. What's more, I... I have this odd feeling that the river has answers to all my questions. <laughs> But Aunt Tim had been right. Problems and obstacles were so endless, I sometimes grew discouraged. Sometimes depressed. How could I live in a world without David? Other times I had grave doubts. Was, was what I planned wrong? Could only evil come from living a lie? But we went right on planning. The first essential was finding a place to stay in the mountains. Well, it certainly can't be a hotel or a motel. Oh, no. Absolute privacy. A, a remote furnished cottage with no close neighbors. But near enough to a village where I can buy supplies. Most important. Near enough to this city. So on the day Susan Clark dies... Don't say that. So on that day, you can drive me to our hideaway and get back home the same day to tell David the sad story of the river's treachery. Susan. Susan, I don't... I don't think I can go through with this. You can. You will. Now, we've got to look ahead, not back. Plan, plan, a thousand things. Buy me a wig, Aunt Tim. A, a what? After I've drowned, there'll be publicity, bound to be. My picture will be all over the papers, I'm sure. When we go house hunting, I mustn't be recognized. Uh, a little black bobbed wig, Aunt Tim. Oh, your beautiful long blonde hair all hidden... Susan, let me tell you something. Finding a place where two women can live alone won't be as easy as buying a wig. I know that. But we'll find that place. Don't be too sure. And I'll tell you something else. If we look at house after house in the mountains, cottage after cottage, and not one is right or even possible, then it will most surely be a sign that we are not meant to do this unnatural thing. Not meant to, Susan Clark. And the Lord will be seeing to it that we can't. By Aunt Tim's sign theory, the Lord was highly in favor. Very soon, we were led to an almost perfect hideaway. A pretty isolated cottage, 60 miles from the city. The sign out front told us part of what we needed to know. Furnished cottage for rent... Monthly or yearly. And, Tim, we are supposed to do this. The little house is telling us so. In the village three miles away, we got the key from the owner, Mr. Alby. Luckily, he was too busy in his hardware store to go through the house with us, or I'd have had to stay in the car faking a sprained ankle. The cottage inside suited exactly, and Aunt Tim 
to her own disgust, was developing into a marvelous liar. Mr. Albee, uh, my niece's name is Mrs. Clayton and I'm Mrs. Timmons. We're both widows and both love the mountains. We'd like to rent your cottage for at least six months. Well, now, ladies, it looks like it was just meant for the two of you. I want to believe that, Mr. Albee. When will you be moving in? Why, uh, we're not sure yet. Some problems to solve first. Anyhow, the rainy season begins soon. I, I think we should come after the rains. Don't you think we should, Aunt Tim? Oh, yes, afterwards, absolutely. Ma'am, you ought to come before the rains. Then you'd see the stream alongside your cottage thundering down the mountain. It's a sight to behold. I, uh, well, yes, I, I'm sure it is. We'll try, Mr. Albee, but we just can't promise. Well, any time suits me, ladies. Uh, we'll pay the first month's rental now, if that's satisfactory. Oh, well, it's fine and dandy. And I hope you'll be happy up here. Uh, kind of a long holiday, I take it? Very long. Longer than we've ever had. We brought it off, Aunt Tim. Weren't we clever every step? Full of lies. That's what we were. And wasn't I foxy saying I walked through the woods around the cottage? Yes, that was a good red herring. Now, if Mr. Albee reads in the city paper that Mrs. David Clark, who drowned, was a victim of paralysis, he won't associate that name with Mrs. Clayton, who tramped through the woods. Oh, the stage is all set, Mrs. Timmons. The die is cast. Well, I wish I could be cheerful about it like you. I shouldn't tell you this, but sometimes when I look at David and know that soon I won't ever see him again, I wish the rains would never, never, never come. The rains did come. Three days of drenching downpour. While the rains poured down, there were my tears. I pretended to David that I was annoyed because I couldn't go to my river. And overplayed my hand, a little. Susie, you've got a kind of obsession about that river. Do you realize how much you talk about it? Do I? It's, uh, well, it's just that I feel boxed in when I can't go there. And the first day the sun shines, I'm going. dawned clear. On our last morning, David sat across from me at breakfast. My husband. Mine. I felt my resolve weakening and wished he wouldn't sit on over his coffee. Go, I thought. Please go. So I can go too. But in spite of inner torment, I said what had to be said. It's a lovely blue-eyed spring morning, David. I can go to the river. <laughs> My wife and her love affair with a river. It, well, it does have something to do with a love affair. <laughs> can a husband be jealous of a river? <laughs> You're teasing me. No, complimenting you, really. You're a marvel, Susie. Have I told you that lately? Probably not. <laughs> All right, I'm off. Have a fine blue-eyed day. Dr. David Clark came around the table to his wife, standing beside her wheelchair. Usually, in farewell, he only touched her cheek with his hand. If he kisses me, Susan thought, I cannot go. A kiss would be a sign that he loves me a little. And I will not go through with it. She holds herself rigid, waiting. And we must wait for Act Three. Never to see David again would be Susan's true death. She longed for the kiss that would hold her to him. His hand touched her cheek. He did not kiss her. She said only two words, final and terrible. 
Goodbye, David. As he turned to go, she even managed to smile. He would remember her smiling on that fatal morning, would believe in the accident. Now, she sits on alone, waiting for Aunt Tim. The moment I woke up, the sun told me you'd say today is the day. I lay there planning how I'd argue with you. You did? Plead, beg, even cry. And then I told myself nothing would change your mind. It's too late for that. So this is the day, Susan. Yes, this is the day. It's begun, Aunt Tim. The die is cast. Yes. I'm clocking how long it takes to get to our cottage so you'll know exactly for the other times. Yes. I've uh, seen my house for the last time. David, for the last time. It isn't real. I don't believe it. It's as if... No. I will not talk like this. Think like this. The die is cast. And Tim. Yes. I, I know what you have to do is harder in some ways than what I have to do. I'll just sit up there in the mountains and wait for oh, you. Don't belittle what you have to do. Manage alone. You've never had to do that since your accident. But I can. I've practiced enough. Oh, poor dear Aunt Tim. You have to go back and tell David the endless lies. <laughs> never have left Susan alone, David. The river at flood like that. I told her I wanted to stay. Several times I told her. I said I was afraid of that river. I remember I used the word ominous. Now it's as if as if I had a premonition. And Susan not listening. Laughing at your fears. Liking to be alone. Sending you off. That's exactly how it was. Exactly. And then, then the river she loved, taking her. Taking her like a lover for its own. You could say that. Damn the river. She loved it and it killed her. Have you any idea what it does to me to know that if I'd given her a better life, this wouldn't have happened? She'd never have felt the need to go to that place. No, no, no. That's not true, David. Her painting, she went there to paint the wild beauty of the water. It is true. Her life would have been full. Instead, it was empty because of me. It was barren. David, don't talk like that. Now, it would break her heart if she knew you felt any guilt at all. You were always good to her. You've nothing to regret. Good. She was good, brave, gallant, never the martyr, never accusing. She never felt there was anything to accuse you of. She loved you. And heaven forgive me, I could never love her the way she needed and deserved. But I loved her, Aunt Tim. I loved her. One worry for me was that friendly Mr. Olby might come to call. He did just that. Fortunately, I was not in my chair. Tired from painting, I was lying on the couch when he knocked. My easel close by. Quickly, I took the afghan covering me and threw it over my chair. Then, with my hands lifted, my legs to the floor so I could sit up. Who is it? Amos Olby. Come in, Mr. Alby. The door's off the latch. Well, good day to you, ma'am. I just come by to see is everything all right? Everything's fine. Forgive me for not getting up. I've been painting for hours. It's made me tired and lazy. <laughs> now, there's no call for fancy manners. So, you're a painter? Yes, of sorts. There on my easel is the view from that front window. Bless my soul. The spitting image of them trees out there. The stream behind them rips snorting down the mountain. It's real beauty. 
I never saw the light. Thank you. Have a seat, Mr. Alby. Well, no, I can't stay but a minute. I've got to get back to the store. I'm awfully sorry I can't offer you something cool to drink. We haven't been very efficient about supplies. My aunt's gone to remedy that. Oh, is that so? I didn't see her car in the village. She's gone to the city. We need other things from there. You don't mind being out here in the woods by your lawn? Not a bit. I uh, paint better alone. My my late husband never understood that. Uh, here I am bothering you. Well, I'll go along. Uh, ma'am, I hope you'll be happy here. I surely do. Happy? That was not part of the plan. Only Davis was meant to be happy. Aunt Tim came back for a few hours the day after Mrs. David Clark's memorial service. It had been another painful ordeal, but in a way, <laughs> laughable. All the lovely, sad things the Reverend Harris said about you. I kept wanting to shout, Stop! Please, stop! Darling Susan is alive and well and living in the mountains. <laughs> well, what have you had? <laughs> But someone else might say it if we don't make more plans fast. Who? Who on earth? Mr. Alby. He was here yesterday, inside. Your chair, did he see it? I had time to cover it up. Then pretended I was too tired to get up from the couch. But if he makes a habit of coming... And Tim, as soon as you're here for good, we've got to tell him I had some kind of accident and I have to be in a wheelchair. More lies. But that isn't a lie, is it? Well... The lies aren't near finished with David. I can't keep on leaving you here alone. That was too close a call yesterday. And what if someone notices when I come here I never stay overnight? You have business in the city. Oh, that won't wash after a while. If I had that much business, I wouldn't take a house in the mountains. Now, next week, I'm going to tell David the last pack of lies. <laughs> Tell me I'm a busybody if you want to, but I just have to ask you a question. Any question, ask. Laura. Laura? What about her? Well, that's my question. Uh, nothing about her. You're not planning to see her? No. Is she married? Well, no, or I'd have heard about it. Oh, Oh, I'm glad, David, because Susan would want you to be with her. She told you that. And out of some wrong feeling of guilt, if you plan not ever to see Laura, then you're being faithless to Susan's memory. Thank you for saying that, Aunt Tim. Thank you. A week later, Aunt Tim told David... What she called her last pack of lies. David, I came to live in this house to take care of Susan. I can't bear it here now that she's gone. I thought it would get easier, but it gets worse. It's the same with me. I see her everywhere. I hear her voice. I keep remembering her at the breakfast table that last morning. Smiling. I'm glad I can remember her that way, but... I can't stand the house. I'll sell it and buy another. Can you bear with it just a little longer? But, well, David, it's not just the house. It's the city. Her city. The river. Her river. I, I want to leave all the memories. So I'm going to travel, David. I have friends to visit abroad, and eventually I'll find the place I want to live. And you'll find a new life, too. I hope, and I know I speak for Susan, I hope it's with Laura. Aunt Tim and I live in a village in France. Seven years have passed. Mrs. David Clark is legally dead. Yesterday, from America, came copies of the newspaper we subscribed to. In one of them, a picture of a young woman. A pretty, sweet face. Susan, look at, look at this picture. Miss Laura Stewart. David's Laura. Let me see. Read the caption. Miss Laura Stewart, 
married today to Dr. David Clark. Oh, and Tim. So, what you wanted has come to be. At long, long last. Now that it's happened, really happened. How do I feel? I don't know. It's too soon. Glad for David, of course. But how do I feel for me? And Tim, I'll tell you something I've never confessed before. To this day, I don't know if what I did, I'm still doing, is wrong or right. Dear, you always said it was right. Always. I had to say that. But I do know lies are wrong. I know laws are meant to be obeyed. My entire life is a lie. And because of me, David has two wives breaking a law of God and man. As long as I live, I'll ask myself if what I've done is good or evil. And I will never know the answer. Never. Sleepless, haunted nights, Susan seems to hear a voice whisper. It was wrong. An act of betrayal. Go back. What's done can be undone. She closes her ears. She will not hurt David anymore. What is now is forever. On better nights, she hears, What you've done is good, is healing. An act of love. David is happy. Be happy, too. And she is. I will return shortly. Stay on the road with Quaker Stay. Running long and Quaker State's new lifetime engine lubrication. Check out this amazing low price. The death of Susan Clark was a lie. But no one who hears her story can deny that she died a thousand deaths. Now I ask again the question we began with. Can good come of evil? In the case of Susan Clark, I personally answer an unqualified yes. What do you answer? How finds the jury? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Terry Keene, Gordon Gould, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. preview of our next tale. You must understand I do not willingly cause you pain. You force it upon me. Yesterday you gave us to understand no one in Doremi or anywhere else conspires with you. And now perhaps today you uh, remember it differently. I have nothing to add. We have sworn evidence that you are a courier for the French underground. Courier? What is that? Do you deny that you have carried messages from Doremi to Paris, the contents of which are to sabotage the German offensive? Whatever I have done has been at the bidding of the holy voices. Ah, sir. Young woman, this is the 20th century. There are no voices other than human. You have withstood some pain by refusing to tell us who is in this plot with you. However... There are voices. I tell you, there are. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Thursday night, CBS Radio Mystery Theater, 806 on 1160 AM. U.S. District Court Judge Alden Anderson today held the local air traffic controllers union and its top officer. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
The world seems crammed with people eager to tell you what's wrong with you and how to fix it. How to enjoy peace of mind. How to escape loneliness. How to love yourself and others. In short, how to live the good, the satisfying life. One wonders, do these people enjoy peace of mind, avoid loneliness, love themselves and others? These people are so anxious to impart their wisdom. How good, how satisfying are the lives they lead? Lovely people. Mm. Perfectly lovely people. Mm. So sweet, so dear, so open, so free. Mm. Lovely people, all of them. Don't you think so, Irene? Oh, yes. Except for you. You are not lovely at all. Frankly, Irene, you are awful. Our mystery drama, Lovely People, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Kim Hunter. I'll be back shortly with Act One. what the great poets, philosophers, and storytellers have written, after deep thought and intense effort, it may dawn on you that the business of living is very complex, very difficult, and contains more grief than joy. So why does each of us remain convinced that he or she will be the exception? Somehow eliminate the grief and retain the joy. If not today, then tomorrow or the day after, if only we can get the hang of it. Never mind, Irene, I'll get it. Okay. I know who it is. Yes, yes, yes. Esther. Oh, you beautiful creature. Come in, come in. I just had to see you tomorrow. You're here, aren't you? And I'm here. We're here together. So everything's fine, isn't it? Well, better anyway. Come into my studio. And sit down and have some tea. Oh, no, no, no tea. I couldn't. I'm having trouble swallowing. You can't swallow anything? Well, just liquids. I, I can't swallow liquids for weeks now. But you have no trouble with solid foods. Well, not most of them. Mm -hmm. No trouble with chocolate eclairs, cupcakes, Nestle Road pudding... Lemon cream pie? I can manage those. Well, then. What seems to be the trouble? I... I think I'm unhappy. I see. Business doing well? Oh, yes. George left it in tip-top shape. It practically runs itself. Of course, I show up at the office every day for a few hours just to let them know who's boss. Sweet Bird Products runs itself, is that it? Well, just about. Oh, oh, here, I brought you a bottle of dewdrop lotion. It's a moisturizer. I use it myself. Is it any good? Well, it hasn't done me any harm that I can see. And it's selling like crazy. <laughs> and the money rolls in. Oh, tomorrow... Money can't buy happiness. I'll try to remember that. Love is what brings happiness. It certainly helps. Ever since George died, there's been no love in my life. Esther, if you were to get out more, do things, meet people. Do what? Meet who? I don't know. Something, somebody. But I don't know how to do anything. Learn how. But I don't know how to meet people. After all these years you've been coming to me, I thought we got you in touch with your feelings. Oh, I am in touch with them. And they hurt. And it's better than not feeling anything, isn't it? I don't know that it is. I think I liked it better before. Oh, Esther. Tomorrow. You want to know why I came here? I never know why you come here. I charge you plenty. Oh, who cares about the money? I, for one, do. Tomorrow, I'm going to tell you why I came here today. I was so frantic, so desperate. Why did you come today? Tell me. 
tomorrow. I want a reading. You want a... A reading? You want me to give you a reading? Oh, please. I haven't given a reading in years. I don't even know where my crystal ball is. I may have thrown it out. Oh, find it. Find it. I wouldn't know where to look. Well, well the, 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 the cards. What about the cards? Tarot cards? Yes. Oh, they wore out. The pictures faded. Oh, anything. Anything, Tamara. Just a little ray of hope. Just a tiny peek into the future. My palm. I'll settle for that. I could read the bumps on your head. Oh, fine. fine. Good. Do that. Or the print of your foot. All right. Do that. Those are merely tools. Simply center my attention upon them and then let my mind go foraging into the future. Seeking out the secrets. Hunting through time and space for happenings that never were. Cries that have never occurred, yet are bound to occur. Circumstances for which the stage was set eons ago, waiting for the actors to arrive. Eventualities which have never transpired, but which are certain to come about. Fortuities conceived in the dark past, waiting to see the light. <laughs> But you can't see tomorrow. I told you. But I'm desperate. I tell you, I'm desperate. Irene, what's going on out there? I can handle it. She won't let me see you, and I have to. All uh, right. Come on in. Oh, really? Come on. Come on. Uh, you, you're, you're sure it's all right? Uh, you wanted to see tomorrow, didn't you? You... You were tomorrow? None other. Come in. Come in. Care for some tea? I'm having some. I... Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll have some tea. If that's all right with you. I asked you, didn't I? Sit down. You're shaking all over. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, 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 I guess I am. Uh, lemon? Milk? Sugar? Uh, uh, no, no nothing. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm sitting here looking at you, actually talking to you. I, oh, oh, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 try not to spill it. No, I won't. I'll, I'll try not to. I, oh, oh. I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't matter. I am so distraught. I have never now, been so... Now, just sit back and tell me about it. After all, that's why you came here, isn't it? I, I couldn't think what else to do. Well, clearly you're in trouble of some sort. Ooh, all sorts, all sorts of trouble. Well, sit back. Sip your tea and tell me. Uh, Miss Tamara... Yes? I have to be honest with you. I can't afford to pay you. Oh? I almost had the money saved up. I had $88, but I, I was so desperate, so desperate for help of, of, of some kind. I, I I bought some lottery tickets. Uh -huh, and you lost. Uh-huh. Well, I, I like your looks, so... You, you like my looks? Why shouldn't I like your looks? Well, nobody ever has before. Well, true. You're a bit on the skinny side. <laughs> I'm a shrimp. That's what they used to call me in school. Shrimp. But you have good, kind eyes. And a lovely complexion. Hasn't anyone ever told you that? Well, never. <laughs> never in my life. Oh, what a pity. Oh, I'm a... I'm a mess. That's what I am. I'm a mess. I'm poor, I don't have friends, I... I have no life, Miss Tamara. And I'm 40 years old, uh, 42, actually. And I have no life, I might as well be dead. Sometimes I think I am. Dead? I might just as well be, don't you think? No, I do not think so. I do not think so at all. Not for one single solitary minute do I think it. Really? I'm going to tell you why life is worth living. Even mine? Even yours. You have a job, I take it. Oh, yeah. With a big firm. I'm, I'm secretary to the head of it. Well, that sounds promising. Oh, well, I'm not really her secretary. She has five of them. Oh, a woman. Yeah, just her appointment secretary. Hardly even get to talk to her. Just good morning and have a nice day. 
Bert, I keep her appointment book, and that, that's how I ran across your name. She seems to see you quite a lot. Oh, really? Sometimes it says Tamara, and sometimes it just says therapy. So I put two and two together. Uh-huh, and they added up to me. Well, that's about it. Well, now, let's see what we can do about your life. Oh, yes, let's. Because in times of desperation, I want you to know that there is always something you can do about it. Always? Always. Never forget that. If I only knew what. You came here, didn't you? Yes, I I did that. And broke past my monstrous secretary to get to me. Didn't you do that? Yes, I did. So there now. You see? Now, what I'm going to do is give you a reading. A reading? A little glimpse of the future. (laughs) You didn't know I used to be a fortune teller, did you? Before I became a therapist. Well, I was... Here, take this apple. Uh, You don't have to eat it. Just peel it. (laughs) Here's a fruit knife. Peel it round and round so it comes out in one piece. Then I'm going to let my mind go foraging into the future. Seeking out the secrets. Hunting through time and space for happenings that never were. Crises that never occurred yet are bound to occur. Circumstances for which the stage was set eons ago. Apple all peeled? Yes. Oh. All in one piece. Throw it on the floor. The peel? Throw the peel on the floor? Do as you're told. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh. oh. Oh, my... My head is swimming. My eyes are looking into the future. Everything is illuminated. Anything about me there? A great deal about you. Marvelous things are coming your way. Unbelievable things. Fantastic, fabulous things. Tell me. Tell me. Oh, I'm exhausted. The effort has been too great. uh, Come back tomorrow. And I'll tell you what the future holds for you. Come back tomorrow. The irresistible urge to know what's in store for us. We all have it, don't we? Will we be successful? Will we marry and be happy? Will we have a beautiful home and charming children? Who would not like to hear that? But would we care to hear that destiny holds poverty or illness or an early death? Certainly not. And nobody is about to tell us. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Nothing has concerned mankind more consistently than the future. Before we could write... Perhaps even before we could talk, we scanned the skies for signs, or made sacrifices, or bowed down to images. Always the inner eye gazed in fear and trepidation on what John Milton called the never-ending flight of future days. Always we have asked of no one in particular, or of anyone, what will happen tomorrow. Your future spreads itself out before me. The mists are evaporating. And the reality is emerging clearer and clearer. It's as though the sun were coming out from behind black clouds. What do you see, Tamara? I see... Oh, how it glistens. Yes, I see... Money. Money? Me? Quite a lot of money. Oh. A lot? Oh, it can't be me. But it is you. No, it's just not possible. Anything is possible. Believe that. I I will. I'll try. I'll... I'll... Wait, wait, wait. The light is growing stronger. I see something else. What is it? What? Yes, what? A woman. A... A woman? Does that surprise you? I never dreamed. I, I... I I never thought... A large woman. Tamara, 
Is it possible that this woman you see in my future, will she, um... Will she like me? Like you? <laughs> yes, she will like you. Perhaps even love you. Oh, oh. oh too much. Uh, it's really it's too much. I, I never thought that money, a woman who loves me, I, I don't deserve that. Well, now, let's have our tea and talk of other matters. Now that your future is decided... You uh, don't think that you could be wrong, do you? I mean, that, that you were seeing somebody else's future and not mine. <laughs> you don't see anybody else in this room, do you? Just you and me. Uh, that's true. Here's your tea. Oh, uh, thank you. No sugar. See, I remembered. Oh, look there. Isn't that dewdrop lotion on your desk? Mm -hmm. What about it? Oh, that's one of our products. Oh, is that so? I, I shouldn't say our products. It's one of her products. Your employer. Mm. She's a remarkable woman. A large woman? Well, yes, but then you know her. She, she comes here. And a wealthy woman. Oh, very. She... Tamara, you're not suggesting... Oh, no. <laughs> well, I only know what I see in your future. Oh, I wouldn't dare. A woman like Mrs. Hobbs... I... How would I go about it? I, how would I make her notice me? Well, now, it, uh, it seems to me... Yes, yes? A little present. Left on her desk in the early morning. So that she sees it upon entering her office. Well, what sort of present? I, I couldn't afford anything grand. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. No, no, I... I suggest something more thoughtful. More sensitive to her feelings. What? What would that be? I suggest a dozen pecan macaroons. Irene, you remember the young man who broke in here so precipitously a few days ago? He came back the next day. Oh, yes, I, I remember him. Do you know his name? Well, don't you? You saw him twice. No, Irene, I do not know the gentleman's name. I do not know his name because I did not ask his name. However, I expect I'll hear from him, possibly today. His name is Harold Herman. His address is... Never mind. His name is all I need. Harold Herman. Hmm. Nice name, don't you think? As names go. Nice man. Lovely man. As men go. And Esther Hobbs is a lovely woman, don't you think? And don't say as women go. No, all right, I won't. All my clients are lovely people. Mm. Perfectly lovely people. Mm. So sweet, so dear, so open, so free. Mm. Lovely people, all of them. Don't you think so, Irene? Oh, oh yes. Except you. You are not lovely at all. Frankly, you, Irene, are awful. So you want me to answer that? I'm perfectly capable. <coughs> yes, hello? Tamara, is that you, Tamara? Uh, it is I. Uh, this is Harold, Harold Herman. Oh, yes, Harold. Tamara, you'll never guess what's happened. And then tell me. I think it was the baton macaroons that did it. I put them on her desk, the way you told me. Well, when she saw... You get to the point, Harold. It was as though... She saw me for the very first time. Harold, what happened? Tamara, she invited me to her house for dinner. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Truly happy. <laughs> I'll call you and let you know how it went. I, I know you're interested. Indeed I am. Oh, uh, Harold. Uh, yes, Tamara? Uh, stop by here before you go to dinner with the lady, and, and I'll give you a little gift to take with you. Something she'll like. A uh, Delmonico Bavavoise, perhaps, or, or a Gâteau Robert. Oh, Tamara, you are so kind. Yes, I can be very kind to those who need me. Goodbye, Harold. Lovely man. So, it's back to the kitchen, is it, Tamara? Mm, high time I return to my old talents. <laughs> and baking is so relaxing. It frees the mind, expands the imagination, 
fertilizes the brain, as it were. Every night, Madame Tamara, every single night for two whole weeks, cocktails in her drawing room. Uh, I only drink a very little, very dry sherry, a... Uh, Sugar, you know, I, I avoid it like the plague. Mm, your teeth. Yeah, well, they're my most attractive feature, so... Uh, uh, I understand. Go on. Then, into the dining room, all crystal chandeliers and damask napkins and the most beautiful silver mm-hmm. and a butler. Imagine, a, well, two butlers, actually. One for her, one for me. After dinner, sometimes it's the theater, if there's anything playing, or a concert. Sometimes bridge with another couple. Very grand, very knowledgeable. At first, I didn't know how to talk to them, what to say. But Esther taught me. Now I'm very good at it. Mm, what's the secret? You ask them questions. Is that all? Mm-hmm. And then you listen very carefully to what they say. No matter how long it takes, you listen. And then you wait a few seconds. And then you nod your head up and down and you say... Well, there there are any number of things you can say. Like what? Well, like uh, that's extremely interesting, or or uh, you've really given me something to think about, or or what an original point of view, or or um, uh, very sound, very sound. Uh, don't or, go on. Uh, I get yeah, the idea. I, I never dreamed life could be like this. I I thought I'd be stuck in my little one and a half room apartment for the rest of my life. So I read your future correctly. Oh, oh, you did, you did. And you thought life wasn't worth living. Oh, I know. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> it was you who taught me that life is always worth living because there's always something you can do. And I came here. And you changed everything. You, you made me believe. Very important. Believing. Uh, Madam Tamara, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Oh, go on. Tell me. <sighs> well, Esther has intimated... In, in fact, she she suggested that she and I get married. No. Oh, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you everything. She proposed to me. No. Yes. Yes, she did. And you consented? Yes. Yes, I did. Oh, good for you. You see, Harold, you're much more of a man than you ever thought you were. Well, maybe. No doubt about it. I'm I'm learning. But do you know what I really think brought it all about? What? It started with the pecan macaroons. And then the gateau robert. You think so? Mm-hmm. And then all the other rich, creamy things. The hazelnut roll, the torte glisse, the allegretti cake. I think it was all those things that made her start to love me. Well, well, well the night I brought her the date and almond cheese... Ah, yeah, that settles it, Harold. I shall prepare your wedding cake. And how is married life, Harold? Oh, marvelous. Tomorrow, I'm uh, no longer her secretary. No? Mm -mm, I'm a vice president. Well, well. (laughs) My name on the door. Carpet on the floor. Mm -hmm, And hunting prints on the wall. Imagine me, Harold Herman, with hunting prints on the wall. English or French? Uh, uh, Are there two kinds? Uh, yes, Harold. But but go on, tell me more. Uh, Now, first you tell me. What marvelous dessert have you concocted for me to take to her tonight? Well, how does a date pecan pie sound to you? Oh, it doesn't matter to me, because, of course, I, I won't eat any of it. Well, I make a very good date pecan pie. Well, I'm sure you do, but it's not for me, Tamara. It's for Esther. Oh, I'm so afraid of losing her. She does so much for me. I, I really do nothing for her. Really nothing? I'm just around, you know? I'm not amusing or interesting or anything like that. I'm, well, you might just say I'm I, I'm a body in the house. Oh, no, oh, Harold. It's true, it's true. I, I don't contribute anything, really. I, I can't discuss anything. I can't tell jokes. Oh, oh, but when I bring her my gifts, I don't give them to her till work is over for the day. I, I give them to her in the limousine that drives us home. Oh, 
And then you should see her eyes light up. She looks at me, almost, almost as though she loved me. <laughs> Am I being silly? No, Harold. Or, or, or conceited? No, Harold, no. Now I'll go get your date pecan pie. And tomorrow, stop around and I'll have some butterscotch tarts ready for you. And there have been several calls. I don't want to hear about them, Irene. Are you going to spend all your time in the kitchen? I may. I may just do that. Well, there's very little money coming in. If you don't mind my mentioning it. I do mind your mentioning it. So kindly do not refer to it again. There's the little matter of my salary. I might have to leave your employ. So leave. Nobody's keeping you here by force. Oh, I don't want to leave. Then stay. Frankly, I don't give a hoot what you do. Stay, go, do whatever pleases you. Tomorrow you know you need me. No one knows you the way I do. I'll get it. Hello? Tomorrow? Harold, um, I, I, uh... I, I don't know how to tell you this. Tell me what? It's such an awful thing. Tomorrow, Esther is dead. She's dead tomorrow. How? Oh, when? Right after dinner. I, I had to call you. Well, I'm glad you did, Harold. Come around tomorrow and we'll talk. Well? Esther is dead. Drop dead right after dinner. Pity. Such a lovely person. What horrors lie ahead for us? We do not know, nor do we wish to know. And yet, what joys are ahead? For we cannot know the joys without the horrors, nor the horrors without the joys. Since we cannot add to the one, nor subtract from the other, perhaps it is just as well that we wait patiently for whatever the future sees fit to bring. I'll be back shortly with our concluding act. expect from prognosticators anyway, from those who try to read our futures in a crystal ball, or fancy cards, or lines in our palms, or the positions of the stars, what do we want to hear from them? However realistic we may think ourselves to be, I strongly suspect that what we truly wish to hear is that we will be not only perpetually happy, but perpetually Alive. Oh, Mr. Herman. Am I early? Well, just a little, but... Oh, come in anyway. Oh, thank you. I'm just so darn lonely these days. Well, tomorrow just went cross town to see a client. Uh, she'll be back. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't come here for tea every day. Look... Come into the kitchen and I'll make you some tea. Well... I bought a brand new kind and I'm dying to try it out on someone. All right. No, it's terrible. I just keep leaving the office earlier and earlier. Not that I'm doing anything there anyway. Not that I know how to do anything. Esther always said the business ran itself. I guess that's what it's doing. I don't need me there, that's for sure. Well, but you're a very wealthy man now, Mr. Herman. You could do practically anything you wanted to. Like what? What about all those things you used to do with Mrs. Herman uh, before? Oh, Esther arranged all those things. The theater and the rest. She always got the tickets, reserved the table at the restaurant. Well, you could do that. Well, and go by myself? Well, well you, um... um you want to know something, Irene? Whatever you want to tell me. When Esther was alive, we used to have two butlers. After, you know, after she, uh... Yeah, I know. You let one go. No, I didn't. I kept them both. Oh, Mr. Herman. You call me Harold, will you? Well, of course I will, Harold. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, having, having both butlers around made the room, uh, the dining room, that is, seem more... Populated. Not 
not so empty. Oh. Of course, I don't talk to them, and, and they don't talk to me, still. Oh, tea's ready. Oh, that's, that's good. I really look forward to having tea here. Uh, no sugar, uh, right? Uh, no sugar. Oh, how did you know that? Oh, well, tomorrow I must have told me. Yeah, my teeth. You know, I, I, I want to save them forever. I don't know why, but that's one of the things I promised myself, that I'd always have my teeth, even if they're all that I have. You think tomorrow will be back soon? Oh, any minute now. She went clear across town to do a reading for Mrs. Featherstone. Hey. Maybe that's what I need, a reading. Oh, you think so? Well, it worked before, didn't it? Tamara had me peel an apple all in one piece, and then just by looking at it, she could tell what was going to happen to me. Yeah. Yes, she, she could see it in the apple peel. And it happened. Oh, that Featherstone woman. She'll be the death of me. I'm not sure it's worth it. It drains me. It absolutely drains me. Ah, uh, you'll feel better after a good cup of strong tea. Oh, I suppose. Um, tomorrow... What, Harold? Uh, I know it's selfish to ask when you're so drained. Ask uh, me what? For a... For a reading. The first time I came here. Remember the apple peeling and, and how I threw it on the floor and you read my future from that? So I did, so I and did. It, it all came true? Oh, probably pure coincidence. It would have happened anyway. Oh, now, Tamara, you don't really believe that. Mm, no, I don't suppose I do. Tell you what, there's no apple here to be peeled. I've lost my tarot cards. Tell you what. Put a match to the fireplace. I'll try to see your future in the flames. Oh, it's more. Th thank you. Thank you. Weary as I am. But uh, there are times when weariness can be an asset. When the mind relaxes and opens itself up. Maybe it'll happen that way. Oh, I'm sure it will. Well, there, the uh, fire's going. Mm, so it is. So it is. Well, now, what are the flames whispering to me? What can I see in their rosy glow? What does the crackle of the logs try to tell me? Oh, let my mind go foraging into the hazy future. Let the curtains part. Let the actors appear. Let me see them. Let me hear them. Oh. T Tamara, what is it? What do you see? Tamara? Can it be? Do I see what I think I see? What do you think you see? Coming toward me through the flames. It's... Yes. A woman. A, a woman? She smiles. She stretches out her arms. Oh, but not to me. No, no. Not to me, not at all. To another, not to me. To... To me? It's your future I'm reading, isn't it? I just can't believe it. Uh, Tamara, uh, what does the woman look like? Can you tell? Is it anyone I know? She's slim. Yes, very slight and thin. Not... Young, but not old, either. She walks with a light step. What else? What else? Dark hair. Dark, dark, dark. Her eyes? Dark. Almost black and flushing with fire. Sparkling with life. This woman is in my future? That's what the flames are telling me. It, it doesn't seem possible that... Tamara, the woman you, you see, could it... Could it be you? Me? Slim, dark, with flashing eyes. Not young, but not old. Why, 
Harold, such a thing never entered my mind. But it's possible, isn't it? Anything is possible. Who's there? Time for tea. Did I ask for tea? Oh, well, no, but this is your usual time. Shall I pour? <sighs> Might as well. Harold, uh, no sugar. Uh, uh, thank you. For you, Madam Tamara. Two sugars. That's right. Hmm? How about you, Irene? Oh, I had mine in the kitchen. Uh, biscuits, anyone? Oh, no, thank you. Well, now, isn't this nice? Don't you think so, Tamara? Uh, think what? Three friends having tea together in front of a fire. There's nothing so... so... Heartwarming, is there? Oh, yes, yes, by all means. Uh, certainly. Anything the matter tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm? No, not a thing. I think you're tired. Oh, it's that Mrs. Featherstone. She's worn her out. She's so demanding. No, it isn't just Mrs. Featherstone. It's me. You, Harold? Oh, no. You always make her feel better. Today I asked her to give me a reading. I shouldn't have done that. She was tired anyway, but she's so good. She's so kind. She was reading my future when you came in with the tea. That, that's why we lit the fire in the fireplace. So we could see my future in the flames. How did it look? Uh, your future? Wonderful. Didn't it, Tamara? Tamara? Hmm? Uh, what's that? Did you say something? My future. You, you saw it in the flames. Uh, what, what, what about it? Well, you remember, don't you, what, what you said about it? What, what did I say? What's the matter with her? It was just a few minutes ago. Harold, she's just tired. She's been overworked lately. Well, can't we do something for her? Well, I think the best thing would be for you to go home and I'll get her to bed. She needs a good long rest. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll call her tomorrow. Yes, do that. Tomorrow, mm. Harold's leaving now. Then I'm going to put you to bed. I'll call you in the morning, Tamara. Mm. Of course, of course, sure. Bye. Now, if you need anything, Irene, uh, if, if she needs... Uh, yes, I'll let you know. Okay, now, Tamara. We've got to get you upstairs and into bed. Mm. Come on, now. Now, come on, try and help. Oh, my goodness, you're dead weight, aren't you? Now, we're going to walk to the door tomorrow. Come on, now. One foot. <sighs> Other foot. That's it. Now, let me, let me get the door. Oh. Now, how are you feeling? Tomorrow. I'm tired, tired. Of course, you're tired. You're worn out. Now, going up the stairs. Mm. One step. That's it. Now, the next step. Hard, hard. Of course, it's hard. And you want to know why? Because I found that little bottle in back of the china in the pantry cupboard. Remember the little bottle tomorrow? With the white powder in it? Of course you remember it. The white powder you put in the torte Elysee, and the hazelnut roll, and the allegretti cake, and the date and almond chews. Well, there was some left. And I thought... Why waste it? Oh, in, in the, the tea. You you put it in, in the tea. That's what I did. I put the rest of the white powder in your tea. Now, here's your nice, warm, comfy bed. You just lie down on it. Oh, there you go. <sighs> now, lie back. Put your little head on the pillow and go to sleep. Don't be frightened, Tamara. 
because I'm right here. Right by your side. And I'll stay here with you till the end. Till the very end. And it won't hurt a bit. It looks like suicide, Harold. That's what the doctor says. Suicide. <laughs> I can't believe it. Tamara had everything to live for. Well, one can't judge by outward appearances, Harold. Who knows what goes on behind the masks we wear. But everything was going to be so wonderful. World weary. That's what she was, Harold. World weary. But that was all going to change. She read it in the flame. She saw a woman in my future. She did? Well, maybe she was afraid of losing your friendship and she couldn't bear the thought. No, no, she described the woman. Slim, with dark hair, flashing dark eyes. And, and I said, Tamara, that could be you. And what did she say? She said, it's possible, Harold. Anything is possible. And then you came in with the tea. Harold, what color is my hair? Why, you have dark hair, Irene. And my eyes? Dark? Yes, they're dark. Flashing? Mm, kind of. So? So what, Irene? Oh, Harold. You... You mean... You and me? Well, what do you think? I don't know. Does the idea appeal to you? Kind of. I'd make you happy, Harold. I can play bridge. I do like you, Irene. Only... Only what? I feel so... <sighs> strange, you know? Us sitting down here talking about things like that. And all the time... Upstairs... Tamara. Yes. Tamara. She was a lovely person, Irene. A lovely person, yes. But then... So are you, Harold. And you, Irene, you're a lovely person, too. A really lovely person. What's going to happen to these lovely people, Harold and Irene? You don't know, do you? I certainly don't know. And most crucial of all, they don't know. Oh, I hope they don't start running around trying madly to find out in advance... Better, much better, simply to take everything as it comes, a day at a time, and let the future take care of itself. It will anyway. I'll be back shortly. Really, it's better, don't you think? Not to know what's in store for you. Better still, not to let anyone predict it for you. Because fate plays crazy tricks on us all. If you don't know that, you don't know anything. And nobody can teach you. You have to learn it the hard way. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Russell Horton, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Time, said Mr. Henry David Thoreau, is the stream in which I go fishing. That's very well put. However, when one goes fishing, one can never tell just exactly what one may catch. When one fishes in an ordinary river, one may throw back what one doesn't like. But where may one throw an unwanted catch from the river of time? Darling, I'm home. Is supper ready? Uh, supper? I'm in a hurry. I have to go to the meeting. The meeting? 
Luther, haven't you just come from the meeting? I've come home for supper. But you've had supper. When? Before you went to the meeting. But I haven't gone to the meeting yet. Oh, how can you say that? Professor Tomlinson just called and said you made a brilliant speech. What time is it? Ten o'clock. It can't be. It's only six. No. Agnes, what... What happened to the last four hours? Our mystery drama, Pie in the Sky, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bob Caliban and Terry Keene. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It might have been. Yes, as the poet said, these are the saddest words of tongue and pen. How many of us can say, it might have been? Of a road not taken. Of a door not opened. Of a question never asked. An answer never given. All of the missed opportunities. Would we really have been better off in the long run? Our story takes place not too long ago, and the mind of an elderly gentleman named Luther Temple is musing over the very questions we have just posed. I don't know. I could have been a millionaire. A billionaire. A trillionaire. Luther. What is it? Are you talking to yourself again? Who? Me? Well, I'd like to know who else might be sitting in the room. I never talk to myself. Yes, dear. Why don't you go inside and... Oh, fix us a cup of tea. You just had a cup of tea. Well, then let's have a cup of coffee. Coffee? Why? Agnes, look out the window. Tell me, what do you see? Oh, my goodness, Luther. It's a rainbow. Well, then we have to have a slice of pie, too. You'll spoil your appetite for dinner. Can't be helped. We have to do it. Why do we have to do it? Because that's what it says to do in the song. What song? The one everybody's singing on the radio these days. Just around the corner, there's a rainbow in the sky. <laughs> so let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. Oh, Luther. <laughs> What am I going to do with you? Well, if after more than 50 years of being married, you don't know, what's the point in asking? Pie and coffee. All right. A good woman. But if I had become a millionaire, a billionaire, would I have stayed married to her? Most of the folks who become very successful, well, what's the point? Now, you may be asking, what's this millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire talk? Well, listen, you'll see. I think it began one day back in 1907. Yes, yes, 1907. Agnes? Agnes? Will you come in here, please? Uh, yes, Luther, dear. What is it? That noise. That abominable noise. Where's it coming from? The parlor. What's it supposed to be? Darling, I bought it this morning. It's a phonograph. It plays music. That screeching, wailing, caterwauling? That's music? Of course, darling. Can't you follow it? It's really a lovely tune. Oh, please lower it. Oh, I'll shut it off. No, no, no. Leave it on. No, it bothers you. I'll just have to put up with it, I suppose. Martha's cleaning in the parlor. Martha, please stop the machine. There, now. Better? Much better. Uh, darling, I want to talk to you about money. Yes? The money my Aunt Minerva left me. Well, it's your money, dear. No, darling, it's our money. Now, what should we do with it? Do you have to ask? Put it in the bank. The bank? Do you realize that the bank pays you as much as two and one-half percent interest? 
that much? Do you realize that at that generous rate, you will actually double your money in precisely 40 years? No, I hadn't looked at it that way exactly. Well, what did you have in mind? Oh, the stock market. The stock market? Now, please, Luther, it uh, was just a thought, just an idle, fleeting, vagrant thought. Well, darling, as I say, it's your money. Oh, we'll put it in the bank. Now, let's forget about it. Um, Agnes, where, where's my pipe? Are you going to smoke your pipe? Well, I've become kind of used to it. Oh. I admit I started it because I hoped it would make me look older. Well, after all, I do seem young to be a professor of mathematics, but I find I rather enjoy it. However, if it bothers you... No, uh, please, go ahead. Light up. Uh, where is my pouch? Your pouch? Yes, a special pouch I bought in which I keep my tobacco. It's dark brown. Well, I'm sure I haven't seen it. Could you have left it somewhere? Could I? Well, let me see. Of course. Oh, I remember now. I was at the faculty club. I, I'd better go get it. You'll walk all the way over to the faculty club just to get some tobacco? Oh, I need the exercise. But look outside. It's pouring rain. Well, I'm certainly not going to melt. And so, I remember I walked over to the faculty club. And the steward had my pouch. Of course, he gave it to me. As I was about to leave, Professor Tonneau came in. I tried to avoid him, but too late he saw me first. My dear Temple, how are you this perfectly miserable day? Uh, quite well, Professor, but if you'll excuse me, I, I have a most pressing engagement. But I cannot excuse you. Oh, you look chilled, drawn, peaked. Come, for the sake of your health, you must have a hot punch. Steward, uh, but professor, two club specials for Professor Temple and me. Now, sit, Professor. Sit. Uh, my wife is expecting... Congratulations. We must drink to the new arrival. No, 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 no. Uh, she's not expecting a baby. She's expecting me. Uh, won't she be happier to know that you are sitting in the club, cozy and warm, rather than battling the cruel elements outside? Well, how could she know that? Rest assured, my friend. She knows. She knows. <laughs> Talking about your wife, I understand that she has come into an inheritance. You do? Yes, and may I offer a word of good counsel? I really must be going, nonsense, Professor. Nonsense, nonsense. Ah, ah, the hot punches. The steward, set them down. Thank you. A toast. I give you this newly born, freshly minted... 20th century. <laughs> a time of unbelievable upheaval, as well as fantastic opportunity. What do you think, my friend? Upheaval? Things seem to be settling down nicely all over the world. Well, uh, thank you for the drink. Uh, no, I, you haven't finished it. I really shouldn't, you know. Talking about your wife's inheritance... Do you have any plans in that direction? Yes, we have agreed to do the prudent thing. Yes, I know, and place it in the bank. But is that prudent? Well, how can you deny it, Professor? One must move with the century. Where? Wherever it leads us. Assuming that's true, where is it leading us? Look about you, in the street. What do you see? Every day, more and more of those horseless carriages. Contraptions of the devil. Why do you say that? Well, who but the devil could devise machines that emit such foul-smelling fumes? They will require, I admit, some getting used to. Oh, if the Almighty had intended for us to drive about in machines, would he have created so many millions of horses? Plans for this world, from whatever source, are constantly being revised. I intend to place my money in horseless carriages. Horseless carriages. There's a company being organized to produce these things which deserves some attention. If you don't it's mind. Called General Engine. I really must be going. What's that? A burst of thunder, a streak of lightning. What else? Now, as I was saying, but I this company you. will manufacture these horseless carriages. And actually, the name will gradually disappear from our language. You will call them 
automobile. I will call them instruments of the devil. The company is being organized now. It requires financing. From the gullible, of course. The stock is selling for mere pennies a share. And it isn't worth the paper it's printed According on. According to present projections, the stock will be worth a fortune by 1928. Projections made by whom? By people who have foresight. Now, it is estimated that an investment of $1,000 today will be worth well over $7 million in less than three decades. Professor, I have been detained long enough. I simply must be getting home. Soaked to the skin. Oh, get those wet things off and I'll make you something hot to drink. I've already had something hot to drink. Yes, I smell it on your breath. Oh, Luther Temple, have you been indulging in spirituous liquors? How did that happen? I don't know how it happened. I ran into this fellow, Tano. Professor Tano. And who is he? He's new. What does he teach? Oh, let me think. Uh, uh, physics. No, no. That's, and that's not quite it. Uh, oh, yes. Metaphysics. What's that? Oh, well, that's new, too. Well, what's it about? I don't know. It has something to do with the mind, I suppose. Oh, wait a minute. Did... Did you tell him about your inheritance? Why would I tell him? How would I tell him? I don't even know him. But he knew about it. How could he know about my inheritance? We only received the letter from her lawyer this morning. Did... Did you mention it to anyone at all? Of course not. Did you? Well, I hadn't been out of the house all day until I went to the club just before. Well, you must have said something about it to this professor... What's his name? To know. But I know I didn't. You might not have been aware of it. How could I have not been aware of it? Well, there's no other explanation. How else would he know about it? But... Uh, dear, look, well, why don't we forget it? We'll only become bothered and overwrought and it'll all be for nothing. Oh, I suppose you're right. But, um, talking about the inheritance, I received a telephone call from my brother George. Oh, George. Do you know what he said he's going to do with his share? Something foolhardy, no but doubt. George is really very sensible sometimes. Now, he's going to take his thousand dollars and invest it in the stock market. Which means he is prepared to kiss it goodbye. This friend of his has some inside information. There's always inside information. This is a stock that must go up. It must? According to what law? According to the imperative of the coming century. Which is? This is to become the era of the horseless carriage. Oh, no. No, no, please, no. The stock is called General Engines. It's estimated that in less than three decades, an investment of $1,000 will be worth over $7 million. What did you say? That's what my brother told me. No doubt... But who told him? Certain information is being bandied about. Well, tips on the market can certainly circulate over a wide range. But other information... How, for example, did Professor Tonneau know about Agnes's inheritance? More to the point, who is Professor Tonneau? We may find out in Act Two. Is it all a matter of fate? Are there people who are born to become rich and other people who are destined to remain poor? For some people, is opportunity a vision and for others, is it merely an illusion? Ah, well. Happy is that man or woman who, knowing his or her fate, accepts it and makes the best of it. Sometimes. <laughs> Yes, like the song says, just around the corner there's a rainbow in the sky. So let's have another cup of coffee and let's have another piece of pie. Now, what are you muttering about, Luther? Oh, me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Mm. Mm. 
Oh, that coffee smells good. <laughs> so does the pie. Well, it's baked fresh. You know, I estimate, in the course of our married life, 47 years, you serve me a cup of coffee and a piece of pie at least once a day. <laughs> that would make it, let's see, 365 times. Five times seven. Okay, three... 17,155 times. I always did have a head for figures. Oh, I had an eye for them, too. Yours was the prettiest in town. Yeah. Now, the pie isn't the only thing that's fresh in this house. Agnes, do you remember your Aunt Millicent's inheritance? Aunt Millicent's inheritance? Yeah, she left you a thousand dollars. Did she? Back in 1907, yes. Oh, that was such a long time ago. She remembers. She remembers very well. She also remembers what she wanted to do with it. And what I said we shouldn't do with it. She listened to me. Yeah, she always did. She still does. And she never says, I told you so. Well, hardly ever. Oh, I remember that night, long ago, in 1907. I'd come back from the faculty club where I'd forgotten my tobacco pouch. Was that when it all began? More pie, Luther? Uh, no, thanks. Mm. No, this is fine. Well, I think I'll light my pipe and smoke for a while, if if you, you don't mind. It's your house, too, Luther. Hmm. Mm. What is it? It's funny taste to this tobacco. Well, I should imagine all tobacco would taste funny. It doesn't taste bad. Just strange. Yeah, different. Different than what? Mm, from the kind I usually buy. Well, that's your pouch, isn't it? Yeah, sure. It even has my initials on it. LT. Well, I'll go inside and see to the dishes. Well, I know the smoke bothers you. I'll, I'll put it out. You'll do no such thing. A man's home is his castle. Isn't that a wife for you? Well, anyhow, later that night we were in bed, asleep, when suddenly, was I dreaming? Was it real? It seemed the whole house began to shake. I felt as if the bed was spinning round and round. Luther. We, we'd better get out of here. Luther. It's an earthquake. Luther, what is it? Don't just lie there, woman. This is the end of the world. Luther, wake up. Wake up. What are you talking about? I am up. Luther, you're having a bad dream. It's no dream. The walls are closing in. Luther, please, wake up. Luther, where are you going? I, I want to look around. See if there's been any damage. What are you talking about, damage? Well, didn't you feel it? No, Luther. It was nothing. Nothing? I thought the place would fall apart. Are you sure you weren't j just dreaming? Agnes, I was wide awake. I tell you, it was no dream. Yes, dear, I I if you say so. It was the strangest, craziest... But it was real. All right. It was real for you. Oh, I'll say it was. Well, it's only three in the morning, so go back to sleep. Oh, I can't. I'll tell you what let's do. I know. Let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. I don't know. I really don't. But things started to happen. What kind of things? Well, it mostly had to do with... I suppose you could say it was time. Like, well, next day I said to Agnes... Uh, remind me to stop off at Belcher's Pharmacy this afternoon. Oh, what for? Oh, I have to get this prescription filled. What prescription? The one Doc Simmons wrote out. When? This morning. Did you go to Dr. Simmons this morning? No, you did. I did? You said you had this headache and it just wouldn't go away. I didn't have a headache this morning. 
Now, Agnes, I called off my morning classes, and I took you to Dr. Simmons. And he gave you this powder, and it got rid of the pain like a shot. And I said to him, could we get a prescription for that, Doc? And he said, sure. Luther, are you all right? What do you mean, am I all right? Last night, you dreamed the house was coming apart. That was no dream. And now you have this uh, illusion that I was ill and we went to see Dr. Simmons? We did. No, my dear, we did no such thing. Well, how do you account for the prescription? What prescription? Well, this one here. Yes? Well, wait a minute, I, I know I put it in my pocket. No, dear. Now, don't now dear me. I remember distinctly putting it in... No, no, no. I placed it right on top of the bureau so I wouldn't forget it. Now, here it is. <laughs> oh. Yes? Oh? Well, he may have given us this prescription some time ago. Uh-huh. Oh, look at the date. Today. Well. Yes? He may have put down the wrong date. After all, doctors are only human. I still say we went to see him this morning. Oh, yes, dear. But I'll tell you what happened. The very next morning I woke up, I looked at Agnes. She had a pained expression on her face. I became alarmed. Oh, I have this terrible headache. Oh, wait a minute. I tried taking everything for it and nothing helps. Maybe I better see Dr. Simmons. But... You went to see Dr. Simmons yesterday morning, remember? How can I remember something that didn't happen? And he gave us a prescription. Oh, Luther, I feel so bad. And I filled it for you at Belcher's Drugstore. Luther. And it's in the bathroom, in the medicine cabinet. I'll get it for you. Agnes, what'd you do with the prescription? What prescription, Luther? The one we got from Dr. Simmons. We didn't go to see Dr. Simmons. Well, I distinctly remember. I think we'd better go now, Luther. I feel terrible. Well, now, Aggie, this will do it for you every time. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Luther, you take this prescription and fill it. Next time she gets one of those headaches, give her some. Yes, Doc. Um, tell me. Yes? Are you sure that we weren't here yesterday? Yesterday? I don't recall. Luther. I could swear. I'd take my oath in court that we were here this time yesterday morning, Doctor, and you gave me this exact self-same prescription. Hmm. Is that a fact? Yes. Tell me, Luther. What are you smoking these days? I let it go. You can tell by the way folks look at you that sometimes it just doesn't pay to press a point. So I took Agnes home and I filled the prescription. I didn't give old man Belcher at the pharmacy any fall draw about didn't I have this filled yesterday either. Then I thought I'd just go to the club for a while and relax. I just settled down in an easy chair when... All right, you guessed it. Ah, Professor Temple, my favorite mathematician. Oh, uh, good afternoon, Professor Tenno. Stuart, some hot rum punch is wanted here. Oh, no, thanks. I, I really nonsense, couldn't. Nonsense, nonsense, my friend. You are obviously under the weather. A hot drink will certainly pick you up and clear your head. I, my head seems to be clear. Good. You shall need a clear head for what I intend to tell you. Oh? Attend to this, Professor. This coming century shall see man free from the bonds of Earth. Uh, actually, Professor, I have an appointment of at... Of course, an appointment with destiny. As we're saying, man shall leave the surface of the Earth. Man shall defy the enslaving forces of gravity. Man shall soar through the skies. Come now, Professor. He is doing it already. The Wright brothers have breathed the air of higher altitudes. Professor, I must tell you, I am not interested. But the future of the world is in flight. If the good Lord had intended for us to fly, he would have given us wings. But he has. He has given us a winged imagination. And therefore, we can make the wings of flight. If it's all the same to you, I'll stay here on good old terra firma. There is a company that will make flying through the air... 
available to all. Please, Professor... Lighter than air machines or airplanes will soon fill the skies. They will replace the huge, ponderous railways. Well, what has this to do with me? There is a company that will develop these machines. Oh, the I see. Stock sells now for only pennies a share. I've heard that one before. An investment of $1,000 now could be worth, within three decades, almost $10 million. Seven million from the horseless carriages, and now ten million more from these flying machines. Is there no limit to the fortunes that can be made? No, Professor. None at all. I see. You really must excuse me. I'll be late for dinner. Darling, I'm home. Oh, how was the meeting? What meeting? Aren't you becoming the absent-minded professor, the meeting of the Mathematics Society? Oh, that isn't until after supper. Oh, dear, I am really starved. Starved? What's for supper? Luther, we had supper. Well, how could we have had supper? Three hours ago. What are you saying? We had supper, and then you went off to your meeting. Well, how can you say that? We had leftover turkey and salad. I've just come from the club. Darling, look. Look at the clock. Well, it can't be 10.30. That that means I missed the meeting. But you didn't miss the meeting. You were there. No. Professor Tomlinson just called. He said he didn't have a chance to talk to you after the meeting, and he wanted to tell you what a fine speech you made. Let me... Uh, let, let me sit down. Luther, are you all right? Yeah, just, just let me... Just, just to relax. Uh, Shall I bring you something? Pie? Coffee? No, no, no. There's something must be wrong. This is the first time you ever refused... It's all right, dear. I just want to sit down and relax. Light my pipe and... Think this out. If you're thinking what I'm thinking, if he wants to do some straight thinking, maybe he'd better not light that pipe. It all began, did it not, when he left his tobacco pouch at the club. We have every hope of piercing the haze in Act Three shortly. seem to be having some problems with time in this particular story. The future and the present appear to be getting all mixed up. But according to the deep thinkers like Einstein, this should not be a cause for concern. After all, time has a habit of getting all twisted up in itself, and that's why so many of us have trouble deciding whether we're coming or going. I suppose so. Coming or going, that's pretty much the story of the world, isn't it? And usually we not only don't know where we're going, we don't even know where we've been. At least I didn't. I was sitting there in my own parlor, smoking a quiet pipe back in the year 1907. Are you feeling better, dear? I'm feeling fine. You seem to have this, uh... This disorientation about time. Now, look here. Well, you must admit you are getting things mixed up. Why am I the one that's out of step? All right, dear. I admit. I just don't know what's happening sometimes. I I just have no recollection of going to that meeting. And making such a fine speech and, and forgetting about having had supper. And then that business with the prescription. And the idea that the house was falling apart. I see where you keep score. Well, that's how I can see the way the game is going. What do you mean? And you're losing, which is why you're going to see Dr. Simmons first thing in the morning. I am not going to see Dr. Simmons. Why not? Because there's nothing wrong with me. Well, I've already made an appointment. Cancel it. I will under no circumstances, and I say this definitely, go to see Dr. Simmons. Well, Luther, I find nothing wrong with you. See, Aggie, I told you. Doctor, these, um... Well, say it. 
Well, a hallucination. Now, Agnes... These are the hallucinations that he seems to be getting. Well, yes. Luther, are you under a strain? Of course not. You're smoking too much? I just have an occasional pipe. Drinking? Maybe a hot punch at the club. Well, who can say? Do everything in moderation. And if the thing persists, come back and see me in a few weeks. At which time you still won't know what's the matter with me. Probably not. But that's the way it goes. You were the one who insisted that I go to the doctor. Would you like something to eat? And I had to pay him two dollars to find out that he didn't know what was wrong with me. Two dollars to visit a doctor? My goodness, when did he raise his rates? Maybe I was right all along. Maybe there's absolutely nothing at all wrong with me. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? I don't know. I... I honestly don't know, Aggie. Luther, why don't you go for a walk? The air might do you some good. Or stop by the club. Oh, no. I'm not going to the club for a while. Why not? Well, lately, I don't seem to enjoy it. But you were always so fond of the place. It's just that I keep running into this fellow there. Which fellow? His name is Tano. Tano? Louis Tano. Didn't you mention him before, in some connection? Yes. I remember. He's the one who seemed to know about my inheritance. Yes. Oh, he sounds a bit spooky to me. Yes, he certainly is. Well, I'll... I'll go for a walk, anyhow. Come, Josephine, in my flying machine. Ah, Professor Temple. Oh, uh... Hello, Professor Tunnell. I never see you at the faculty club anymore. I'm so happy we met. Here, let us sit down on this bench for a moment. Uh, professor, I happen to be in somewhat of a rush right now. A uh, rush? My good Professor Temple, it should be made illegal to be in a rush on a day like this. So, <laughs> how are things? Things? Just fine. I, I see you have a pipe. I'm a fellow smoker myself, you know. Except, well... Lately, I find my tobacco tastes rather different. Do you? So does mine. And I'm completely at a loss to explain. Well, at any rate, do you know what's happening in the city of New York? And in large cities all over the country? No. This business of electricity. They're going to... I suppose you could say pipe it, but it might be more accurate to say conduct it through wires under the ground. And soon every building, every house will be equipped with electrical current. Electrical current? Well, what will folks do with it? What do they do at present with the gas? Light with it. Cook with it. Sounds far-fetched to me. Gas is so cheap and plenty. Nevertheless, it is estimated that an investment of, say, a thousand dollars will be worth it at least... I know, I know. In 30 or 40 years, it will be worth 10, 15, 20 million dollars. Am I right? Not even the sky is the limit. All I can say is... I am satisfied to have my funds draw safe and secure two and a half percent in the banks. Good day, Professor. Uh, Luther, dear. Yes? My brother called. Oh. And he told me that... That he had been tipped off about a fantastic new stock. How did you know? Did it perhaps have to do with electricity? Luther, you overheard the conversation. How could I? I was out for a walk. But do you think we should? As I said before, it's your money. But you know best. No, do as you please. Oh, now you're upset. I am not upset. All right, r relax, dear. I'll get you some pie and coffee. And you might light up your pipe. I don't know. The world was moving too fast, or maybe I was moving too slow. I lit up my pipe, and I felt even worse. She was unhappy. She wanted to invest her money in stocks that might or might not rise. In that case, why should I oppose her? Why should I be the villain? Just then, there was a knock on the door. 
Darling, uh, this gentleman, Professor Tonneau, is here to see you. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. Professor, forgive this intrusion. Yeah, yes. Oh, I see you're not well. Uh, I... It's, uh, it's all right. Darling, is something wrong? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, forgive me, I am perhaps the cause of it. You? Oh, uh, the unwitting cause. Professor, earlier today we were sitting in the park and we complained about the strange taste of our tobaccos. Yeah. And, uh, we couldn't account for it. And then I remembered I had left my pouch at the club one evening. Did you, by any chance, also forget yours? Did, uh... Did, did I? You did. Of course you did, Luther. Don't you remember? You went back for it. Uh, and I, too, went back for mine. Uh, may I see your pouch, Professor? Ah. <laughs> Notice. What? They look exactly alike. Both are brown. Both have the initials L.T. The steward must have mixed them up. Yes, of course. He gave you mine. I can smell this very special mixture. Uh, I hope you didn't suffer any discomfort. The blend is rather strong, you know. Uh, I'm quite all right. Thank you. No, no, no. I can see you're not. If if you'll excuse me. Good night. Good night, Professor Tenor. Uh, don't bother. I can let myself out. Agnes, as I said before, it's your money. Do, do as you please. No, dear. I want you to make that decision. But you have the right. The right, perhaps, the wisdom, no. You're as wise as I am, Agnes. Perhaps, but not as experienced. You see, I know nothing of the world outside. I was raised to be a man's wife. I was trained in the ways to keep him content. And years from now, perhaps, women will be taught how to make their own way, but... It will be too late for me. I, I guess. And so I'm happy. I have what I want. And it will be enough. Agnes. I'm so t tired. What sort of tobacco does that man smoke? Seems so strong. I'm s so tired. So tired. Sleep on that June day in 1907. Or was I asleep? Suddenly I was walking along the street. I had never seen such a street, or such buildings, such crowds, heard such noises. And not only were there horseless carriages, there were horseless trolley cars. And they weren't on tracks, they just ran. And overhead, I could hear a drone of mighty engines. I looked up. They were enormous flying machines. And all over, electric lamps were blinking on and off. It was the most dizzying sight. What did I tell you? Professor Tonneau. Well, well, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Well, what's here? Look at yourself. A most distinguished elderly gentleman. What happened to me? To, to you? We, we look older. Well, we should. We're no longer young bucks in our thirties. We're now in our late sixties. That's impossible. Why? Time passes. Uh, your car is at the curb. My car? That elegant limousine. That's mine. Inside you go. The airport, Morgan. I have a car and a chauffeur. And a private airplane. And a penthouse apartment in New York. An estate in Hollywood. A chateau near Paris. A townhouse in London. Wow. <laughs> Your fortune, my friend. You are worth millions. Perhaps billions. I don't understand. You invested in the right stocks at the right time. Yes, yes. I see I did, but... Those were the stocks you told me about. Of course. Money goes to money. It's like a snowball rolling down Mount Everest. I'm glad I listened to you. Oh, I'm glad. Your wife is waiting. Oh, marvelous. Agnes is here, too. Agnes? My wife. Oh, Agnes. She was your first wife. My... My first wife? 
she divorced you. Well, why? She had no choice. She caught you with that dancer. Which dancer? I would never cheat on Agnes. Oh, you remember? You started making money and you decided to invest in a Broadway show. It was a terrific hit, incidentally. What happened to Agnes? What's the difference? You've had three wives since then. And I don't know how many mistresses. What happened to Agnes? Oh, you really don't want to know what's happened to Agnes. What happened to Agnes? Tell me. What happened to her? What, what, what happened to Agnes? Her, wake up. What happened nothing, to... Nothing, nothing happened to Agnes. I'm here. Yes. Yes, that's right. And, and here's where you'll stay. That that money also stays in the bank. Do, do you understand? I don't want us to get rich. Do you know why? I can't afford it. I could have been rich. These past 30 years, the stocks I could have bought would have turned to pure gold. Luther, are you talking to yourself again? I never talk to myself. Do you remember years ago, Agnes, back in mm, 1900? Mm, I certainly do. I remember I had this inheritance from my aunt. I listened to you and put it in the bank. If I'd listened to myself and bought those certain stocks, we'd be rich people today. Who says we're not even richer the way things turned out? I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. Agnes, let's have another cup of coffee. And let's have another piece of pie. <laughs> That's because around every corner, for Luther and Agnes, there's a rainbow in the sky. What is wealth, anyhow? As the poet put it, which would you rather have, a full purse and an empty heart, or the other way around? I realize there can be differences of opinions on this. I shall return shortly. The title of our little tale has been Pie in the Sky, and it has been written specially for all who lament what they consider their lost opportunity. How many of us sigh and say, oh, if only we had been around when? Well, suppose you had been around when land was dirt cheap, when fantastic growth stocks were still selling for pennies, when you could have bought great art from starving artists for the price of a cup of coffee. Would you have made the right moves? And if you're wondering whatever became of Professor Tonneau, he became a billionaire. And in 1927, he was shot by a jealous husband. Our cast included Terry Keene, Bob Caliban, and Bernie Grant. The entire production was under the direction